Welcome to this video, which is a compilation of my Intro to Proofs course. So this includes all 24 lecture videos in order. So like I said, in my college, this is called Introduction to Proof Writing. That's the name of the course. It might also be called Elements of Higher Mathematics. I've seen it called that in other institutions, Discrete Math, or Bridge to Higher Mathematics, or other fairly similar names. So you might have noticed that all of the videos on this channel, Math Major, are ad-free. And that's exactly what the Patreon helps us do. Keep these videos ad-free. What are some other things that the Patreon helps us do? Well, it helps us pay for creation of the between lecture example videos. And in the future, we would like to be able to invite other people to contribute their mathematical voice to this channel either by making big lecture series or by making example videos that go between my lecture videos. So before you jump into this course, if you can help us out on the Patreon, that would be great. If you can't, that's also okay. Okay, so enjoy this course. This is the first video in a series devoted to a course on introductory proof writing. So this is generally a course that you might take when studying mathematics just after taking the calculus sequence. Perhaps you've also taken something like linear algebra. So we're essentially covering the material from this great book that I like called The Book of Proof, which is free and open source. You should be able to find it in the link below. Okay, so let's jump into it. So we'll start with the definition of a set. So we're starting pretty basic, and actually we're going to look at some mathematical structures before we start writing proofs. And th that's just so that we're, we're familiar with enough things that we can write proofs about. Okay, so a set is a collection of objects, and those objects are known as elements. And the important thing here is the elements can really be anything we'd like. They could be numbers, they could be letters, they could even be sets themselves. And so let's look at some basic examples. So this would be the set containing three, four, and five. So that's a set with three elements and each of the elements are numbers. You could have the set of all words in the English language. So some things inside of that set are like the and blue and tree and so on and so forth. The important thing about these two sets is they're both finite. So this one is clearly finite, it has three elements, but there are only finitely many words in the English language. Perhaps that number is quite large, but it is finite. We could also have the set containing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, so on and so forth. So we'll later call that the natural numbers or the set containing all real numbers. And those are both infinite sets. They have infinitely many elements. So already we see two different types of sets, sets containing finitely many elements, so finite sets, and sets containing infinitely many elements, infinite sets. And then a quick non-example would be the collection of all sets. So in other words, there's no set containing all sets, but that's like some higher end set theory, which we won't get to in this course. And so let's go back to our definition and notice that sets are made up of elements. Now we'd like a shorthand to describe this relation of being an element of a set. And that shorthand will be this symbol here. So it's kind of like an E, but I just call this the element symbol. And I think that's what most, most people would call it. So this we would say A is an element of capital A. So there it is there. But you could also negate this statement as well. So this says that X is not an element of the set capital A. And in fact, this symbol can be written in any direction you like. So here we have A as an element of A, like written backwards. But sometimes that might read like this. A contains the element little a. And that's just because we're reading it from left to right. Now let's look at a quick concrete example using this notation over here. So let's take our set A to be the set 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, so on and so forth. So that's gonna be all odd positive integers or positive whole numbers. Now let's notice we could say something like this. 1, 3, and then 121 are all elements of A. So this means that 1 is an element of A, 3 is, and 121 is as well. 
Well, let's notice there are some things that are not elements of A as well. So one half is not an element of A, two is not an element of A, and 240, they are all not elements of A. So now let's look at some important sets which we'll see over and over again. So the first is called the empty set. And so we denote it by this symbol or less commonly this symbol where we've got curly braces and nothing inside. The important thing is that there's nothing inside. In fact, the empty set contains no elements at all. Then a next important set would be maybe the natural numbers. And so that includes all positive integers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, so on and so forth. Sometimes that includes zero depending on who you ask. But I think mostly for this course, we will have it not include zero just for the sake of argument. Then we've got the integers, that's all positive and negative whole numbers, and then the number zero. So like negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, so on and so forth in both directions. The next we could have the rational numbers, so that's gonna be all ratios of integers. So they're of the form P over Q, where P and Q are integers and Q is not zero. Then you could have R, which is all real numbers. In order to carefully construct the real numbers, it's actually pretty tricky. You might learn that in a real analysis class like in the future. Then you've got the complex numbers, which are of the form A plus B I, where A and B are real numbers. And then I is, of course, the imaginary number. So when you square it, you get negative one. Okay, so moving on, if we just look at finite sets for a little bit, we've got this natural thing, which is the number of elements in the finite set. And we'll call that the cardinality of a finite set. So to define it, the cardinality of a finite set is the number of elements it contains. And let's say A is a set with five elements, then we would write it like this. So it looks like absolute value of A equals five, but since we're thinking of A as a set, we would write, read that as the cardinality of A is five. Now I've seen other textbooks that use this number symbol, like this number symbol is a function acting on the set A, and it gives you the number of elements inside of A. So there are probably some more notations as well that you might want to look out for, depending on which textbook you're reading. So let's look at some examples of sets with different cardinalities. Let's start by noticing that the cardinality of the empty set is zero. And that's because it has zero elements. That's the definition of the empty set. But if we take the cardinality of the set containing the empty set, we get the number one. Because this set contains a single element. That element is the empty set. So it's a little bit tricky, but let's recall that elements of sets can be sets. So let's look at maybe a simpler one. What about one, two, seven, 100? So that set contains four elements. Well, let's look at another one. Let's make it a tricky one this time. So the cardinality of the empty set, and then the set containing the empty set, and then the set containing the empty set, and the set containing the empty set. So our goal is to find the cardinality of that set. But the cardinality of that set is three. So let's notice it's three elements are the empty set, the set containing the empty set, and then finally, this set containing both the empty set and the set containing the empty set. So we have three elements. So that means, like I said, its cardinality is three. Now, what about this? What's the cardinality of the set, con of the set containing the real numbers and the integers? Well, the cardinality of that is two. So the real numbers itself is an infinite set. The integers is an infinite set, but we're not asking the cardinality of the real numbers or the cardinality of the integers. This is the cardinality of the set containing each of these two sets. But that's all this larger set contains are those two sets. But that means that the cardinality is two. That set has two elements. It just happens that each of those elements are infinite sets. Okay, so let's move on. Now we're gonna look at some succinct ways to write down sets without listing all of the elements. And that's called set builder notation. And in fact, we've already used it to describe both the rational numbers and the complex numbers before. So it goes like this. 
So you'll have two curly braces kind of building the whole thing. And then you'll have this thing broken by a vertical line or sometimes a colon depending on the author. And we have it like this. On the left hand side of the vertical line is an expression. And on the right hand side is a rule satisfied by that expression. And this vertical line or the colon is the word such that. So you read this as the set containing this type of expression such that this expression satisfies a certain rule. Sometimes you do something slightly different and it goes like this. So on the left hand side you have the broad shape of an element and on the right hand side you have specific rules that element must follow. Okay, so let's look at some examples. And we're actually going to look at some of the same sets written with set builder notation in different ways, for a couple of these at least. So let's say we've got 2 times n, where n is an integer. So that would be one way of describing a certain set. So notice we've got n as an integer over here, and then we've got 2 times n over here. That means our elements look like 2 times n as n runs through all integers. Now, we can easily see that this means this is all even integers, and then well, we can list all even integers with some dot dot dots to recognize that there's some pattern here. So maybe this would be dot 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 minus 6 minus 4 minus 2 0 2 4 6 dot dot dot. And I think that's clear that we're listing all even integers. So what are some other ways to write this down? Well, you could write it like this. You could say we've got all elements in which come from the integers satisfying the rule that n is even. So that would be more in line with this second way of using set builder notation. Next, we could translate this phrase n is even, or maybe it's a sentence n is even, into something that looks more mathematical. It's not really more mathematical, but it's got some symbols. And that would look like this. So this would be the set containing all integers n such that n equals 2k for some integer k. That would be another way of describing all even integers. So all even integers are most definitely multiples of 2. That's the definition of an even integer. So that's why this works. So let's look at some other examples. So let's look at the set of all real numbers x such that x squared equals 2. Okay, well that's just going to be all solutions to the equation, the polynomial equation, x squared equals 2. I think probably from a pre-calculus class we know that this is negative square root of 2 and positive square root of 2. So this is a set containing two elements. Now what about this? What about the set of all rational numbers x such that x squared is 2? Well, famously, the square root of 2 is not a rational number. We'll prove that later in the course, but you probably know that fact already. So that means no rational number will satisfy this, which means, in fact, we have the empty set. This is just a really fancy way of writing the empty set. So let's look at a couple more. Let's look at all integers z such that the absolute value of x is less than 3. So that means x has to be between negative 3 and positive 3, but it's not allowed to include 3. But we're also only looking at integers. So this boils down very quickly to the set negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. If we take the absolute value of everything within that set, we get something smaller than 3 for sure. But everything outside that set, we would get something bigger than or equal to 3. So let's look at a companion to this. Let's say we've got all real numbers satisfying the, e, the inequality absolute value of x is less than 3. Well now, we would generally write this in interval notation, something that you probably learned in calculus or pre-calculus, and I would write this as the open interval negative 3 to 3, just keeping in mind what I mean by that is the portion of the real line between negative 3 and 3, not including negative 3 or 3. So now let's look at some operations we can do between two sets. Now we're going to look at a way to take the product of two sets. So given two sets A and B, we'll define their Cartesian product by the following new set. 
So we'll call it A cross B, and it'll be the set of all ordered pairs, A and B, where A comes from A and B comes from B. Now the important thing here is that A and B don't have to be the same type of set. You could have A be the set of all real numbers, and B be the set of all vegetables in your fridge. So an example of A, something in A cross B here would be like the number five and broccoli. Um, and then maybe something else would be like the number pi and a pie. So most of the time, both of these will be sets of numbers, but I think it's like a fun example to think about, well, what happens if they're not both sets of numbers? So here's a nice visualization, and this harkens back to thinking about this like the real plane. So let's say we've got a set A, it has two elements, U and V, and then we have a set B, which has three elements, X, Y, and Z. Then we could write, then we could lay A across a horizontal axis and B across a vertical axis. And then everything in A cross B will be ordered pairs made up of elements of A and elements of B. So this would be A cross B. So for instance, U comma Z, V comma Z, U comma Y, V comma Y, U comma X, V comma X. Those are the six elements of A cross B. And in fact, something that we won't prove right now is that if A and B are finite, then the size of A cross B is the size of A times the size of B. Okay, so now let's look at some visualization examples of cross products. So let's start with R cross Z. I think this is a nice example. So this is living within the Cartesian coordinate plane. Notice the Cartesian co coordinate plane is just R cross R, or sometimes we write R cross R as R squared. We'll see that later. So it's gonna be a subset of this plane. And what subset will it be? Well, notice that each first coordinate can be any real number, whereas each second coordinate can be just any integer. So notice the x-axis is definitely a member of this set. And that's because the first coordinate is a real number x and the second coordinate is the integer zero. Maybe I'll underline this in yellow just to show that we're graphing this in yellow. You could also maybe have this portion right here, which would be of the form, maybe we'll say y comma one. We could have something down here, which is y comma negative one or real number comma negative one. We could have something up here, which would have a second coordinate of two. Down here would be a second coordinate of negative two and so on and so forth. So it's this infinite co collection of lines. Okay, so let's look at a next one. Let's say we've got n cross n. So again, that naturally lives within the Cartesian coordinate plane, r squared, which is r cross r. So we might as well write it as a substructure of that larger structure. So notice here, all of the first coordinates are natural numbers and all of the second coordinates are also natural numbers. So we would have like one comma one, that would be an element. And then maybe two comma one, three comma one, four comma one, five comma one, six comma one, and so on and so forth. We could also go this way. So this would be one comma two, one comma three, one comma four. And as you see, we're filling in all of these points. So this is some sort of like lattice and it's going infinitely in both directions, including like up like that. So that would be n cross n. Now let's look at another one. Let's look at maybe z cross the half open interval one to three. Let's say it includes one, but it does not include three. So this is a substructure of the real numbers. So what would that look like? So notice all of the first coordinates are integers. All of the second coordinates are real numbers between one and three. So that would be something like this. So we could go here to one, up to here to three, and it would be that. So this would be like zero comma x, where x comes from one comma three. But then this first coordinate can be any integer like we pointed out. So it could be one, two, three, four, it could be negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, so on and so forth. 
So pushing that out, we've got this like infinite collection of half open line segments, which are all parallel to each other like that. So that would be an example of that set. Okay, let's look at one more. Let's maybe look at the set one, two, three, cross the set negative one, zero, one. So again, we'll put this in the Cartesian coordinate plane, but this is only going to have nine elements based off the fact over here, which we're not proving just yet at least. We'll prove it later. So notice the first coordinates can be either one, two, and three. The second coordinates can be negative one, one, or zero. So here would be the fact when the second coordinate is zero, you would get those three points. If the second coordinate is one, you would get those three points. If the second coordinate is negative one, you would get those three points. So we get those following nine points. So one of the important things for each of these is that we drew them all as substructures of the real plane R2 or R cross R. So that really motivates us to define what it really means to be a substructure or a subset. So let's do that. So if we've got two sets A and B, we say that A is a subset of B if every element of A is an element of B. And we'll write like this, A is a subset of B. But there is some contention among math people whether or not we should have this line down here. I'm really agnostic on it. I don't care one way or the other. But sometimes people use A as a subset of B without the line down there. And sometimes this means that B cannot just be all of A. So B has some elements that don't contain A. Or sometimes these two symbols can mean the same thing. Sometimes if you want to really hit home that A does not contain all of the elements of B, in other words, B has some things that are not in A, you would write it like this. So A is a subset of B, but a proper subset. So you'd put a cross, but in, so you'd put a cross through that line. <clears throat> but all of these notations vary. So you just have to think on, but you should be able to pick up by context which the book you're reading is using. Okay, so let's look at some examples. So if we have any set A, well, we automatically know two subsets. And one of those subsets is the empty set. So the empty set is a subset of A. And the set itself is also a subset of A. Now, you might think that this means that every set has two subsets, but that's totally not true because the empty set only has itself as a subset. So, and that's because A would be equal to the empty set in this case. Then we also have this nice string of numerical subsets. So we've got the natural numbers as a subset of the integers, which is a subset of the rational numbers, which is a subset of the real numbers, which is a subset of the complex numbers. And in fact, you can push that way if you want to the quaternions and other more obscure things if you're psyched. You can also maybe look at this. So the set containing negative one, zero, one is a subset of the closed interval from one to, or from negative one to one. You could also maybe look at the set Z cross R as we saw in a picture previously, and that will be a subset of R cross R, which is sometimes called R squared or R2. And now all of this really brings us into an important definition, which will fit in here, and that is the set of all subsets. And that's called the power set. So the power set of a set A is the set of all subsets of A. And we denote it with the following notation. We've got this calligraphic P of A. So we read that as the power set. That opens us up to some more examples. So the power set of the empty set is simply the set containing the empty set. So let's recall up here, if A is any set, then the empty set is a subset and that set is a subset. Well, in this case, those two overlap. Then we could have the power set of the singleton set X. So let's just a set containing a single element, we'll call it X. 
So that's going to be the empty set and then the whole set, the singleton containing X. Then we can move on, maybe the power set of the set containing A and B. So that's sometimes called a doubleton, a set with two elements. So this one's a little bit more interesting. You would have the empty set, that's a subset. You would have the singleton A, the singleton B, and then the whole set A and B. Great. And all of this brings us to a fact, a fact that's pretty similar to the fact that we saw with the Cartesian product on the size, and that would be the size of the power set of A is two to the size of A, or the cardinality of the power set of A is two to the power of the cardinality of A. And right now this only makes sense for finite sets, but in fact, you can make some meaning out of this for infinite sets if you want to maybe dive deeper. Well, let's maybe check this in these two examples, or three examples. So here we've got the empty set that contains zero elements. Two to the zero is one. The power set has exactly one element. What about this? This set contains one element, but the power set contains two elements. That's two to the one. This set contains two elements but the power set contains one, two, three, four elements, that's two to the two. So this fact seems to hold for these basic cases, but we'll prove that it holds um, in general later. Okay, so that's about enough for this first video. I'll leave you with some warm-up exercises. So here are two warm-up problems, each with a couple of parts to work on based off what we saw today. So the first is to list the elements of the following sets. So these are given in set builder notation. So first, we've got all integers x such that the absolute value of 7x is less than 24. Next, we've got all real numbers x such that 7x squared minus x cubed equals 12x. Finally, we've got all capital X inside the power set of the set containing 1, 2, 3 such that the cardinality of x equals 2. Then next up, we've got some subsets of the plane to sketch. So the first is everything of the form x comma x plus y, where x is a real number and y is an integer. Next, we've got the doubleton 0, 1, so the set containing 0 and 1, cross the half open interval 0 to 1, not including 1. Then next, we've got the closed interval 1 to 5, cross the set containing all ordered pairs x and y from real numbers such that x squared plus y squared equals 1. So this last one is interesting because it's three-dimensional, and that's a good place to stop. This is the second video in a series devoted to proof writing and in fact a course that I'm teaching in proof writing at my college. And so in the previous video we looked at the very basics of sets and here we're going to look more at the basics of sets. And all of this is really just to give us some tools to work with so we can start writing down some proofs. So now let's start by looking at the intersection and the union of two sets. So let's say we're given sets A and B we can define their union, which we read this as A union B, to be everything X such that X is in A or X is in B. So union is like the conjunction or. And there's a typical way to draw this or visualize this via something called a Venn diagram. So you think about this circle here being everything in A, this circle here being everything in B. So notice we're shading everything in A or everything in B. The total of A and B. Then the intersection, which we read as A intersect B, that's going to be all X such that X is in A and X is in B. So intersection is like the conjunction and. So here we've got our same picture, but now we just have this sliver between A and B. So notice everything within this sliver is in A and it's also in B. Whereas up here, we definitely have things in A and B, but we've got elements over here that are only in A, and elements over here that are only in B. Then finally, we'll have the difference between two sets. And so A minus B is equal to all X that are in A, but they're not in B. And I use this slanty minus sign, but some authors use this just straight minus sign. So if you wanna draw that, well, notice we've got this drawing right here. We have A and B, 
And over here, this shading in yellow is everything in A that's not in B. So that excludes the intersection because those elements are in A and B, but you don't want them to be in B. So let's look at some simple examples first before we look at something a little bit trickier involving maybe sets of real numbers. So let's say we've got these three sets, A, which has A, B, C in it, so little a, little b, little c, little d. Let's say capital B has c, d, e in it and capital C has e, f, g in it. So let's calculate a intersect b. So for that, we're gonna look for everything that is in both sets. So a and b are only in capital A, so we don't use those. C and d are in both though. So a intersect b is just the doubleton c and d. Now notice we do not include, include e because that's only in the set b. Now let's look at B union C. So that'll be everything in B and everything in C or, or everything in C. So it's a little bit tricky because naturally you kind of want to put the word and there, but it's not really as precise as we want to be. So that will include C, D, and E. So we've got C, D, and E, those are in B. And then we go over here and look at C. Notice C also contains E. Well, we've already got that written down, so we don't need to write it down twice. And then we'll have F and G. Now there is a way of writing down E twice, something called the disjoint union, but we won't cover that just now. Now let's look at this. We've got A union, B intersect C. So later we'll be able to rewrite this maybe by distributing the union over the intersection, but we're not gonna do that just yet. So let's do this maybe from inside out. So we'll do these parentheses first. So that'll be A union and then B intersect C is simply the singleton E. That's because that's what's in common of B and C. But now let's go up and look at A and A does not contain E. Okay, but it contains A, B, C, and D. And since we're doing a union, that's okay. So here our set is is A, B, C, D, and E. We get the first four from the set A and then the last one from our intersection. Now let's look at this set difference, A minus B. So there we're looking for everything in A that is not in B, but that clearly is just little a and little b. Now we've got another one of these. We have the Cartesian product of a and b minus c. So that's gonna be the Cartesian product of a with, well, let's see, b minus c is the doubleton c, d. So we've got a set containing four elements, Cartesian product with a set containing two elements. So that should give us a set containing eight elements. And those eight elements are ordered pairs. The first entry comes from a and the second entry comes from this doubleton C, D. So we'll have something like this. So maybe A, C, B, C, D, C, and C, C. So that comes from choosing A, B, C, and D and pairing it with C. And then we could choose each of these and pair them with D as well. That'll give us our four other elements. So we'll have um, A, D, like I said, B, D, like I said, C, D, like I said, and D, D, like I said. And for some weird reason, I put these like, maybe they're not really out of order because the order doesn't matter, but it's not the next natural way that we would have written that down. I think my brain just did something weird there. So now let's look at B minus A. Well, we already calculated A minus B and saw that it was A comma B. And in fact, our subtraction is not gonna be commutative here. Well, normal subtraction is also not commutative. So here we're looking for everything in B that is not in A. Well, that's just gonna be the singleton E. So here we've got the singleton E. So here are four examples of these set operations on sets of real numbers. And we'll approach these by making a bit of a picture of what's going on. I think that'll be a nice way to visualize what's happening. So let's get our real number line for this first one and let's shade these as I'm color coding right here. So let's see, we'll need four numbers to make sure we know what's going on here. We'll need zero to one, Actually, now that I look at this, this should have been 10, although that will also work. So we've got zero, seven, 10, and 12 are the important points for this uh, problem. Now let's shade everything between zero and 10. I'll shade it below just so it doesn't get in the way. So we're gonna include zero and 10, so we need closed circles. Then everything between seven and 12. So let's color code that orange. 
And now we're looking for the intersection of those. So since we're looking for the intersection of those, we need numbers that are in both of those sets. Well, I think that's pretty clearly gonna be everything between seven and 10. And we're allowed to include both seven and 10. So here we can make this nice simplification to the interval seven, 10. Now let's look at this next one. We've got the closed interval negative one, six minus the closed interval two to infinity. It's closed because this infinite thing doesn't make it open on that side. It actually makes it open and closed on that side. So let's do the same thing here. Maybe we'll keep our same color coding. So we've got orange there, we have yellow here. So the important points to write here will be negative one, two, six. So let's write negative one here, two here, and six here. And I don't really need to worry about scales. This is just to kind of get an idea of what's going on. Okay, so negative one to six will be this interval as I'm shading in yellow. And then let's see, two to infinity will be this thing that I'm shading in orange. And I'll put an arrow to say that we're going forever. And now notice we're doing the set minus here, the set difference. So we want everything in this yellow set that is not in this orange set. So that's gonna include things like negative one all the way up to the number two. But in fact, it will not include the number two because two is included in this other set. So in the end, we get that red shaded bit, but we can rewrite this as the half open interval from negative one to two. Okay, so now let's look at this one. So here we'll have important points of negative three, zero, three, and five. So let's see, negative three, zero, three, and five. Again, let's color code just to keep everything consistent. And we'll have negative three, three looks like this, whereas zero, to five looks like this. And now we're trying to find the union there, but notice the union is gonna include everything between negative three and five, not including the endpoints. Oh, I got my colors off a little bit, but that's okay. In fact, maybe these are better color choices because yellow and red makes orange. Okay, so putting this together, we see that we have the open interval negative three to five. Okay, so now let's look at this next one. We have the entire real number line minus this interval from negative one to one. So let's get negative one and one on this. So negative one and one. And then we'll see that the real line will just be everything here in yellow, whereas this negative one to one will be this orange that I'm putting underneath. So we wanna take the orange bit away from the yellow bit. So we cannot include negative one, we cannot include one, but we can include everything branching off from that. And then probably the easiest way to write this is as a disjoint union of two open intervals. So we'll have negative infinity to negative one for this left-hand bit, union one to infinity. Okay, so let's keep going. Now that we know about the set difference, the next logical thing to look at is something called the complement of a set. But in order to talk about the complement of a set, we need to know what like context we're working in or what universe we're working. And so I have this little remark to kind of describe what I mean by this. So depending on the context of the, of the problem you're working in, we may want to define something called a universal set that contains every set that we might be interested in as a set subset. So here are some standard examples of universal sets, although this list could be much larger. So you could have all of the numbers 0, 1, 2, up to n. That would be like a standard finite version of a universal set. You could also maybe have the set of all letters in the English alphabet, or I guess it wouldn't be the Latin alphabet. You could have the set of natural numbers, integers, rational numbers, real numbers, or complex numbers as well. And as you might imagine, you can also have like R2 or maybe Z cross R or whatever. You can really work with any universal set you want. These are just some standard examples. Okay, now that we've got that taken care of, let's suppose that we have a universal set U and A is a subset of U. So let's say for a certain class of problems we're working on, we don't need to consider anything larger than a certain universal set then the complement of A, sometimes you would actually say the complement of A in U, but we'll just say the complement in A, the U is understood. 
We'll write that as a bar, so a bar over it, and that is u minus a. But there's some different notation depending on which textbook you're looking at. You could also have a complement, so we've got that superscript c, or sometimes a prime. I bet there's more notations as well, but as I've seen, these are the most common. Okay, so let's look at some examples. So let's say we've got a universal set, which is all natural numbers, or I guess I should say all integers between zero and 10. And then we've got a is all all of the even integers in that set, and b is all of the powers of two in that set. So one is a power of two because it's two to the zero. Now let's calculate a few things. So let's calculate a complement first. So that's pretty straightforward. We have one, three, five, seven, and nine. Those are all the odd numbers. That's pretty obvious. All of the complement of all of the even numbers should be all of the odd numbers. And then B complement will be, let's see, we'll start at zero, and then we get three, uh, five, six, seven, nine, and 10. So those are all of the non-powers of two. So now let's do some combinations of this complement action with union and intersection. So let's look at the intersection of A complement and B complement. Okay, so we need to find numbers that are in both of these sets. So one is only in this first set, zero is only in the second set set, but three, five, seven, and nine are in both of them. So three, five, seven, and nine. Now let's do something a little different. Let's take A union B and then complement that. So we're taking the union before taking the complement. So let's take this union first. So we'll have zero, one, two, four, six, eight, and 10. So that's a combination of all of the even numbers numbers and all of the powers of two. Now let's complement that and see what we get. Notice the first thing that we're missing is three. I guess I should say we're looking for things in our universal set that are not here. So we're missing three, we're missing five, seven, and nine. Now you've probably noticed that these two sets are equal to each other. And in fact, this is true for any set. And that's something that we'll prove like in the future. Okay, now let's look at another example. Let's maybe look at the example where our universal set is all real numbers. And let's do something like this. Let's Let's find the complement of the interval between 1 and 12, including 1 and uh, including 12. So that's pretty similar to a problem we did on the previous board. So we want everything outside of this interval. So that's going to be everything from minus infinity to 1. We're not allowed to include 1. Then we can pick back up at 12 without including it and go forever. So that would be the complement in this case. So what about this? What about the complement of the integers? Well, the complement of the integers can be written as an infinite union. So notice that the union, <clears throat> so notice that we'll need the open interval between zero and one. We have to take out zero and take out one, but then we'll also need the open interval between zero or one, two, two, three, and so on and so forth. And we also have to go backward. So this would be the open interval between negative one and zero, dot, dot, dot. So we've got this infinite union of things like that. And actually the necessity of writing this complement of integers as an infinite union brings up the next thing that we'll look at, which is indexed sets. Now we're ready to look at the notion of an index set. So how this works is we have any set i, and it's really important that we can actually have any set i as our indexing set. So this capital I, like I said, will be called our indexing set. And then for any element little i in capital I, there is some set that we can attach to that element, and we'll call that set a sub i. Okay, so the logical thing to do would be to talk about intersections and unions over these indexing sets. And the notation for that goes like this. So this would be the intersection over all all i of the a sub i. And this is all x such that x is an a sub i for all i in i. So you can think of a for all conditional as being like a bunch of ands string together. And so this could in fact be like some sort of continuous and state. So x is in a1 and a2 and a3 and a4 so on and so forth. But the important thing here is that i doesn't have to be a discrete set, it can be a continuous set, like for example, the real number. And then the union over all i and i of a i is all x such that x is an a 
AI for some I and I. So it only has to be in one of them. It could be in one, two, or three. It could be in all of them, but it only has to be in one of them in order to be in the union. So let's look at some examples. So let's start with I being natural numbers. That's kind of a classic indexing set. And then A sub I is all of the numbers between I and I squared. So notice that A sub one is gonna be everything between one and one squared. Well, that's just the number one. Notice that A2 will be everything between two and two squared. Well, that'll be two, three, and four. A sub three will be everything between three and three squared. So that'll be everything between three and nine. Well, now we can immediately see that the intersection here will be empty. And we'll write it like this. So the intersection from I equals one to infinity of A sub I is the empty set. So when you've got an indexing set of the natural numbers, it's kind of classic to write the intersection like this, I equals one to infinity, instead of like over all I and the natural numbers, although either one would be correct. And we see that's the empty set because there's no single number that's in all of those sets. In fact, the number one is only in A1. It's not in any of the others. And then what about the union? Well, I think it's pretty clear here that the union is just gonna be all natural numbers. And that's because the number I is in A sub I. So let's say we want 45. Well, 45 is gonna be in a sub 45. It's gonna be in something else, but it will be in a sub 45. So that allows us to get all of our natural numbers. Now let's look at our second example. So we've got i as the integers, and then a sub i is the open interval from negative i to i. Actually, I'm gonna change this a little bit. Let's change this to the open interval between i minus one and i. I think that's a little bit more interesting and it'll go back to a previous example. So now maybe let's look at a couple of examples. So a sub one will be the open interval between zero and one. A sub negative three will be the open interval from negative four to negative three. And again here, if you take the intersection, so the intersection from i equals minus infinity to infinity of a sub i, that's still the empty set. And that's because these in fact don't overlap at all. But what about the union? So the union over all i and z, and I'd like to point out that if you're working with an indexing set of the integers, it's kind of similarly typical to write our indexed union as intersection in one of these two ways, but both of them are fairly typical. Okay, so the union here will in fact be r minus the integers. And I think that's pretty clear just by the structure of how this is going. Well, you can have a finite indexing set as well. What if our indexing set is the set one, two, three, then we've got three sets a1, a2, and a3. So let's notice in this case, the union from i equals one to three of ai, well, that'll just be the union of those three sets. I think that's gonna give us the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, stop. So all of those numbers right there. And then we've got one last example where we've got a continuous indexing set, which is the close interval zero to one. I'm actually gonna do that more properly on a clean board. So now we're gonna look at our example where we have a continuous indexing set. Here the indexing set is all real numbers between zero and one. And typically if you have a concrete continuous indexing set, you'll use alpha as your indexer. Now if you're working abstractly, you'll generally use the i, although it's not right or wrong to do either. Okay, so for some real number between zero and one, we'll define a sub alpha to be the rectangle alpha comma two cross product with zero comma alpha. And so like I said, this is gonna be all real numbers between zero and one. Those are our possible values of alpha. Okay, so let's write down a couple of these sets and then we'll make some pictures. So probably most interestingly is to look at a zero and a one because those are the endpoints. So notice that a zero will be zero two cross zero zero. But zero zero, the closed interval, is just gonna be the singleton zero. So we really we have zero two cross the singleton zero. Now let's maybe look at a one. So that's gonna be one two cross zero one. So there we've got a nice kind of biggish rectangle. Then let's look at something in the middle. We may look at some more things in the middle, but let's look at a one half. 
so that's going to be the close interval half two cross the close interval zero half. Okay, so now that we've got those written down, let's look at a bit of a picture. So along the x-axis, we need everything between zero and two. So let's maybe put one here and two here. And then along the y-axis, we'll just need things between zero and one. I won't keep my scale constrained here, but I think that's okay. Okay, so now let's color code this a little bit. So let's say that a zero will be drawn in yellow. So all of the x coordinates go between zero and two, but all of the y coordinates are just simply the number zero. So that means we've got this line segment here that's along the x-axis or along the horizontal axis. So that's our a zero set right there. It's that line segment. Now let's look at a half. So that's going to be a rectangle. Notice the x values are between half and two and the y values are between zero and half. So let's go to y equals half right here x equals half right here, and we're allowed to have this rectangle. So that right there would be our a1 half. Next up, let's draw a1. So a1, all of the x coordinates can be between one and two. So just between one and two, and then all of the y coordinates are between zero and one. So that'll be something like this. So there's a nice picture of a1. And then maybe to fill in just just a little bit, let's calculate a three quarters, and then maybe as a bit of an exercise, you could do a one quarter or some more of them if you'd like to. So a three quarters, all of the x coordinates are between three quarters and two whereas all of the y coordinates are between zero and three quarters. Let's maybe make this in this nice magenta color. So let's see, between three quarters and two, those are our x values. So three quarters is about there, and zero and three quarters, so those are all of our y values. So we've got a rectangle that looks something like this. Okay, nice. So I'd say it'd probably be a nice exercise to play around with this some more. I think this makes some nice pictures. Okay, so now let's look at some bigger ideas before we leave you with some warm-up exercises. So now we're gonna look at a few bigger ideas. The first is the well-ordering principle. So that says that every non-empty set of positive integers has a least element. And this should be quite clear. So notice if we try to make a non-empty set of positive integers, like three, four, seven, 1001, it most definitely naturally has a least element. In this case, it's three. This is not true over the real numbers or even over the rational numbers though, if you take positive rational numbers. Let's consider the set of positive rational numbers, one, one half, one third, one quarter, one fifth, so on and so forth. So all of the reciprocals of natural numbers. This does not have a least element. You can always find one of these fractions that's smaller than anything else that you want. So something that follows from the well-ordering principle is called the division algorithm. And that says for all integers a and b, there are unique integers q and r such that a equals b times q plus r and r is between zero and b. It's allowed to be zero but not allowed to be b. So this is your typical division with remainder that you learn in grade school. So for instance, 14 is equal to four times three plus two. So if you divide 14 by four, you get a quotient of three and a remainder of, so that's what's going on there. And so I'll maybe like start the sketch of the proof of that up at the top here, but we won't really finish it off. We'll do the proof of that a little bit more carefully later. So let's say we fix A and B, and now we're gonna consider the following set. And that set will be made up of everything of the form a minus b times x as x ranges through all integers and then we'll take that set and then intersect it with all non-negative integers. So in other words, this thing right here has to be bigger than or equal to zero. Now we'll call that set S. And so maybe the step number one here is to show that S is non-empty. Well, clearly S is a set of natural numbers. Well, not exactly. It could include zero, and we're not taking zero to be a natural number, but the well-ordering principle is satisfied by um, the positive or non-negative integers. So that's okay. So S is not the empty set. You can check that fairly easily. When we do the proof carefully, we will do that. Then next, we'll take the minimum element of S to be R and let 
Q be the corresponding X that makes that R. But then let's notice that we'll have R is equal to B minus or is equal to a minus b times q, which gives us this equation down there. Now we just have to check that r is the correct size and the unique thing. But like I said, we'll do that more carefully later when we're into our proof writing part. Okay, so finally I wanna talk about something called Russell's paradox, which is related to this fact that the collection of all sets is not a set. So it's gonna consider the following collection of objects, and that will be A. And it's made up of all sets X, such that X is not an element of its set of itself. So notice that A is non-empty. We can find things inside of A for sure. Notice the empty set is an element of A. That's because the empty set is a set and it doesn't contain anything. So that means it cannot contain itself. Then a bunch of other stuff is inside A as well. In fact, all maybe typical sets are inside of A. Like Z is an element of A. So Z contains all integers, but it doesn't contain the set of all integers. But can we find something not inside A? And we can can, but it's kind of a crazy object. So notice if we set the set B equal to this kind of infinite collection of empty boxes, then this B is definitely inside of itself. Notice it's right there inside of itself. But since it's an element of itself, that means that B is not an element of A. So now that really brings us to the following natural question. And that is, is A an element of itself? Okay, so let's see. So case number one. So case number one is yes, A is an element of itself. But notice in order to be inside of A, you're not allowed to be an element of yourself. So being an element of yourself implies that you are in fact not an element of yourself if you're this whole set A. Okay, so now let's look at case two. So case one is impossible because it brings us to this contradiction. Notice we've got these two feuding ideas. So case number two will be no, but if it's not an element of itself, then by the definition of A here, it means it is an element of itself. But again, that's another contradiction. But that means we can't determine if A is an element of itself. And like I said, this is a paradox, but this is a paradox that's connected to the collection of all sets not being a set. And so while we're doing really, really basic ideas of sets right now, we're not doing this like higher end set theory in this course. Okay, so I think I'm gonna leave everyone with some warm up exercises. So here are two nice warm up exercises based off what we've done. So let's start with two sets A and B. They're both doubleton. A contains one and two and B contains two and three. Then there are these six things to calculate. So A cross B intersect B cross B, the power set of A intersect intersect the power set of B, A cross B intersect B, the power set of A union B, A cross B set minus B cross B, and then finally the power set of A union the power set of B. Then next let's simplify the following intersections or unions of indexed sets. So the intersection over all real numbers alpha of the singleton alpha cross 0, 1. And then the next is the union over all natural numbers, or sometimes you would write that as the union of I going from 1 to infinity, of the closed interval from I I to I plus, and that's a good place to stop. This is the third video in a series devoted to an introductory course of proof writing. And previously we looked at the very basics of set, and now we're gonna look at mathematical statements, mathematical open sentences, as well as a bit of logic. Okay, so let's look at a definition first. So a mathematical statement, or sometimes just a statement, is a sentence that is either definitely true or definitely false. And this can be a sentence written in English or it can be a sentence written in mathematical notation. So let's look at some examples. So for this first one it says if a square has a side length of x it has an area of x. So that's a true statement just by the standard area formula for a square. Next up we have every odd integer is one more than an even integer. That's also a true statement just by the simple characterization of even and odd integers. So next up we've got three that are written in mathematical notation but we can read these as complete sentences. We have
have 3030 is a natural number. In other words, 3030 is an element of the natural numbers. We have the natural numbers form a subset of integers. And next up we have three quarters is a rational number or three over four is an element of the rational numbers. And again, these are all true mathematical statements. Now for some false mathematical statements. There's still mathematical statements though, as long as you have a sentence which is definitely true or definitely false, it is a mathematical statement. So the first is the square root of two is a rational number. So this is false. It's well known that the square root of two is irrational and we'll prove that later in the course. Next is the set of all integers is a finite set. So the set of all integers is fairly clearly an infinite set. Next up, all triangles are right triangles. Well, I can think of a lot of triangles that are not right triangles. For example, equilateral triangles, those are not right triangles. And then next, every quadratic equation has two real solutions. So this is also false. You could have a quadratic equation with one real solution, a so-called repeated root, or you could have a quadratic equation with zero real solutions. For instance, x squared equals minus one. That doesn't have any real solution. And now I won't write these on the board, but some non-examples of mathematical sentences would be something like for all integers n. So that's just a phrase. That would be the setup for a mathematical statement. Or what is the solution to x squared plus three x equals one? But a question is neither true nor false until you start writing down the answer, but the answer would turn into a mathematical statement. Okay, so now I wanna go on to the standard strategy of naming mathematical statements. So now moving on, it's fairly typical to name mathematical statements. That sets up maybe a calculus of logic, which we'll see later. So general names occur like at the two thirds point of the alphabet, like P, Q, and R. Further, sometimes these statements depend on variables. And in fact, if the truth of that statement depends on what the input of the variable is, it's technically not a statement anymore. It's something called an open sentence. And that's a bit more interesting when we have this variable dependence. So let's look at some examples. So let's say the statement every differentiable function is continuous. We could call that statement P. So we've named that sentence. The next, if we said Q was the statement the function f of x equals sine x is un bounded, that would be the name for that sentence. We've named that Q. Now I'd like to point out that P is most definitely true. Like in a calculus one class, you learn that if a function is differentiable, then it's continuous. Q seems like it would be false because the function F of X is bound between negative one and one. And this is actually where context matters. So if X is a real number, then this is a false statement because sine of X, like I said, is bound between negative one and one. But if X is allowed to be a complex number, then this function is actually unbounded and this is true. So the truth of Q depends on the context that we're working. And then here's another statement R, and that says if P and Q are prime numbers that are two digits or more, so they are bigger than or equal to 11, then P to the fourth minus Q to the fourth is a multiple of 240. This is a nice, fairly elementary number theory problem. So here are some open sentences. So they become statements when we plug in values for the variable. So here we have P of X and the statement or the open sentence is X is an even integer. So notice we cannot determine the truth or the falseness of this open sentence without plugging in a number. So notice if we plug in the number like 2,142, then we get something which is most definitely true because 2,142 is even. But if we were to plug in something like 137, we would get a false statement because now the statement reads 137 is an even integer. Now, furthermore, if we were to plug in something like one half, we would also get a false statement because one half is not even an integer. Now let's look at another one. Let's say we have R of F, G. So in this case, it's depending on two variables and those variables are function. And this open sentence says the function F is the derivative of the function G. So the truth of this will be determined once we plug functions into this. And sometimes we'll have something that's true and sometimes we have something that's false. So let's notice if we plug in two X plus one and X squared plus X, we get a true statement. 
That's because the derivative of x squared plus x is most definitely 2x plus 1. But if we plug in sine of x and cosine of x, we get a false statement. And that's because the derivative of cosine of x is in fact equal to negative sine of x. So we're almost there, but we're off by a sign. So now that we've got a pretty good idea of mathematical statements, open sentences, and the like, let's talk about how to combine two mathematical statements. Now we're gonna look at some operations that we can have on mathematical statements. So there are four main ones that we wanna start off with. The and statement, the or statement, the not statement, and the implication statement. So let's start off with and. So the notation is this wedge shape, and you read this as P and Q. And so in shorthand, you have this P wedge shape. Then we have this OR, which is maybe this upside down wedge shape or this V shape. And you read this as P OR Q. Then here we have this little squiggle. That's our NOT operator. So squiggle P will be the negation of the statement P. Now later we'll talk about how to negate complicated statements, but for now we're just going to be negating fairly simple statements. Then we've got our implication or our conditional, and so we read this as P implies Q, or sometimes if P then Q. But in fact there's lots of other ways to write this down as well, which we'll see later in the video. Okay, so let's start with some fairly simple examples. So let's say we've got three statements. P is the statement three is odd, so notice this is definitely a true statement. So I'll write a capital T for true. And then the second statement, Q, is 12 is odd. This is most definitely a false statement. So I'll write a capital F for false. And then finally, I've got a statement R, which is for all X, which are real numbers, the absolute value of the sine of X is less than one. Well, that's equivalent to saying that sine of X lies between negative one and one, as long as you have a real input. And from a trigonometry class, which you probably have in your past, that is a true statement. So now let's look at some combinations using these operators. So let's start by looking at P and Q. So we'll write this out in words. That says that three is odd and a 12 is odd. So we could maybe simplify that a little bit to three and 12 are both odd. That's maybe a more natural way to write this down. But notice this is most definitely a false statement because for this to be true, you would need both of these numbers to be odd, but only one of them is odd. So here we have a false statement. Great. And later we'll talk about how the truth or falsehood of a mathematical statement interacts with these operations. Now let's look at this, P or Q. So that would be three is odd or 12 is odd. Now we could maybe write this in a more natural way as well. And that more natural way might be something like this. Um, at least one of three or 12 is odd. So since three is odd, we're good to go because at least one of those two numbers is odd. So this is a true statement. Now let's maybe practice a negation. So maybe this is the simplest negation to practice and it's the most illuminating. So if we do not Q here, we would get the statement 12 is not odd. And since there's a word for not odd in this case, we probably want to use that and that would be even. 12 is even. And that is a true statement. So as expected, if we negate a false statement, we get a true statement. And in fact, if we negate a true statement, we'll also get a false statement. Let's see that here. If we negate P, we'll get something like this. So we'll have three is not, but notice that's the same thing as saying that three is even. And like I said, that is a false statement. So the negation of a true statement is a false statement. Okay, let's look at one more real quick. Let's maybe look at P and R. So P and R would be the statement three is odd and for all real numbers X, so X element of real numbers, the absolute value of sine X is less than or equal to one. So there's no natural way to combine these like we did before because they're two different types of sentences. One is about a number and one is about this function sine of x. So we would just leave the writing like this, but let's notice that this is a true statement. So it seems like when we connect a true statement 
And a true statement with an and statement, we get a true statement. All right, so that's good. So now I'm gonna introduce something called a truth table for making like quick calculations on these logical operations. So a truth table is like an operation table or maybe like a multiplication table for mathematical statements. But the multiplication depends on what operation we're interested in. Like it could be the and operation, the or operation, the not or operation, or as we'll see in just a bit, this implication or conditional operation. And so the idea here is we wanna populate this left-hand side with all different possibilities of truth or falseness of Q and P interacting with each other, and then record the output of those operations on the right-hand side. So let's look at our AND table. So we need to look at the possibilities when P is true or false. So I'll have two trues for P and two falses for P. And then here I'll alternate the truth and the falsehood of Q. And now let's notice doing that strategy allows us to combine every possibility for P with every possibility for Q. Okay. And now let's be inspired by what we saw in the logic of the sentences, those concrete examples from the last board, to fill this in. So we have a true statement and a true statement must be a true statement. We have a true statement and a false statement must be a false statement. So the and operation requires both of the statements to be true. So that means a false statement and a true statement will give us a false statement and two false statements will give us a false state. Now let's look at this other one, this or uh, operation. So we'll fill this in the same way. We have true, true, false, false, and then we have true, false, true, false. It's a little bit trickier when you have three inputs, but I'll let you think about a systematic way of covering all of those. So if you have two true statements and you combine them with an or, you get a true statement. So that would be something like two is either an even integer or it is an odd integer. Well, it's definitely one of those, so that is a true statement. Then a true statement and a false statement combined with an or to a true statement in both ways. Notice we've got some commutativity up of the operation here. And then two false statements will combine to give us a false. Now let's look at our not operation. So if we have a true statement that will negate to a false statement and vice versa. If we have a false statement that will negate to a true statement. Okay, so I think we're good to go with this. Now let's look at the implication or the conditional combination of two mathematical statements. So to look at conditional statements, I think our best starting strategy is to start with a statement which is a hidden conditional statement and break it down into two pieces. So our statement says, if the integer x is a multiple of 15, then x is a multiple of five. Let's notice that this is most definitely a true statement because every multiple of 15 is a multiple of three times five, but then it's obviously a multiple of five. So what we wanna do is break this off from the if and then, and then we'll have our two component statements. So let's say this is our first one, which I'll put in orange brackets. And then our second one I'll put in these purple brackets. So we'll define our orange bracketed thing to be P and that will be the integer X is a multiple of 15. And then for the purple bracketed one, we'll define that to be our statement Q and that'll be X is a multiple of. Okay, so now that we're done with this first example, let's look at another example that'll help us unravel like the truth table of our conditional statement. So our second example will help us build the truth table for this conditional. So let's say our statement P is the statement you pass the exam and the statement Q is the statement you pass the class. Then the implication P implies Q or if P then Q reads, if you pass the exam, then you pass the class. Okay, so let's maybe fill the truth table in by re rewriting these two by rewriting these possibilities as sentences over here and then getting an idea for whether or not the implication is good or not. So let's look at this first one. So P is true and Q is true. So this would be something like this. You pass the exam and the class. So does that violate this implication? Well, it does not violate this implication. You can think about this implication or this conditional as some sort of promise. And that promise is that Q will always be true as long as P is true. And that's exactly what we have here. So that means this implication here is true. Now let's look at the next one. So P is true and Q is false. And that will be you pass the exam and fail the class. So notice that's a broken promise of the P implies Q statement. The P implies Q statement says that 
if you pass the exam, you're guaranteed to pass the class. But that does not occur in this scenario. So that tells us that this conditional would have been false. It's a broken promise. So we put a false right there. Now let's look at these others. So P is false and Q is false. So this would be you fail the exam and pass the class. Notice that doesn't break the promise here at all. That's okay. It might seem kind of strange that false implies true should give you something true, but it does. So, and that's again, because this promise is not broken. Perhaps you did really well on all your homework or all of your other stuff. So you didn't really need to pass the exam to pass the class. Okay, so let's look at this last one. False implies false. So that would be you fail the exam and the class. And again, that does not break this promise either. So you would get a true statement here. So interestingly enough here, this P implies Q statement gives you true for three of the outputs and false for one of the outputs. And the false it gives you is based off this promise breaking. As long as P is true, then Q is also true. So lastly, I'd like to write down a several different wordings of this conditional statement. So there are tons of ways to write the conditional statement P implies Q. Here are a few. So the first is if P then Q. So the first is if P then Q, then we could have Q if P, Q whenever P, Q provided P, whenever P then also Q, P is a sufficient condition for Q, Q is a necessary condition, condition for P, and P only if. Okay, so let's end with some warm-up problems. All right, here's a smattering of warm-up problems. So the first is to determine if the following are mathematical statements, and if they are mathematical statements, are they true? The first is the derivative of a cubic polynomial is a quadratic polynomial. Next is sets Q and R. Next is the union of R cross N with N cross R equals R cross R. Then next up, let's write the following in symbolic form, defining the component statements P, Q, R, so on and so forth if you need to. And then use our operations like P and Q, P or Q, not P, um, and the conditional P implies Q as needed. Okay, so first is there is a quiz on Monday or Wednesday. Next is x is in a minus b, so that's the set minus. The next is a geometric series converges only if its common ratio r satisfies the inequality the absolute value of r is less than one. And that's a good place to stop. This is the fourth video in a series devoted to introductory proof writing. And in the previous video, we looked at mathematical statements and the very basics of logic. We're gonna continue to do that today. And we're gonna start by building up to the notion of a biconditional. And we'll do that with the first very important observation. And that is the conditional P implies Q is not the same as the conditional Q implies P. And that's pretty clear from these two examples that we'll go through. So the first one, we have the statement P is the function F is differentiable and the statement Q is the statement the function F is continuous. So P implies Q here reads, if F is differentiable, then it is continuous. And that's a well-known true statement. So that's something you would learn in a first semester or a differentiable calculus class. But the statement Q implies P is not true. But let's read that statement real quick. So Q implies P would read, if a function f is continuous, then it is differentiable. But like I said, that's false. And we can see that it's false by looking at a fairly simple and fairly classic example, and that is the absolute value function. So let's consider the function f, which is defined by f of x equals the absolute value of x. And let's recall what its graph looks like. So it's this nice V shape. And that tells us that we have a point of non-differentiability given that we have this corner right there at the origin. Great, so that's some motivation for why P implies Q can be true, but Q implies P can be false. So that means these two conditionals are not logically equivalent. Let's look at another example. Let's say now we have a statement P which says the integer N is a multiple of 120 and then the statement Q is the integer N is a multiple of 24. So P implies Q here is also true, just as before. And that's because if you have something which is a multiple of 120, 
then it's a multiple of 24 times 5, because 24 times 5 is 120. But if it's a multiple of 24 times 5, then it will be a multiple of 24. Now, Q implies P is not true in this case, but let's read Q implies P real quick. So that says, if N is a multiple of 24, then N is a multiple of 120. But we can come up with a bunch of examples of this. Maybe the simplest example would just be N equals 24 itself. So 24 is a multiple of 24, but 24 is clearly not a multiple of 120. Then we could have some other examples like 48, like 96, so on and so forth. Those are all multiples of 24, but they're not multiples of 120. So now we want to look at the very special case where P implies Q and Q implies P might be true, and that's called a biconditional. And we'll define it as follows. So if P implies Q and Q implies P, then we write P by conditional Q, we read this as P if and only if Q. And there are a couple of ways to write that down in English that you would write down if you're writing a proof in complete sentences. So you might write P if and only if Q, like we said. You might write P is a necessary and sufficient condition for Q. Or you might write P is equivalent to Q. Okay, so now let's see an example of this by conditional in action, and then we'll look at a truth table. So as a quick example of a biconditional statement in action, let's look at this one. We have A is even if and only if A is a multiple of 2. So in fact, this is really clearly true because that's exactly the definition of a number being even. That being said, whenever you have these if and only if or biconditional statements, then often they can be used to give some logically equivalent definitions or alternative definitions for a certain mathematical concept. Okay, so now let's look at the truth table for our biconditional. So we've got if P is true and Q is true, then P if and only if Q is true. If one of them is false, then the statement is false. But if they're both false, then the statement is true. Okay, so that's good. The next thing that we want to do is look at maybe the arithmetic or the calculus of logic operations. Now we're going to look at the what I'll call the logical calculus or the calculus of logic. And the idea behind this is we can build mathematical statements from very, very simple ones with the addition of the operator and, or, and not. So in fact, we will not need our conditional or our biconditional. We'll need to show that. So of course, we'll always use our conditional and our biconditional because it makes things simpler. But that being said, it's kind of nice to think that we only need these three building blocks. Okay, so let's maybe do an example first. And that will be building the exclusive OR operator. So the exclusive OR or the XOR would work like this. So P exclusive OR Q should give us a truth when exactly one of P or Q is true. So they're not both allowed to be true. That would be the exclusive part of the exclusive OR. Okay, so how will we approach this? I think our best strategy will be able to write this down into kind of a bigger sentence that can be easily translated to our logical operators. Okay, so maybe something like this. So P or Q is true, but they are not both true. So that would be a first translation of the sentence that we have. Now let's see if we can translate that into symbols. So P or Q, so that would P, P or Q. Good. And then what is a but? Well, a but is kind of like an and. Now connotatively, it feels a little bit different, but denotatively, I think it's the same thing. So we can really maybe more appropriately read this as P or Q is true and they are not both true. So let's put an and statement in there to play the role of that. And then let's write, they are not both true. So for both of them to be true, we would have P and Q. And for not both of them to be true, we would have a not symbol right there. Okay, so let's check to make sure this works. And we'll check to make sure this works by building a big truth table. 
So we'll have inputs P and Q, and then we'll have like intermediate calculations like P or Q, and then P and Q, and then not P and Q. And then we'll have our final entry, which is our goal over here of, let's see, P or Q, um, and not P and Q. Great, so let's get this going. So we've got this big table. So maybe I'll put a yellow line here to separate ourselves from the inputs and the intermediate calculations. Another yellow line here to separate ourselves from the intermediate calculations and the final calculation. And then let's start maybe partitioning this off so that we can fill it up. So we'll need four total entries. So P can be true, true, false, false. Then we can have Q, true, false, true, false. Now let's see what we get out of this. So P or Q can be calculated like we did last time. So we'll get a true for this, a true for this, a true for this, and a false for this. And then P and Q can be, again, calculated like we did last time. So that'll give us a true when they're both true and false is otherwise. But now we need to negate P and Q. So that just means swapping all the trues for falses and all the falses for trues in that column. That'll give us false, true, true, true. And then finally, we need to do an and conjunction between this intermediate column here and this intermediate column here. Great. So again, we want to do an and calculation between those two, and those should give us our final value. So let's see. If we have true and false, we get something that's false. If we have true and true, we get something that's true. Another true and true gives us something that's true. Another false and true gives us something that's false. And now let's, see we were, let's say we were to kind of forget everything that's going on in the middle. So I won't really scratch this out, but let's say we forget everything that's going in, on in the middle and notice that we have exactly built what we wanted to. If P and Q are both true, then the output is false. If exactly one of them is true, then the output is true. And if they're both false, then the output is false. That's exactly our exclusive or that we were going for. Next, we're gonna take a fact that you've probably used for a long time, since probably a high school algebra class, and we're gonna turn it into a logical statement. So that fact will be the product x times y is zero, if and only if x is equal to zero or y is equal to zero. Okay, so let's put this into symbols first. We have the product xy equals zero, and then if and only if can be this nice biconditional, and then we'll have x equals zero or y equals zero. Great. Now let's give these some names. So maybe we'll give this first one the name p. So p is the statement xy equals zero. And then maybe we'll give this one a name Q and this one the name R. So in fact, we have rewritten this like more abstractly as P if and only if Q or R. Great. And now just for practice, let's find the truth table of this abstraction of this fact, this kind of logical abstraction of this fact. So notice in this case, we have three inputs, P, Q, and R. So that means we'll need eight total entries. So let's see, we'll need a P column, a Q column, and an R column. Then we'll need an intermediate calculation of Q or R. And then we'll need our final calculation of the biconditional P if and only if Q or R. So something like that. So let's build this table. So like I said, we've got this intermediate calculation of Q or R. I'll separate that from P, Q, and R with a yellow line, and then we have our final calculation, which I'll separate from the intermediate calculation with another yellow line. Now we need to break this into eight pieces. So let's break it in half here, we'll break it in half here, here, and then we'll break each of those in half as well. So now we've got a table that we can start to fill out. Well, maybe one more thing we'll break this into thirds for P, Q, and R. Now we need to populate this these three columns to the left of this line 
with all the possible values of P, Q, and R. So let's see, we could have four trues for P, four falses for P, we could have kind of an alternating two trues and two falses for Q, right? And then we could have just an alternating one true and one false for R. And if you look carefully, this calculates, this gives all possible interactions of values of Q, P, and R. Okay, so now let's do our intermediate calculation, our Q or R. So let's see, here we'll have a true, true, here we'll have a true, here we'll have a false. It's because for an or statement, that is only false when they're both false. Okay, and then next we'll have actually another copy of that. True, true, false, true, false. Okay, that's good. Now we wanna do P if and only if Q or R. So let's link those two columns that we'll want to compare at this point. So that would be those two columns, and we're doing the biconditional between those. So that means we get a truth only when the entries are the same. So here we have true, true, so that'll give us a true. True, true, that'll give us a true. True, true, that'll give us a true. But then true, false, that'll give us a false. False, true, that's a false. False, true, false, true, that's two falses. And then finally false, false, but that biconditional gives us a true. So next up, we'll do some calculations to show the equivalence between logical statements that may look inequivalent. Okay, so like I mentioned before, the idea behind this logical calculus is that everything should be able to be built out of and, or, or not. And then what about conditional statements? Well, in this claim, we will show that the biconditional statement, P if and only if Q, can be built out of and, or, and not. And then as one of the warm-up exercises, you'll do the same thing for the conditional statement, P implies Q. So in fact, what we have here is P if and only if Q is logically equivalent to P and Q, or not P and not Q. So how can we prove this claim? Well, we'll do it with the truth table. So notice that there are two entries so there are P and Q, two inputs I should say, and then there's a few intermediates, but then we know the truth table for P if and only if Q, so we don't need to include that. So let's see, we'll have uh, not P as one of the entries, not Q as one of the entries, P and Q as one of the entries, and then finally not P and not Q as one of the entries before our final goal, which is P and Q, or not P and not Q. Okay, so now let's use yellow lines to separate from the inputs and to separate the intermediates from the finals. And then let's start partitioning our table. So let's see, in this case we'll need four entries. So that's a little bit easier to work with. So let's say we've got those four rows and then we'll need to partition some columns as well. So right there, right there, right there and right there. Now we can get going. So we can have P be true, true, false, false. We can have Q be true, false, true, false. So let's see, not P will just be the opposite of P. So that'll give us false, false, true, true. Not Q will be false, true, false, true. Nice. Now P and Q, well, that's pretty simple. It's true, false, false, false. And then not P and not Q. So that'll be the and statement between these two columns. That should give us false, false, false. And then finally true down here. And now we'll finish this thing off by taking the or conjunction between these final two intermediate columns. So that'll give us a true value here, false, false, and then a true value there. But let's notice that is exactly the same as the truth table for P if and only if Q. So we just took this by conditional and wrote it in terms of and, or, and not. So we'll finish this whole thing off by looking at some of the arithmetic rules of and, or, and not. Now we're gonna look at this pretty big list of rules for calculations, if you will, with our logical arguments. So the first one is called the contrapositive. 
and it says that the statement P implies Q is logically equivalent to the statement not Q implies not P. This will be really important later when we start proving things, which is coming up. And then next is De Morgan's laws. That tells us how the not operator interacts with and and or. And in fact, what it does is it flips an and to an or and an or to an and. So not P and Q is the same thing as not P or not Q. Whereas not P or Q is the same thing as not P and not Q. Then we've got these fairly straightforward commutativity rules and associativity rules. So like P and Q is the same thing as Q and P. There's not that much that needs to be said about that. And if you have P and Q and R, that's the same thing as P and Q and R. Same thing with ORs. Then finally, there are some nice distributive properties as well. So P and Q or R is the same thing as P and Q or P and R. And then there's a similar statement where you switch the ands and the ors. Okay, so let's look at a couple of these. Maybe starting with the contrapositive, as though that's probably one of the most important. So let's build our truth table. We'll have inputs P and Q. We will need not P, we'll need not Q, and then we'll need not Q implies not P. And for good measure, we'll put P implies Q as well, although we calculated that previously. Okay, so we'll have a yellow line between the inputs and the intermediates, a yellow line between the intermediates and the outputs, then let's get to it. So breaking uh, our rows and our columns up, so in this case, we'll need four rows because we have four total possibilities of entries. So let's see, we could have P be true, true, false, false. Then we could have true, false, true, false. Then let's see, not P will be the opposite of P. So that's gonna be false, false, true, true. And then here we'll have false, true, false, true. Great. Now let's look at not Q implies not P. So the only time that's false is when the input is true and the output is false. So let's see, that happens right here. We have not Q is true, whereas not P is false. So that's the only one that makes this conditional false. The rest of them are in fact true. But if you compare that to the truth table of P implies Q, you see that we have the same thing, giving us our logical equivalence. Okay, let's maybe do one of these De Morgan laws while we're at it. So let's get the chart on the board. Okay, so I got all the simple parts of our truth table put together, now ready to finish it off. So let's do this not P or not Q. So that means we'll compare these two columns right here, and if one of the entries is true, then the whole thing is true. So that means we'll have a false entry here, then that'll have a true entry here, a true entry here, and a true entry here. Now let's compare that to not P and Q. Well, maybe we should write down what P and Q is first. But let's just recall that P and Q will give us a true, false, 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 just based off the standard rule. So if we negate that, we'll in fact get a false, true, true, true. So that means that this operation right here, not P or not Q, is the same thing as this operation right here, not P and Q. Proving this second of the De Morgan's laws. Okay, so I'm gonna leave you with some warm-ups. So here are some nice warm-up exercises. So we'd like to use truth tables to show the logical equivalence of the following statements. So the first one is this distributive rule over here. So we've got the and distributes over the or as follows. P and Q or R is P and Q or P and R. Next, we can write the implication without using the implication, just with the or statement and the and statement. Then we've got this one that's kind of nice. It says not P if and only if Q is the same thing as P implies not Q and not Q implies P. And that's a good place to stop. This is the fifth video in a series devoted to introductory proof writing. And today we're gonna look at quantifiers, both the universal quantifier for all, which has the symbol which is like this upside down A, and the existential quantifier there exists, which has this symbol of a backwards E.
So our main goal here for today will be to translate mathematical sentences into symbols using quantifiers and also negate statements involving quantifiers. And that will kind of finish this topic of logic or this very basic logic. And in the next video, we'll start writing proofs using counting strategies. Okay, so let's look at these examples. So we'll translate each of these mathematical statements into symbolic notation. Okay, so the first one says, for every integer n, 2n is even. Okay, so we would write that as, for all n in z, 2n is even. That would be a, a way to do that. Another thing that we could do is maybe say, for all n in z, the e of 2n, where e of x is the statement or the op open sentence, um, x is even. Okay, so let's look at this next one. Every subset of the numbers between 1 and 10 has 10 or fewer elements. Okay, so this says for all x, which is a subset of the set containing one up to 10, the cardinality of x is less than or equal to 10. So that's how we would write that in symbolic notation. Now let's notice that this bit right here, x a subset of the set containing one to 10, could be replaced with something involving the power set. We could say that this x is an element of the power set of this set containing one to 10. That's equivalent. Now let's look at this next one. There is a function whose derivative is itself. Okay, so we would say there exists an f such that f prime of x equals f of x. So there, we've got it. And of course, this is true. We can probably think of a function off the top of our heads. That would be the exponential function e to the x. Now let's look at this one. There is a subset of the natural numbers with exactly 330 elements. Okay, so we would say there exists an x, which is in the power set of the natural numbers. We could also say that it's a subset of the natural numbers like this. And then we'll have such that the cardinality of x equals 3030. Okay, so we're going to do quite a few examples here because I think it's helpful to see a lot of these. So let's get on it. So here are two more examples. So the first one says that every odd integer is one more than an even integer. So I think this is pretty clearly true, but the truth of the falsehood is not our goal here. Our goal is to rewrite it in symbols using quantifiers. So I think maybe something like this would work. For all n in z, where n is odd, there exists a k in z such that n equals 2k plus 1. So look, we've got an odd integer, and that says that this odd integer is one more than an even integer. Okay, so that's pretty good. Now let's look at this next one. If f is continuous on the closed interval a to b, f of a is negative and f of b is positive, then f of c equals zero for some c between a and b. This is of course the intermediate value theorem, which you probably learned in a calculus class or maybe even a pre-calculus class. So this one's a little bit more complicated, but I think it's nice to dig into something like this. So we'll have f is continuous on the closed interval a, b. That'll be one statement and f of a is less than zero, and f of b is bigger than zero. So that's what we have here. First of all, I maybe should have noted this first, that this is a conditional. Notice that we have if this stuff in orange brackets, then this stuff in blue brackets. So what I've done so far is I've exchanged all the stuff in orange brackets for a logically equivalent formulation using um, symbols. Okay, so since we have an if-then statement, this is gonna turn into a conditional or an implication. So all of the stuff in orange brackets will imply that there exists a C on the open interval A to B such that F of C equals zero. 
So that's where our quantifier lives here, this existential quantifier, which notice up here the language was for some C between A and B. But that's equivalent to saying there exists a C between A and B such that F of C equals zero. Okay, so let's do some more. So here's our last example before moving on to some other stuff. For all integers n bigger than or equal to 3, the equation x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n has no solution for x, y, z, which are natural numbers. So this is, of course, the statement of Fermat's last theorem, which we know to be true. Okay, so I think... Okay, so to rewrite this, we might do something like this. So if n is a natural number and n is bigger than or equal to 3, so that would be this thing right here for all integers n bigger than or equal to 3, that would be something like this. That implies that for all x, y, z in n, x to the n plus y to the n is not equal to z to the n. So this reads a little bit different than it does up here in the sentence form, but it has the same information. So sometimes when translating it from a sentence like this to symbolic notation, you might have to tweak it a little bit. Just based off the differences in natural English writing versus like natural logic writing. Okay, so now let's look at negating statements with quantifiers. So the rule for negating things with quantifiers is kind of similar to the rule for negating things with ands and ors. So remember an and switches to an or and an or switches to an and under negation. And in fact, for alls or the universal quantifier switches to a there exists the ex existential quantifier and vice versa under this negation. So properly, we have the negation of the statement for all x, p of x, is logically equivalent to the statement there exists x, such that not p of x. And then similarly, the negation of the statement there exists x, such that q of x, is for all x, not q of x. Okay, so let's look at a couple of examples, starting with this one that says every even integer is of the form 2n, where n is an integer. So let's start by translating this into just another English statement that has the same information that will allow us to put it into symbols a little bit more easily. And that would be something like this. So for all n in z, 2n is even. Okay, good. So into symbols, we would have for all n in z, 2n is even. Okay, good. And now let's make our negation step. So let's say this magenta arrow means negate this. So I'll maybe put a negation here in blue. So that will negate to there exists an n in z such that 2n is not even. But of course we've got a rule for not even and that is odd. So 2n is odd. And now let's rewrite that into a sentence and that sentence would be something like this. There is an integer n such that 2n is odd. Or maybe another way of writing this sentence would be 2n is odd for some integer n. Of course, these two equivalent statements, as well as this statement up here in symbols, are all false. But that's because we've negated a true statement. So the process here is not to investigate the truth or the falsehood. The process is to get some practice with negating statements. Our next thing to look at will be the negation of a conditional. So we're just going to write it down real quick. And then we'll check that it works using a truth table, which I've already prepped. And then we'll look at some examples, which will make it even more evident. So the negation of the statement P implies Q is the statement P and not Q. So let's build out this truth table just to convince ourselves that this is the fact. So we've got P and Q set up. Let's now do our not Q. So that means we'll change every true to a false and every false to a true. So we've got false, true, false, true. And now let's do our P and not Q. Recall that both of those need to be true in order to get a truth out. That only occurs right here. 
So we've got a true here, but then we have falses everywhere else because at least one of those entries is false. But now let's compare that to P implies Q. And notice it's exactly the opposite of P implies Q. Here we have false true, true false, false true, and false true. But that means that it's logically equivalent to not P implies Q. So that establishes this logical equivalence over here. Now let's look at a little bit of an example of this. And then we'll do a bigger example. So if N is odd, then n cubed is even. So this seems like it should be a true statement. And in fact, it is a true statement. It's one of the very first types of proofs that we'll do. But let's negate this conditional. In order to do that really carefully, what I'd like to do is to put it in the form P implies Q. So we'll have n is odd implies n cubed is odd. Great. So this is playing the role of P, and this is playing the role of Q. And now let's make our negation. So this magenta arrow will be our negating operator. So we should have P and not Q. So we have N is odd and N cubed is even. Which notice I just went straight to putting an and here instead of the symbol, but I think it's okay in this case. Okay, so again, we started with a statement that seems to be true, and we ended with a statement that seems to be false, which is okay. Okay, now let's do a bigger example. Now let's look at this nice big example, which actually comes from a future math class that you probably haven't taken yet called real analysis, or sometimes advanced calculus. But what we have here is the precise definition of what it means for F to be differentiable at A. So what we have is this kind of complicated statement. For all epsilon bigger than zero, there is a delta bigger than zero such that if the absolute value of x minus a is between zero and delta, then the absolute value of f of x minus f of a over x minus a minus some number l is less than epsilon. Okay, so our goal is to negate this, but our first step should be to translate it. So let's say this green arrow is the translation arrow. So we might have something like, for all epsilon bigger than zero, there is a delta bigger than zero, so that would be an existential, there exists a delta bigger than zero, such that if this happens, then this happens. So notice that's the conditional statement. So what we'll have is zero is less than x minus a minus delta implies the absolute value of f of x minus f of a over uh, x minus a minus l is less than epsilon. So we've got something like that. So probably the first thing to notice is if we have these quantifier setups, and after those quantifier setups, we have a conditional statement. I'll say this is P implies Q. So P is this inequality and Q is this inequality. So that means to do our negation, we'll need to exchange for alls for there exists and vice versa in this quantifier setup. And then we'll need to negate our conditional using the rule that we have over here. Okay, so let's do it. So we'll have something like this. There exists epsilon bigger than zero, such that for all delta bigger than zero, we have P and not Q. So that would be zero is less than X minus A, which is less than delta, and the absolute value of F of X minus F of A over X minus A minus L is bigger than or equal to epsilon. So notice the negation of a less than is a greater than or equal to. Okay, now we might wanna put this back into words. So that would go something like this. There exists epsilon bigger than zero such that for all delta bigger than zero, zero is less than the absolute value of x minus a, which is less than delta, and the absolute value of f of x minus f of a over x minus a minus l is bigger than or equal to epsilon. So if this up here, what we started with is the precise definition of F being differentiable at A, 
This down here would be the precise definition of f being non-differentiable at a. So f is not differentiable at a. So of course, some functions are differentiable and some functions are not differentiable. So in order to show that a function is not differentiable, you would show that it satisfies this um, definition right here. So we're gonna finish this video off with some rules of logical inference. And then after that, I'll give you some warmups. Now we're gonna look at some rules of logical inference. So we'll start with inferring things from the truth of the conditional P implies Q. This first inference is called modus ponens. And that says, if we know P is true, then Q is true. Then the second one is called modus tollens. And that says, if we know Q is false, then P is false. So let's look at a quick example of that. So here we've got our conditional. If a function f is differentiable, then it is continuous. So again, this is a well-known result from differentiable calculus that we've used several times in the past. Now, let's maybe apply these two rules. So we know the function f of x equals e to the x plus x sine x is differentiable. So it is continuous. So it must be continuous. So let's say, for instance, that it's easier to test if that function is differentiable, then we get that it's continuous for free based off this larger result. Okay, so now let's look at another one. So we know the function g of x equals the floor of x. So let's recall the floor of x is like an elevator down to the closest integer. So the floor of a half is zero. The floor of three quarters is also zero. But the floor of one is one because you don't have to go down at all. Okay, so back to this. We know that g of x equals the floor of x is not continuous. So it must be non-differentiable. So not differentiable. Great. Now it might be kind of tricky to straightforwardly show that this is not a differentiable function, but it's easy to show that it's not a continuous function. Now let's look at one more logical inference, and this is called elimination. And here we suppose that the or statement P or Q is true. And then we know that if P is false, then Q has to be true. Okay, so let's look at an example of that. So every even integer is even or odd. So I think that's pretty clear. Now let's note that three is not even. So it's not even, it's not a multiple of two. So it must be odd, must be odd. And then this may seem kind of silly, but this either or kind of thing actually shows up quite a bit in our proof techniques moving forward. So now I'll leave you with some warm-up exercises. So here are three nice warm-up exercises that are based off what we just saw. So for each of them, we'd like to translate them into symbolic logic, use that translation to easily negate these statements, and then write the negation back into a sentence. So that's a nice kind of holistic practice of everything that we saw. Okay, this first one says, for every capital M bigger than zero, there is a delta bigger than zero such that if the absolute value of x minus a is less than delta, then, I missed my then, let's get that in there, then f of x is bigger than m. I'd like to point out real quick, just as a point of interest, this is the precise definition of the limit as x goes to a of f of x equals infinity. So that's pretty cool. The next one says there is a real number a such that a times x equals x for all x in r. So of course we know exactly what that real number is. It is the real number one. That being said, you know, that's not what we're going for here. We'd like to do all of this stuff. Next we have the statement for every x in r, n is bigger than x for some natural number n. This is actually technically called the Archimedean principle and that's a good place to stop. This is the sixth video in a series devoted to an introductory course in proof writing. We just finished doing some stuff with logic, and now we're going to look at counting principles. So in order to get us started with that, we need to define something called a list. So a list is an ordered sequence of objects. 
we'll use the notation in parentheses like this. So we have A1, A2, A3 up to AN. This is a list of length N. And maybe the third entry in this list would be A1, the second entry would be A sub 2, the nth entry would be A sub N. And I'd like to point out that we will allow repetition as we define our lists. So for example, the list A, 0, A, 1 is allowed. That repeats A two times. Now this is in stark contrast to sets. You don't have repeat, repeats of the same elements in sets. Now I'm going to recall something called the multiplicative principle or the multiplication principle. And I say recall not because we've done it in this course, but because you've likely seen it in the past. And that talks about how many such lists there are given the setup of the situation. So there are m1 times m2 up to mn, so that product of n numbers, such lists of length n if there are mi choices for the ith object. Okay, so let's do some examples of this setup. And the first example will have like a counting tree to kind of see where this multiplication principle comes from. But then after that, we'll just apply this principle. So let's say we want to make a list of three objects. The first object comes from the set containing 0, 1, the second from the set containing A, B, C, and finally the third from the set containing X, Y, Z. So notice we've got two choices, three choices, three choices. So by the multiplication principle, there should be 2 times 3 times 3 or 18 choices. But let's just make sure that makes sense. So let's say we've started having not making any choices at all. So that'll be like our Big Bang event. The first thing that we'll do is choose whether the first entry is a 0 or a 1. So that'll give us two branches here. We've got our branch for 0 and our branch for 1. And at this stage, we've got one entry lists. And those one entry lists are either just 0 or 1. And now from here, we'll make a choice A, B, C, but that's three choices. So let's see, we'll have a choice A, B, and C. And like I said, that's for all three of these. So where does that leave us? So this would be maybe the choice A, B, C, and then likewise down here, the choice A, B, C. So that'll leave us with 0 comma A, 0 comma B, and then finally 0 comma C, and then same thing here, 1 comma A, 1 B, and 1 C. And next up, we need to make our third choice. And there are three choices for our third choice. They come from x, y, z. So that's going to branch this off three times again. So we'll have three choices here, three choices here, and three choices here. And then likewise, three choices here, three choices here, and three choices here. And so let's say those go as X, Y, Z. Those are the choices X, Y, Z. And then you can fill in all those other branches as well. So up here, we'll have the list 0, A, X, 0, A, Y, 0, A, Z. And then here we'll have 0, B, X, 0, B, Y, and 0, B, Z. Moving down, we'll have 0, C, X, 0, C, Y, and 0, C, Z. And that's half of them so far. Then the next choice down here will be uh, 1, A, X, 1, A, Y, and 1, A, Z. And then I'll let you fill in the rest. But I think what we can see is that we'll definitely get 18 just based off of these 18 points that we get in the end. So that's kind of a nice illustration that there are 18 such lists. But from here on out, instead of making this like large tree, we'll just use this multiplication principle. Okay, let's do another example. So after that basic example, let's look at something a little bit more interesting. Let's say we're trying to choose a four element list, or we're trying to count the number of four element lists, where the first entry comes from the set containing A and B, and the remaining three entries come from the set one, two, three, but we do not allow repetition in this case. So with general lists, we do allow repetition, but sometimes we'll like to not allow repetition. Okay, so the way I like to do this is maybe put an open box for my four choices. 
Great. And now let's color code this a little bit. So maybe I'll underline this in yellow to show that my first choice comes from that set containing A, B, but then I'll underline this in magenta to show that my second, third, and fourth choices come from the set containing one, two, three without repetition. So now let's count it up. So we can choose from A or B here, so that's two total choices. And then we can choose from one, two, three here, that's three total choices. And you might say, well, here we can also choose from one, two, or three, that'll be three more choices. But that's wrong. And that's wrong because we've already used one of the choices from one, two, three here. So for instance, let's say we chose the number one. Then here we're only allowed to choose two or three. Or if we've chosen here the number two, we're only allowed to choose the number one or three. So as you can see, we have less choices here. We have exactly two choices. But now we've chosen two elements from the set one, two, three, which means we're only left with a single choice for this last bit. So let's maybe match these up. So this matches with that choice, this with that choice, and this with that choice. So putting this all together, we have two times three times two times one or 12. So there are 12 total possibilities. Okay, let's do another. So this next question is about license plates from the state where I live at the moment, which is Virginia. So Virginia license plates consist of three letters followed by four digits. And those digits can be between zero and nine. Now we'd like to decide how many plates are possible. So I'll use like my boxes to indicate choosing letters or numbers. So I need seven boxes for the three letters and then the four numbers. And let's color code this again. So the first three are letters. So that would be this one, this one, and this one. Whereas the remaining four are digits or numbers between zero and one. So that would be like this box, this box, this box, and this box. And notice there's no rule here about repetition, so we don't have to think too hard about that. Now we've got to choose a letter for here, here, here. How many letters are there? There are 26. So that means we get 26 choices here, 26 choices here, and 26 choices here. And then over there, we need to choose a digit between zero and nine. That gives us 10 possible choices. So we have, 10 times 10 times 10 times 10. And then you can multiply this all up and you'll see that you get 175,760,000 and that's it. So that's far more cars than you would ever have in the state of Virginia. So now we've got a classic problem about the number of choices on a menu. So let's say a pizzeria offers two types of crust, three sauces, two cheeses, and 10 different toppings. And then our goal is to determine how many four topping pizzas are possible. Okay, so let's see. We'll have a choice for the crust, a choice for the sauce, a choice for the type of cheese, assuming that we're not gonna get two types of cheese or two types of sauce, and then four choices for the toppings. So that means we've got these boxes to fill here. Now let's color code this. So two types of crust. So let's say this yellow box is our choice for crust. Three sauces. Let's say this orange box is our choice for sauces. Two cheeses. Let's say this red box is our choice for cheeses. And then finally, 10 different toppings. Let's say those are our choices for our four toppings that we will choose. So we have this kind of setup. Now we can apply this multiplication principle. So there are two types of crust, so there are two choices for this box. There are three sauces, so there are three choices for this next box. Two cheeses, there are two choices for this next box. And then 10 different toppings. So for the first topping, we can choose 10 different objects. Then for the next topping, we can't choose 10 anymore because we've already chosen one. Let's just say that doubling up on a topping is not possible. So if you've already chosen, for example, mushrooms for your first topping, you're not allowed to choose mushrooms for the second topping. So that means there are only nine choices for the second topping and similarly eight for the third and seven for the fourth. 
So now we can take the product of all of those and what we'll see is that there are 60,480 total pizzas. Okay, so now let's do a quick follow-up problem and that will be how many pizzas are there with four or less toppings? Well, we just decided that the number with four toppings was this 60,000. So all we need to do here is determine the number with three toppings, two toppings, one topping, or zero topping, a plain cheese pizza, and then add those together. So I think we can do that without maybe doing our graphic, just motivated by what's going on here. So if we're choosing three toppings, it's like filling up all of these boxes except for the last one, which means we have this product here without the seven. So that would be two times three times two times 10 times nine times eight. You can multiply that up and you'll see that you get 8,640. Now let's move on to two topping pizzas. Then that's like filling up all of these boxes except for the last two, because we only want two toppings. So that means it's doing this entire product except for the eight times seven. So we have two times three times two times 10 times nine. And you can multiply that up and you'll see that you get 1,080. And then how many one topping pizzas and how many zero topping pizzas? So likewise for one topping pizzas, we have two times three times two times 10, which multiplies up to 120 different pizzas. And for zero topping pizzas, we have two times three times two, because we don't make any topping choices. And that will be 12 total pizzas. But now if we add all of this together, we need to add these four numbers along with this number right here for four toppings, you'll see that we have 70,332 total pizzas with four or fewer toppings. And this example actually brings us to another principle that instead of called the multiplication principle is the addition principle. So let's look at that. So now we're gonna formally write down the principle that we just used and that's called the addition principle. So let's suppose we have a finite set, we'll call it A, and it can be expressed as a disjoint union. So what I mean by that is we can write A as A1 union A2 union all the way up to AN, where AI intersect AJ is the empty set unless I is equal to J. So that means if these are not equal indices, we get this intersection is empty then the cardinality of A is equal to the cardinality of A1 plus the cardinality of A2 all the way up to the cardinality of AN. So let's notice that we definitely used that in the previous example. Our set A would have been all pizzas with four or less toppings and we broke that down into pizzas with exactly four, exactly three, exactly two, exactly one, or zero toppings. So let's look at our next example. We want to determine how many five digit multiples of five there are that contain exactly one nine. So we can break this up into four disjoint possibilities. So I'll draw these in this like rectangle shape. And those possibilities depend on exactly where that single nine happens. The single nine could be the first entry and then after that we have four more digits to choose. The single nine could be the second digit, and then we have one before and three after to choose. The single nine could be in the middle, or finally, the single nine could be not quite at the end, but it could be the next to last digit. You might say, well, why can't that single digit be the last digit? And that's because these are all multiples of five, and multiples of five only end in zero and one. So I'll shade this in right here just to collect the information that these have to be multiples of five. So that means they end in either a zero or a one. So now let's see what we have here for our choices. So this is a nine. We're only supposed to have exactly one nine. So how many choices do we have to fill in the rest? Oh, we'll have nine choices here, nine choices here, and nine choices here, and then two choices here. That's because this is allowed to be anything except for nine. So zero through eight. This is allowed to be zero through eight, zero through eight. This is allowed to be zero or five. So in the end, we have nine times nine times nine times two. That's the number of possibilities for those two cases. Now these other two are slightly different. So this first entry is allowed to be one through eight. 
It can't be equal to zero because then we would have a four digit number instead of a five digit number. So this can be one through eight, that gives us eight possibilities. Then this can be zero through eight, zero through eight, so that's nine possibilities, nine possibilities, and then two possibilities. But then that's similar for each of these, we just have the product in a slightly different order. But we could write it all down as eight times nine times nine times two, eight times nine times nine times two. Okay, so in the end, how many possibilities are there? Well, there's the sum of those four numbers. But let's notice we can factor a nine times nine times two out of the whole thing. That's 81 times two. 81 times two is 186. So in fact, we really have 186. And then plus eight plus eight plus eight, so that's 24, plus nine, so that is 33. So the final answer is 186 times 33. I'll let you do the final calculation if you'd like to. Okay, so now that we've looked at the addition principle and the multiplication principle, let's look at the subtraction. Now we're ready to look at something called the subtraction principle. So let's say we have a finite universal set, which I'll call U. Then the cardinality of A complement is the same thing as the cardinality of U minus the cardinality of A. So let's see that counting principle in example. So our goal now is to find how many phone numbers contain at least one eight. So let's maybe recall the shape of phone numbers, at least if you're living in the US. So they look like this. You have an area code, so that would have three choices right here. And then you have a prefix, which is three more choices. And then you have the suffix, which is four choices. And I don't know the precise rules, perhaps you're not allowed to start with a zero, but we're not going to worry about the precise rules here, just to simplify the game, and since I don't know them. So let's just assume we have 10 choices for all of these entries. Maybe post in the comments if you know what the rules are, and you can talk about what the real number is based on those rules. So we've got 10 choices for each of these 10 possibilities. Okay, so I'm gonna first of all like just sketch out the way that you might do this without using the subtraction principle. You could break this into the following possibilities. So we want at least one eight, so you could break it down into exactly one eight, exactly two eights, exa exactly three eights, and then so on and so forth, up to really just all eights. But I think we can, achieve, we can all agree that that's gonna be a little bit too much work. So maybe we could do something different. And let's notice that having exactly one eight is disjoint from having zero eights. And in fact, it's the complement of having zero eights. So what we could really do here is the following calculation. So all possible, phone numbers minus the phone numbers without eight. So phone numbers without eights. Notice if we were to perform this calculation, we would get exactly what we want. We would get the number of phone numbers with at least one eight. Okay, but I think we can pretty easily calculate all possible phone numbers. We've got, we've got 10 possibilities for each of these 10 choices, so that would be 10 to the 10. But now if we're not allowing eights, then we're allowing zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine. So that'll be nine possibilities, but we're making 10 choices. So it'd be 10 to the 10 minus nine to the 10. But you can calculate this out and it's actually quite large. It's 6,513,215,599. So, that, so that's the number of phone numbers that contain at least one eight. Now we're gonna look at a very special case of this multiplication principle, which we actually saw in practice. And that is the notion of a K permutation. So let's look at the definition. A K permutation of an N element set is a list of k elements from this set without repetition. Then we can easily calculate that the number of k permutations from this n element set is, we'll use the notation p of n k, so it's the product n times n minus one times n minus two ending at n minus k plus one. So let's talk our way through that real quick. So we're trying to make a list of length k from n element set. 
For our first choice, we have n possibilities. For that second choice, we have n minus one possibilities. That's because we've already used up one of the possibilities. For the third choice, we have n minus two possibilities. Again, because we've used up two possibilities, so on and so forth. Way down here for the kth choice is n minus k plus one possibilities. Now I'd like to point out that sometimes the notation is this n with an underlined k. That's called a falling power. I don't think that's in the textbook that I'm using for the course, but you might see this somewhere. And then furthermore, if k is between 0 and n, then there's like this nice more closed formula, which is pnk is n factorial over n minus k factorial. Okay, let's look at an example. Let's say you deal five cards from a standard 52 card deck. Then your goal is to determine how many such uh, dealings or how many such hands or possibilities are there that all of them are red cards or all of them are clubs. So let's recall that half of the cards are red cards. So that means there are 26 red cards. So we're thinking about our set as our set is containing 26 cards. And then we want to choose five of them from that set. And so this is like taking a five permutation from a 26 element set. So that means we get P 26, five. So that's clearly gonna be 26 times 25 times 24 times 23 times 22. Great, and then what about all clubs? So there are four suits in a deck and each suit has 13 cards. So that means we wanna choose five cards from that 13 card set. So that means we wanna do the number of permutations 13, five. So that'll be 13 times 12 times 11 times 10 times nine. But then notice that these two are disjoint. If you choose all red cards, you won't choose a club because clubs are black cards. And that means that we can just use the addition rule to find out our total possibilities. So our total possibilities, like I said, will be the sum of these two numbers, which turns out to be 8,048,040. So those are how many possible dealings there are like this. Okay, so it's time to leave you with some warm-up exercises. So here are two nice warm-up exercises. So the first has to do with eight-digit binary strings. So those will be lists with eight digits where each of the entries are either zero or one. So our goal is to count them under the following different possibilities. So the first is how many are there with no restrictions at all? Second, how many of them have zero as their second, fourth, and seventh digit? Next, how many have zero as their second, fourth, or seventh digit? And then finally, last, how many of them contain at least one one? Then for the last problem, let's This is the seventh video in a series devoted to introductory proof writing. And we're doing a couple of videos related to counting. So we just made a video on the multiplication principle, the addition sum principle, and the subtraction principle, as well as k permutations of n elements. And now we're ready to look at subsets of sets with n elements and all of the counting that goes along with that. So let's look at our main definition for the day, and that is n choose k, or the binomial coefficient as we'll come to know it a little bit later. So if n and k are integers, then we'll define this symbol right here, which we will read, like I said, as n choose k, as the number of k element subsets of an n element set. So I think that gives you some idea for why we're using the word choose. We're choosing k things from a set of n things. And later we'll get some sort of formula for this, but we're not quite there yet. Let's start with an example where we list all of the subsets of a four element set. So we know there should be 16 total subsets from some things that we did earlier in the course, but now we're gonna list them by the size of each subset. Okay, so let's start with this maybe chart right here where we have k 
so this is going to be the size of the subset, then we'll explicitly list the subsets here, and then we'll count the number of such subsets, which means we're counting the binomial coefficient for choose k. Okay, so since n and k can both be integers here, that means k can be a positive or a negative number or zero. So let's look at this maybe really boring case where k is negative. So it's negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, so on and so forth. Well, now think about this definition right here. It's the subsets with a certain number of elements. You can't have a negative number of elements. That's impossible. So I'll just say that there are no such subsets. I'll put in a here for not applicable, which means four choose a negative number will give us the number zero. So now what about zero element subsets? Well, in fact, there's always a zero element subset and it's a unique zero element subset, which is the empty set. And if we count up how many such there are, well, since there's the unique one, we just get the number one. So this is really important and this is actually true for any number. And that would be that if you take n choose zero, you always get the number one. There's always a single zero element subset. Now let's look at one element subsets. But that's pretty straightforward. You just make a singleton out of every element. Remember, singletons are always gonna be like the only one element sets by definition. So we have the set containing one, the set containing two, the set containing three, and finally the set containing four. There are exactly four subsets like this. But now if you think of an n element set, then there will always be n one element subsets for the same reason as this counting went here. You can just make a singleton out of every element. So in other words, we have n choose one is always equal to n. So at least we know those two values in general. Okay, so now let's go for two element subsets. So I think we can make some sort of systematic choice here. Let's do the ones that contain one first. So we could have one with two, we could have one with three, or we could have one with four. Those are all of the two element subsets containing the number one. Next, we can have the ones containing two, two with three, or two with four. We won't have two and one because we've already counted that one. And then finally, the one last subset would be the subset of three, four. So notice there are six such subsets. And there's not a quote unquote obvious way to write down a formula for two element subsets. And so we'll wait until we do this in more generality. Okay, so now what about three element subsets? Well, in fact, we can do that kind of in line with one element subsets. But instead of thinking about which element to include, we think about which element to leave out. So we could either leave out one, leave out two, leave out three, or leave out four, and that gives us four choices. So if we leave out the number one, we get two, three, four. If we leave out the number two, we get one, three, four. If we leave out the number three, we get one, two, four. And finally, if we leave out the number four, we get one, two, three. So it's counting just as we counted here, but instead of counting what to include, we're counting what to exclude. But there are four choices for everything to exclude, so we've got a four there. And just how we generalized these two, we can generalize this one as well. And that would be counting how many n minus one element subsets. And there are always n, n minus one element subsets. We're just talking about what we're including instead of what we're excluding. So now what about four element subsets? Well, we've got a four element set. There will be a single four element subset and that will be the set itself. So one, two, three, four. And so we've got one. And then we can generalize this as well very, very easily. So how many n element subsets are there from an n element set? There will be one, so n choose n is one. Now what about five element subsets, six element subsets, and so on and so forth? Well, since we only have four elements to work with, we can never get a larger subset than a four element subset. So maybe we would also say that this is not applicable or there are none which means we get zero such subsets 
all the way up there. And we could generalize this as well. n choose k is equal to zero if k is strictly bigger than n. Or I guess if k is strictly less than zero based off what we saw up here. So next up what we'll do is reinvestigate this type of problem for the set one, two, three and we'll work towards a closed form of this binomial coefficient. So I misspoke on the last board. We're not gonna look at subsets of one, two, three. We're gonna look at three element subsets of one, two, three, four, five. This is right at the level where it would be too much to look where the numbers are larger, but this gives us some nice structure, like I said, towards a closed formula for n choose k. So here what I've done, I've made all three element subsets of one, two, three, four, five. So they're pretty easy to write out when the numbers are small like this, but any larger and it would be kind of a chore. And now we're gonna build an array here. Let's notice that the number of columns in the array will be five choose three. So let's maybe point that out. So number of columns. So like I said, that's gonna be equal to five choose three three because we're making three element subsets of a five element set. And then from there, what we'll do is build the entries of this table. And what are the entries of this table? Well, the entries of this table will be all three permutations of a five element set. So all three permutations, and I guess I should say of five objects. So of five objects. And then we're gonna list these by three permutations that involve one, two, three, one, two, four, one, two, five, so on and so forth. But the fact that we've got like a tool for doing this, we know that there's a closed formula for all three permutations of five objects. We had some notation for this. It was P of five, three, and that ended up being five times four times three or five factorial over five minus three factorial. So it's a descending product of three terms starting at five. Okay, so now let's fill in the rest of this table. So here we'll have all permutations of the number one, two, three. So we'll have one, two, three, we'll have one, three, two. Those are the, all the ones starting with one. Next, we'll have two, one, three, two, three, one. Those are all the ones starting with two. And then finally, three, one, two, or three, two, one. Those are all the ones starting with three. Now we'll go down the line and do that for all of these. I'm not gonna in practice fill out this whole table because it's just kind of a lot of busy work. But what we'll notice is that each of these columns has the same number of elements. So here we'll make all permutations of one, two, four. So we'll have one, two, four, one, four, two. We'll have starting with two, one, two, one, four, and then two, four, one. Starting with four, we'll have four, one, two, and four, two, one. And then so on and so forth. But notice that each column is made up of three permutations of three objects. It's just those three objects vary. So that means we can count the number of rows so the rows would be like this row, this row, this row, this row, this row, this row. The number of rows is equal to three factorial. That's because we're taking three permutations of three objects. But now let's notice that we can calculate the entries two different ways. The one that we, the way that we did before, or just by multiplying the number of rows and the number of columns. And given that, we can set up this equation for five choose three and solve for five choose three as five times four times three over three factorial. And again, that's just by noticing that five choose three times three factorial is this object over here and then dividing by three factorial. Okay, so now we could totally generalize this to have all of the K element subsets here and then all of the permutations of the entries of the k element subsets here. So here we would have n choose k columns, and then we would have k factorial rows, and then we would have p n k total entries, setting up a similar like division problem. So in the end, that brings us to the following nice closed form for n choose k. So I'll just put squiggle arrow here to see that, say that we've just developed this. 
we have n choose k is equal to n times n minus 1 ending at n minus k plus 1 all over k factorial. So this descending product on the top is just this p n k. And then furthermore, let's notice that this is equal to n factorial over k factorial times n minus k factorial if k is between 0 and n. And often you're working with k values between 0 and, and, and n, so that's okay. And it's equal to 0 otherwise. And that's from reasons that we saw previously. Good. So now let's work through several examples. Now let's look at two examples. So the first one is fairly straightforward. Based off our definition, we want to determine how many six element subsets of the set containing 1, 2, 3, up to 10. So that'll just very simply, by the definition of the binomial coefficient, be 10 choose 6, which by definition is 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 times 5. So that's a descending product of six things on the top over 6 factorial. But I'll write that out as 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2. And now let's cancel some things out. So we can cancel this 6 here with this 6 here. We can cancel this 5 here with this 5 here. We can take this 4 and this 2 and use them to cancel this 8. And then finally, we can ch cancel this 3 with this 9 down to a 3. And that leaves us with 10 times 3 times 7, or in other words, 210. Okay, so now let's ratchet up the complexity a little bit and see how many six element subsets of the same set are there with two or three even elements. Okay, so let's break this into two cases. So let's break it into the case where you have two even elements. But if you have two even elements, that means that you must have four odd elements. Okay, so that's pretty clear because if two of them are even, I guess I should say exactly two of them are even, then the rest of them have to be odd. But if three of them are even, then the rest of them being odd means that three of them are indeed odd. Okay, so now we'll use the multiplicative and the additive property here, or principle, I guess it was. So to choose the two even elements, that will be five choose two because choosing the two even elements means that we're choosing two elements from the set containing two, four, six, eight, ten, just the even numbers in here. But then choosing the four odd elements will be choosing five, choose four, because we're choosing four from the set one, three, five, seven, nine. So again, still five element set that we're choosing four elements from. And now we take the product of these by the multiplicative pr principle because we choose the even ones and we choose the odd ones and then finding the total way of making those choices is multiplying them together. Then for three even, three odd, using the same kind of logic, we'll have five choose three for choosing the even ones and five choose three for choosing the odd ones. And now all that's left to do is some arithmetic. So this turns into 5 times 4 over 2 factorial, which is just 2, and multiply that with 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 over 4 factorial, which is 4 times 3 times 2. Okay, so let's see this simplify. This 4 times 3 times 2 will cancel this 4 times 3 times 2, and then this 2 will cancel this 5 down to a 2, and we're left with 5 times 2 times 5, which is 50. And now let's look at this. We'll have 5 choose 3 times 5 choose 3, but that'll be 5 times 4 times 3 over 3 times 2, 3 factorial, and then squared, because that's just 5 choose 3 squared. But what do we get there? So here this 3 will cancel this 3, this 2 will cancel this 4 down to a 2, and we'll have 5 times 2 squared, which is 10 squared, which is 100. So now putting these together, we see that there are 150 total such subsets satisfying this condition. Now we've got two examples based on the card game poker, and these are like classic counting problems. So our first goal is to determine how many five card poker hands there are in general. So that means we've got to choose a five element set from a set that contains all of the cards in a standard card deck, which would be 52 cards. So we have 
52, choose 5. So in other words, we have 52 times 53 times 52, 52 times 51 times 50 times 49 times 48 over 5 factorial. So I won't multiply that out, but we get a fairly large number of 2,598,960. And then so that's how many poker hands there are in total. So now we want to determine how many five card poker hands are flushes. Let's recall that flushes means that they have the same suit and there are four suits and each suit has 13 cards. So let's see, there are spades, there are hearts, there are diamonds, and there are clubs. Okay. So what we really needed to do is determine how many ways can we choose five spades, how many ways can we choose five hearts, five diamonds, and five clubs, and then really add them all together. But choosing spades will give us 13 choose five because we have to choose a five element subset of a 13 element set. It's just the 13 element set here is all of the spades. But it's gonna be 13 choose five for all of these because each of the suits have the same number of cards. So we have 13 choose five added to itself four times or just four times 13 choose five. So this ends up being 13 times 12 times 11 times 10 times nine times four over five factorial, which is five times four times three times two, nominally times one. Okay, so notice I snunk the four in way over there. Now let's like simplify these as we can. So we can take this four times three and have it cancel this 12. We can take this five times two and have it cancel this 10. And in the end, we have 13 times 11 times nine times four. And if you multiply that out, you'll get 5,148. So there are 5,148 total flushes, whereas they're like, two and a half million total hands. So if we were calculating probabilities, you would see that the probability of getting a flush is quite low. Okay, let's do another poker example. Okay, so next up, we're gonna determine how many poker hands are a full house. So that's another type of poker hand, and this type of hand has a pair and three of a kind. So for instance, you might have a pair of twos and then three fives, or you might have a pair of aces and three queens. Okay, so by the multiplicative principle, what we need to do is determine the number of ways to choose three of a kind, and then also determine the number of ways to make a pair and take the product. But the important thing is, is that the number of ways to make a pair after making three of a kind is different than the number of ways to make a pair just kind of on its own. So we'll have to be careful with that. And you might say, well, does that mean that we should count this by making the three of a kind first and then the pair second or vice versa? Well, in fact, it doesn't matter. And that's because of some relationships between the individual binomial coefficients, which you'll likely see on your homework exercises. So let's calculate the number of ways to choose three of a kind. So let's notice for each rank of card, there are four of them. So what I mean by that is that in the deck, there are four kings. There are four jacks, there are four aces, there are four fives. So we wanna choose three of those four. So that means building off of this, we'll have to choose three of a four element set. So let's say we wanna choose three sevens. How many ways can we choose three sevens? Well, there are four choose three total ways. But we don't just wanna, for instance, choose three sevens or three nines. We just wanna choose any three of a kind. So how many different rankings of cards are there? There are 13. So that means we'd multiply this by 13. Really, we're adding four choose three to itself 13 times. And that would be for choosing three aces or three twos or three threes or three fours, so on and so forth. Okay, so that's the number of ways to choose three of a kind. Now, after choosing that three of a kind, we need to make a pair. So how can we make a pair? Well, again, there are four of each ranked card and we wanna choose two of them. So there are four choose two ways to make a pair if we're like choosing two of four sevens or something. But now we can choose two of anything that remains. 
but how many remain? Well, there are 12 different ranks of cards that remain after making our three of a kind. So in the end, we need to take this product. Th 13 times four choose three times 12 times four choose two. Then if you multiply this all out, which I won't go through the details, you can use similar strategies to what we did on previous boards, you'll get 3,744. Notice that's less than the number of flushes. And that makes a full house less likely to occur than a flush. And in fact, it is a higher ranked hand in poker. Okay, so now we're gonna to work towards some nice relations involving these binomial coefficients, and then look at some other applications. Now we're gonna start looking at some of my favorite things, which are the relations between the binomial coefficients. So let's look at this nice one. In fact, this one can be used to define the binomial coefficients if we'd like to. And what it says is if we have natural numbers n and k, and k is between one and n, then the binomial coefficient n plus one choose k is equal to n choose k minus one plus n choose k. Let's see why that is the case. Well, let's start with a subset A of one up to n plus one. And let's assume that it has k elements. I won't write that down, but we're just, actually maybe I will write that down as the size of A equals K. The cardinality of A is K. Now, how many such A are there? Where, well, there are N plus one choose K. Okay, so now next up, we'll notice that A must satisfy exactly one of the following conditions. So I'll maybe put those conditions as these two blue dots. So n plus one could be an element of A. Well, that's possible because A is a subset. So that was sloppy. That should be a subset of that because A is a subset of one up to n plus one. But now if A contains n plus one, then how many such A are there? Well, it has k elements in total. If it has n plus one in it, then there are k minus one remaining choices. And you can make those choices from one to n. So there are n choose k minus one possibilities for a. But what's the other case? The other case is that n plus one is not in a. But that means that all of the choices for elements of a are open. We can choose k total elements, but we can only choose them from the set one to n because we're not allowed to choose n plus one. So that tells us that we have n choose k possibilities left over. And that's like a nice combinatorial interpretation of this setup. Or we could also establish this with a straightforward calculation. Let's do that as well. So I'll start with the right-hand side. n choose k minus 1 plus n choose k. So n choose k minus 1 is a descending product of k minus 1 terms. So n times n minus 1 all the way down to n minus k plus 2. That would be k minus 1 factors in the numerator. And then over k minus 1 factorial. Then we're going to add that to n times n minus 1 all the way down to n minus k plus 1. That is k terms in the numerator and then over k factorial. Next up, we'll give these to a common denominator and we'll do that by multiplying this first one by k over k. So that leaves us with n times n minus 1 all the way down to n minus k plus 2 times k over k factorial and then plus this n times n minus 1 all the way down to n minus k plus 1 over k factorial. Now we have a common denominator. We can like put these together. But actually, let's maybe take this second term and rewrite it by putting the next to last term in. So we'll have n minus k plus 2 and n minus k plus 1. And now as we add these together, let's factor out this descending product from n to n minus k plus 2. So what does that leave us with? We'll have n times n minus 1 all the way down to n minus k plus 2. And then left over will be this k term here and then this n minus k plus 1 term here. So we'll have k 
plus, because we have this plus sign here, n minus k plus one, and then this is all over k factorial. But now let's notice that this k here cancels this k here, and we're left with n plus one. And now we can put that n plus one over here at the front, so let's do that, and maybe scrub this out in total. But that leaves us a descending product of k terms in the numerator starting at n plus 1 over k factorial. In other words, we have the binomial coefficient n plus 1 choose k. So there we have it. We have two arguments for the validity of this observation. First is a straightforward calculation, like I said, and the second one is this nice combinatorial argument where we take subsets of the set containing one to n plus one and partition them into two places. Okay, so now armed with this observation, I wanna build something really nice, which you've probably seen before called Pascal's triangle. So now we're gonna use this observation that we just like discovered two ways to build something called Pascal's triangle. And so you might recall that this is a triangle formed from a certain rule where as you descend, you add neighbors together. Well, that's exactly what's happening here. You would add neighbors together to get the term that's below and between those. So I've started with just like a tree of ones, but those ones are playing either the role of something choose zero or something choose itself. Again, those are like zero element subsets or subsets like that are full, if you will. Okay, so now we can start adding things together. So what should two choose one be? Well, two choose one is one choose zero plus one choose one. So that means you would add these two together to get this number right here, you would get two. Okay, and then this is the three choose row. So here we have three choose zero is zero, three choose three is three. So what's three choose one? Well, it's gonna be the sum of these two above it, or one plus two, which is three. And likewise, this three choose two will be the sum above it as well. And now we can just descend all the way down. So adding the two above it will give us four, six, four. Here we'll get five, 10, 10, five. Here we'll get six, 15, 20, 15, six. Okay, so how do you read this? Well, this row right here is the six choose K row. And for instance, this entry right here will be six choose, let's see, zero, one, two, three, four. So this is the six choose four entry. So that means six choose four is 15. Okay, so now let's investigate some more things involving these binomial coefficients. Now we're gonna look at my favorite defining property of binomial coefficients, and that is that the coefficient of the monomial x to the n, y to the n minus k in the binomial expansion of x plus y to the n is n choose k. And the idea behind the proof of this goes like this. So if we take x plus y to the n and write it out as x plus y, times x plus y n times, then we can easily count up the way to achieve x to the k, y to the n minus k. So let's write that down. So let's say we want to achieve x to the k, y to the n minus k. So really all we have to worry about is achieving x to the k, the y to the n minus k kind of comes along for free. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, among these n factors, we choose k exact, we choose x exactly k times. So let's write that down. So we will choose x from k of these factors. So while we're doing the big product, so maybe we choose x here, we choose x here, we skip some x's and then we choose x again until we've chosen k x's. But how many ways can we choose k x's from this list of n total factors? Well, that's exactly the definition of binomial coefficient. So multiplying this out, we'll get n choose k times x to the k, y to the n minus k. Okay, so that leads us to the very important formula, which is a lot more powerful 
than it might seem initially. And that is, if we take x plus y to the n, we get the sum as k goes from zero up to n of n choose k, x to the k, y to the n minus k. Okay, nice. And now from here we can do lots of nice sum identities really quickly. So let's do those via some examples. Let's first determine n choose zero plus n choose one plus n choose two all the way up to n choose n. So I'll do this two different ways. I'll do it with a combinatorial approach using subsets and I'll also use this sum formula. So let's notice that this is equal to the sum as k goes from zero up to n of n choose k. But that's equal to the sum as k goes from zero up to n of n choose k times x to the k where we've evaluated x at one. And we've not only evaluated x at one, but we've set y equal to one in this initial thing. And I would say that it's common to have this formula here with y equals one. Okay, but let's notice that this is equal to x plus one to the nth power evaluated at x equals one. But that's just one plus one to the n power, or in other words, two to the n. So what's another interpretation of this? Well, we can interpret this by our original definition. So this would be the number of zero element subsets plus the number of one element subsets all the way up to the number of n element subsets. But that's all possible types of subsets. So that should equal the total number of subsets. But the total number of subsets from a fact that we had before was two to the n. So that would be another interpretation. Okay, so let's do one more before we end with some warm-up exercises for you to try. And that's the sum as k goes from zero to n of minus one to the k, n choose k, seven to the n minus k times two to the k. Okay, nice. So this seems like it might be really difficult, but if we just think about it as probably evaluating this binomial raised to a power uh, at some certain numbers, it shouldn't be that bad. Okay, so let's maybe put all the powers of k together. We have minus one to the k and two to the k. So this will give us the sum. As k goes from zero to infinity, we'll have n choose k minus two to the k and then seven to the n minus k. And now this looks exactly like this thing over here. So this is equal to the sum as k goes from zero to n, I should say. So that was infinity before, but that should be n of n choose k, x to the k, y to the n minus k, where x is equal to negative two and y is equal to seven. But that's gonna be equal to minus two plus seven to the nth power based off this rule right here, but that's equal to five to the nth power. So that's a quick proof of kind of an identity that seems kind of gnarly. Okay, so let's end with some warmups for you to try. So here are five nice warm-up problems based off what we saw. So the first is to find the cardinality of the following set. So the set is all x and the power set of the set containing one to 12, such that the cardinality of x is equal to six. The next is to answer how many poker hands have one pair and nothing else. Next, suppose there are 126 five element subsets of A. What's the cardinality of A? Next, let's determine the coefficient of x to the fourth y cubed from the expansion of 5x minus 2y to the seven. And finally, simplify the sum as k goes from zero to n of six to the k over three to the n times n choose k and that's a good place to stop. This is the eighth video in a series devoted to introductory proof writing. And we've been going through counting strategies and we're gonna to continue to do that for this video as well as the next, focusing on combinatorial proofs in the next. Whereas this one, we're gonna look at the inclusion exclusion principle, as well as something called multi-sets. So let's start with this inclusion-exclusion principle, which very simply says that if A and B are finite sets, then the cardinality of A union B is equal to the cardinality of A plus the cardinality of B minus the cardinality of the intersection of A and B. 
And we can visualize this as follows. So if we've got A as this yellow set, B as this red set, then the intersection is in here like shaded in orange. And notice if we were to add the cardinality of A and the cardinality of B, we would double count the cardinality of the intersection. And so in order to only single count the cardinality of the intersection, we need to subtract one copy off. So like I said, it's counted twice, but if we want to only count it once, that's why we have this subtraction of the cardinality of A intersect B there. Okay, so let's start with a fairly simple example, and that is to count the number of elements in the set 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 50 that are divisible by 2 or divisible by 7. So let's put this into the language of some sets first. So let's say that A is all in in the set 1 to 50 such that N is divisible by 2. So we could write it in set builder notation like this. But notice being divisible by 2 is the same thing as being even, and we can easily enumerate the elements in this set. So we've got 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, all the way up to the number 50. So the number 50 itself is, of course, even. But how many of these are there? Well, I think it's pretty easy to count up that the cardinality of A in this case is simply 25. And you can count that very easily as saying that this is 2 times 1, 2 times 2, all the way up to 2 times 25. So really just we're counting 1 to 25. So now let's look at B. So B is going to be all elements in in this set such that N is divisible by 7. So that's our definition there. Again, we can enumerate this pretty easily as well. We have 7, 14, next would be 21, then 28, then 35, then 42, and then 49. In fact, we don't need to do dot, dot, dot here because there's a smaller number. Okay, but let's look at this. This is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 total elements. So here the cardinality of B is 7. Well, we could count that up pretty easily as well by noticing that this, this is 7 times 1, 7 times 2, up to 7 times 7. Now let's look at A intersect B, which we can do just by taking the elements of B which are even. Of course, that's going to be 14, 28, and 42. But that means that the cardinality of A intersect B is simply the number 3. Okay, nice. And so now in order to answer this question, we can apply this inclusion-exclusion principle. Notice that answering this question is equivalent to finding the cardinality of A union B. So using this principle, we'll have 25 plus 7 minus 3. So let's see, that'll be the same thing as 25 plus 4, which is 29. So there are 29 such subsets. So there are 29 such elements. Now for another example. And in this example, we're gonna count up how many integers are between zero and 10 million, where they have exactly four digits that are equal to one, or exactly two digits that are equal to nine. So let's quickly notice that this being between 0 and 10 million means that n has the following form. So it's equal to a seven digit number. So let's write this out. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And that's where we're allowing 0 to be leading digits. So we would allow something like 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 2, 3. That would be a, an allowed 7-digit number in this case. Now often if we were just to say a 7-digit number, we would not allow a leading 0. But in this setup right here, where we have n between 0 and 10 million, we do allow leading zeros. Okay, let's also notice that zero is not a possibility in this setup, even with leading zeros, because we must have either exactly four digits equal to one or exactly two digits equal to nine, which means the smallest such possible number would be 99. Okay, so now let's get counting. So let's maybe first look at the condition exactly 
four digits equal to one. And let's count that up here next to this yellow next to this yellow square, and then we'll look at the exactly two digits equal to nine with a magenta square underneath after we're done with this. Okay, so we've got seven entries here. We wanna choose exactly four of them to be equal to one, so that's using a binomial coefficient. We have seven choose four. So like I said, this is choosing the location of the ones. Great. But then after we choose those four locations of a one, we have to fill in the rest of the digits. But how can we fill in the rest of those digits? Well, they can be really anything that we want, except they cannot be ones because it's saying exactly four ones. So that means we need to fill in three digits from nine possibilities. Those nine possibilities being zero, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So in total, we have nine cubed extra possibilities. So this would be the remaining digits. So I'll just put remaining here. Okay, good. So that's the number of ways to have numbers between zero and 10 million where exactly four of the digits are equal to one. Now let's look at this next case, exactly two digits equal to nine. So I'll do that with this magenta coloring here. Okay, so we need to choose two of these seven placements to be equal to to be equal to nine. So that would be seven choose two. Then after we've chosen two, there are five ones that we need to fill in and we can fill those in with any numbers except for nine. So that means we can fill them in with the numbers zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there are nine possibilities there. So we have nine possibilities for each of the five remaining. So that would be nine to the five total possibilities left over. Okay, so let's just point out that this is the location of the nines. And then this right here is the remaining. So it's a little bit tricky because this is locations of nines and we're using nine again here, but those are playing different roles. Okay, so this would be like our set A or the cardinality of our set A. This would be like the cardinality of our set B. And now we need to look at the cardinality of the set A intersect B. So let's put these together right here. So I'll just put yellow square plus magenta square. So that means we need to choose four boxes from this set to be ones. So that would be seven choose four because we've got seven empty boxes to choose. But after choosing four of those boxes, there are three remaining boxes, but we need to choose two of them to be nines. So from those three remaining boxes, we choose two of them to be nines. So let's just point out that here, we're choosing the location of the ones, and here we're choosing the location of the nines, like that. But then after that, we've used up six total digits, four of them for ones, two of them for nines, which means we have one digit left over to fill up. But we can fill that up with any number except for one or nine. So that comes from the set zero, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there are eight total possibilities for that remaining digit. So let's put here, this is the remaining digit. Good. So now we need to use that inclusion exclusion principle to finish this thing off. So it'll be this number here plus this number here minus that number over there. So let's just write this. So it'll be seven choose four times nine choose three and then plus seven choose two times nine to the fifth power and then minus seven choose four times three choose two times eight to the first power. So I won't calculate that up, but you can use the formula for binomial coefficients to easily calculate that up. It's gonna be a fairly large number, so you probably wanna use some sort of computational device. Now, what I will say is there seems to be something fishy going on here, because what would happen if at this step right here, we first chose the location of the nines, and then after that, chose the location of the ones? Well, choosing the location of the nines, we would have seven choose two, 
And then choosing the remaining location of the ones, we would have five choose four because we've got four locations to choose again. And it seems like we would get a different number, but in fact, we don't get a different number because this is one of those binomial coefficient identities. So you can check that those two are the same. And in fact, there's a more general identity, which is a nice homework problem, which you might have in whatever course you're taking, and you'll definitely have in the course that I'm teaching. So now that we've done a couple of these inclusion exclusion examples, let's move on to talk about multisets. Now we're ready to explore the notion of a multiset. So let's look at a definition. A multiset is a collection of objects which may be repeated. So this is kind of a generalization of a set and a list. It lies kind of in between a set and a list. Let's recall that objects in a list can be repeated, but the order matters in the objects of a list. Like 112 is thought of as being different than 121. Whereas in a multiset, that's not the case, as we'll see with an example. Then that repetition can be recorded in a multiset by the notion of a multiplicity. So the multiplicity of an element in a multiset is the number of times it occurs. So let's look at this very simple example, as well as some notation that we can build out of this example. So let's say we've got the multiset, which I'll call capital X. We'll use the notation where we have these uh, square brackets. So that's different than what we used for lists, which was round brackets or parentheses, or for sets, which was curly braces. So here X is the multiset A, A, B, 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 C. So there are six elements in this multiset. It just happens that two of them are equal to A and three of them are equal to B. So that means A has multiplicity two, which we'll denote like this, M sub X, so X is the name of the multiset, of A equals two. So that's the element right there. Then the multiplicity of B is three, so that's what we would read here, and the multiplicity of C is one, because it only occurs once. You might read this holistically as the multiplicity of B in X is three. Now, I'd also like to point out that we could write the multiset X in a different ordering if we wanted to, and it's still the multiset X. So we could indeed write it as B, A, B, A, B, C. So there are two A's, three B's, and a C, and that's all that matters. Furthermore, I'd like to point out that any set is a multiset. It's a multiset where everything has multiplicity one. Okay, so since we're talking about counting, we want to move up towards counting certain multisets. And we'll start that with an example. So let's say we've got a three element set and we want to find all multisets that contain elements from this three element set. So let's start with zero element multisets. Well, there's only one zero element multiset and that's the same thing as the zero element set, which is the empty set. Okay, now let's look at one element multisets. Well, one element multisets are just singletons, just like one element sets. If you only have one element, there's no opportunity for repetition. So here we would have one, the multiset, the multiset two, and the multiset three. Of course, we could write that in curly braces because multisets and sets are the same when they have either zero or one element. Now let's look at two element multisets. So we've got more of them here. We've got like one, one, two, two, three, three. So those are all of the ones that are not sets themselves. We have repetition. But we could also have one, two, we could have one, three, or we could have two, three. So those are all the ones that turn into sets. They do not have repetition. Okay, so next up I wanna introduce some notation, and this notation will help us eventually count the number of multisets. And so let's just get into writing this notation and then we'll explain how it works. So I'll denote this multiset one, one as star, star, and then bar, bar. So this means that there are one, two, ones, but there is zero, two, and zero, three. So I'm separating the elements one, two, three by these bars right here. 
And so depending on the placement of the bars, that tells me how many ones there are, how many twos there are, and how many threes there are. So now let's look at two, two, the multi-set two, two. So that would be bar, star, star. That's how we would denote that. And that's because there are zero ones. So there's zero stars right here. That denotes the number of ones. There are two twos and there are zero threes. Okay, well, let's look at three, three. So that would be bar, bar, star, star. So reading into this, since there are zero stars in this location right here, that means there are zero ones in the multi-set. There are zero stars in this location right here. There are zero twos in the multi-set, but there are two stars here. That means there are two threes in the multi-set. Okay, let's move on to the next one. So one, two, so that would be star, bar, star, bar. So this placement right here is for the number of one, there's one of them. This placement right here is for the number of twos, there's one of them. This placement right here would be for the number of threes, but there are zero of them, so that's left blank. Okay, so let's look at one, three. So that would be star, bar, bar, star. Notice the place that would count the number of twos is empty because there are zero twos. Okay, finally, let's look at the set two, three, the multi-set two, three. So that would be bar, star, bar, star. So this spot right here that would count the number of ones is empty. So now let's look at three element multi-sets. So let's start with one, 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 and two, 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 and then three, three, three. So those are all of the multi-sets that only contain one type of element. They all contain three elements, but only one type of element. And we could put this into the star and bar notation as follows. So this first one would be star, 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 bar, bar. So the location where we count the number of ones has three stars. The location where we count the number of twos and the number of threes is empty. Now let's look at this next one, two, two, two. So that would be bar, star, 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 bar. So where we count the number of ones is empty, the number of threes is empty, the number of twos, there are three of them. And then finally for three, 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 we would have bar, bar, star, star, star. Again, the place where we count the number of ones is empty, the number of twos is empty, but the number of threes has three stars. Okay, so let's get a little bit more interesting. Let's maybe look at the multi-set one, one, two. So that's definitely a three element multi-set. So that would be star, star, bar, star, bar. So again, we're counting two ones, one, two, and zero threes. Okay, so let's do a couple more. We won't totally enumerate these, but we will do enough to get an idea for what's going on. What about one, three, three? So there's a single one and then zero twos and then two threes. So the place where we count the number of ones has a single star, where we count the number of threes has two stars, the place where we count the number of twos has zero stars. So that would be the star bar diagram for one, three, three. Now let's go ahead and look at some four element multi-sets from, like I said, the set containing one, two, three. And I just wanna be clear that this is not a full enumeration of the three element multi-sets. It might be a nice warm up exercise for you to write down the rest of them if you'd like. Okay, so now let's look at some four element ones. I'll just say that there are 15 in total and we'll be able to calculate that later, but just like I did not enumerate all of them here, I won't enumerate all of them here. I think it'd probably be a good exercise for you two as well. Okay, so let's maybe look at this one. So one, 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 three. So that's definitely an example. So let's see, we would have three stars in the one position, then a bar, zero stars in the two position, so that means there's two bars next to each other, and then a single star in the three position. So that would be the diagram for this multi-set. Okay, let's look at another one, maybe one, two, three, three. So there's a single star in the one position, a bar, a single star in the two position, a bar, and then two stars in the three position. That's how we would count that up. So let's maybe look at 
two, two, three, three. So that's kind of an interesting multi-set. So it only contains elements from one, two, three. It's missing one, but then it has two each of two and three. So that would have zero stars in the one position and then two stars in each of the two and the three position. So that would be our diagram there. So I said there are 15 in total. We've done three of them, so that means there are 12 left. Again, that would be a nice homework exercise. Okay, so now that we've kind of explored these multi-sets quite a bit, I think we can probably count up how many there are in general. Now we're ready to count k element multisets from an n element set. That leads us to the following claim. That is, there are n plus k minus 1 choose k k element multisets from the set containing 1, 2, 3, 4, up to n, or really any n element set. That being said, if you've got an n element set, it might as well be equal to one, two, three, up to n, especially if there's no additional structure to it. Now, some of you may like to learn extra notation. I know that when I was a student, I liked to learn extra notation. And in fact, there is notation for this number of k element multisets. And it goes like this. So n plus k minus 1 choose k is this kind of like, I don't know the name of it, but it's this binomial coefficient where you have an extra parentheses. And furthermore, you can check this, but it's equal to n times n plus 1 all the way up to n plus k minus 1 over k factorial. But this is very, very close to a normal binomial coefficient, but instead of having a lowering factorial or a descending factorial, a falling factorial of k terms starting at n, we have what's called a rising factorial of k terms starting at n. So notice this is the product of k terms, n times n plus 1 times n plus 2 all the way up to n plus k minus 1 where we start at n. And just as we saw earlier notation for this falling product, which was k underline, there's notation for this rising product of k overline. Okay, so like I said, this is just some bonus notation for those that are interested. I know that I was super psyched about things like that when I was a student. Okay, so let's maybe do a little bit of a proof of this claim. So let's maybe suppose that a is a k element multiset from the set containing 1, 2, up to n. Now I'm going to introduce some notation for A. So I'll write A as follows. So it's going to be the multiset 1 to the m1, 2 to the m2, all the way up to n to the mn. So those don't really mean exponents. I'll show you what those mean, but these need to satisfy a certain rule, and that is m1 plus m2 plus all the way up to mn is equal to the number k. Okay, great. But what do I really mean by this notation? So let's be careful to sort that out over here. So the multi-set, which would be like 1 cubed, 2, 4, and then 3, 2, would be the multi-set where we have 3 1s, 4 2s, and 2 3s. So in other words, it would be 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2, 2, and then 3, 3. Okay, so that's just some shortened notation for this multi-set. I don't know how common it is. I know it's like sort of common to use these exponents for repeated appearances of numbers when you're studying integer partitions. And I know something about integer partitions, so that's where I'm taking this notation. Okay, so now what we will do is take this multi-set and attach it to one of these diagrams. And then we can count the number of such diagrams. And after counting the number of such diagrams, well, that'll be the number of such, such sets and we'll be good to go. So what would the diagram be? Well, it'll be one of these star and bar diagrams where, where we have M1 stars in the one position, M2 stars in the two position, and so on and so forth. So it would look something like this. Star, 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 star. So a bunch of stars, and then a bar, and then a bunch of stars, and then another bar, and then that ends with a bar and a bunch of stars. So something like this. 
And like I said, this note denotes the first position, so the position of the number of ones. So that means there are m1 total stars here. Then this is the position for the number of twos, so there are m2 stars there. And finishing off way down here, this denotes the number of n's, so there are m sub n number of stars here. So there's a really important thing to note here, and that is if we take out all of the bars, there are exactly k stars. So let's point that out. So there are exactly k stars. Great. And then how many bars are there? Well, notice the bars separate the number of ones from the number of twos, from, from the number of threes, all the way up to the number of n's. So that means we have exactly n minus 1 bars. So let's write that down. n minus 1 bars. Because there are n minus 1 places be between each of the numbers. There's a spot between 1 and 2. There's a spot between 2 and 3. There's a spot between 3 and 4. There's a spot between n minus 1 and n. So now putting this together, we can see how many characters there are. And that would be the sum of these two objects. So there are exactly n plus k minus 1, like I'll say there are characters. So really, we're thinking about making a word, and that word has n plus k minus 1 characters, but there are only two possible letters. You could have the letter which is a star and the letter which is a bar. And now we're ready to finish off our counting, and it goes like this. So from the n plus k minus 1 characters, we choose, let's see, k of them to be, to be stars. But how many ways are there to choose k objects from n plus k minus 1 objects? Well, that's exactly the binomial coefficient which we learned about in the last video. So that leads us to our result, which is there are n plus k minus 1 choose k such choices. And each of those choices gives us a new multiset. So that counts the number of multisets. But you might worry a little bit right here. And you might worry because what if instead of choosing the location for the stars, we chose the location for the bars? Notice that we'll choose n minus 1 spots for the bars, which would give us the binomial coefficient n plus k minus 1, choose n minus 1. Well, in fact, those two are the same number. So let's put that in here. This is the same thing as n plus k minus 1, choose n minus 1. And that's a, from a binomial coefficient identity, which likely you saw on your homework. Okay, so that clears up the proof of this result. Now let's do some examples based around this. So our first example will be to count the number of non-negative integer solutions to the equation x plus y plus z equals 17. This is an example of something called the linear Diophantine equation. So what we'll do is start with the solution, attach it to a multiset, and use that to come up with some sort of counting argument. We know we should attach it to a multiset because, well, of course, we're looking at examples involving multisets right now. Okay, so let's look at a solution, maybe x equals 10, and then y equals 5, z equals 2. That's most definitely a solution because 10 plus 5 plus 2 is equal to 17. Okay, so now, like I said, let's attach this to a multiset. Well, maybe we'll first attach it to one of those diagrams, and after which we'll attach it to a multiset. Well, maybe the diagram could be something like this. Star, 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 star. I'm making 10 stars, by the way. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 9, 10. And then, so this would represent the value of x. And then this line would be kind of like the plus sign. And then we'll have the value of y, which is 5, so star, 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 so 5 stars, and then 2 stars for the value of z. And in particular, what you can think about this is having 17 stars and then choosing where to put these two bars. And those two bars will split your number into x, y, and z. 
But let's notice that this corresponds to the following multiset. So instead of using one, two, three here, I'll use X, Y, Z. So this would be the multiset X, X. Well, how many of them will have 10 of them? And then Y, 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 Y. So we have five Y's. And then finally, we'll have two Z's. Great. So let's notice that this is a 17 element multiset from a three element set. So that tells us how many solutions do we have? Well, we'll have 17 plus three minus one, choose 17. So just to reiterate what I just said, this is a 17 element multiset from X, Y, Z, a three element set. So, so you could, so of course that's gonna be 19 choose 17 and you can work that out and it'll be 171. Now we could also use the notation that we had before over here. This is equal to 317, where we have this different type of binomial coefficient. So this would be a rising product starting at three for 17 total terms. And so let's see, that's gonna end at 19 and then it'll be over 17 factorial. Again, that's from this like bonus notation over here. Okay, so let's look at a generalization of this example. Okay, so now, like I said, we're gonna look at a generalization of that example. Let's look for all non-negative integer solutions to x1 plus x2 plus x3 up to xn equals k. Okay, so this is the same sort of idea. Okay, so let's say that we have a solution and our solution is xi equals mi. Now we can take that solution and attach it to a multiset. The multiset would look something like this. So it would be x1, x1, and there would be exactly m1 of these. And then it would be x2, a bunch of x2s, and there would be exactly m2 of these, all the way up to xn, xn, and there would be exactly mn of these. But what is that really doing? Well, how many total entries are there in this multiset? Well, since xi equals mi is the solution, there are m1 plus m2 plus up to mn total elements in this multiset, but that's equal to k. Again, that's because this is a solution to that equation. So what are we doing here? Well, we're finding multisets with k elements from n total elements. So let's see, each of these corresponds, like I said, to a k element multiset of an n element set. That n element set is written as x1 up to xn. So we know exactly how many of those there are, and those are n plus k minus one choose k such solutions, because that's the same number as the number of multisets. Okay, let's do another example. Okay, so now I've got an example which actually has a nice geometric interpretation. That geometric interpretation is hard to see in higher dimensions, but it's fairly easier to see in a simple two-dimensional case, which we'll look at. So our goal is to find all integers w, x, y, z such that Zero is less than or equal to W, which is less than or equal to X, which is less than or equal to Y, which is less than or equal to Z, which is less than or equal to 10. So like I said, there's a nice two-dimensional analog to this, which is, uh, has a nice geometrical interpretation, and it goes like this. Let's say we want all X and Y integers satisfying zero, less than or equal to X, less than or equal to Y, less than or equal to five. Well, if we were to graph all of those, we would get this nice triangular shape. So notice this kind of hypotenuse of the triangle is all of the cases where x equals y. That's allowed here. So this would be x and y are both 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then filling in the rest of it are the cases where x is less than y. So like I said, we get a nice triangle here. And that's in fact going to be some sort of triangular number. If we were to add all of these up, we would have something like this. Uh, one from this plus two plus three plus four plus five plus six. So we have one plus two all the way up to six. That would be the total number here. But of course, we're doing this in this larger case. So you could maybe think about the three-dimensional version as some sort of tetrahedral number, right? Because everything would be arranged in a tetrahedron. 
Okay, so let's maybe think about how we might take certain quadruples here. Well, like I said, we're gonna look for x, w, x, y, z, but let's organize them in a quadruple, w, x, y, z. And what we'd like to do is assign each quadruple to a multiset. But let's do that via a couple of examples first before we get an idea of how it works. So let's look at one, two, three, four. That's definitely a quadruple that follows our rules. And let's organize this into a multi-set where we have 10 total entries or 10 elements. And what these numbers are telling us is the location of the bars. So we'll have a star and then a bar after the first star, and then we'll have star, bar, star, bar, star, bar. So like I said, this is telling us the location of the bars. There's a bar after the first star, after the second star, after the third star, and after the fourth star. But after that, there are no more bars. That, so that means I need six kind of free stars here. Okay, great. So notice that this is one of those diagrams for a 10 element multiset of a how many element set? Well, I think it's gonna be a five element set. So five element set. Because notice the number of bars is equal to one less than the total number of elements. And in fact, we can turn this into our multi-set notation as follows. So it would look like one to the one, two to the one, three to the one, four to the one, and then five to the six, because there are six copies of five. Okay, let's look at another one. Let's say in this case we have zero, three, five, ten. So that would be a quadruple satisfying this inequality for sure. But let's say that zero, three, five, and ten are the location of the stars. But now zero, three, five, and ten will be the location of the bars. So that would turn us into the following diagram. We have a bar, and then we'll have star, 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 and then a bar. So this would be a bar in the zeroth position, in the third position, and now we need one in the fifth position, so that would be right there. And then we'll need one in the tenth position. So that means we need five stars, and then a remaining bar. Okay, good. So now, which multiset does this correspond to? Well, let's see, I think it corresponds to the multiset where we have three twos, and then we'll have two threes, and then we'll have one, two, three, four, five fours. So that would be our multiset in this case. Okay, so let's do one more just for practice. Let's say we have seven, nine, 10, 10. Okay, so that means we have bars in the seventh location, the ninth location, and two bars in the tenth location. Okay, so let's see what diagram that will correspond to. So we'll have seven stars to start off with, just to get us to the first bar. So there we have seven stars, and then we'll have a bar, two stars, and then a bar. So now we have one in the seventh position and the ninth position. And then we'll have a star and two bars in the tenth position. That's what we have here. And then which multi-set does this correspond to? Well, let's see, it's gonna be seven ones, so one to the seven, we'll have two twos, so two to the two, and then a single three. Okay, so that would be our multi-set in that case. <clears throat> okay, so I think we've practiced this enough, but notice that in all of these cases, what it boiled down to was finding 10 element multi-sets of a five element set. But we know exactly how many that should be based off of our claim over here. And that is 10 plus 5 minus 1, uh, choose 10. So that's how many total multisets there are. But since those multisets are in correspondence to these quadruples, that's how many quadruples there are. So you can do the calculation here and you'll see what you get is 1001. Okay, so we're gonna do one more counting game before we finish off the video. Now we're gonna look at the number of permutations of elements from a multi-set. So we're gonna start off with an example which is just the number of permutations of an element from a set. And we've done this before, so this shouldn't be new, but then when we move on to a real multi-set, when I say a real multi-set, I mean one that has a multiplicity larger than one for one of the elements, things get a little bit more interesting.
So let's start with the number of permutations of the multiset M-I-C-H-A-E-L. So that's my name. So let's notice that's a seven element multiset where the multiplicity of each element is one. So that might as well just be a seven element set. But we know how many permutations there are of a seven element set. There are simply seven factorial. And that's by some counting exercises we did in previous videos. You can think about having seven slots to fill and you'll have seven choices for this first slot, but then you've used up one of the letters. So you only have six for the second, five for the third, and so on and so forth. So you get seven factorial. Okay. So what about the number of permutations of the multiset P-E-N-N? -N? So of course we have to be a bit more careful here and that's because N occurs twice. So what we'll do to start this off is to turn this multiset into a set and when we turn it into a set we'll, we will differentiate between the two ends with some colorings. Okay, so like I said, we're gonna turn this multi-set into a set, and that set will be PE, and then we'll have magenta N and then yellow N. Okay, great. So now we really have a four element, and now we really have a four element set because we're differentiating between the magenta N and the yellow N. And now looking at it like this, there should be four factorial, or 24 permutations. And now what I'd like to do is list all 24 permutations, but do it in a way so that when we maybe erase the colors, we're left with columns that look like the same permutation. Okay, so let's get started. So let's start with maybe just the standard spelling. So that would be P-E, and then we'll have yellow N and magenta N. And then we'll have P-E, and then magenta N and yellow N. So that would be two of the 24 permutations. But if we were to erase the color here, then we would only have a single permutation of the original multi-set. Okay, so now let's maybe try to do this systematically. So let's do everything starting with P first. So we have P and then E. Now let's say we have P and then N. So we'll have P yellow N and then E and then magenta N. That would be an example. And then we could have P magenta N and then E and then yellow N. So that would be another such set of permutations with the colored letters that maybe collapse to the same permutation when we uncolor the letters. So now I'm gonna write down all the remaining permutations on the board and then we can work towards maybe a general way of counting this type of thing. Okay, so there's all the remaining permutations. So notice we have 24 in total, which is expected because four factorial is 24. And here at the moment, we're considering yellow in and magenta in to be different but I've done this careful pairing. And that careful pairing is maybe like what we'll eventually call an equivalence relation, which will set each of these equal to each other when we erase the color. So let's see, over here we have E magenta N, P yellow N. And here we have E yellow N, P magenta N. But if we were to erase the color, that, that would simply be E N P N. And that's true for all of these. So let's notice in the end, we have 24, which is four factorial over two, which is the same thing as two factorial total possibilities. But we wanna think about this not just as that number, which that number is obviously equal to 12, but how that might generalize to a larger such question. And I think maybe the best way to think about it is like this. So this would be permutations of four objects divided by the permutations of two objects. Okay, so I think maybe this leading exercise gives us an idea for how to write down the number of permutations of a K element set where we have certain multiplicities. And so we'll write that as a claim over here and then we'll talk our way through the truth of that claim. Okay, so here's how we can count permutations of a K element multiset. 
with multiplicities m1, m2, up to mr. Let's notice if those are the multiplicities, then that means the sum m1 up to mr is equal to k. So the number of such permutations is k factorial over m1 factorial, m2 factorial, up to mr factorial. But there's actually a name for that, which is called a multinomial coefficient. And that multinomial coefficient is written as k choose m1, m2, up to mr. But this really only makes sense if r is bigger than or equal to 2. Because if r is equal to 1, it might look like a binomial coefficient, but the left-hand side is not a binomial coefficient. So, like I said, this is only really if r is bigger than or equal to 2 that we would use this notation of the multinomial coefficient. Okay, so here's the idea behind the proof here. So let's say we've got a k element multiset, and that k element multiset looks like this. x1, so a bunch of x1s. How many x1s do we have? Well, based off of this, we will have m1 x1s, and then we'll have a bunch of x2s. So how many x2s will we have? Well, we'll have m2 x2s all the way up to xr, how many of those will we have? Well, we will have mr xrs. We know we need x1s up to xrs just based off the fact that we've got that many multiplicities. So what we'll do is take this multi-set and then turn it into a set by doing colorings on each of these like equal elements. So we'll color each of the x1s differently, each of the x2s differently, and so on and so forth but we'll color them via superscripting. So we'll say like the first color, the second color, and so on and so forth. So that's gonna turn into the following set. I'll call it x1, x1, 2, all the way up to x1, m1. So that would be all of the x1s. And then we'll have x2, 1, all the way up to x2, m2, all the way up to xr, 1, and then xr, MR. And then how many elements are in this set? Well, based off this sum, M1 to MR, we know there are K elements in this set. And now we count the total number of permutations. So the total number of permutations will be K factorial because that's the number of K permutations of a K element set. But then a bunch of those permutations are equivalent to each other. And we can get that equivalence by just permuting each of these different colors. So how many different ways are there to permute all of these different colors of X1? Well, there are M1 different ways. So that means we have to divide by M1 factorial because all of those will be equal to each other. And so we're like making this big multi-dimensional array, if you will. And then how many different ways are there to order these x2s? Well, there will be m2 factorial ways of ordering those x2s all the way up to mr factorial number of different ways of ordering those xrs. So there's a sketch and definitely just a sketch of the proof of this claim. Okay, so now I'm gonna leave you with some warm-up exercises. So I've got three nice warm-up exercises for you. The first is to count how many four digit positive integers, there are with no repeated digits, or if there are repeated digits, all of the digits are odd. And I don't mean all of the repeated digits are odd, but all of the digits are odd. Next is to count how many six digit numbers are even or divisible by five. And finally, count how many w, x, y, z integers satisfy their sum is equal to, that should be 100, and then w is bigger than or equal to 5, x is bigger than or equal to 1, and then y and z are bigger than or equal to 0. And that's a good place to stop. This is the ninth video in a series devoted to introductory proof writing. Today we're going to look at the pigeonhole principle and combinatorial proofs. So let's start with the definition, which will lead us towards the pigeonhole principle. So given a real number x, we'd like to define this function called the floor of x, which we'll use this following notation, as the largest integer n such that n is less than or equal to x. And then as a dual to that, we'll define something called the ceiling, 
and we'll have similar notation and that will be the smallest integer n such that n is bigger than or equal to x. So you can think of the floor as an elevator downstairs to the closest integer, whereas the ceiling is an elevator upstairs to the closest integer. So let's look at a couple of quick examples. So the floor of 2.3 is equal to 2. We go downstairs to 2. The floor of E is equal to 2. That's because E is 2.718. The floor of 2.99 is also equal to 2 because it's not quite equal to 3. And the floor of 2 is equal to 2. That's because if you're at an integer by this definition, you don't have to go downstairs. Next up, the floor of negative 3 quarters is negative 1 because that's downstairs from negative 3 quarters. Then the ceiling of 8.0001 is 9 because the ceiling says to go upstairs. So now let's look at the following fact, which is actually a generalization of the classic pigeonhole principle. So let's suppose we have n objects and we are to place those n objects in k boxes. Then at least one box contains the ceiling of n over k objects or more, and another box contains the floor of n over k objects or fewer. So let's do a quick example to see why that is true. So let's take eight objects and let's place them into three boxes, and we're going to do it semi-randomly. So let's take this first object, we'll place it into this first box. And so let's draw this object occurring in this box. So there we've got it. Then maybe we'll take this second object and we'll place it in the third box. So there it is there. Then maybe this third object will be in this second box. And now let's keep going. This fourth object, let's put it in the third box. Let's say this fifth object goes back to the first box. And then maybe this sixth object goes into the last box. Okay, so there's my object there. And then let's say this next one, this seventh object, will go into our second box. And then finally, the last object, the eighth object, is placed into our first box. Okay, so now let's notice that this first and this third box both contain three objects. But how many is three in terms of eight and three? Well, it's gonna be the ceiling of eight over three. So like I said, this contains the ceiling of eight over three equals three objects. And we're guaranteed for something like this to happen by our fact over here. Well, we're really guaranteed for there to be a box with this many objects or more. But, but in this case, we have exactly this many objects. And now let's look at what we have right here. So this has two objects, and two objects is the floor of 8 over 3. So this one has the floor of 8 over 3, or two objects. And we're guaranteed for a box to have that many objects, or fewer, again, by this portion of our fact. Okay, so now that we've investigated this fact, let's look at the classical pigeonhole principle and then do several examples. Now we're ready to look at a special case of our general fact, which is classically known as the pigeonhole principle. So let's suppose we place n objects into k boxes. Then if n is larger than k, then at least one box contains more than one object. And towards our general statement, that's because, and that's because if n is bigger than k, then n over k is strictly larger than one. So when we take the ceiling, you get something bigger than or equal to two. And then if n is less than k, then at least one box is empty. And that's because, again, if n is less than k, then n over k is less than one strictly, which means when you take the floor, you get zero. Okay, so now let's look at an example. Let's suppose we have six distinct integers and they're between 0 and 9. Then we'd like to show that two of them must add to 9. Okay, so we've got six objects. Those six objects are the six integers. And we'd like to place them into less than six boxes. And so likely it'll be exactly five boxes because for these introductory examples, you generally have one less box than objects, forcing two objects in a single box. Okay, so what might those boxes be? Well, there's a big hint built into this based off of the fact that we want two of them to add up to nine. So those boxes are based upon pairs of numbers that add up to nine. 
Okay, so let's get to it. So let's distribute our six integers among the boxes described as follows. So our first box will contain the numbers zero and nine. Our second box will contain the numbers one and eight. Our third box, two and seven. Our fourth box, three and six. And finally, our fifth box will contain the numbers four and five. So we've got one, two, three, four, five boxes. We are to put six integers inside of these five boxes. So that means we're guaranteed two of these integers land in the same box. So let's write that down. So we are guaranteed to have two integers in the same box. But let's notice if those two integers lie in the same box, then since they are distinct, they're non-equal in the same box, which means they sum to nine. So let's write that out. These sum to nine. And that's really all there is to it. You could write this down a little bit more carefully, but I'll maybe leave that as an exercise. We'll write down a solution to the following examples, which are a little bit more complicated more carefully, so you can use those as a guide. Okay, let's move on. Now we're gonna look at a very classic example. So a version of this example generally is inside of any proof writing book that I've seen that covers the pigeonhole principle. So let's suppose we have n plus one integers. I'll call them a1 up to a n plus one. And then our goal is to show that we can find two of those integers so that their sum or their difference is a multiple of two n. So I've written that carefully as show that we can find i not equal to j between one and n plus one such that a i minus a j or a i plus a j is a multiple of two n. Okay, so how are we going to do this? Now this being a multiple of 2n gives us motivation to divide each of these numbers by 2n and keep the remainder. And this may not seem super obvious at the moment, but as you'll see moving forward, anytime we're trying to show something as a multiple of something else, it's common to look at the remainder when dividing by that number. Okay, so anyway, let's get to it. So like I said, we wanna divide each of these AIs by two N and keep the remainder. So let's define a new set of numbers. So for all one less than or equal to I less than or equal to two N, let's define RI by the following equation. So we have AI equals two N times QI plus RI where ri comes from the set between 0 and 2n, but it's not allowed to be 2n. Okay, so this is something called the division algorithm, which we talked about in a previous video. So let's just point out here, this is the remainder, or these are the remainders of the ai when divided by 2n. So what's nice about this is it takes a set of integers that can be really of any size and it restricts them down to a set of integers between zero and two n. So that's pretty nice. Okay, so now we're gonna look at two cases, two disjoint cases, I should say. So that first case will be the following. So let's suppose we have i not equal to j such that ri is equal to rj. Okay, nice. So that's definitely a possibility. And you might say, well, this is a super restrictive possibility, and maybe it is, but we'll cover all other possibilities with case two, which as we'll see will be essentially not case one. Okay, so now what we'll do is either look at the sum or the difference. And maybe you'd like to play with it, but I think looking at the difference is maybe the obvious thing to do here. So I'll write it like this. So now let's note that AI minus AJ in this case is equal to, well, we'll write AI and AJ using this formula right here, which we've derived for them. So we have 2NQI plus RI, and then minus 2NQJ plus RJ. But by our assumption, RI and RJ are the same. So that means when we take RI minus RJ, those cancel. 
And thus, we can factor a 2n out of what's left over, and we have 2n times qi minus qj. So what does that mean? So we've got qi minus qj is 2n times something, so that means ai minus aj is a multiple of 2n. And now that'll bring us to our second case. So we just looked at the first case of this proof, and now we're ready to look at the second case. Let's recall the first case was there is an i not equal to j such that ri equals rj. We haven't used the pigeonhole principle yet, so hopefully we use that in this second case. But this second case will be exactly not the condition on the first case. But luckily, we've done some work in the past of negating statements. So let's negate the setup of the first case. So we have this existential quantifier, there exists i not equal to j, so that's going to turn into a universal quantifier. So for all i not equal to j, we have this statement is not true. So ri is not equal to rj. But now we've got n plus 1 numbers, r1 through rn plus 1, that we'd like to put into n boxes, or n or less boxes, to use the pigeonhole principle. So let's figure out what those boxes are. So let's start by, we'll distribute the n plus 1 numbers, let's see, r1, r2, all the way up to rn plus 1, into the following boxes. And those boxes are going to be all pairs of remainders after dividing by 2n that add up to 2n. So this is taking motivation from that previous example that we did. Okay, so one pair would be 0 and 2n. And I guess we're saying that we need to do summing here because we did differencing or we did subtraction in the first case. And so that would be a pair of remainders that add up to 2n. And then next, we would have 1 and 2n minus 1. And then I'm going to put a general one in here, k and 2n minus k. And then the next to last one would be n minus 1 and n plus 1. And then the final one would be n and n. But there's something that's a little bit fishy with these boxes. First of all, since these ri's are remainders after dividing by 2n, we know they must be strictly less than 2n. They're between 0 and 2n. We can include 0, but we cannot include 2n. So that means this is an impossibility. But that's actually not a huge deal. What is a huge deal is that we have n plus 1 total boxes at the moment. But we've got n plus 1 objects, so that doesn't help us out at all. So what we'd like to do is somehow throw away one of those boxes. And indeed we can. We can throw away this last box where both of the remainders are equal to n, and that's because we have this assumption right here that the remainders are different. So that means we can scrub away that possibility, and we in fact have n boxes. So we've got n plus 1 objects to put into n boxes. That means two of those objects are guaranteed to be in the same box. Okay, so let's write that down a little bit more carefully. So we have i, j, and k such that r, i, and r, j come from the box or the set, it would be k and 2n minus k. And here I guess I should say i is not equal to j. Okay, so that would be like r i and r j coming from the same box. Okay, but now one of these is going to be k and one of these is going to be 2n minus k. So maybe let's just without loss of generality assume that r i is equal to k and r j is equal to 2n minus k. Again, they cannot be the same by our assumption right here. Okay, so that's good. Now, since we looked at the difference before, in this case, we will look at the sum. So let's look at I, AI plus AJ. So that's going to be 2N times QI plus RI. Let's recall that RI is equal to K by our assumption. And then we'll have plus 2N QJ plus RJ, which is 2N minus K by, by our assumption. 
But now we get some nice simplification. This K here cancels with this K here. And then everything else is a multiple of 2n, making the sum a multiple of 2n. And we can explicitly write it as the following multiple of 2n. We have 2n times qi plus qj and then plus 1 from factoring the 2n out of this term right here. So in the end, we have ai plus aj is a multiple of 2n. So let's see, these two cases are disjoint and they make up all possibilities. In the first case, we saw that the difference of these two numbers was a multiple of 2n. In the second case, we saw that the sum of two of the numbers was a multiple of 2n. So that proves this claim up here, which was our, maybe like I said, very classic example. Okay, let's do another. Now we have what is one of my newly favorite examples for the pigeonhole principle. So let's see the setup. Let's suppose we have 101 natural numbers whose sum is 300 and we'll place all of those numbers on a circle. And then our goal is to show that we can find a consecutive sequence of these numbers whose sum is 200. Okay, so I've laid out a picture here just to get us started. So I have my circle, and I have my 101 numbers, which I have noted as A1, A2, A3, so on and so forth, up to A101. So since they're on a circle, we have A101 next to A1. That will be important moving forward. So let's see the proof here. So since we're trying to find a consecutive sequence whose sum is 200, that motivates us to look at the partial sums. So let's do that. And we'll define the sequence of partial sums. So let's consider the sequence of partial sums, which I'll write as SM, and that's going to be A1 plus A2 ending at AM. And we can define these for all M between 1 and 101. So let's, for instance, notice that S1 is equal to A1, S2 is equal to A1 plus A2, and finally up to S101 is the sum of all of these numbers, which we are assuming to be 300. So S101 is, in fact, 300. That'll be a good bit of information. So now let's take these 101 numbers and put them in 100 boxes. We just have to figure out which boxes to put them in or how to define those boxes. But the definition of those boxes is hinted towards by the fact that we have a 300 here and a 200 here. And what's common about 300 and 200? Well, they're both multiples of 100. They both end in 0, 0. So I think that gives us some motivation to define the boxes by the final two digits of a number. And in fact, there are 100 possibilities for the final two digits of a number. We've got 100 numbers, so that means we've got one more possibility of numbers than possibility of final digits. So that's really good. Okay, so now let's put these 101 numbers, and let's just write those numbers out, S1, S2, up to S101, into the 100 boxes, which are defined as, maybe, like I said, by the final two digits. So I'll write them like this. So my first box, I'll write as star zero, zero. We don't care what it starts with, but it ends with zero, zero. The next one will be star zero, one. The next one will be star zero, two. We would end with star nine, nine. So two of these must be in the same box. So what that means is that we have an SN and an SN plus K that are in the same box, but being in the same box means they are of the form star AB. In other words, they end in the same digit. Now you might say, well, why did I write SN and SN plus K instead of like SN and S some other index? Well, I think it's helpful here to notice that these two will have different indices. One of the indices will be larger, so it kind of makes sense to write the larger one as an extension of the smaller one. Okay, great. Now I'd like to make a really quick observation, which I think is pretty obvious here, and that is Sn plus K is strictly bigger than Sn. And that's because we have at natural numbers we're adding together here, and Sn plus K is further in this sequence of partial sums. 
Now let's look at the difference of Sn plus K and Sn. So let's write it like this. So let's notice that Sn plus K minus Sn is of the form star zero zero. And that's because they end in the same two digits. But since they end in the same two digits, when we take their difference, their difference will end in zero, zero. But that actually restricts the possible values. So they cannot be the same, so they can't just be equal to zero. And we know that for sure because Sn plus K is strictly bigger than Sn. But they cannot be equal to 300 or larger than 300. They can't be bigger than or equal to 300 because the sum of all of the numbers is 300. Well, that only leaves two possibilities, but that means that this difference, Sn plus K minus Sn, comes from the set 100 or 200. But that's gonna break us down into two cases. Well, if they're equal to 100 or if they're equal to 200. Let's look at this first case where they're equal to 200. That one's actually easier. Okay, so case number one, which is Sn plus K minus Sn equals to 200. But we could rewrite that as 200 equals Sn plus K minus Sn, but by the partial sum definition of these S's, that'll end up giving us a n plus one plus a n plus two plus all the way up to a n plus k. In other words, we have consecutive numbers along this circle that add up to 200. And I could draw them on the circle like this. Maybe a n is right here, a n plus one is right here, all the way up to a n plus k is right here, and then maybe the next one might, might be important also, a n plus k plus one. So here what we did is we added from a n plus one up to a n plus k and we got the number 200. But of course that's for this first case where they sum to 200. Now we need to look at the second case where they sum to 100. So we just looked at the first case which is when s n plus k minus s n was equal to 200. And in that case we got this string of terms summed together starting at a n plus one ending at a n plus k equal to 200. 200, which showed that we had the right kind of consecutive sequence. But now we're gonna look at the other case and show that we can get a consecutive sequence in that case as well. But let's notice if Sn plus K minus Sn equals 100, then by what we saw previously, that means that An plus one plus An plus two ending at An plus K equals 100. In other words, this sum from here to here is equal to 100. But if that sum from there to there is equal to 100 and the sum around the whole circle is equal to 300, that means the sum of the remaining stuff from here all the way around to here is equal to 200. Again, because simply 300 minus 100 is equal to 200. So we can now put that into words as follows. So we'll observe that 200 is the same thing as 300 minus 100. So I think that's pretty obvious. We can write 300 as A1 plus A2 ending at A101. And then we can write this 100 as this sum right here. So we have AN plus one ending at AN plus K. Great. But now taking but now performing that, we get the following sum. I'll maybe start it right here and then loop around. So we'll have a n plus k plus one added all the way up to a 101. So that would be from here to here. And then plus a one all the way up to a n. So we have 200 is equal to that, but that's another consecutive sum of terms along this circle. So either way you look at it, we are able to get a consecutive sequence along the circle whose sum is 200. Okay, let's look at another one. So for our last pigeonhole principle example, it's kind of geometric, I think that's nice. So let's say nine points are placed in an isosceles right triangle with side length one. So I've drawn the triangle here. We've like, like I said, we've got an isosceles right triangle, side length is one then our goal is to show that three of them form a triangle whose area is at most one eighth. So let's maybe notice that the area of this entire triangle is one half. That's because it's one half base times height. 
So that gives us motivation to split this up into four pieces. Four pieces because one eighth is one quarter of one half. So furthermore, we hope that we can split this into four nice pieces. So let's see if we can split it into four pieces, all of which are isosceles right triangles. And in fact, we can. Let's split each of these into half. So we'll split each of these legs into half and then we'll make line segments connecting them like this to the hypotenuse. Now let's note that since those are split in half, we have a length of a half here, length of a half here, this is a length of a half and this is a length of a half. So this triangle right here that I'm shading in brown has area 1 8 and so does this one right here that I'm leaving unshaded. But that didn't split this into four pieces that are the same. We've got two triangles and one square. But we can split that square into two triangles as well. Maybe we'll split it into two triangles like this, although we could split it across the other diagonal as well. And now let's notice we have split this into four equal triangles that are all isosceles triangles with side length one half. Then furthermore, let's notice that we've got four boxes here, if you will. The boxes are triangles, and we're trying to put nine points into each of those four boxes. We're guaranteed to have three points end up in one of these boxes but those three points will make a triangle and that triangle can't at most have area of the entire triangle that it lives within, but the entire area of the triangle that it lives within is 1 8th. So that's a sketch of how to do this. Now let's write it out. So maybe we would use the following words. Let's partition, partition the triangle into four similar isosceles right triangles with side length one half uh, per the diagram. I think it's fair to say that we're explaining what's going on with this diagram over here. Then next, so of the nine points, three are guaranteed by the pigeonhole principle, but maybe we don't need to say by the pigeonhole principle explicitly. Well, especially since I'm saying it out loud here. So of the nine points, three are guaranteed to be placed in the same sub-triangle. So by sub-triangle, I mean either this one right here, this one right here, this one right here, or this one right here. Okay, well, let's also maybe like give a name to those points. So let's call them A, B, C. Great. So again, that's by the pigeonhole principle. And now we can maybe note the following. So the area of triangle ABC is less than the area of the subtriangle. The subtriangle is an isosceles right triangle with side length one half, and that has an area of one eighth. But now we've done, we've done exactly what we wanted to. We found three points that form a triangle whose area is at most one eighth. Okay, so now let's move on to some combinatorial proofs. So to put it simply, a combinatorial proof involves showing two expressions are equal by showing they are answers to the same counting problem. So we've done this one in a previous video, but I thought I'd do it again, just because now we're talking about combinatorial proofs, you know, officially. Okay, so let's show for all natural numbers n and k, where k lies between one and n, we have n plus one choose k is equal to n choose k minus one plus n choose k. And so let's quickly recall that n plus one choose k is equal to the number of k element subsets of an n plus one element set. But we might as well like write down an explicit n plus one element set. And I'll write zero, one, two, three, ending at n. So I think that clearly has n plus one elements because we are including zero here. Okay, so that's the left-hand side of this proposed equation. Now we'd like to count the number of k element subsets of 0 to n another way to achieve the right-hand side. And we can do it as follows. So let's suppose that a is a subset of 0, 1 up to n where 
the cardinality of A equals K. So in other words, it's a K element subset of our set right here. And now let's notice that there are two possibilities for A. So I'll write those down as cases. So case number one and case number two. So case number one is that zero is an element of A. Okay, well, so if zero is an element of A, then we can write A as follows. It's equal to the singleton zero disjoint union. So I'm gonna introduce some notation here. We have a union with a dot there. That means disjoint union, which means these two elements will not overlap. So it'll be disjoint union A prime, where A prime is a subset of one, two up to K, up to N. So it's a subset of one up to N. So in fact, what we're really just doing here is using the fact that zero is an element of A, we're pulling zero out of A, and we're seeing what's left over. So let's also note that the size of A prime now is K minus one. And we can see that because we've taken a single element out of A prime. Okay, so that's good. So how many such A prime are there? Well, it's really easy to count because all we have to do is count K minus one element subsets of an N element set. So there are N choose K minus one such A prime, but the A prime completely determine the A in this case because we're assuming that A contains zero, thus A in this case when A contains zero. Okay, so let's just reiterate what we've done right here. We have A is a subset of zero to N. In this first case, we have zero as an element of A, which is definitely a possibility. And then we've shown that there are N choose K minus one such A's. So there are N choose K minus one subsets that contain zero. Okay, well, let's look at the next case. And the next case will be, well, what happens if A is not containing zero? So zero does not, so zero is not an element of A. But if zero is not an element of A, then that means that A is just plainly a subset of one to N. Okay, but how many elements are in A? Well, there are K elements in A. That's kind of our assumption from the very beginning. Okay, but how many such A's are there in this case? Well, that's easy to count as well because A is a K element subset of an N element set. So there are N choose K such A's. Great, but this covers all different cases. So if we have a subset of zero to N minus, of zero to N, then it either contains zero or it does not contain zero. In the case that it contains zero, there are N choose K minus one of them. In the case that it does not contain zero, there are N choose K of them. So we've counted the number of K element subsets of this a different way. So by definitions, so by definition, it's equal to N plus one choose K, but by this other counting procedure, it's equal to the sum of these two. So putting this all together, we have N plus one choose K is equal to N choose K minus one from case one plus N choose K from case two. Okay, let's do another. Okay, so for our next one, we'll show for all natural numbers n and k, where k is between zero and n. I guess that really makes k perhaps not a natural number, but a non-negative integer, but you know, we'll let it slide in this case. So with that setup, we have n choose k is equal to n choose n minus k. So we're gonna note that n choose k is the number of subsets of one to n with k elements. So maybe we'll start with a subset from the set containing one up to n with k elements. So that's what I'll write down here. Suppose we have a, which is the subset of one to n, where the number of elements of a is k. Okay. Now let's notice that we have the number of elements of A complement is equal to N minus K because it's the number of elements of the universal set, which is understood to be one to N in this case, minus the number of elements of A. So I think we saw this in a previous video or this kind of formula in a previous video. So we have N minus K. So that defines a unique pairing. So I'll write this down. So we have a unique pairing of sets A with their complement A complement. 
which means if there is a certain number of possible sets of the form A, then there are a certain number of possible sets of the form A complement. So how many sets are there of the form A? Well, the only thing restricting A is that it must have K elements. So that means the possible, value, the possible types of sets A here are in choose K. But then how many possible sets are there like A complement? Well, the only thing governing A complement is that it has N minus K elements. So how many sets are there with N minus K elements? Well, there are N choose N minus K. And again, since this pairing is unique, we must have equality between these two choices of types of sets. Okay, we're gonna do one more. So for our final example, we'll look at a nice combinatorial proof of a fairly famous sum identity. And that says the sum as k goes from zero to n of n choose k squared is two n choose n. Sometimes this is known as a central binomial coefficient just by the way. So let's maybe look at a little example of this real quick, although we won't work out all of the details. Let's say we have n equals four. So that means we'll have four choose zero squared plus four choose one squared plus up to four choose four squared must be equal to eight choose four. Now you can check that that works out if you'd like to, but really there's kind of no point because we're about to prove it in general. So I think a good first strategy is to look at one side of the equation, which we can easily write down what it means combinatorially and show that the other side of the equation also counts that type of object. Okay, so let's do that as follows. So let's note that 2n choose n equals the number of n element subsets of a 2n element set, which I'll call 1, 2, up to 2n. Okay, so that's a good first observation to make. Then let's notice that the parts of this sum are counting the number of k element subsets of an n element set and we're squaring them, which, so I think that motivates us to split this 2n element set into two n element sets. So let's maybe do that with the following observation. So if x is a subset of one, two, up to two n, with the number of elements in x is equal to n, then we can write x as the disjoint union of a, b, so I'm using that notation again, where a is a subset of one up to n, where the number of elements in a is k, and b is a subset of n plus one up to two n, where again, b, has n minus k elements. Okay, so I think this is looking good, and I think that motivates our final, what I'll call calculation. So let's do it here. We have 2n choose n is equal to number of n element subsets of one up to n. Okay, let's maybe put a yellow box around that but that'll be equal to the sum as k goes from zero to n of the number of the number of k element subsets of one to n. That's like deciding the number of ways to choose this subset a, and then times, times the number of n minus k element subsets of n plus one to two n. That's like choosing the number of ways that we can pick this subset B. Great, and then of course we're taking a sum here by the sum principle. So we would sum over where we had a zero element subset A and an n element subset B, all the way up to having an n element subset A and a zero element subset B. Okay, but now we can count each of these orange and red boxes using like the definition of the binomial coefficient. This gives us the sum as k goes from zero up to n of n choose k times n choose n minus k. But by our previous example, we know that n choose n minus k is the same thing as n choose k. So in the end, we get n choose k times itself or n choose k squared. Okay, that's good. Now I'm gonna leave you with some warm-ups. So now I've got two warm-up problems for you. So the first is to, well, suppose you're in a class of 17 students. So that includes yourself. 
then you'd like to show that at least three of you were born on the same day of the week. So this is like a pigeonhole principle problem. And then next, let's find a combinatorial proof of the famous identity for triangular numbers. That says 1 plus 2 plus 3 ending at n is n plus 1 choose 2. So there are many different ways to prove this, but here we want to look for a combinatorial proof. And that's a good place to stop. This is the 10th video in a series devoted to introductory proof writing. And today we're going to talk about mathematical results, kind of the terminology behind mathematical results. And then we're gonna start learning how to prove conditional statements. Okay, so there are lots of different names for mathematical results. And in fact, there's a bit of a hierarchy to these results that it's useful to know a little bit about. Although just be aware that this isn't really a strict hierarchy. So a lemma can be thought of as a very, very small result, but not really a small result that stands on, stands on its own, but it's generally thought of as a building block for a theorem or a building block for a step in a proof of a theorem. And then often theorems are such big results that you'd like to look at some very special cases of a theorem or look at something that follows very quickly from a theorem and that's called a corollary. And then furthermore, if you have a result that's not quite as big as a theorem, whatever that means, you might call it a proposition. Now, kind of on the level of proposition, you have these other names of results, claim or observation. Often a claim is something inside of a proof, but it doesn't have to be. In fact, when I was in grad school, I had a professor use the name meditation for a result in class once. I thought that was pretty funny. And now a result that we don't know if it's true or false is called a conjecture. So all of these are known to be true. So there are proofs of every theorem, proposition, lemma, corollary, and so on and so forth. So if we, as the mathematical community, are calling a result a theorem, proposition, lemma, so on and so forth, then it has a proof and it is known to be true. So something that does not have a proof is called a conjecture. But often some of this stuff has historical naming to it. Like, for example, Zorn's lemma is equivalent to the axiom of choice, but that kind of makes it a fairly large result, but it's called Zorn's lemma. And I'm sure there are other examples of things like that that have historical names, even though the size of the result maybe doesn't match the naming convention. So here are some examples of results. So the first one says, if the sum as n goes from 1 to infinity of a sub n converges, then the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n is equal to 0. So if a series converges, then its terms go to 0. So this is an example of a conditional statement. So it's of the form p implies q. So the statement p would be the series converges, and that implies the statement q, which is that this limit is equal to 0. Let's look at another example. So you probably learned this other example in a linear algebra class. It says an n by n matrix A is invertible if and only if its null space contains only the zero vector. So if this is an example of a biconditional statement. We would read the, this as P if and only if Q. And then there are also non-conditional statements, such as the harmonic series, which is the sum as n goes from 1 to infinity of 1 over n diverges. Notice this isn't of the form if p then q. That's a non-conditional statement. So we'll learn how to prove conditional, biconditional, and non-conditional statements in this course. But that being said, we will start with conditional statements. But before we can get off the ground, we really need an explosion of very basic definitions to work off of. And so let's get those on the board. Okay, now we've got a boatload of basic definitions which we'll use in order to start our very basic proofs. And I don't think it's reasonable to memorize all these definitions right now. You'd probably just like to keep them written down somewhere near you or kind of at the ready to use whenever you see them within some sort of result that we're trying to prove. Okay, so let's maybe just go through them one by... <clears throat> okay, so let's go through them one at a time. So an integer n is even if n is equal to 2k for some k, which is an integer. So it's a multiple of 2. An integer n is odd if it's of the form 2k plus 1 for some k in the integers. The parity of an integer is its evenness or its oddness. So we would say that the parity of 5 is odd. 
Or maybe we would say the parity of five is one, but that's kind of getting ahead of ourselves. So M and N have the same parity if they're both even or they are both odd. So three and five have the same parity. M and N have opposite parity if one is even and the other is odd. For example, 19 and 100 have opposite parity. Next, if we've got two integers A and B, we say that A divides B and we write, well, I'm gonna read this A divides B, but it's A and a vertical line B if there is a D such that B is equal to A times D. So there's some dual way of saying this. So if A divides B, then B is a multiple of A. So sometimes we'll be saying B is a multiple of A, and sometimes we'll be saying A divides B, but those have the same meaning. Next, we say a natural number P, which is not equal to one, is prime if its only divisors are one and P. So like, for example, 17 is prime. Next, we say a natural number was, which is not equal to one is composite if it's not prime. And in fact, all composites can be written of the form A times B, where A and B are strictly between one and N, where N is that composite number. You might notice that neither of these definitions say anything about, well, what happens if we're talking about the number one itself? That's, that's because it plays a special role. One is called the unit of the natural numbers. So I didn't write that down here, but I'll just say it out loud. One is the unit of the natural numbers. So in general, in larger number systems, if you will, there are units, composites, and primes, or sometimes those primes become irreducibles. So those are your three types of numbers in larger number systems. So it's just kind of a bummer that within the natural numbers, there's only one unit. So it seems to be playing this unique role, whereas in other number systems, more objects are units. Okay, so moving on to the next two definitions. So given two integers a and b, we say that d is the greatest common divisor of a and b, and we write it as d equals gcd a b. If d divides a and d divides b, so it's a common divisor, and then it's gotta be the biggest common divisor, but we encode that using divisibility. So if we have another common divisor c, so c divides a and c divides b, then c divides d. So that ensures that d is the largest such common divisor. Then what about the least common multiple? That's like dual to the notion of the greatest common divisor. So we'll say that L is the least common multiple and we'll write L equals LCM AB. If A divides L, B divides L. And if A divides M and B divides M, then L divides M. So this condition over here ensures that L is both a multiple of A and B. But then this condition here ensures that if we have another multiple, it is larger. Okay, so like I said, we probably don't need to memorize these just yet, although after doing lots of examples, you'll hopefully internalize all of these definitions. But we'd like to be able to unpack and repack these definitions as needed for our basic. Now we're ready to start writing down some very, very basic proofs. We're gonna start with what's called the method of direct proof, which is used to prove conditional statements like if P then Q, or P implies Q symbolically. And so in fact, I think there's this nice outline that we can use for inspiration of how to write this proof in the first place. My suggestion would be to essentially follow this outline for your first several proofs, and then you can start maybe adding your own creative flavor to, to them. Okay. So let's say we've got this proposition, if P then Q. And P and Q can both be really, really complicated mathematical statements. But our goal is to show that one implies the other. So how does the proof go? So based off the truth table of the implication statement, P implies Q, which I'll let you review if you need to, what we'd like to do is suppose that P is a true statement and show that that leads to the truth of Q as a statement. So we'll just say right here, suppose P, and what the undertext there is we're supposing P is true. And then we end with thus Q, and the undertext there is thus Q is true. And in the middle, you know, it's gonna vary from proof to proof, but the general strategy will be to unpack the statement P via definitions. Probably since we're just starting it out, out it'll be one of those definitions that we just saw on the board. So what I mean by unpack with definitions, I mean rewrite what it means 
for P to be whatever we're saying it is into like some equations or something. And then we'll make the appropriate calculations and logical arguments to get to a point where we can repack into Q via definitions. Okay, so this is all well and good, but I think it's better just to look at some examples. Actually, it's probably best to look at a ton of examples and then try examples on your own and then revisit this outline so that you have a more holistic view on it. So that, in fact, would be my suggestion. Okay, so let's do this first example. We'll prove this simple proposition. If n is odd, then n squared is odd. So just going through some typical examples of odd numbers, this seems very true. So five is an odd number. Five times five is 25, which is an odd number. 11 is an odd number. 11 squared is 121, which is also an odd number. So it seems like we're good to go here, but let's write this proof down. So let's suppose that n is an integer and n is odd. Okay, so I filled in a little bit of the detail there. I said that it was an integer. That's kind of subtext of this statement, but that's okay. Now we'd like to unpack what it means to be odd via definitions. Well, we had a definition of that on the previous board. So that means, so we have, so I'll say, so we have a k, which is an integer, such that n is equal to 2 times k plus 1. That was our definition of oddness. But now we've written oddness as some sort of equation. And since we need to square n, that gives us something like meaty to like do some calculations with. Okay, so now let's go from there. Now we've kind of unpacked the left-hand side, the p statement, totally, and we can see what the right-hand side is saying. It's motivating us to square this thing. So let's do that. So I'll write it like this. So let's notice that n squared is equal to two times k plus one squared. That's because n is two k plus one. Then we can multiply this out to 4k squared plus 4k plus 1. But then notice that we've got something times 4, something times 4 plus 1. But 4 is an even number itself, so we can factor 2 out of each of those. So we can factor a 2 out of these first two, and that leaves us with 2k squared plus 2k plus 1. Okay, so let's see what we have. We have n squared is equal to 2 times something plus 1. So if we wanted to be super clear here, we could do that. And maybe we would use some language like observe that n squared equals 2 times a plus 1, where a is equal to 2k plus 2. Sorry, that should be 2k squared plus 2. And then we can repack this expression for n squared into the oddness of n squared. So we would end with thus n squared is odd. Because recall, by our definition, if a number can be written as 2 times something plus 1, it is odd. Okay, let's do another. For our next example, we'll prove that if n is a natural number, then the expression 1 plus negative 1 to the n times 2n minus 1 is a multiple of 4. Okay, well, this is not quite the same sort of conditional statement because there's nothing really to unpack of our hypothesis here. So our hypothesis is just that n is a natural number. Like I said, there's nothing to unpack there. But there is a little bit of motivation for how to proceed by the shape of this object that we have in the conclusion. Notice we have minus 1 to the n power. And let's recall that minus 1 to an even power is positive, whereas minus 1 to an odd power is negative. So this object seems to behave differently depending on the parity of n, the evenness or oddness of n. So that motivates us to look at those two cases separately. So let's do that. So we're still going to start the same way. So we'll su suppose that our hypothesis is satisfied. So we'll suppose that n is a natural number. And then we'll notice that this tells us that n is even or odd. So thus, n is even or n is odd. Because every natural number, in fact, every integer is either even or odd. And now we're going to split this into two cases. 
It's pretty typical to explicitly write down that we're splitting into cases like this. So case one will be maybe n is even. Whereas case two, I'll put it down here, I think that'll give me enough room, will be the case when n is odd. Now we wanna decompose what it means to be even or odd. Okay, so let's do it. So in this case, we have n equals 2k for some natural number k. And we know it's a natural number because we're starting within the natural numbers. So now let's plug that version of n into our expression, this being our expression. So maybe we'll use this language again. Notice that one plus negative one to the n times two n minus one now has the form one plus negative one to the two k times 4k minus one. It's 4k minus one because we have a two times n right here. Okay, but now let's notice that negative one to the 2k is definitely positive one, given that 2k is even. So this simplifies down to one plus 4k minus one, which is equal to four times k, which is a multiple of four. So we would maybe put a comma here and then note at the end a multiple of four. So at least in this case, when n is even, we have achieved that our expression is a multiple of four. Now let's do it in the case that n is odd. Okay, but notice that since we don't have all integers here, we'll need to use a slightly different expression for n being odd, and that will be of the form 2k minus one. That's because if we use 2k plus one, we can't achieve the odd natural number one. I'll let you think about that, but in the end, it's not that huge of a deal. Okay, so the case when n is odd. So in this case, we have n is equal to 2k minus one, for, like I said, some natural number k. And now we'll essentially do the same thing, but just with this value of n instead of the 2k value of n. So I'll use the same language. Notice that one plus negative one to the n times two n minus one in this case is equal to one plus negative one to the 2k minus one times so this is gonna end up being 4k minus, minus two minus one, right? So it's 4k minus two because if we multiply this thing by two, we get 4k minus two. Okay, but now let's do our calculation. This ends up being one minus 4k plus two plus one. That's because this object minus one to the 2k minus one is a negative one given that we have an odd exponent. But now putting this all together, we have four minus four K, which is the same thing as four times one minus K. But that's also a multiple of, of four. So either way we look at it, if N is even, we get a multiple of four, and if N is odd, we also get a multiple of four. So that's the end of this proof. Let's do another. For our next result, we'll prove that if m and n, which are integers, have the same parity, then their sum is always even. So this is going to, again, break down into two cases. So, and those cases are based off both being even or both being odd, but let's write that out. So let's suppose that m and n are both integers with the same Parity. So we're assuming that the hypothesis is true and just like we've been doing this whole time, we want to prove that that will imply the conclusion is true. Okay, so M and N are both even or both odd. That's exactly what it means for them to have the same parity. Now we'll split into cases. So case number one again, let's say M and N are both odd. So let's work through this. So what does this tell us? This tells us we can write m as 2a plus 1 and n as 2b plus 1 where a and b are integers. That's the definition of them each being odd. And now we'll notice that their sum will end up being even. So let's notice that m plus n is in this case 2a plus 1 plus 2b plus 1, 
But now we can put this all together and get two times a plus two times b plus two. Factor a two out, we get two times a plus b plus one, which is even. Great. So we showed that if we started with two odd numbers and we took their sum, we got an even number. And actually, I'll leave case two as a little bit of a homework exercise, but it should follow fairly similarly. Okay, so now we're gonna look at something called a contrapositive. For our next set of examples, we're gonna look at something known as a contrapositive proof. So let's recall that a conditional statement is logically equivalent to its contrapositive. So that means if we can prove that the contrapositive of a statement is true, that means that the original statement is also true. Well, let's recall what the contrapositive is in the first place. So if we have a conditional statement, P implies Q, its contrapositive is the statement not Q implies not P. And like I said, those are logically equivalent, which you can show with a truth table if you'd like to, but likely you did on your homework already. So what's the outline for a contrapositive proof? Well, it's just essentially a direct proof of the contrapositive of the statement. So there's nothing really there. Let's say we've got the statement, if P then Q, and so you would suppose not Q and then do calculations and whatever, just like we had talked about before, and end up with thus not P. And so this proof has shown not Q implies not P, which, like we've been saying, is logically equivalent to the original statement. But I think maybe the really important question here is how do you know whether to use a contrapositive proof or use just direct proof? And while there's no like tried and true method, the way that I think about it is the simplicity of the statements. So generally, it's easier to prove a statement if it starts with something simple in the hypothesis and you have something a little bit more complicated in the conclusion. So in other words, you're taking a simple statement implies a complicated statement. So if P is a simple statement and Q is a more complicated statement, you probably want to use the method of direct proof. Whereas if P is a complicated statement and Q is a simple statement, then you probably want to use the method of contrapositive proof. And that's because it essentially like changes the direction of this arrow. Of course, there's some negation there, but it takes you from simple to complicated when you weren't originally set up to do it that way. Okay, so we're gonna do a couple of examples starting with this one. So let's suppose that we have real numbers x and y, and now we wanna show that y cubed plus x squared y is less than or equal to x cubed plus xy squared implies that y is less than or equal to x. So this is a classic example of this thing that I was telling you down here. We've got a fairly complicated hypothesis and a very simple conclusion, which is kind of like backwards of what you would like. So we'll look at the contrapositive. Maybe let's write it out for this first one. We generally won't write it out, at least in the final proof. You might want to write it out in your scratch paper. So what does the contrapositive say? It says if y is not less than or equal to x, in other words, y is strictly bigger than x, then y cubed plus x squared y is strictly bigger than x cubed plus xy squared. So those non-strict inequalities changed directions and turned into strict inequalities. So this is the statement that we will prove. And often, at least when we're starting out, we'll indicate that we're proving something by contrapositive at the beginning of the proof. I'll just put it in parentheses. So contrapositive. Great. And that's mostly for the reader, but generally in higher level math classes, you wouldn't write that you were doing it by contrapositive. Okay. So now let's suppose that we have y bigger than x. So that's like supposing not q in this case. And now we want to work towards this inequality right here. But notice if y is bigger than x, we can immediately see that y minus x is bigger than zero. And x and y are both not zero. It's clear that they're both not zero or not both zero because if they were both zero, if we took their difference, we would get something that's zero. Okay, but if they're both not zero, then if you square them and add them together, you get a strictly positive number. So let's write that down. So thus, 
x squared plus y squared is a strictly positive number. Why do we want to look at x squared plus y squared? Well, the stuff over here on the right hand side seems like it looks like the stuff over here where we've multiplied by x squared plus y squared. Okay, so that motivates the following calculation. So I'll just write notice that we have y minus x times x squared plus y squared is bigger than zero times x squared plus y squared. So the inequality is inherited from this inequality right here, y minus x is bigger than zero, and the fact that we're multiplying by something positive. So that does not change the direction of the inequality. Okay, so after expanding out the left-hand side, hopefully we have something nice. So let's see what we have after expanding out the left-hand side. We'll have x squared y plus y cubed minus x cubed minus xy squared. And then over there on the right-hand side, we'll have zero because zero times anything is zero. But look at what we have. Everything which is a positive term is this stuff over here, and everything that's attached to a negative is this stuff on the right-hand side of the inequality. So when we move uh, the stuff, so when we move everything with a minus sign over, we get exactly our inequality, our not p statement. So we can just figure that, finish this off by saying thus x squared y plus y cubed is strictly bigger than x cubed minus xy squared. Sorry, that should be plus xy squared. But that's what we wanted to show. So that finishes the proof of this statement by contrapositive. Let's do another. So for our next result, we'll start off with two integers m and n, and we'll prove that if three does not divide m times n, then three does not divide m and three does not divide n. And we're gonna use the contrapositive again here. But the interesting thing about this is that our conclusion, which maybe I'll put in these orange brackets, this conclusion is an and statement. So that's pretty cool because we have to negate an and statement, which will turn into an or statement. Okay. So now let's suppose not Q, which in this case would be not this AND statement. So suppose that three divides M or three divides N. So that's by one of De Morgan's laws, right? And so saying three does not not divide M is the same thing as three divides M. Same thing for three and N. And then like I said, AND turns to an OR. Okay, but now let's notice that in our entire setup right here, M and N are playing in symmetric roles. But since they're playing in symmetric roles, it doesn't matter whether or not we decide that three divides M or three divides N. But there's a careful way of writing that down and that's using the phrase without loss of generality. So without loss of generality, we will assume that three divides M and then that's the same thing as saying that m is equal to three times k, where k is some integer. That's what it means to be divisible by three. So you have to be careful with this phrase without loss of generality, or also the tool which we'll learn later similarly, because they're not always applicable. You have to be really sure that it's the same calculation if you choose m to be a multiple of three or n to be a multiple of three, or that m and n are playing symmetric roles in your setup. So here we're okay. Okay, so now we have everything that we need to work towards the conclusion of the contrapositive statement, which should be the negation of three does not divide m n. So that means we're trying to get to three divides m n. In other words, m n is a multiple of three. Okay, so let's look at m n. So maybe we'll just say observe that so m times n is now equal to three times k times n by replacing m with three k by our setup, but that's equal to three times n k. But since m n is a multiple of three, we can say that three divides m n as needed. And that finishes this proof off. 
Okay, we're gonna look at one more basic definition, which we weren't quite ready to put in that big list at the beginning. And then we'll do a proof with that definition, and then we'll end with some warm-up exercises. So this next example plays a very important role in elementary number theory, and it's another useful thing to have under our belts for doing basic proofs. So given integers a and b, and then a natural number n, we'll say that a and b are congruent modulo n if n divides a minus b. So in other words, a minus b is a multiple of n. Later, we'll see that that's equivalent to a and b having the same remainder when dividing by n. That'll be a nice um, homework exercise. And then in this case, will write, well, I'm gonna read this as a is congruent to b mod n, but this is the notation here. We have this triple equal sign here, and then in parentheses, mod n. So let's look at some quick examples. So 12 is congruent to two mod five. That's because five divides 12 minus two. Of course, 12 minus two is equal to 10. 34 is congruent to negative two mod nine. It's really important to consider negative numbers mod n as well. Sometimes that'll be super helpful. And that's because 9 divides 34 minus negative 2. 34 minus negative 2 is, of course, 34 plus 2, which is 36. That's a multiple of 9. Then 57 is congruent to 0 mod 3. So notice 3 times 10 is equal to 30. 3 times 9 is equal to 27. That means 3 times 19 is equal to 57. Notice 57 would also be 0 mod 19. Finally, if we have two numbers that are incongruent mod n, we say, well, like I said, we say they are incongruent or not congruent mod n, and we would write it like this. So with this slash uh, through the triple equal sign. So we would read that as 13 is not congruent to five mod three. Okay, so here's a nice first example of calculations that you might do with congruence mod n. So let's suppose that a and b are congruent mod n. Then we wanna show that a squared and b squared are congruent mod n. Okay, so this is a conditional, a p implies q statement. Let's suppose that the hypothesis is true. So let's suppose that a is congruent to b modulo n. And now we're gonna unpack this all the way to an equation. So this will take a couple of steps. So thus, um, n divides a minus b, and what I really mean by that is that a minus b is equal to n times k for some integer k. So let's see, we did a stepwise unpacking of this definition. So we started with a is congruent to b mod n, we moved that to n divides a minus b, but if n divides a minus b, a minus b is a multiple of n, so we can write a minus b as n times something. Okay, great. But now we'd like to get at a squared and b squared. But since these are on opposite sides of the congruence and these are on the same side of the equation, perhaps we'd like to move some things around. So maybe we'd rewrite this as a equals b plus nk. But then how would we write that in language? Well, maybe we'll just say that we will write a equals b plus n, n times k and then we'll say observe or notice or something that this calculation will finish us off. So we've got a squared is the same thing as b plus n times k squared, but, but multiplying that out gives us b squared plus two times b times n times k plus n squared k squared. But the important thing is that all of this stuff here is a multiple of n. So that means we can write the following. a squared minus b squared is equal to n times, it'll be two times b times k, and then plus n times k squared. But that's the same thing as saying n divides a squared minus b squared. We have a squared minus b squared is a multiple of n. But n dividing a squared minus b squared is the same thing as saying a squared is congruent to b squared modulo n, which is exactly where we wanted to end up. Okay, so that's good. Now I'll leave you with some warm-up exercises. So I've got four warm-up exercises for you. So the first is to read section 5.3 of the Book of Proof. So the class that I'm teaching based around this material is using the Book of Proof. I think section 5.3 is a really nice take on the style of mathematical writing. 
Then for number two, let's show that if we've got integers m and n that are the same parity, then 5m minus 1 and n plus 10 do not have the same parity. Next, let's show that if we have integers x and y, if x squared plus 2 times y minus 1 is even, then x is even and y is odd. And finally, show that if we've got integers a and b, then a plus b cubed is congruent to a cubed plus b cubed mod 3. Now, I'll just say that we have the methods of direct proof and contrapositive proof to work with for all of these examples. And that's a good place to stop. This is the 11th video in a series devoted to introductory proof writing. In the previous video, we looked at proving conditional and non-conditional statements. And when proving conditional statements, we used the direct proof method as well as proof by contrapositive. Today, we're going to look at proving conditional and non-conditional statements via contradiction. So let's look at a quick outline of a proof by contradiction, and then we're going to do a bunch of examples. So let's say we want to prove a proposition P. So P is some mathematical statement. It might be a conditional statement. It might be an existential statement. It might be something else. So what we'll initially do is suppose that P is not true. So this seems like we're kind of giving up the game. If we want to prove that something is true, why would we start our proof by supposing that it's false? Well, that's where the big trick is. What we'll do after supposing that it's false is follow that line of logic until we come up with a contradiction. So this should actually read not C and C. And that's obviously a contradiction. It's impossible for a statement C to be both false and true at the same time. But if we got a contradiction from assuming that P is false, then that means it's impossible for it to be false. In other words, it must be true. So that's how this whole thing works. Okay, so that being said, I think really we need to look at several examples and then after which you need to get your hands dirty with some of your own proofs by contradiction. So we're going to start with a very classic one, and that is the square root of 2 is irrational. So let's see how we can do this. Obviously, we're going to use a proof by contradiction because that's the whole game today. Okay, so I like to use the following kind of language when doing a proof by contradiction, although you can come up with your own language. I like to say something like, towards a contradiction, we assume that the square root of 2 is rational. That means we can write it as a over b, where a and b are integers, and we might as well assume that this is a fraction in lowest terms. So that means that a and b share no factors, which is the same thing as saying that their GCD is equal to 1. So we'll say here the GCD of a and b is 1. So part of this, this equation right here, is not the square root of 2 is irrational because if we take the not of that statement, we see that the square root of 2 would be rational. But being rational means that you can be written as the ratio of integers. And then by the structure of the rational numbers, we know that we can always write a rational number in lowest terms. That's what this GCD of 1 stuff is. Okay, so now we want to take this assumption and then hopefully work it towards some sort of impossibility. Okay, so let's get started. So if the square root of 2 equals AB, then we see that 2 times B squared is equal to A squared. So we can get that by multiplying both sides by B and then squaring both sides. Okay, but look at this. We have 2 times b squared equals a squared. That means a squared is even. But if a squared is even, then a is even. So let's write this down. So a squared is even, and thus a is even. So you probably established that result in your homework exercises or something. OK, so we know that a is even. But now we can decode a being even into an equation. So let's do that. So now let's write a as 2 times c, where c is some integer. 
right? So that's the definition of e evenness. And then plugging this expression for A into our equation right here will actually bring us to an immediate problem. So maybe I'll extend this sentence and say leading to 2b squared equals a squared, but that's equal to 2 times c quantity squared, but that's equal to 4 times c squared. But notice that we can divide both sides by 2, and that leaves us with b squared is equal to 2c squared. But that means b squared is even, and thus b is even. So maybe let's just write and so b is even. But let's see, what do we have? We have a is even and b is also even. But since a and b are both even, they're both divisible by two. But if they're both divisible by two, their GCD is at least two. So we can say, so since uh, two divides a and two divides b, we have two divides the GCD of A and B, right? So that's the, kind of the definition of the GCD. But let's recall that we started with the GCD of A and B is one. So this ends with the statement two divides one because one is the GCD of A and B, but that's a contradiction because two clearly does not divide one. One itself is not an even number. So we got ourselves to a contradiction, but that finishes everything off because what did we contradict? We contradicted our original assumption way up here that the square root of two was rational. So if the square root of two cannot be rational, it must be irrational. All right, let's do another. For our second example, we've got another very classic result, and that's on the infinitude of primes. This is based off of Euclid's original proof of this statement. So let's see, our proposition is that there are infinitely many primes. So again, we're gonna to work towards a contradiction. Here maybe we'll use a little bit different language by way of contradiction. And I'd like to point out while we're at it that often if you're making notes or if you're doing a rough draft of a proof, you might shorten by way of contradiction to BWOC. So often when I'm writing things on the chalkboard and not writing things out in their final draft, I'll use BWOC for by way of contradiction. Okay, so anyway, so by way of contradiction, let's assume that the set of all primes is the set P1, P2, all the way up to Pn. Okay, so let's talk our way through this. So if we're assuming that there are not infinitely many primes, then that means that there are finitely many primes. But if there are finitely many primes, then we can put them all together into a finite set and index them as such. So that's exactly what we've done here. So now from this set, we're gonna consider a special number. And there are lots of different proofs for infinitely many primes of different types. 4K plus one, 4K plus three, 5K plus four, 5K plus one, so on and so forth. And lots of, lots of them use a similar strategy to this. In fact, there are two main strategies for proving the infinitude of prime in special cases. And one of them is using this kind of method right here. Okay, so anyway, let's get to it. So let's consider the following number. And this number is gonna cause all the problems towards our assumption of the finiteness of the set of primes. Okay, so we'll call it n, and it'll be the product of all of these primes, p1, p2, up to p little n plus the number one. But now that's a natural number and every natural number is divisible by a prime. Well, I guess we should say that's a natural number bigger than one and thus it's divisible by a prime. So let's find a prime dividing n. Okay, but since this set right here is the set of all primes, it must be in this set. So maybe we'll write that as which uh, must be P sub K for some K between one and N. Okay, so first of all, N must be divisible by a prime. 
But then it must be divisible by one of these primes because this is the set of all primes. So now that we said n is divisible by pk, that means n is a multiple of pk, which means we can write n as a times pk for some a, and then we'll do kind of the calculation that finish this th finishes this thing off. So let's observe that we can take the number one and, and we can write it as capital N minus the product P1 up to Pn. That's just by solving this equation right here for the number one. But now capital N is a multiple of Pk, so we can write it as A times Pk. But then this P1 to Pn is also a multiple of Pk. That's because it's the product of all of the primes, including this Pk. So I'll write this as minus B times Pk. And then maybe over here I'll say that B is equal to the product P1 up to Pk minus 1, Pk plus 1, all the way up to Pn. So it's going to be the product of all of those primes except for Pk. But now we can factor a pk out, and we'll see that we have pk times a minus b. But that leads us to a problem. We have 1 is a multiple of pk. So that means pk divides the number 1. But the only natural number divisor of 1 is the number 1. So here we have thus pk is equal to 1 but one is not a prime. So we've ended up with PK is in this list, thus it's a prime, and it's equal to one, so it's not a prime, but that's our contradiction. So we'll write down here a contradiction. But what was the source of this contradiction? It was way up here where we assumed that there were only finitely many primes. So thus, thus it must be false that there are finitely many primes and thus there are infinitely many primes. So now let's notice that neither of these were conditional statements. Let's now look at some examples of conditional statements that can be proven with a proof by contradiction. Now let's look at proofs by contradiction for conditional statements. But in order to do that, let's recall what the negation of a conditional statement is. So not P implies Q is the same thing as P and not Q. So we made a truth table earlier to establish that logical equivalence. Okay, so now let's say we want to prove the proposition if P then Q, which is the same thing as this conditional right here. So if we wanna do it via contradiction, we'll suppose that this conditional is not true. So in other words, we will suppose that P is true and Q is false. And then we'll do calculations with that setup. That's what happens in this box, which will lead us towards a contradiction just like we had before. So we'll have some statement is true and some statement is not true. So let's recall earlier we had contradictions like two divided one. So two clearly does not divide one. And we had another contradiction where some number was simultaneously a prime and it was equal to one, but that's not possible. So I just like to do a little bit of a remark down here. So if C looks like P or Q, then maybe this proof could have really been done with a, with a proof by contrapositive. Now some instructors are really strict about only making a contradictory proof when a contrapositive proof is impossible. I'm not that picky, but just be aware of the instructor that you have. I guess the best case is that C is unrelated to P and Q. That's really the mark of a contradictory proof that was not a contrapositive proof in disguise. Okay, so let's look at an example. So let's prove the following conditional statement. If A and B are integers and A is bigger than or equal to two, then A does not divide B or A does not divide B plus one. Okay, so just to maybe write this out, this statement here, which I'm underlining, would be our statement P. This statement here, which I'm now underlining, would be our statement Q. So we want to initially assume P is true and Q is false. So let's do that. So let's first notice that we're working towards a contradiction. So I'll put BWOC by, so by way of contradiction. Now in your final write-up of a problem like this, you'd want to write those words out. Okay, so by way of contradiction, let's suppose that A and B are integers where A is bigger than two or equal to two and 
a divides b and a divides b plus 1. So let's recall that when negating q, which is an or statement, that's going to turn the or statement into an and statement. Okay, so now let's use the definition of divisibility to rewrite this a little bit. So thus, we have b is equal to a times m and b plus 1 is equal to a times n. And that's going to be for some m and n, which are integers. Now here's where we cause the problem. So let's do our subtraction of b plus 1 and b. So we have 1 is the same thing as b plus 1 minus b, but that's going to be the same thing as a n minus a m, but that's going to be the same thing as a times n minus m. But that means we've got an integer a which divides 1. But there are exactly two integers a that divide 1, and that's plus 1 and minus 1. So thus, we have a equals plus or minus 1. So let's see what we have. We have a is plus or minus 1, and a is bigger than or equal to 2 up here. But that's a contradiction. So I'll just put these two arrows going towards each other. That would be read as that is a contradiction. And that finishes this proof. And now we'd probably like to do a little bit of a review of this proof to make sure that we couldn't do a proof by contrapositive. And in fact, this one is a little bit on the edge. I'll let you check if you can do a proof by contrapositive, but I think a proof by contrapositive would not lead to a being bigger than or equal to 2. It would in fact lead to a being bigger than or equal to 2 or a being less than or equal to negative 2. So I would say this problem lies somewhere in the middle right here. So C does look like P or Q, but if we try to do the proof by contrapositive, which like I said, I'll let you do, we don't end up proving not the original statement. We end up proving like something similar to it, but that's a little bit weaker. So that being said, it's also not one of these best cases, which is to be expected because not every proposition that you try to prove will fall perfectly into one of these two cases. And that's just something that you have to work with. Okay, now let's move on to biconditional statements. Now we're gonna look at biconditional statements. But luckily, this is really just proving two conditional statements in a single proof. And we're armed with a couple of different strategies for proving conditional statements. So we should be good to go. But that being said, let's look at a quick outline just for good measure. So let's say we want to prove the biconditional statement P if and only if Q. That means we need to prove P implies Q using any method that we want. And we need to prove Q implies P using any method we, that we want. And that's really all there is to it. Okay, we're going to do two examples. The first one is actually something that we used previously in the video. But that being said, I think it's nice to see written out. So we'll prove that the integer n is even if and only if n squared is even. So I like to point out which direction I'm doing one at a time. And so I'll start by saying, okay, I'm going to go in this direction first. So I'll put the implication arrow and put a little box around it. Now, keeping in mind good proofwriting etiquette, which you were assigned to read at the end of the last video, you'd want to put this into a sentence in your final draft. And this is something really important to stress is that your first draft of a proof should not be the same as your final draft. And your chalkboard draft and your chalkboard notation needs to be translated into final draft notation. Okay, so that being said, let's do this forward direction first. And we're going to do this with the method of direct proof. So let's suppose that n is even. Okay, but what does that mean? So by definition of n being even, we have n is equal to 2k for some integer k. So that's the definition of evenness. But now thus, n squared is equal to 2 times k quantity squared, which is the same thing as 4 times k squared, which is the same thing as 2 times the, times the quantity 2 k squared, which is even. And there we've done it. If n is even, then n squared is even. So now let's do the reverse direction. So I'll just put a little box and then the arrow going the other direction. 
And since we just talked about a proof by contradiction, let's do it that way. That being said, a, a proof by contrapositive is also a good choice. And actually, in the end, perhaps this proof by contradiction really could have been written as a proof by contrapositive, but we'll see that at the end. Okay, so for the reverse direction, what do we need to suppose? Let's suppose that n squared is even and n is odd, right? So if we're going in the reverse direction, we want to prove that if n squared is even, then n is even. So recall that the negation of that implication would be this kind of setup right here. Okay, that's good. So now let's write n as 2k plus 1 for some integer k. And we'll simultaneously write n squared as 2, 2 times maybe l for some integer l. Okay, so we're able to do that by the, by the assumption that n squared is even and n is odd. So now from there, let's do our calculation. So let's put a heading on that like observe. So let's do zero equals n squared minus n squared. But now let's use our two versions of n squared. So this is equal to 2k plus 1 quantity squared minus 2 times l. Where the first version of n squared is taken from this expression, n is 2k plus 1, and the second is taken from our expression for n squared as an even number. Okay, so now let's do a bit of calculation. That's going to give us 4k squared plus 4k plus 1 minus 2l. But now notice that we've got 0 on the left-hand side, and we have even plus even plus odd minus even. That's definitely an odd number on the right-hand side. That being said, in a previous video we learned about congruence mod n, so let's maybe simplify this with the language of congruence mod 2. So this right-hand side is congruent to 1 modulo 2. So if you need to review that definition, now would be a good time to do that. So let's see what we ended up with. We have 0 is congruent to 1 mod 2, but that's a clear contradiction. So A contra Diction. Recall that numbers are congruent mod 2 if and only if their difference is a multiple of 2. But the difference of 0 and 1 is not a multiple of 2. So that contradiction finishes off the proof of this backwards direction. Okay, so that being said, I think a proof by contrapositive is much better here, but I think Doing this proof by contradiction is a nice illustration, especially going down here to the end and using this newer technology of congruence mod 2. Okay, so okay, so now let's do another. This next example will also use the notion of congruence mod n. And I'm also going to introduce a little bit of shorthand that perhaps you haven't seen yet. So we will start by supposing that we've got integers a and b. And then from there, we'd like to show that a is congruent to b mod 15 if and only if a is congruent to b mod 3 and a is congruent to b mod 5. And the shorthand that we're introducing is this IFF for if and only if. So again, this is something you would write in your notes or on the chalkboard, not in a final solution. Okay, so let's go and start maybe with the forward direction. So let's suppose that a is congruent to b mod 15. And we'll hopefully be able to prove is that a is congruent to b mod 3 and mod 5. Okay, so let's decompose this into a definition. So thus, 15 divides a minus b. That's the definition of congruence mod 15. So a minus b is equal to 15 times n for some integer n. Again, that's the definition of divisibility. So we had a twofold uncoupling of our definition. First, from congruence mod 15 to divisibility to this being a multiple. So that's cool. Okay, so now let's go from there, keeping in mind that we're trying to get to congruent to mod 3 and congruent mod 15. Okay, so let's see if we can do this all at once. So let's note that a minus b is equal to 3 times 5n, and a minus b is equal to 5 times 3n. 
So that's obviously the same thing because of commutativity and associativity of multiplication, but writing it in this first way, we, say, we see that a minus b is a multiple of three, and writing it in the second way, we see that it's a multiple of five. So now we would maybe say that 3 divides a minus b and 5 divides a minus b. Thus, a is congruent to b mod 3 and a is congruent to b mod 5. Again, note what we did here is we unpacked the definition, did a tiny bit of a calculation. It was really just the factoring of 15 into 3 times 5, and then repacked the definition. Okay, so that finishes the proof of this direction. So now let's do a proof of the other direction. Now let's look at the reverse direction. Now I think we can do this with a direct proof as well. So let's start by supposing that a is congruent to b mod 3 and a is congruent to b mod 5. So here I use this SPS as a shortening for suppose sometimes. Now let's unpack these definitions into equations. So thus... 3 divides a minus b and 5 divides a minus b. So a minus b is equal to 3m and a minus b is equal to 5n, where m and n are appropriate integers. Now let's maybe cut out the a minus b bit and notice that this means that 5 times n is equal to 3 times m. But that means the left hand side is a multiple of 5 and thus the right hand side is also a multiple of 5. Now technically we're using the fundamental theorem of arithmetic here but I think that's kind of okay here. But 3 is most definitely not a multiple of 5 so that means that m is a multiple of 5. So via that, we can write m as 5 times k for some integer k. Great. And that's because 5 and 3 are both primes. And thus, 1 is not a multiple of either. Okay, great. So we've got m is equal to 5k. Now we plug this version of m back up here. So I would maybe write that as notice that a minus b is equal to 3 times m, which is now equal to 3 times... 5k, which is equal to 15k, which leads to a congruent to b mod 15. So I skipped maybe an intermediate step where I said that 15 divides a minus b, but I think that's okay here. So that finishes this reverse direction, which finishes this proof. Okay, so now we're going to end with a few assorted results. Like I said, we're going to finish with a couple of assorted results. And this first one is an existential statement. So we'll prove that two numbers exist that satisfy some rule. We won't show that they're unique though. And in fact, in this case, they are not unique. And so this is a really famous formula called Bezu's formula or Bezu's lemma. So it says that if we've got natural numbers a and b, then there are integers x and y such that ax plus by equals d, where d is the GCD of a and b. So in other words, given two natural numbers, you can always write their greatest common divisor as a linear combination of those natural numbers, where you think about linear combination in terms of what you learned probably in a linear algebra class. Okay, so the proof of this is super classic. So let's get going. So let's consider the following set. So I'll call that set S. And it'll be everything of the form AU plus BV, where U and V range over all integers. And then we'll take that and intersect it with the natural numbers. And so now let's note that the number A is in S. Well, so notice that we get the number a by taking u equal to 1 and v is equal to 0. And since a is a natural number, it's both in this set and that set over there. But what that really tells us is that s is non-empty. So we have a non-empty set of natural numbers. 
So now let's recall earlier we talked about something called the well ordering principle. And the well ordering principle allowed us to take any non empty set of natural numbers and choose a smallest element. And that's exactly what we're going to do here. So by well ordering, S has a smallest element. And what will we call it? Well, based off of this up here, we'll call it D. So D is equal to the minimum of S. But since S is everything of the form AU plus BV, that means D is of this form too. And so we'll take the numbers that produce D to be equal to X and Y. So we'll define integers X and Y such that D equals AX plus BY. So in other words, X is the U value that produces D and Y is the V value that produces D. Okay, good. So now from here, what we'd like to do is show that D is in fact the GCD. So I think this is a perfect place for a sub claim. So let's put that here. So claim D in fact is equal to the GCD of A and B. So let's recall in order to prove that we need to show that it's a CD, in other words, a common divisor. And then we have to show that it's the largest such common divisor. So let's first show that it's a common divisor. And we'll do that by dividing A by D and show that we get a remainder of zero. And since A and B are applying symmetric roles here, we only need to check it for A. The B is similar, which we'll write at the end. So now let's use the division algorithm with D and A to write A equals D times Q plus R, where R is between zero and let's see, D. Great. So again, like I said, that's the division algorithm. And now let's notice if R is equal to zero, we are done because that implies that D divides A. And then similarly, D divides B. So by way of contradiction, let's suppose that D is not zero. So by way of contradiction, suppose I meant R is not zero. But now let's solve this equation for R. So let's note now that R is equal to A minus D times Q, but that's equal to A minus AX plus BY times Q, where we wrote D using that linear combination of A and B. But now we can collect terms and then see that we get A times the quantity one minus QX and then plus B times QY. But that's an element of S because it's a linear combination of A and B, and that's what it takes to be an S. You have to be a linear combination of A and B, and you also have to be a natural number. But if R is not equal to zero, that means it's bigger than zero, which means it is a natural number. But that's a problem, because what do we have now? We have R is strictly less than D, and we have R is an element of S. So that means that R is in S, but it is smaller than the minimal element. But that's a contradiction. You can't be smaller than the minimum of a set. So here we've reached a contradiction. And so that contradicts this possibility right here, the possibility that R is not equal to zero, which means that R really is equal to zero. But if R is equal to zero, then we have D is in fact a divisor of A. But then, like I said, D being a divisor of A and showing D being a divisor of B is really exactly the same proof. So that means we know that D is a divisor of both A and B, which is the first thing we need to prove when we show that D is the greatest common divisor. Okay, so now let's show the greatest part. So along the path of showing that D is the greatest common divisor of A and B, we've shown that D is a common divisor of A and B. So let's recall that we really only proved this case right here, that D is a divisor of A. But the case when D is a divisor of B is exactly the same. We could use our similarly approach in that case. Okay, so we have it's a common divisor. Now we need to show that it is in fact the greatest common divisor. So let's suppose that we have another common divisor. I'll call it C. So C divides A and C divides B. Okay, great. But what does that mean? 
that means that A is equal to C times some number, maybe we'll use the number Z, and then B is equal to C times another number which I'll call W, where Z and W are integers. But now let's look at D. So maybe we'll do the following calculation. D is equal to AX plus BY from what we had up here. But now that'll be equal to C times XZ from this expression for A plus C times YW from this expression for B. But that's equal to C times some stuff. That stuff is xz plus yw. So we have d is equal to a multiple of c, which is the same thing as saying that c divides d. But that's exactly what we needed to prove the greatest part of the greatest common divisor. And that finishes off this proof. Okay, good, let's do one more. So we're gonna finish off with a really classic result. And that is, there exist irrational numbers, x and y, such that x to the y is rational. So I think that's pretty cool. We're going to give two proofs here, a non-constructive proof and a constructive proof. And I guess like a non-constructed proof might have some logical issues depending on how you feel about the law of excluded middle. But that's some really kind of hardcore logic stuff that we're not going to worry about so much. Okay, so for our non-constructive proof first. So this is going to break down into two cases. And it's so quick. Notice I don't have much room here and that's because I won't need much room. So our first case is what happens if the square root of 2 to the power square root of 2 is rational? So perhaps that is a rational number. And if it is, then we are done because we've got an example of an irrational to an irrational which is rational. Okay, cool. So what about case two? So case two is what happens if this number is not rational? So if this number is not rational, then in fact we can raise it to another number which is also irrational to produce something that's definitely rational. So let's do that. So let's note that if we take the square root of two to the square root of two and raise that to the square root of two, then, by our assumption, we have an irrational to an irrational, but by exponent rules, this simplifies to the square root of 2 to the 2 power, which is 2, which is rational. And we're done. So either way we have it, we have an example of an irrational to an irrational, which is rational. So here we're going to actually define numbers x and y. So let's set x equal to the square root of 2. Notice that is irrational by earlier in the video. And then we'll set y equal to the log base 2 of 25. And this is irrational by a homework exercise. And then from this setup, now let's observe that we can take x to the y, which is the square root of 2, all to the power log base 2 of 25, and we can write this as the square root of 2 to the power 2 log base 2 of 5, but then this 2 will cancel that square root of 2 down to a 2, and that leaves us with 2 to the power log base 2 of 5, which is clearly equal to 5, which is a rational number. So we've got an explicit example of an irrational to an irrational, which is a rational. Okay, so now I'm going to leave you with a couple of warm-ups. So I'm leaving you with four warm-up exercises. The first one is the gap in that proof that we just saw, and that is to show that the log base 2 of 25 is irrational. Next, show that there are no xy integers, integers xy, such that 4x minus 6y is equal to 1. Next, suppose that a and b are natural numbers and show that a is equal to the GCD of a and b if and only if a divides b. And finally, say you've got an integer n, then you want to show that 2n squared plus n plus 5 is even if and only if n is odd. And that's a good place to stop. This is the 12th video in a series devoted to introductory proof writing. And today we're gonna to talk about proofs involving sets. So how do you show that something is an element of a set? How do you show that one set is a subset of another set? And how do you show two sets are equal? Those will be the main things that we cover. So let's start with how to show that something is an element of a set. 
So let's say we've got a set written in set builder notation as follows. We'll call our set A and it's built up of elements X satisfying some condition P, so P of X. So there's really not much to showing that A is an element of A. All you need to do is show that P evaluated at A is true. So recall P when it's not being evaluated at anything is an open sentence, but when you evaluate it at something, it becomes a mathematical statement which may be true and may be false. If it's true, then your element is in the set, and if it's false, then your element is not in the set. Okay, well, there's another way of writing down sets, which is also set builder notation, but adds a little bit of a different condition, and that's set builder notation of the following form. We have the set A is all X in S such that P of X. So P of X is still that mathematical statement or that open sentence being evaluated at X. But we have this extra condition that X must come from some sort of universal set. And so the proof here really is essentially the same thing, except you also have to check that you're within that universal set first. So if you want to prove the claim that A is in A, then you would first show that A is an element from S, and then you would show that P of A is a true mathematical statement. Okay, so let's do a couple of examples before we move on to the meat of the video, which is showing one set as a subset of the other and then showing set equality. So let's consider the set, which I'll call A again, and it'll be all ordered pairs of integers such that their product is congruent to zero mod six. So let's look at some examples of things in A and things not in A. So let's notice that two comma three is in A, and that's because two comma three is in Z cross Z, and two times three is equal to six, but six is congruent to zero mod six. Okay, so that's really all there is to it. Now let's look at another one. So the ordered pair four nine is an A, and that's because four comma nine is an element of Z cross Z, and four times nine is equal to 36, but 36 is a multiple of six, so it is congruent to zero mod six as well. So in fact, we could find an infinite family of elements in this set. Let's note for all n in z, the ordered pair n comma six is in a. And that's because it starts off being inside of z cross z. So that's the first rule that it has to satisfy. And then the stricter rule that it has to satisfy is that six times n is congruent to zero mod six. So now let's look at a non-example. So let's notice that the ordered pair two comma five is not inside of A, and that's because two comma five is in Z cross Z, but two times five is equal to 10, which is not congruent to zero mod six. In fact, it's congruent to four mod six. We could do another example. Notice one half 12 is not inside of A, and that's because 1 half 12 is not inside of Z cross Z. So it's not even within the universal set. But that being said, it does satisfy the condition, which is kind of interesting. I'll put that in quotes. We wouldn't actually check that because we don't get past the first door in this case. Notice that a half times 12 is equal to six, which is congruent to zero mod six. So it satisfies the stricter condition, but not the opening condition. Okay, so now let's talk about subsets. Now we're gonna talk about proving how one subset is a subset of another. But let's note that that's really a conditional statement. Showing that A is a subset of B is equivalent to the conditional A is an element of A, so lowercase a is an element of A, implies lowercase a is an element of B. So we'll keep that in mind when we form our outline for our proof. And we'll have a direct and a contrapositive outline. Although I guess you could have a proof by contradiction outline if you wanted to as well, but I'll let you fill in those details. So if we wanna prove that capital A is a subset of capital B, then the direct method would be to suppose we've got an element, lowercase a of A, 
and then do some calculations with what it means to be inside of the set A. That's what this box is. And then you would end at the end with lowercase a is an element of B. And then likewise, if you want to do a contrapositive proof, you would start with lowercase a is not an element of B. That's like the not Q condition here. You would do some calculations and you would end with lowercase a is not a subset of capital A. Okay, good. So let's look at this first example, which I think we might do both ways. So we'll show that the set of all integers that are congruent to one mod four is a subset of the set of all in integers which is congruent to one mod two. Okay, so let's get to it. Now let's start by supposing that we've got an integer, I'll call it M, from this left-hand side. So in other words, it's of the form one mod four. So being inside that set means that you're one mod four. So thus we can say M is congruent to one mod four and M and then M equals 4K plus one for some integer K. Now we did this step from here to here in more than one step previously. We moved through divisibility, so we would say in the middle that four divides m minus one, but I think this is okay just to jump all the way there um, from now on. Okay, so now looking ahead, we'd like m to be of the form one mod two, but that means that m minus one is divisible by two, but we can show that pretty easily. So now let's note that m is of the form two times two k plus one. But that means that two divides m minus one. Pretty clearly, we can move that one over and then we have m is an even number. Okay, so thus m is congruent to one mod two. But that's exactly what we need for m to be in the set on the right. So maybe we would finish it off with and m is an element of the set of all integers that are congruent to one mod two. Okay, so that would be this proof. Okay, so now as promised, let's also do the contrapositive. Now we will reprove this result using the contrapositive. So let's suppose we've got an integer which is not in the right-hand side. So in other words, m is an integer with m is not in this set of all integers such that it is congruent to one mod two. Great, but what does that mean? That tells us that m itself is not congruent to one mod two. That's what it takes to not be in that set. But if m is not congruent to one mod two, it must be congruent to zero mod two because, well, there are only two possibilities when you're working mod two, only two remainders when dividing by two, zero and one. So let's write that here. We have m is congruent to zero mod two. Okay, but if m is congruent to zero mod two, that means m is even. So let's write m as an even number. So we'll write m as two times k for some integer k as needed. And now let's break this down into two cases depending on the parity of k. So here's our case number one, which is k is even, thus we can write k as two times, maybe I'll call it a, where a is some integer. So in this case, we have m is equal to four times a, which is congruent to zero mod four. But that means that m is not congruent to one mod four. Great. And now let's look at case two, which is the case where k is odd. But if k is odd, we can write k as two times b plus one for some integer b. But now plugging this version of k here, we see that m is equal to two times the quantity two b plus one, which is the form four b plus two, which is congruent to two mod four. But being congruent to two mod four means that you cannot be congruent to one mod four. So that tells us that m is not congruent to one modulo four. So either way you have it, through either of these cases, 
we have M is not an element of this left-hand set. So let's write out that left-hand set. It's all integers N, such that N is congruent to one modulo four. So the direct way is definitely easier in this case, but I think it's nice practice to see both. So let's do another couple of these. So for our next one, we'll show that the intersection of the set of all integers that are divisible by two and the set of all integers that are divisible by 15 is a subset of the set of all integers divisible by 10. So let's get going. We'll do this with the direct method. So let's suppose that we have an element M from this left-hand side. So it's in the intersection of these two sets, the first of which is the set of all integers divisible by two, and the second of which is the set of all integers divisible by 15. But what does that mean? Well, that means that M is in this set and M is in this other set. But we can quickly bring that down to M being even and M being a multiple of 15. So let's maybe take it all the way to that point. So M equals two times A and M equals 15 times B for some A and B which are integers. So this two times A is being in the first set, this 15 times B is being in the second set. So now let's note that since two times A equals 15 times B, so that's just setting both versions of M to each other, we know B is even. So I think that's pretty clear. The left-hand side is even. That means the right-hand side has to be even. 15 is non-even, which means all of the evenness on the right-hand side must be created by this number B. So now let's write B as two times C for some integer C. So now that we have this, let's plug this expression for B into this expression for M up here. So I'll maybe write it like this. Observe that M is now equal to 15 times 2C, which is the same thing as 30 times C, which is the same thing as, as 10 times 3 C. But 10 times 3C is an element of this right-hand set. So we could say that this is in the set of all integers n such that 10 divides n. Great, but that's what we needed to do to show this subset relationship. We started with an element of the left-hand side and we showed that that element was also an element of the right-hand side. So that concludes this subset proof. So now let's do a couple more that are kind of a little bit more abstract. So for our next result, we'll show for all sets A and B, the union of the power set of A with the power set of B is a subset of the power set of the union of A and B. Let's recall in order to be inside the power set of a set, you are a subset of that set. Okay, so let's get going. So let's take an element capital X from the power set of A union, the power set of B. So that means that X is in the power set of A or X is in the power set of B. But now let's notice that A and B are playing symmetric roles in this entire setup. So that means we might as well just choose X to be an element of the power set of A given that the same calculation would happen if we chose it to be in the power set of B. So that allows us to use our phrase without loss of generality. So let's do that. So without loss of generality, let's assume that X is an element of the power set of A. Okay, now let's get down to what it means to be an element of the power set of A. Thus, X is a subset of A, but notice that A is a subset of A union B. So this is a subset itself of A union B. But being a subset is a transitive property, so that means X itself is a subset of A union B. So I'll just add that on, and that X itself is a subset of A union B. 
But now we'll go back to power set world. So if X is a subset of A union B, it's an element of the power set of A union B. So we'll write that as finally, X is an element of the power set of A union B. So let's just check that we've done everything we needed to. We started with an element of the left-hand side, and we showed that that was also an element of the right-hand side. That's exactly what we need to do to prove this subset relationship. Okay, let's do another. So for our next result, we'll show that if the power set of A is a subset of the power set of B, then A is a subset of B. So let's really focus in on what we want to prove. So our goal is to prove this green box thing over here, that A is a subset of B. But then this power set setup is the tool in order to prove our goal. And we know that because this is part of the hypothesis, whereas that's the conclusion. Okay, so keeping in mind that we want to prove the green thing, that tells us that we should follow one of these over here. I think probably a direct proof is fine again. So let's take an element A from A. And then we want to end with that element A is in fact in B. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, we have this stuff about the power set, but what's the closest thing to a single element within the power set? Well, you guessed it, it is the singleton. So if we take A in A, let's notice that the singleton A is a subset of A. But being a subset of A means you are an element of the power set. So we might say thus, the singleton A is an element of the power set of A. But let's recall the power set of A as a given is a subset of the power set of B. So let's strip out the middle over there and say that so, the singleton A is an element of the power set of B. But if the singleton A is an element of the power set of B, that means that this singleton A is a subset of B. And we'll add that on, the singleton A is a subset of B. But if the singleton A is a subset of B, that means every element inside of that singleton is an element of B, but there's only one element and that's little a. So we can finish this off finally, little a is an element of B. But that finishes off what we need to do. We started with A as an element of A, we ended with B, A as an element of B, and we use the tool at this step right here. Okay, so now let's move on to showing set equality. Now we're gonna show how to prove one set is equal to another set. And this is technically a biconditional. So to show that capital A is equal to capital B, we would show little a as an element of capital A if and only if little a is an element of capital B. And so I've got this as an outline down here. So what you really need to do is show these two subset relations any way you want. So that capital A is a subset of capital B and capital B is a subset of capital A. So now let's look at this example. We want to show that the set of all integers that are congruent to zero mod 10 is equal to the intersection of the set of all integers that are zero mod two and the set of all integers that are zero mod five. So how are we gonna do this? Well, we'll follow this outline. And just to say which direction we're doing first, I'll indicate that with a subset symbol in a box. So this means we're gonna start with an element of the left-hand side and show it's an element of the right-hand side, and then we'll reverse that. So let's suppose that M is an element of the set of all integers that are congruent to zero mod 10. Okay, great. But what does that mean? That means that M is zero mod 10, but being zero mod 10 means that you're a multiple of 10. So we can write M as 10 times K for some k in the integers. But now we just factor 10. So let's maybe put it as an observation or a note. We have m is equal to two times five k, and m is equal to five times two k. But that tells us that m is congruent to zero mod two, and 
m is congruent to zero mod five respectively. Finally, that tells us that m is an element of that intersection on the right hand side. So in other words, m is in the set of all integers that are zero mod two intersect the set of all integers that are zero mod mod five. And now we've done half the proof. We've shown that this set on the left is a subset of the set on the right. And now we'll do the other half. So now we'll do the other direction, which I'll indicate with the subset symbol going the other way. So now we want to suppose that we have an element M from the right hand side. So that means it's in the intersection of these two sets. So the set of all integers that are zero mod two intersected with the set of all integers that are zero modulo five. But what does that mean? That tells us that M itself is zero mod two and M itself is zero mod five. That's the entry fee to be in each of those sets. But being zero mod two means that you're even and being zero mod five means that there are multiple of five. So that means we can write M as two times A and M as five times B for some A and B which are integers. Multiple of two from this, multiple of five from that. But now we can set those two expressions equal to each other. So we have two times A equals five times B Notice the left-hand side is even, which means the right-hand side also has to be even. The numbers five is odd, that means the number B has to be even. So we'll write that here. Thus, B is even, which means we can write B as two times C for some integer C. Now, putting this expression for B into this expression for M, we'll see that we're essentially done. So let's observe that M is equal to five times B, which is the same thing as five times two C, which is equal to 10 C. But if M is equal to 10 C, then that means it's congruent to zero mod 10. But if M is congruent to zero mod 10, it's in the set on the left-hand side. So that means we have M is in fact an element of the set of all integers that are congruent to zero mod 10. And that finishes this proof off. We started with an element of the right-hand side and ended up with an element of the left-hand side. Now let's do a more abstract example. Now we've got a bit of a more abstract example. So we'll start with any non-empty sets A, B, and C, and we'll show that A cross B intersect C is equal to A cross B intersect A cross C. So in other words, this cross product has a nice distributive property over the intersection. Okay, so since this is a set equality problem, we need to show containment in both directions. Let's do this containment first. So we'll start with an element of the left-hand side and show that it's in the right-hand side. Okay, so let's do it. So let's suppose, like I said, we have an element of the left-hand side. But notice that elements of the left-hand side are ordered pairs given that we have a cross product. So that means we have x comma y is an element of a cross b intersect c. Like I said, it's best to work with ordered pairs. Okay, but now let's strip this away into what it means for an ordered pair to be in a Cartesian product. And so that means that x is an element of a and y is an element of b intersect c. Great, so like I said, that's what it means to be in a cross product. But now we'll strip away what it means for Y to be in the intersection of B and C. So we have X is in A, Y is in B, and Y is in C. But now let's go back to the cross product world. So let's see, since X is in A and Y is in B, we know that the ordered pair XY is in A cross B. And furthermore, since X is in A and Y is in C, we know the ordered pair XY is in A cross C. But if XY is in A cross B and XY is in A cross C, then it's in their intersection. So we can finish that off. We have XY 
is an element of A cross B intersect A cross C. But that finishes the proof of this first containment. Now let's do the reverse containment. Okay, now we're gonna do the reverse containment. Notice we're still working with cross products of sets, so when we start with our starting element, it makes sense to start with an ordered pair. So let's do that. Let's suppose we have an ordered pair, I'll call it x, y again, which is in the intersection of a cross b and a cross c. And I think this is gonna be exactly the same steps that we saw before in reverse, but that's okay. So let's see what we get immediately. We see that x, y is in a cross b and x, y is in a cross c. But now let's decode each of those. So that means we have x is in a and y is in b and y is in c. So that's what we get from decoding this sentence right here. So the fact that x, y is in a cross b means x is in a and it means y is in b. And then the fact that x, y is in a cross c again tells us that x is in a, that's not new information though, but it tells us that y is also in c. Okay, good. But now we'll put these back together. So we might say something like, therefore, x is in a and y is in b intersect c. So that's putting this and statement back into an intersection but then we can finish it off. This means the ordered pair xy is in a cross b intersect c, but that finishes this direction off as needed. Okay, so now we're gonna look at an interesting application of set-based proofs to a very classic problem. Now we're gonna look at a nice little application of set theoretic proofs for studying a certain class of numbers. And so let's look at the definition of that class of numbers. So a natural number P is called perfect if it's the sum of its proper divisors. So here are the first three perfect numbers. There's six, which is one plus two plus three. Those are all of the proper divisors of six. So when I say proper, I mean all the divisors that are not equal to the number itself. Then 28 is one plus two plus four plus seven plus 14. And then 496 is this big sum right here. 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8 plus 16 plus 62 plus 124 plus 248. And then they go on down the line. You can find big lists of them online if you'd like to. Then after that, we're going to define two sets which seem unrelated, but they will be very related. So let's take capital P to be the set of all perfect numbers. And let's set capital A be equal to all numbers of the form 2 to the power n minus 1 times 2 to the n minus 1, where n is a natural number, and then this 2 to the n minus 1 is a prime. So it doesn't run through all numbers of this form, it runs through only numbers of that form if this object is prime. But I'd like to point out that primes of this form are known as Mersenne primes. And what we'll prove is that A is a subset of B. So, in other words, all of these Mersenne primes give rise to perfect numbers. And in fact, if we only looked at even perfect numbers, instead of all perfect numbers, this would be equality right here. And an even more crazy fact is that it is not known whether or not there is an odd perfect number. So maybe there is, but we just haven't found it yet. Or perhaps there are no odd perfect numbers and we just don't know the proof yet. Okay, so anyway you have it, this is what we'll prove here, this subset relationship. And we'll do it by chasing elements through, just like we've been doing the entire video. Okay, so let's suppose that we have an element A from the left-hand side, so it's of this form. So we have a natural number N such that A takes this form here. So it's two to the n minus one times two n minus one, where two n minus one is prime. But then the fact that that's prime really allows us to write down the factors of A quite easily. So now let's list the factors of A. So the factors of A are, so they break up naturally into two classes not multiples of that prime number two to the n minus one or multiples of that prime number. 
So let's maybe break those into one and two. So one will be not multiples of that, whereas two will be multiples of that. Okay, so if you're not a multiple of this part, which is prime, then you must be a power of two because that's all that's left over. So that gives you two to the zero, two to the one, two to the two, ending at two to the n minus one. So you have all of those factors of a. But then you also have the factors of a that include that prime two to the n minus one. But you have all of those factors multiplied by all of these factors or these powers of two. So you would have two to the zero times two to the n minus one, two to the one times two to the n minus one, all the way up two to the n minus two times two to the n minus one, and finally two to the n minus one times two to the n minus one. But now let's underline all the ones that are proper divisors. So these are all proper divisors and these are also all proper divisors. This number right here is a itself, so we won't include that in the sum. So now let's sum the divisors and see that we get a back. So let's maybe note that we're doing that here. So summing the divisors gives us two to the zero plus two to the one, all the way up to two to the n minus one, plus, I'll maybe factor this two to the n minus one out of the whole thing. So we'll have two to the n minus one, and then we'll have a two to the zero added all the way up to two to the n minus two. But now these are finite geometric series. So those have a well-known closed form that I bet you learned in an integral calculus class or a second semester calculus class. So let's sum those up. So this first one right here, which maybe I'll underline in yellow, turns into two to the n minus one. So again, that's from the finite geometric series summing rule. But then we'll have a two to the n minus one that comes down here. And then we'll have this, which is coming from this brown underline, which is two to the n minus one minus one. But now we can add those two together and we'll see that we get two to the n minus one times two to the n minus one. But that's exactly equal to our starting number a. So we started with the number a from capital A, and then by showing that the sum of all, all its divisors equaled itself, that shows you that it's a perfect number, which means that a is an element of this set P. But that's exactly what we needed in order to show that subset relationship. Okay, so now I'll leave you with some warm-ups. So I've got four warm-up exercises to practice based on what we just saw. The first is to show the set of all integers that are zero mod mn is a subset of the set of all integers that are zero mod m intersected with the set of all integers that is zero mod n. Then furthermore, sometimes this subset relationship will be an equality. And I think it's a nice extra exercise to give an example where you have equality and where you definitely don't have equality. Okay, so the next one is to prove that A is a subset of B if and only if A union B is equal to B. And then next, you'll need to show that the intersection over all natural numbers of the open interval from minus one over N to N plus one over N is the closed interval from zero to one. And then prove the union from N equal two to infinity of the closed interval one over N to N minus one over N is equal to the open interval from zero to one. And that's a good place to stop. This is the 13th video in a series devoted to introductory proof writing. And mostly today we're going to talk about how to disprove statements. But before we look at that, I'd like to look at a chart of mathematical statements, be they true, false, or unknown. So generally, if a mathematical statement is true, we call it a theorem or a proposition or a lemma, but I'll just put this all under the larger heading of theorem. So in other words, these are true mathematical statements. If we have a false mathematical statement, well, we just call that a false statement. I'm not sure there's a really decided upon word for that. But something whose truth is unknown is generally called a conjecture. So we have things that are true, things whose truth or falsehood is unknown, and things that are definitely false. So let's look at some examples of things from each of these categories. So the Pythagorean theorem is something which we know is true. So of course we know that says that the sum of the squares of the lengths of the legs of a right triangle equals the square of the length of the hypotenuse. 
And so this theorem was discovered lots of different places independently, which is kind of interesting. Then also Fermat's last theorem is known to be true. So that's fairly recently in the grand scheme of things. It's also known that there are infinitely many primes. In fact, we proved that in a previous video. Some things that are known to be false are this statement right here. So there exist natural numbers a, b, and c such that a cubed plus b cubed equals c cubed. So that would contradict the truth of Fermat's last theorem. Another statement which we know to be false is that all continuous functions are differentiable somewhere. And this is maybe not known to students taking a class like this, but once you take an analysis class, you'll learn about a function that is continuous everywhere, but nowhere differentiable. So it's one of these crazy analysis examples. And then what about some conjectures, some things that we don't know if they're true or false? Well, we don't know if all perfect numbers are even or not. So the existence of an odd perfect number is not known. Also, we don't know something called Goldbach's conjecture, which says any even number bigger than or equal to four is the sum of two primes. So we don't know if that's true or not. Also, we don't know if there are infinitely many primes of the form n factorial minus one. These are unknown. Okay, so now that we've got these three categories like described, let's talk about what a mathematician does. So mathematicians are generally interested in taking things from this category, so the category of conjectures, their truth is not known, and transporting them into the category of theorems or to the category of false statements. So we've been working on proving things. We'll talk about how to disprove things a little bit today. Then there's another really important thing that mathematicians do, and that is come up with conjectures in the first place. And so they go out here to the ether of mathematical results that are just floating around waiting to be discovered, and then they find one and put it in this category of conjectures. And then it either sits there if it's really hard, or if it's not really hard, it probably gets proven immediately to be a theorem or a false statement. Now I'd like to tell you a little bit of a story about this process of going to the ether to find a conjecture. And in fact, I had a professor in grad school who did analytic number theory. So this is number theory that's on the edge of analysis. And she talked about going down to Princeton on the weekend, so this was in upstate New York, to visit with a professor. And she told a story that there would be a very large line of junior faculty from all over the region outside this senior professor's door just asking for conjectures to work on. So I guess when it comes down to it, this ether might just be the outside of some professor's door who's more senior than you are. Okay, so now back to how to disprove statements. So let's just say, in short, how do you disprove a statement P? Well, you show that the negation of that statement is true. So to show that P is false, you would show that not P is true. But just to have some very simple outlines down on the board, what if we've got a universal statement? Let's say we want to disprove the universal statement for all x in s, p of x. Then you would want to show that its negation is true. But what that boils down to is finding an x in s such that not p of x. So that for all statement turned into an existential statement. Then if we'd like to disprove this conditional statement, p implies q, you would find some x, I'm missing an x here, such that p of x is true and q of x is false. False. So that's the negation of the conditional. What about disproving an existential statement? Well, that's going to turn into a universal statement. So to disprove there exists x in s such that p of x, you would show for all x in s, not p of x. Okay, so let's get down to some examples. So now let's look at our first two examples of things to disprove. So we'll show that these are false. The first one is that for every natural number n, f of n equals n squared minus n plus 11 is prime. Now let's say we were not told that this was false. So if we were not told that this was false, we would guess that it's false because there's no like simple closed formula for a prime. So there's no polynomial expression that always outputs a prime. That's kind of a well-known fact. So we know that this must not always be prime by that well-known fact. But now what we need to do is find a particular n so that when we plug that value of n in there, we get something that's most definitely composite. 
but it's not so hard to find one. In this case, 11 works. So let's note that f of 11 equals 11 squared minus 11 plus 11, but that's equal to 11 squared, which is not prime. So this was a for all statement that we disproved by finding a particular x, that x was equal to 11. Now let's look at another for all statement that we'll disprove, and that is for all sets a, b, and c, we have a set minus b intersect c equals a set minus b intersect a set minus c. So this one's maybe a little bit trickier to get some intuition behind, but this is false as well. And we'll show that it's false by making a particular example where this, fall, where this fails. So let's maybe look at the following sets. Let's take A to be the set containing 1, 2, 3. We'll take B to be the set containing 1, 2. And we'll take C to be the set containing 2, 3. Great. And now let's look at either side of this would-be equation, this would-be identity. So let's start with the left-hand side. So we have A set minus B intersect C. Okay, but that's going to be the set containing 1, 2, 3, set minus the intersection of B and C. But what's the intersection of B and C? It's exactly this number 2. Great. So just to be very clear here, this B intersect C became this singleton 2. But now if we do that set difference, we'll get the set 1, 3. So here we get 1, 3. Okay, good. So that would be the left-hand side. Now let's look at the right-hand side. So let's do A set minus B intersect A set minus C. So that'll be 1, 2, 3 set minus 1, 2 and then intersected with 1, 2, 3, set minus 2, 3. Okay, good. But now let's do that simplification. So if we take 1, 2 away from 1, 2, 3, we're just left with the singleton 3. So this turns into the singleton 3, and then we need to intersect that with what's left over after doing that set difference. But that's pretty clearly the singleton 1. But then if we intersect the singleton 3 and the singleton 1, we get the empty set. So let's see what we have. We have the empty set from one direction and this doubleton 1, 3 from this other direction. These are clearly not equal to each other, which means we found an example where this fails, but that disproves this statement. Okay, let's do another. So for our next example, we'll look at the following statement. So we will disprove this. So this statement is false. And the statement says there is a real number x such that x to the fourth is less than x, which is less than x squared. So let's maybe get started on this and we'll disprove this by negating the statement and show that the negated statement is true. So let's say that this orange arrow means to negate our statement. But perhaps to do that carefully, we should maybe write this into symbolic logic. So notice that in symbolic logic, this says there exists an x in R such that x to the fourth is less than x and x is less than x squared. So what I did is I took this compound inequality and turned it into an and statement. I think that's the best way in order to negate this kind of thing. Okay, so now negating it, what happens is the existential turns into a universal. So that'll turn into a for all x in R. And then we negate this and statement into an or statement while negating each of the sub-statements, if you will. So we'll have x to the fourth is bigger than or equal to x or x is bigger than or equal to x squared. Okay, so now let's write that in words. So for all x in R, x to the fourth is bigger than or equal to x, or x is bigger than or equal to x squared. So that's what we will indeed show. And we'll break this into a couple of cases. And these cases are maybe inspired by how we know the real numbers act from maybe a pre-calculus or a calculus class. So for my first case, I'll look at everything where x is less than or equal to zero. So in other words, x will come from the interval minus infinity up to zero, including zero. Okay, but if x is negative and we take the fourth power of x, then x is positive. 
but a positive number is always bigger than or equal to a non-negative number, so that actually takes it all the way home. I don't think much needs to be said about that. So we have x is less than or equal to zero is less than or equal to x to the fourth. Again, because every even power of a real number is bigger than or equal to zero. But then pulling out the middle there, we get this part of our or statement. So I think we're good to go there. Okay, so now let's look at our second case. So for case number two, we'll take the case when x is between zero and one, but not including zero and also not including one. But then from there, I think we can just take the well-known behavior of the real numbers, that if you take a number between zero and one, not including zero and not including one, and you square it, you get something smaller. So for instance, if your number was one half and you squared it, you would get one quarter, that's smaller. If your number was two thirds and you squared it, you would get four ninths, which is smaller. So I think this like immediately leads you to see that x squared is strictly less than x as needed. Now this may seem a little bit like a cheat, but I think it's okay in our process. And in fact, for one of the upcoming cases, we'll do it a little bit more carefully. But that being said, I think this is okay for here. Okay, so now let's look at case number three. Case number three is maybe the most boring case, which is x is equal to one. But if x is equal to one, we have x squared equals x equals x to the fourth. But equality satisfies, well, really both of those. Okay, so now let's move on to case four. And so case four will be x is bigger than one. So it's on the interval from one to infinity. So if it's on the interval from one to infinity, then that means we can write x as one plus a, where a is on the interval from zero to infinity. So I think that's pretty clear. And then from here, we're going to look at the fourth power because if x is larger than one, we expect it to satisfy this inequality here. So let's look at x to the fourth, which is equal to one plus a to the fourth. And then multiplying that out will give us one plus four a plus six a squared plus four a cubed plus a to the fourth. And that's by a binomial expansion, which we learned about in a previous video. But now let's notice that everything that I'm underlining in orange is strictly bigger than zero. So since all of that is strictly bigger than zero, I can drop it and I've made something smaller. So that means this object is bigger than one plus four a. And then again, since a is bigger than zero, I can replace that four a with an a and I've created something smaller. So this is strictly bigger than one plus a, but that's equal to x. So now reading from here to here, we see that we have achieved this inequality right here, or a strict version of this inequality. Okay, so let's see, have we covered all real numbers? We have. So we covered non-positive numbers here, everything on the open intervals from zero to one here, everything equal to one here, and everything on the open interval from one to infinity here. So that covers all real numbers. And in each of those cases, we either satisfied this inequality or this inequality. So that means we've proved the negation of our starting statement, which means our starting statement was false. We're gonna end the video by looking at a little bit of a conjecture, one that we can actually prove. So this conjecture says there are distinct x, y, z, which are integers, such that x to the y is the same thing as y to the z. And in order to approach our decision of whether or not this is true, we would really just play with some integers. I think that's the best way to go about this. But since this is an existential statement, all we have to do is find distinct integers satisfying this rule. So after playing around with a little bit, we'd come up probably with the following example. And I actually think this is the only example, although you would have to check that. So let's notice that two to the 16 is the same thing as two to the four times four, which is the same thing as two to the four raised to the four power. But four, two to the four is 16, that's 16 to the four power. So let's notice here we have 16 in the exponent, here we have 16 in the base, which means we've done it. We have x equals two, y equals 16, and z equals four is a solution. And that's all we need to do to prove that this is true. Okay, now I'm gonna leave you with some warmups. So for the warm-up exercises, your goal is to decide if they are true and then prove them if they are true or prove that they are false by appropriate methods.
So this first one is f of n equals n squared plus n plus 41 is prime for all natural numbers n. So decide if that is true or false and then prove it accordingly. Next is if n is an integer and n cubed minus 3n squared is even, then n is even. And finally, if x and y are real numbers such that x cubed plus 4x is less than y cubed plus 4y, then x is less than y. So I guess I'll give you a hint here that two of these are false and one of these is true. And that's a good place to stop. This is the 14th video in a series devoted to introduction to proof writing. And today we're going to start talking about mathematical induction. So mathematical induction is a strategy for proving a family of mathematical statements is true where that family is indexed by the natural numbers or sometimes more generally the integers. Okay, so let's dive into an outline of a proof by mathematical induction and then we'll kind of give some intuition for why it works. So let's suppose that you want to prove the following proposition. It says for all natural numbers n, p of n is true. Well, it just says p of n, but that's understood to mean p of n is true. So that means you've got a bunch of mathematical statements, p of 1, p of 2, p of 3, p of 4, so on and so forth. And they're all probably connected in some sort of way. And we'd like to prove that they're all true. Okay, so here's our strategy. We'll prove something called the base case. And the base case is the first case of this identity or statement or whatever it is. So we'll prove that the statement p of 1 is true. And I'd like to point that out that we could do this any way we want with a proof by contrapositive, contradiction, a direct proof, whatever we need to do. And then after that, we'll do something called the induction step. And for the induction step, we'll say that we are given some arbitrary k bigger than or equal to 1, and we'll prove that the truth of pk implies the truth of pk plus 1. So I'd like to point out that assuming this pk is true is sometimes called the induction hypothesis and then proving this conditional is known as the induction step but i think we can all put it into an induction step so i guess it's important to point out that this is a conditional so you would prove this with methods for proving conditionals like we've done before okay so the standard visualization of a proof by induction is with a set of dominoes so let's say we've got infinitely many dominoes and those dominoes are indexed by the natural numbers and each of them is attached to a statement. So this is the domino P1, P2, P3, so on and so forth. So I like to think about the base case as pushing over domino P1. Okay, so we've pushed over domino P1. And then the induction step which shows that pk implies pk plus 1, is like checking that the dominoes are close enough together so that one knocks over the next one. So if this induction step holds, then pushing over p1 will push over p2, which will push over p3, which will push over p4, and so on and so forth. But it's important to do both of these. If we check that the dominoes are close enough together without pushing over the first domino, then we haven't done anything. So that's why the base case is important. But if we've pushed over the first domino without checking that the dominoes are close enough together, then all we've done is pushed over the first domino. That's why this induction step is important. So these two together will prove this infinite family of mathematical statements. Okay, so for the remainder of the video, I essentially want to do just a bunch of examples of proof by induction. And then there'll be a follow-up example video with even more of these. And if you're in the class I'm teaching, you're going to do a ton of these in class. I think maybe we'll just use the method of greasing the groove to get the real feel for proofs by induction. Okay, so let's look at our first statement. We'd like to prove for all natural numbers n that the sum 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 7 plus 9 plus 11 all the way up to 2n minus 1 is equal to n squared. So this is the sum of the first n odd natural numbers is equal to n squared. So that's pretty interesting. Okay, so let's prove this by induction. So I'm going to lay this out by stating that we're doing the base case first. 
But this is really a chalkboard way to write this down, or maybe a rough draft way to write this down. If you were to write this down as a final draft, it would be like in a paragraph form. So maybe look back at your rules for writing mathematically to see how you might want to edit it into a final version. Okay, so our base case will be the n equals 1 case here. And notice the n equals 1 case is simply 1 equals 1 squared. So that's okay. Notice that if we're just summing the first natural number, the first odd natural number, that's just one. And the first square of the odd natural numbers is just one also, so one squared. So we're good to go there. Okay, so now let's make our induction hypothesis. So in other words, we will assume that PK is true. So again, I will just lay this out. So our induction hypothesis is, let's suppose, for some k bigger than or equal to 1, we have 1 plus 3 plus 5 all the way ending at 2k minus 1 equals k squared. So if we're doing our conditional over here, if pk, then pk plus 1, this is like assuming that pk is true. Now we want to show that this leads to pk plus 1 being true. Okay, so let's see how we can do that. So now we'll consider the next case, but we'll only consider the left-hand side of this next case. So that'll be 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 2k minus 1 plus 2k plus 1. So let's notice that's the next odd natural number. So if the kth odd natural number is 2k minus 1, then the k plus first is 2k plus 1. And I guess maybe we can notice that by seeing that this is equivalent to 2 times the quantity k plus 1 minus 1. Okay, great. But now we can use our induction hypothesis to take this first bit and rewrite it as k squared. So this is equal to k squared plus 2k plus 1 by the induction hypothesis. So let's color code this. All of that stuff in the green underline is collapsing to this k squared by our induction hypothesis. And then we're simply bringing down this k plus 1, or 2k plus 1. But now that clearly factors as k plus 1 squared, so we have this is k plus 1 squared. But that's exactly what we wanted to do. The sum of the first k plus 1 odd natural numbers is k plus 1 squared, so that finishes our proof by induction. So let's just reiterate what we've done here. Notice that at this step here, we supposed that pk was true, and down here we showed that that led to pk plus 1 being true. Okay, let's do another. So our next example will be an alternating version of our first example. So in particular, we'll show for all natural numbers n, this alternating sum, minus 1 plus 3, minus 5 plus 7, all the way up to minus 1 to the n, 2n plus 1, is equal to minus 1 to the n times n. And we'll do this exactly the same way, by proving the base case and then doing the induction step. Okay, so let's see our base case here. That is also the n equals 1 case. So let's see what happens with the n equals 1 case. We have minus 1 is the same thing as minus 1 to the 1 times 1. So we're good to go there. Notice the base case is generally quite simple. Okay, so now let's make our induction hypothesis, which is that the kth case is true. Okay, so let's suppose for some k bigger than or equal to 1, we have our statement is true. So in other words, we have minus 1 plus 3 minus 5 plus 7 all the way up to plus minus 1 to the k times 2k minus 1 equals minus 1 to the k times k. Okay, then that's like our kth statement being true. We're assuming pk in this conditional. Now we'd like to use this to prove pk plus 1. So let's consider the left-hand side of the k plus 1 case. So that will be minus 1 plus 3 minus 5 plus 7 minus all the way up to plus minus 1 to the k times 2k minus 1 and then plus minus 1 to the k plus 1 times 2k plus 1. So here we have the first k terms alternating and then we've got the k plus first term there. 
Okay, and now let's color code our simplification again. So this purple underline will collapse to something quite simple using our induction hypothesis. In fact, it will collapse to minus one to the K times K using, like I said, our induction hypothesis. So let's underline that. And then we'll simply bring this term down. So we'll have plus minus one to the K plus one times two to the K or times two K plus one. Now what we'd like to do is factor a minus one to the K plus one out and see what we're left with. So factoring a minus one to the K plus one out of this whole thing, let's notice that this K will be attached to a minus one. So we'll have a minus K. So I think that's pretty clear because we're essentially just dividing by minus one there. And then we'll have plus two K plus one left over from the second term. But now that simplifies quite nicely to minus one to the K plus one times K plus one, which is exactly where we needed this to end to finish this proof by induction. Okay, let's do another. For our next example, we'll prove for all natural numbers n, n to the fifth power is congruent to n mod five. So this is indeed a special case of Fermat's little theorem, just for what it's worth. Okay, so let's get going. So we'll do this by induction, like we said. So let's do our base case. So our base case is the n equals one case. Well, let's notice that one to the five is equal to one. Well, anything well, one raised to any power is equal to one, but one is definitely congruent to itself mod five. And that's because five divides one minus one. Five divides zero. Zero is clearly a multiple of five. It's the trivial multiple of five. Okay, great. So now let's make our induction hypothesis. So, so let's suppose for some k bigger than or equal to one, we have the result. So in other words, k to the fifth is congruent to k modulo five. Great. And now what we wanna end up with is k plus one to the fifth is congruent to k plus one mod five, but we have to get there. And in order to get there, we need to recall what it means for numbers to be congruent mod n or congruent mod five. So let's recall that up here. So A is congruent to B mod, I'll just say five, if and only if five divides A minus B. So that's what we'll use. We will actually show that five divides K plus one to the fifth minus K plus one. Okay, so that means we need to look at K plus one to the fifth minus K plus one. Okay, so anyway, let's consider that. So let's consider k plus one to the fifth minus k plus one. Again, motivated by the fact that we need to look at the k plus first case and this definition of congruence mod five up here. Now let's expand some things out and see what we have. So we'll have k to the fifth plus five k to the fourth plus 10 k cubed plus 10 k squared plus five k plus one. So that's what we get if we take k plus one to the fifth power. We know how to do that quickly by using binomial coefficients. So this is five choose zero, five choose one, five choose two, five choose three, five choose four, and five choose five. Okay, so from this object, we will subtract k plus one. Okay, so let's see what that leaves us with. So that will leave us with k to the fifth minus k, where I've put the k to the fifth here and this minus k together. You might say, well, why didn't I combine like terms with, with this 5k term? That's because I want to use my induction hypothesis. Okay, so anyway, I've got k to the fifth minus k, and then everything left over will be a multiple of five because those ones cancel. So let's factor a five out. So we'll have plus five and then k to the fourth plus two k cubed plus two k squared plus k. Okay, great. So that's the simplification that we've done here. But let's notice that this is most definitely a multiple of five. And this is a multiple of five as well by the induction hypothesis. So in the end, we know that this whole thing is a multiple of five. So this is equal to five m for some m, which is an integer. Again, because we've got a multiple of five here by the induction hypothesis, and we have a multiple of five here like by construction. 
Okay, but now putting this together, we see that five divides k plus one to the fifth minus k plus one, just reading this from the extreme left to right hand side, but that's exactly the same thing as saying k plus one to the fifth is congruent to k plus one modulo five. But that's exactly where we wanted to end this thing up. Okay, let's do another. Next up, we've got a nice calculus problem and it's something that you've learned in calculus class, but I think it's nice to reinvestigate it now that we know a little bit about induction. So let's assume the product rule and that the derivative with respect to x of x is one. And then our goal is to show that the derivative with respect to x of x to the n is n times x to the n minus one. So that's the power rule for natural number exponents. Okay, so we'll do this just like we've done the others. Let's first look at the base case. Notice the base case is done here by the given. So notice that it's given right here. We are assuming that the derivative with respect to x of x to the one is one times x to the zero. So this is done. You know, and sometimes this will be the case. Okay, so now let's make our induction hypothesis. So that will be for some k bigger than or equal to one, we have the derivative with respect to x of x to the k is k times x to the k minus one. And then from here, let's consider the next case. So let's consider the derivative with respect to x of x to the k plus one. But now we can use exponent rules for multiplying powers of x to rewrite this as the derivative with respect to x of x times x to the k. And then from here, we'll use the product rule, which is sometimes more formally known as the Leibniz rule. So this will give us the derivative with respect to x of x times x to the k plus x times the derivative with respect to x of x to the k. So the derivative with respect to x of x is one, so that leaves us with x to the k plus x times k times x to the k minus one using the induction hypothesis. But now putting this all together and simplifying, you'll see that we get exactly what we want, that we have k plus one times x to the k. Okay, let's do another. So our next example is a special case of something known as Bernoulli's inequality. So you can look up the general setting of Bernoulli's inequality if you're psyched. So what we'll show is that for all real numbers x bigger than or equal to negative one and natural numbers n, we have one plus x to the n is bigger than or equal to one plus n times x. So if x were positive here, we could use binomial expansion. It'd be quite nice. But here we're allowing certain negative values of x. Okay, so let's get into it. So our base case will be the n equals one case, just as normal. So it won't always be the n equals one case. You could envision a time where we start at n equals zero or n equals two or n equals three, just if we don't have all of the statements. But for everything that we've seen, we've used n equals one as our starting point. Okay, so let's look at uh, one plus x to the one power is equal to one plus one times x, but that is bigger than or equal to one plus one times x. So there, we've done it. There's not much to do there. So now let's make an induction hypothesis. So following the same kind of strategy, let's suppose for some k bigger than or equal to one, we have the statement is true. So in other words, one plus x to the k is bigger than or equal to one plus k times x. And then next up, we'll consider the k plus first case. So one plus x to the k plus one, which is the same thing as one plus x times one plus x to the k. Notice it's always really important to take your next case, your k plus first case, and somehow manipulate it so that we can use the induction hypothesis. And that manipulation is usually quite simple. Just like here, we took one plus x to the k plus one and factored a one plus x out so that we had a one plus x to the k to work with. Okay, so now let's apply our induction hypothesis. So that makes this bigger than or equal to one plus x times one plus k times x. So again, that's our induction hypothesis. 
And then from there, we'll just multiply this out. So that will give us something like this. One plus K plus one times X plus K times X squared. So that's what we get when multiplying this out. But since k is a natural number and x is a real number, we know that this is bigger than or equal to zero. So if we drop it, we get something less than or equal to what we started with. So we get that our object is bigger than or equal to one plus k plus one times x. But now reading from here to here, you see that we have the desired equality or inequality to finish off this statement. Okay, let's move on to another example. Now we're gonna look at a result related to the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. So let's suppose, suppose we have a list of integers, a1, a2, up to a n, n is bigger than or equal to two, so we have at least two integers. And then let's also suppose we've got a prime, which I'll call p. Finally, let's suppose that p divides this product, a1, a2, up to a n, then we'll show that it follows that p divides a i for one of these AIs, or for one of these I's between one and N. So notice that we can do this by induction and our base case is the N equals two case here because we're not interested in the N equals one case based off the setup. So let's do our base case, which like I said, is the N equals two case. So let's suppose that P divides A1 times A2. And then let's break this down into cases. So case number one is that P divides A1. And in that case, we're done because it divides one of the terms of the product. But case two will be that P does not divide A1. Okay, so we've got it must divide A1 or it must not divide A1. So that's pretty clear. But if it does not divide A1, then the GCD of P and A1 is equal to 1. So that's by the definition of the GCD and primeness. Okay, but if the GCD is equal to 1, then that tells us there exists integers X and Y such that P times X plus A1 times Y equals 1. So recall the GCD of two natural numbers can always be written as a linear combination of those natural numbers. I guess I should say an integer linear combination of those natural numbers. So now let's start using that P divides A1 times A2. So maybe I'll write it like this. So also, since P divides A1 times A2, we have A1 times A2 is equal to P times, I'll maybe use Z for another integer. And now where would we like to go from there? Well, I think we'd probably like to get an a1 times y built in to this equation so that we can get the a1 out of there. Notice that I can rewrite this linear combination equation as a1 times y equals 1 minus px. So if I can eliminate the a1-ness from this, that would be good. So we can do that by multiplying this entire equation by y. So that'll give me a1 times y times a2 is equal to p times z. And then from there, I can make my replacement. So I'll replace a1 in this equation with 1 minus px. So that means I have 1 minus p times x times a2 is equal to p times z. But now let's move some things around. I have a2 is the same thing as p times z plus p times x times a2. So that's just from symbolic manipulation. But notice that equals p times z plus a2x. But that means that a2 is a multiple of p. In other words, p divides a2. Okay, so let's see what we have. Our first case was p divides a1, in which case we're done. Our second case was p does not divide a1, but that led us to p must divide a2. So that means that we do have p divides a1 or a2 as needed, but that's just for our base case. So now let's move on to our induction hypothesis. So now let's make our induction hypothesis. So let's suppose that if P divides A1 up to AK, then P divides AI for some I between one and K. So we're supposing that a conditional statement is true. So that's important. Okay, so now let's suppose that P divides A1 up to AK plus one. 
And then let's break this into two cases. So case number one is that P divides A K plus one. But in this case, we're done because we have P divides one of the terms from that product. Then case number two will be P does not divide A K plus one. But then by the n equals two case or by the base case, that means that P must divide the product A1 up to AK. Here we're thinking about splitting this product A1 up to AK plus one as A1 up to AK and then AK plus one. Great, so we can really apply the base case to that like a larger problem. But now if P divides this product A1 up to AK, then by the induction hypothesis, so by the induction hypothesis, that means uh, P divides AI for some I between one and K. Okay, so let's see it. Either P divides AK plus one, or it must divide one of the AIs between one and K, but that's exactly what we needed to, to finish the statement off. Okay, let's do one more example. For our last example, we'll use induction to prove the finite geometric series formula. And so that says for all real numbers X, we have the sum one plus X plus X squared ending at X n equals one minus X to the N plus one over one minus X. Okay, so let's start with the base case. So notice our base case is the n equals one case. And we'll have one plus x, but notice that's most definitely equal to one minus x times one plus x over one minus x, just multiplying the numerator and the denominator by one minus x. And then we can multiply this out and get one minus x squared over one minus x. And I guess I see a little bit of a problem with, with my statement here. And that is I should not allow X to be equal to one. So let's fix that there. So for all real numbers X that are not equal to one. So anyway, we've done our base case. Now let's make our induction hypothesis. So let's suppose for some K bigger than or equal to one, we have one plus X plus ending at X to the K is equal to one minus X to the K plus one over one minus X. Okay, good. Now let's consider the next case. So our next case will be the sum one plus X plus up to X to the K plus X to the K plus one. Good. Now we'll apply our induction hypothesis to the first K terms. And that will leave me with one minus X to the K plus one over one minus X. So let's just point out that that's coming from our induction hypothesis. And then we have this last term, which is X to the K plus one. Now let's give ourselves a common denominator. This is gonna be one minus X over one minus X to give myself a common denominator. And then let's multiply some things out. So we'll have one, then we'll have minus X to the K plus one plus X to the K plus one. So those will cancel. And then we'll have X to the K plus one times minus X. That'll be minus X to the K plus two. Then my denominator is still one minus X. But that's exactly where I needed to end to finish this proof by induction. Okay, now let's end with some warmups. So I've got three warmup exercises based off what we saw today. So the first is to show that the sum of the first n squares is equal to n times n plus one times two n plus one over six. Next is this nice inequality involving powers of two. We have two n plus one, two to the power n plus one is bigger than or equal to two to the power n plus two to the n minus one plus one. And then finally, a divisibility pro problem. Show for all natural numbers n that three divides seven to the two n minus one. In other words, seven to the two n minus one is a multiple of three, or if you wanna work with congruence mod three, that's the same thing as saying seven to the two n is congruent to one mod three. So there might be a really simple way to do this, but recall that our goal here is to prove this by induction for practice. And that's a good place to stop. This is the 15th video in a series devoted to introduction to proof writing. And in the last video, we looked at induction and several examples. And today is gonna to be another day about induction, this time something called strong induction. And then we'll end with some nice examples involving the Fibonacci numbers. Okay, so let's look at the outline of how to prove a proposition using strong induction. 
So we have the same sort of setup as a proposition with normal induction. That is, we want to prove for all natural numbers n that some statement p of n is true. So that means p of 1 is true, p of 2, p of 3, p of 4, so on and so forth. Well, it's not always all natural numbers. Generally, it's all natural numbers after some point. But that's clear by the problem. Okay, then what's the outline? So you'll start by proving several of the first statements. Well, it might be one, it might be two. It's really going to depend on the problem. So I've written it like this. We'll start with this larger base case where we prove p of 1, p of 2, up to p of r. And this r, like I said, it depends on the statement. So sometimes you may only need to prove p of 1, sometimes p of 1 and p of 2, so on and so forth. And then comes for the strong induction step. That's where we show that p1 and p2 and p3 up to pk implies pk plus 1. So instead of only relying on the previous step to prove the next step, we rely on all previous steps. Okay, good. So let's look at our first example. So our first example says that every natural number n bigger than or equal to 8 can be written in the form n equals 3x plus 5y, where x and y are non-negative integers, but they're not both 0. Well, I guess this would stand if they were both 0, because that's not giving anything with this n bigger than or equal to 8. Okay, so anyway, let's get at it. In this case, there will be three base cases. So let's put here our base cases. And those base cases will be n equals 8, 9, and 10. And the reason it's 8, 9, and 10, because you need to cover three cases, and then you can just add on threes afterwards to get everything else. Okay, so anyway, that's getting ahead of ourselves, so let's jump back a little bit. So the first base case is 8, which can be written as 3 plus 5. Then the next one would be 9, which can be written as 3 times 3. So I guess here, x is equal to 1 and y is equal to 1. Here, x is equal to 3 and y is equal to 0. And then next, we'll have 10 is equal to, let's see, that will be 5 times 2. So in this case, x is equal to 0 and y is equal to 2. Okay, so those are our three base cases. And now let's make our strong induction hypothesis. So our induction hypothesis will be, suppose for all 10 less than or equal to m less than or equal to k, we have the result holding. So in other words, we have integers, well, non-negative integers, x and y, such that m equals 3x plus 5y. So you might say, well, where did this 10 come from? Well, notice 10 is the biggest base case. So it's true for 8, it's true for 9 by our base case, then it's true for 10 by our base case, and now we're picking some arbitrary k which is bigger than or equal to 10. And so this is in line with this kind of thing over here. And now looking ahead, we're going to look at the k plus first case, but the k plus first case is 3 more than the k minus second case, so perhaps we need to look at that case on its own. So let's write that here. In particular, since we have 8 is less than or equal to k minus 2 is less than or equal to k, then k minus 2 equals 3 times what I'll call x naught plus 5 times what I'll call y naught for x naught and y naught in non-negative integers. So what I essentially did here is I just applied my induction hypothesis to this k minus 2 term. And the motivation for that is it's 3 less than our next case, our k plus 2 term. Now we've like used everything from the induction hypothesis and we're ready for the indu induction step. So let's consider the k plus first term and notice that we can write that as k minus 2 plus 3 using elementary arithmetic. But that's equal to 3x naught plus 5y naught plus 3 by our induction hypothesis. But that's equal to 3 times x naught plus 1 plus 5 times y naught by simple arithmetic. So we've done it. Notice that we have k plus 1 written as a non-negative integer combination of 3 and 5, which is exactly what we needed to do to finish this thing off. 
Now let's move on to the next one. For our next result, we'll show for all natural numbers n, 12 divides into the fourth power minus n squared. And before I present the proof, I'd like to present a little bit of exploration, which I've already worked out. So in general, let's say that we uh, suppose that we could do this without strong induction, and we had an induction hypothesis where, where k to the fourth minus k squared was a multiple of 12. So we have this is a multiple of 12. Then we would look at the next case, which is k plus one to the fourth minus k plus one squared, and we would expand it out. So expanding it out, we get this previous case, which like I said, by our induction hypothesis is a multiple of 12. But then this leftover bit is not clearly a multiple of 12. I think there's probably a trick that you can play with that to show that it is a multiple of 12. But since we're really going for examples of strong induction here, I think it's maybe better for us not to play that trick. So that motivates us to go back further instead of using Instead of going back from k plus 1 to k, maybe we go back even further. And the motivation is to go back six steps to k minus 5. So notice there's six steps between k minus 5 and k plus 1. And you might say, well, why six steps? Well, it's actually pretty simple. It's because 2 times 6 is 12. We're looking for things that are multiples of 12. And then 2 and 4 are even. So if we expand something using binomial coefficients with 2 and 4, we'll always end up with 2 times something. And then we'll have this 6 rolling around in here too because of this 6-step difference that we're doing. So that's just a hunch. We'll have to work that out as we're going through the proof. But I think this is a good, like, intuitive guess of how to approach this. Okay, now let's look at the proof. Now we're ready for our proof. And since we have six steps between k minus 5 and k plus 1 during that induction step, that tells us we should have six base cases. And so I've done the calculation on the base cases here. There's really not much to that. All we have to do is look at n to the fourth minus n squared for n 1 through 6. So for instance, for n equals 3, we get 81 minus 9, which is 72, which is 12 times 6. I'll let you check the rest of those. Like I said, those are pretty straightforward. Okay, so now let's get at it. So our induction hypothesis will be something like this. For 6 less than or equal to m less than or equal to k, suppose that... 12 divides m to the fourth minus m squared. So that's our strong induction hypothesis. And look, I picked it up right at the end of my last base case, just as we did before. So now in particular, since we have one less than or equal to k minus five less than or equal to k, we know 12 divides that sort of combination with k minus five. So in other words, 12 divides k minus 5 to the fourth minus k minus 5 squared. Great. Now that's like the induction hypothesis applied to our k minus 5 term, which we motivated the need for on the previous board. And now we're ready for our last calculation. So let's consider the k plus first case. So that means we need to look at k plus 1 to the fourth minus k plus 1 squared. But we'd like to put this in terms of k minus 5. So this is equal to k minus 5 plus 6 to the fourth minus k minus 5 plus 6 squared. And now let's introduce a little bit of notation. So this is equal to L plus 6 to the fourth minus L plus 6 squared, where L is equal to K minus 5. And now we'll expand that out. So this expands out as L to the fourth minus L. Well, I'm like moving things around as we do this. So I'll let you check it if you need to. And then after that, we'll have plus 12 times the following object. We'll have 2L cubed plus 18L squared. And then after that, plus 71L plus 105. The important thing is that we have a multiple of 12 right here. And then by our induction hypothesis, we have a multiple of 12 right here as well. So we could maybe put that in right here and note that we have k minus 5 to the fourth minus k minus 5 squared is equal to l to the fourth minus l squared, which is equal to maybe 12 times x. You know, by this 12 dividing this thing.
Okay, but now grouping things together, we have this first green underline is 12x, this second green underline is 12y, but if you add two multiples of 12, you get a multiple of 12. So in the end, we have 12 most definitely divides this k plus 1 to the fourth minus k plus 1 squared as needed. Okay, so now let's apply this idea of strong induction to the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Now we'll prove the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, and that says that any integer that's bigger than 1 has a unique prime factorization. And this will involve an existence proof so that it has a prime factorization to start with, and then a uniqueness proof that shows that that prime factorization is indeed unique. Okay, so the existence proof will be using strong induction. So our base case here will be the n equals 2 case. But notice for the n equals 2 case, we're done, and that's because 2 is a prime number. It's the only even prime number. Okay, great. So now let's move on to our induction hypothesis, which will be a strong induction hypothesis. So let's suppose for all 2 less than or equal to m less than or equal to k, the result holds. So in other words, m has a prime factorization. Notice I'm not saying anything about a unique prime factorization because we're just doing uh, existence here, not uniqueness. And now let's consider k plus 1. So consider k plus 1. And this breaks down into two cases. So case number one is k plus one is prime. So if it's prime, then we're done because k plus one itself is its own prime factorization. So that's maybe kind of the best case scenario is that if k plus one is prime. But let's look at case number two, which is k plus one is not prime. But let's recall if it's not prime, it's either equal to the number 1 or it's composite. It's not equal to 1 because it's bigger than 1, so that must, means it must be composite. So k plus 1 is, like I said, composite. But that means that k plus 1 equals a times b, where a and b lie between 2 and k. Not including k, though, but it could include 2. But now what we'll do is apply the induction hypothesis to both a and b. So apply induction hypothesis to a and b. So that allows us to write a as the product p1 up to pr and b as the product q1 up to qs where the pi and the qj are all primes. So we've got this prime factorization for a and a prime factorization for b. But now we put that together with the fact that k plus 1 has the perhaps non-prime factorization of a times b and we can write k plus 1 as a times b but in turn that's the product p1 up to pr times q1 up to qs, a product of primes. Or in other words, a prime factorization. So assuming that every number between 2 and k had a prime factorization allowed us to prove that k plus 1 also has a prime factorization. Okay, and so that's our existence proof done. Now let's do our uniqueness proof. So for our uniqueness proof, we're going to use a contradiction. We're going to use a neat contradiction involving like something called the smallest possible counterexample. Okay, so by way of contradiction, suppose that not every n in n has a unique prime factorization. But that means that everything without a unique prime factorization forms a non-empty subset of the natural numbers. We, we can find the minimal element of that subset by the well-ordering principle, so let's call that m. So let's call the minimum such number m. So what is m? So m does not have a unique prime factorization, but it's the smallest one without a unique prime factorization. Okay, so that means we can write m as p1 up to pr. We can also write it as q1 up to qs, where the list p1 to pr and q1 to qs are not permutations of each other. 
because of course this uniqueness is up to permutations. We're allowing like a factorization of two times three and then a factorization of three times two to be the same. But if we have a non-unique factorization, that means the list P1 up to PR and the list Q1 up to QS are not permutations of each other. Okay, so now we're good to go. So now let's just set M equal to M and we'll notice that P1 producted to PR is the same thing as Q1 multiplied up to QS. But then since PR divides the left-hand side, we know that PR also divides the right-hand side. So in other words, PR divides Q1 up to QS. But that means that PR divides one of the terms in that product by last video. So by last video, PR divides something I'll call QI for I between one and S. And actually let's reorder the QI so that indeed we know that PR divides QS. So we can do that. Then next up, if PR divides QS and P and Q are both primes, then that means that PR must be equal to QS. Okay, but then that means we can cancel it from this equation right here. So cancel it from, so let's maybe put a green star next to this equation and then we'll bring the green star down. And what does that give us? So that gives us the equation P1 up to PR minus one equals Q1 up to QS minus one. But then if we set each of these maybe equal to M prime, we see that M prime is most definitely less than M and it has a non-unique factorization. And so it inherits that non-unique factorization from the non-unique factorization of M. But what does that do? That contradicts the minimality of our original M. So that contradicts the minimality of M because we found a smaller number that also has a non-unique factorization. Okay, so where does this contradiction make everything blow up? Well, way up here where we suppose that not everything had a unique factorization. So that must be a false statement, which means indeed everything does have a unique factorization. And that finishes this proof off. Okay, so now I'm gonna do one example involving Fibonacci numbers. So a very nice source of exercises for induction problems are the Fibonacci numbers. So I thought I'd leave you with the definition of the Fibonacci numbers and then one such example. There'll be others on the homework and the warm-up. Okay, so the Fibonacci numbers are defined as a recursive sequence as follows. So the zeroth Fibonacci number is the number zero. The first Fibonacci number is the number one. And then the n plus second Fibonacci number, f sub n plus two, is the sum of the previous two. So f sub n plus one plus f sub n. This is true for n bigger than or equal to zero. So for instance, f2 is f1 plus f0. f3 is f2 plus f1 and so on and so forth. So here are the first several Fibonacci numbers. So we've got zero, one, one. We add one and one, we get two. We add one and two, we get three. We add two and three, we get five. We add three and five, we get eight. Eight and five get 13, so on and so forth. So you see it's quite nice and easy to generate more Fibonacci numbers. Okay, so there are tons of nice identities involving Fibonacci numbers, which like I said, give nice practice for inductive proofs. Here's one that I thought I'd do. So we have fn plus one squared minus fn plus one times fn minus fn squared is equal to negative one to the n. So let's start with our base case. And for our base case, I'll take the n equals zero case because that's the first Fibonacci number, or really the zero Fibonacci number. So let's see what our left-hand side collapses to here. We'll have f sub one squared because it's zero plus one minus f sub one times f sub zero minus f sub zero squared equals, well, f sub zero is zero, so both of those cancel. f sub one is one, so we get one squared, but one squared is one, but that's the same thing as negative one to the zero power. So it checks out, the base case works. So we could maybe check bark next to this saying that our equation holds for n equals zero. Now let's make an induction hypothesis. So let's suppose for some k 
bigger than or equal to zero, we have our result holding. So in other words, fk plus one squared minus fk plus one times fk minus fk squared equals negative one to the k. And now we'll consider the k plus first case. So let's consider the left-hand side where we replace k with k plus one. So that'll give us fk plus two squared minus fk plus two times fk plus one minus fk plus one squared. And then let's start simplifying that. So we wanna get that down so that it looks something like this. So we probably need to use our recursive definition of Fibonacci numbers for the fk plus two. So we'll replace each fk plus two using this right here. So that'll leave us with fk plus one plus fk quantity squared. So let's just be really clear, that comes from this term right here. And then we'll also be replacing this fk plus two. So that will be minus fk plus one plus fk times fk plus one. So like I said, that comes from here, this orange underline. And then finally, minus fk plus one quantity squared. I might leave that as is. Okay, so now let's multiply some things out. That leaves us with fk plus one squared plus two fk fk plus one, and then plus fk squared. Okay, good. And then we'll have minus fk plus one squared minus fk fk plus one minus fk plus one squared. So that's just from expanding everything out. And now let's see what simplifies. Notice we have an fk plus one squared here, which will cancel this fk plus one squared. Okay, so that's cool. And then another thing, let's notice that this negative fk times fk plus one and this two fk times fk plus one will cancel this down to have a coefficient of two. And now we can bring a minus sign out of the whole thing, which is motivated by the fact that we're really going for minus one to the k plus one. So bringing a minus sign out of the whole thing, we'll be left with fk plus one squared from this term, and then minus fk plus one times fk from this term, and then minus fk squared from this remaining term right here. But then by our induction hypothesis, that's minus one to the k. So multiplying negative one to negative one to the k obviously gives us minus one to the k plus one, but that's exactly where we wanted to end up. Okay, so now I'm gonna leave you with some warmups. Okay, so here are three warmup exercises based off of what we saw. The first is to prove for all natural numbers bigger than or equal to 12, we can write them in the form 4x plus 5y where x and y are non-negative integers. Next, if we've got this recursively defined sequence where a0 is one and a sub n is one plus a0 plus a1 up to a n minus one, then show that a n is equal to two to the n. Then finally show that the sum of the even Fibonacci numbers has this nice identity. So F0 plus F2 plus F4 all the way up to F2n is equal to F2n plus one minus one. And that's a good place to stop. This is the 16th video in a series devoted to proof writing. And today we're gonna to talk about relations. So let's just jump into the definition. So a relation on a set A is merely a subset of the cross product of A with itself. And so this subset could really be anything. So in fact, the empty set is a subset of A cross A. That means the empty set is technically a relation on A. But this is not a super interesting relation. This says that nothing is related to each other. So an element is, isn't even related to itself. Whereas at the other end of the spectrum, A cross A is a subset of itself. And that's almost like too much. That says that everything is related. And so of course, to have meaningful relations, we probably need something in between here. That would be most interesting. And also we'd probably like those relations to have certain conditions. And we'll introduce those conditions as we move through this video. And we'll study them more in upcoming videos. Okay, now I'd like to say a little bit about notation. So often, if an ordered pair x comma y is an element of R, then we say that x and y are related via R. And often we write x, R, y 
Okay, so let's look at an example. So let's say we've got this set A and it's the three element set A, B, C. And let's say we've got a couple of relations. So let's say we have R1, which has A comma A in it, A comma B, and then maybe A comma C and C comma A. And then let's maybe also say that we have R2 and maybe R2 is equal to A comma B, B comma C, and then maybe C comma A. Okay, nice. And so those are definitely relations, and we know they're relations because they're both subsets of the cross product of A with itself, and that's all it takes to be a relation. But that being said, let's practice with some of the notation just really quickly. So let's take this R1 and make the following observation. So notice that A is related to itself via R1, so A R1 A, and that's because A comma A is an element of R1. Whereas B is not related to A via R1, and that's because B comma A is not an element of R1. Notice that A comma B is, but B comma A is not. And so that's just an example of how this notation might work. But there's also a really nice way to look at these things via a visual representation. So what you do is you think about every element of your set as being a vertex of a graph or a point in the plane. So let's do an example right here. Let's say this is our point A, this is our point B, and over here is our point C. And then if something is related to something else, then that gives us an arrow from the starting position to the ending position. So let's just talk our way through it. So this fact that A comma A is in R1, in other words, A is related to itself, says that there's a loop from A back to itself. So this loop is playing the role of this A comma A here. And then what about A comma B? So A comma B would be an arrow from A to B. So an arrow from A to B, so something like that. So that arrow from A to B, just to reiterate, that's like from this ordered pair here. So the left term in the ordered pair is the initial point of the arrow, and the right term in the ordered pair is the terminal point of the arrow. Now let's notice that B comma A is not in R1. That means there's no arrow going back from B to A. So there's just a one direction arrow. Okay, so now let's look at A comma C and C comma A. So A comma C will be a path from A to C like that, and then C comma A will be a path back from C to A. So this would be a picture of R1. So maybe we would put R1 over here to just to say that that's a picture of R1. Okay, so while we're at it, let's maybe make a picture of R2 as well. So R2, so I'll still need my points A, B, and C, but this one has less arrows because there are less elements. Notice that each element in the relation corresponds to an arrow between points in this graph. So we have A comma B, so that gives us an arrow from A to B. We have B comma C, that gives us an arrow from, a, from B to C. And then we have C comma A, that gives us an arrow back from C to A. And that's all we have. We don't have any reversals of these arrows. And we also don't have any loops like we did right here. So let's maybe put a box around this. Now notice that since R1 and R2 are simply subsets of A cross A, that means we can take their union and intersection and that will also give a subset of A cross A. So R1 union R2 and R1 intersect R2 will also be relation. So let's look at each of those. Maybe let's look at R1 intersect R2 first. So which elements do these have in common? Well, we have A comma B, and we also have C comma A, and that's it. So those are the only elements in common. So if we were to draw our picture again, so again, label these A, B, C, then we would have an arrow from A to B, like this, and then we would have an arrow from C to A, and that's all we would have for R1 intersect R2. And then I'll let you look at R1 union R2, but what you'll get is just exactly this graph right here for R1 with the inclusion of an edge between B and C like this. 
Okay, so let's do some more examples. So this whole notion of a relation is really just an abstraction of things that we've seen before that we actually called relations between numbers. And so often we'll like to go back to previously known relations that we've seen in other classes in order to further motivate this study. So in fact, we could just take our relation to be the relation less than, and that's what we'll do in this example. So let's say we've got a set A, which is the set containing one, two, three, four, and we say that X is related to Y if and only if X is less than Y. So let's start by writing this relation down as a set of points. So let's notice that one is related to two. So that means we have one comma two in this set. That's because one is less than two. And then we also have one being related to three and one being related to four. Again, because one is less than three and one is less than four. Next, we have two is related to three and two is related to four. And finally, three is related to four. And that would be all of the entries from this set R. Okay, so now let's maybe make a picture of this. So I'll just put my numbers in a string. So let's say one is here. Let's say two is here. Let's say three is here. And maybe let's say four is here. So we need an arrow from one to two. We also need an arrow from one to three. And finally, we need an arrow from one to four. And that's because one is smaller than two, three, and four. And then we need an arrow from two to three and we need an arrow from two to four, and that's because two is smaller than three and four. And then finally, we need an arrow from three to four, and that would finish off our picture. Okay, so now we're gonna look at one more set of examples before we look at some characteristics that relations can have. Now let's look at two related relations. So let's say R sub one is the set of all points X comma X squared where X is a real number. Let's notice that this is naturally a subset of R cross R. That means it is a relation on the set of real numbers R. Okay, so let's maybe graph this one first to get started. So notice that this is exactly the graph of our favorite parabola y equals x squared. That's because x is like a free variable, but then the y variable depends on x. So let's color code this. Let's say here we will graph this relation in yellow. So that means we simply need the graph of a parabola. So we need something like that. Great. And then let's look at our second relation, which I'm actually going to change for no reason than it makes a nicer picture. And so this is going to be the set of all points x comma y in R2, where y is bigger than x squared. Let's also notice that this is a relation on R cross R. Great, which means we can graph it the same way. But what's that? That's the set of all points that lie above this parabola. So let's maybe color code this in blue. So if we were to graph all of these points, we would graph every y value which is above its corresponding x value on the parabola. So we would graph everything inside the parabola. And notice we do not graph the parabola itself. I think that's a good variety of basic relations. Now let's look at some properties that relations can have. So there are three very important properties that a relation might have. And if it has all three of those properties, it's super special. And it's the type of relation that we'll talk about next time. So let's suppose we have a relation, we'll call it R. So let's just recall again that that just means that it's a subset of A cross A. Then we say R is reflexive if for all X in A, X is related to itself. So if you're talking about a relation, it often kind of makes sense for something to be related to itself. Then we say R is symmetric if when X is related to Y, we know that Y is related to X. But we can put this symbolically into the conditional X related to Y implies Y related to X. So that's how we would prove this type of thing. And then finally, we say R is transitive if when X is related to Y and Y is related to Z, we know that X is related to Z. So again, you could put that into a conditional with an AND statement now. So X related to Y and Y related to Z implies X is related to Z. Okay, so let's look at a chart of standard relations on the integers and we'll prove some things about some of these relations and then just argue the properties of the rest. So I have the properties here, reflexive, symmetric, transitive. 
And then I've got my relations. Less than, less than or equal to, equal to, divides, does not divide, and is not equal to. So I don't have greater than or greater than or equal to because that's really just a reflected version of less than or less than or equal to. So let's start with the less than relation. So maybe I'll put down here, we're going to start looking at the less than relation. So let's notice it is not reflexive. And we can see that via example. So two is not less than two. Two is equal to two. It's not strictly less than two. So maybe we would say here, no, it is not reflexive. Is it symmetric? No, it's not symmetric. And we can check that it's not symmetric by noticing that two is most definitely less than three, but three is not less than two. So again, it is not symmetric, but it is transitive. So let's note that if uh, L is less than M and M is less than N, then L is less than N. So that would be the transitivity property for less than. So I'll go over here and I'll put yes, it is transitive. Now it looks like we didn't prove anything here, and in fact we didn't, and, that, and that's because in order to really check this thing about less than, you need something about the integers at a more base level, but we're not going that deep here. Okay, now what about less than or equal to? So notice that it's not symmetric, so let's start with that. It is not symmetric. That's because two is most definitely less than or equal to three, but three is not less than or equal to two. But it is reflexive. That's because any number is less than or equal to itself because we allow that equality. And then it's also transitive. So I'll put a yes here for transitive for the same sort of reason as this down here. Now, and then maybe we would finish this off by saying that m is less than or equal to m for all integers m. That's because m is in fact equal to m. So there's not really anything going on there. Okay, now what about equality? Well, I remember learning in grade school that equality was reflexive, symmetric, and transitive, and we even use those words. So perhaps you've seen that before, but that's really one of the defining properties of equality. So I'll just put yes for all of these. And now let's move on to divisibility. So looking at divisibility, is it reflexive? Yes, it is reflexive. That's because for all integers n, we can write n as 1 times n, but writing it as something times n means n divides n. So notice to prove that it's reflexive, we had to prove this universal statement. We had to do something. Whereas to prove that it is not symmetric, which we're about to do, all we have to do is give a counterexample. So that's important to notice. Okay, so we can go over here and put yes, it is reflexive. And shortly, that's just because everything divides itself. But it is not symmetric. And that's because, for example, uh, 2 divides 4. So 2 most definitely divides 4 because 4 is 2 times 2. But 4 does not divide 2. But in order for it to be symmetric, 4 would have to divide 2. So anyway, that's our counterexample for symmetry. So it is not symmetric but it is transitive. And I think that was maybe a homework exercise, but let's work through it just in case. So let's suppose that x divides y and y divides z, just to put it in this language over here. So let's notice that means that y is equal to a times x and z is equal to uh, b times y for some integers a and b. So I'll just put down here where a and b are some integers. But now we'll take this version of y and plug it into y in this next equation. So let's see what that leaves us with. We'll have z is equal to b times a x. In other words, it's equal to a b times x. But that means z is a multiple of x, but having z be a multiple of x means that x divides z. But that's exactly where we needed to end to show that this is transitive. So I'll put yes, this is transitive. Now what about the condition? Now, what about the relation does not divide? Well, in fact, that's neither reflexive, symmetric, or transitive. Now, I'll let you check that one on your own, but that's essentially because if you negate does not divide, you get does divide. Okay, so now let's move on to 
inequality. Okay, so looking at inequality, it is not reflexive. And we can see that because three is equal to itself. It's not not equal to itself. So anyway, that's an example of it not being reflexive. But you could say that every number is equal to itself, but that means that every number is not not equal to itself. So anyway, it's pretty clear that this is not reflexive. But is it symmetric? It is symmetric because note, if x is not equal to y, then y is most definitely not equal to x. So that shows that it's symmetric. So we have yes, it is symmetric. Now, is it transitive? Well, in fact, it is not transitive. And we can do that via an example as well. So let's note that two is most definitely not equal to three and three is most definitely not equal to two, but two is equal to two. But for it to be transitive, we would need two to not be equal to two. So anyway, that's a counterexample for it being transitive. So it is not transitive. So there's our filled in chart. We didn't do everything, but I urge you to do the rest on your own. So separately, we talked about graph visualizations of relations, and we also talked about these properties. Now I'd like to put those together to show some visual cues that a relation is reflexive, symmetric, or transitive given its graph. So it's reflexive if every point has a loop. So if you look in at your graph of your relation, then you look at a point and that point should have a loop kind of around it. So where the terminal point and the initial point of that arrow is that point. Okay, so that's a hallmark of reflexivity is every point has a loop. So what about symmetry? Well, so symmetry says that every arrow has an arrow back. So here we need two points. And let's say we've got two points and we've got an arrow from one to the other like this. So at the moment it is not symmetric, but if it were symmetric, we would also have a path backwards. So it's like having a two-way street instead of having a one-way street. And then what about transitivity? I like to think about transitivity as having a shortcut. So I'll just say there is always a shortcut for two connected arrows. So there are two cases of this to be interested in. So let's say we've got three points like this. Let's say we have an arrow from this top left point to this bottom point, and then another arrow like that. So let, let's say that's what we start with. So transitivity will tell us that there's a shortcut. So in other words, there's an arrow simply from this point to this point. And then there's one other way to think about transitivity, and that involves only two points. So say we've got two points like this, and we have an arrow from one of them to the other one and back again. But now if we apply transitivity to this scenario, it will create a loop at either end. So that's important to notice as well. Okay, so now let's do some examples of checking these conditions. So now we're gonna show that the relation on the integers given by congruence mod n is reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. Okay, so let's do these one at a time. So we'll start with reflexive. Great, and so let's look over here. In order to show it's reflexive, we need to take an arbitrary integer and show that it's related to itself. So let's do that. So let's suppose we have an arbitrary integer, which I'll maybe call A, and observe that zero times n is the same thing as a minus a. Oh, well, that's because a minus a is zero, but zero is the same thing as zero times n. But notice that implies that n divides a minus a. So there's nothing really fancy going on here. But notice that implies that a is congruent to a mod n by the definition of congruence mod n. But then since we started with an arbitrary a and showed that it was congruent to itself, then we have indeed showed that this is reflexive. Now let's show that it is symmetric. So that means we need to take two things that are congruent mod n and show that we can reverse their order. So let's suppose that a and b are in z such that a is congruent to b mod n. And where we'd like to end up with is b is congruent to a mod n. So let's see how we can get there. Notice by definition of congruence mod n, that means n divides a minus b. But that means a minus b is equal to n times k for some integer k. 
But now we can just take this equation and multiply it by minus one. That will tell us that B minus A is equal to N times minus K. But since K is an integer, minus K is also an integer. So this equation tells us that N divides B minus A. But N dividing B minus A is exactly the condition that we want to end, it, to end this off, which says that B is congruent to A mod N. So that's good. We have symmetry now at this point. Notice we took arbitrary A and B satisfying A congruent to B mod N, and we ended up with B congruent to A mod N, but that's exactly what we needed to do. Okay, good. So now let's work on transitivity. Okay, so for transitivity, we need to start with three things that are related in this sort of scenario. Maybe we... <clears throat> Maybe we'll use A, B, and C here. So we need A to be related to B and B related to C, and then we need to show that A is related to C. But remember our relation here is congruence mod N. So let's suppose we have A, B, and C, which are integers, such that A is congruent to B mod N, and B is congruent to C modulo N. Okay, but then definition of congruence mod n will tell us that n divides a minus b and n divides b minus c. But then definition of divisibility says that a minus b is equal to n, maybe I'll call it times x, and b minus c is equal to n times y, and this is for integers x and y. So just to reiterate, that's by the definition of divisibility. But let's recall where we're trying to get. We're trying to get to A is congruent to C mod N, so we need something like A minus C. So how can we do that? Well, let's take these two equations and add them. Notice if we add these two equations, that gives us A minus C is equal to N times X plus Y. But that equation tells us that n divides a minus c, but that's exactly the condition for a to be congruent to c mod n. So let's make sure we've done the right thing. We assumed that a was congruent to b mod n, and b was congruent to c mod n, and then we did some calculation, and we ended up with a is congruent to c mod n. But that's exactly what we need for transitivity. Okay, let's look at another. So our next relation will be on the integers as well. And let's say in this case that A is related to B if the absolute value of A minus B is less than or equal to three. And then our goal is to show that R is reflexive and symmetric, but not transitive. Okay, so let's do this one at a time, just like we did before, starting with reflexivity. So reflexivity is really simple in this case. Let's notice that for all, maybe I'll call it a, which is an integer, the absolute value of a minus a is equal to zero, but zero is most definitely less than or equal to three. So that means that in fact, a is related to itself. And since a was chosen arbitrarily, that does it for this reflexivity. Okay, so now let's check symmetry. So let's suppose that a and b are integers such that a is related to b. But notice, putting it in terms of the definition of our relation, that means the absolute value of a minus b is less than or equal to three. But we want b to be related to a, which would be the absolute value of b minus a. So let's note that the absolute value of b minus a is the same thing as the absolute value of negative one times a minus b, but the absolute value will cancel that minus one out, just leaving us with the absolute value of a minus b, which is most definitely less than or equal to three by our given. So that tells us that yes, b is related to a. So it is symmetric. So now let's move on to transitivity and we'll show that it is not transitive. And we can find a pretty simple example of this. Notice that six is related to three. That's because six minus three is equal to three. That's less than or equal to three. And three is related to zero because three minus zero is equal to three, which is less than or equal to three. But six is not related to zero. And that's because the absolute value of six minus zero is equal to six, which is strictly greater than three. 
So here, this is reflexive, symmetric, but not transitive. Okay, let's do one more. So for this example, we'll consider a relation on the real numbers defined as follows. So x is related to y if and only if x squared plus y squared equals one. Now let's check these properties. So starting with the reflexivity. Maybe before we start to check these properties, let's notice that all of the points that satisfy this rule lie on this circle of radius one. So this is not reflexive. So here we'll say, no, it is not reflexive. And why is that? That's because one is not related to itself. And we can see that one is not related to itself because one squared plus one squared is equal to, let's see, the number two, which is not equal to one. Okay, is it symmetric? Well, yes, it is in fact symmetric and we can prove this. So let's suppose that I'll call them A and B. So A is related to B. So that means that A squared plus B squared equals one. But then that means that B squared plus A squared equals one by the commutativity of addition. But that means that B is related to A. So it's quite simple to prove that this thing is symmetric. Now, is it transitive? Well, in fact, it is not transitive. And actually, if you have something that's always symmetric, but never reflexive, you can automatically know that it's not transitive because you'll never get those loops that we talked about with that picture before. But anyway, let's show that it's not transitive by an example. So let's note that one is most definitely related to zero. That's because one squared plus zero squared equals one. And zero is related to one for the same reason because zero squared plus one squared is one, but one is not related to itself by our previous calculation. So this is a counterexample for transitivity. So we're gonna end by extending this definition of a relation to two different sets, but we're not really gonna do much with that. And then we'll have some warm-up exercises. So now we wanna look at this very, very slight extension of our notion of a relation, but we won't do much with this. We'll just pick up on it later when we talk about functions. So there's a little bit of a spoiler. So a relation from a set A to a set B is simply a subset of A cross B. But now notice if we're in two different sets here, A and B, the notions of reflexivity, symmetry, and transitivity don't make any sense. Notice that A comma A doesn't make any sense because every element of A may not be in B. That sort of helps us figure out why symmetry and transitivity may also not make any sense because these could be wildly different sets. Okay, so let's look at a couple of examples. So let's say we've got a set A, which is one, two, three, and our set B is A, B, C, D. So these are different sets. One is made of numbers and one is made of letters. And then let's say we've got a relation between these sets of one comma A, one comma B, and two comma C. So this is a fine relation. You might like light up and think, hey, this is not a function, but we're not there yet. We're not thinking about this type of stuff yet. This is a relation. And we could maybe make a picture of this relation as follows. Let's put A and B each in a line. So here we have one, two, three, and here we have A, B, C, D. And then we could do our arrows for the, and we could do the arrows for the things that are related. So one is related to A, so we've got an arrow from one to A. One is related to B, so we've got an arrow from one to B. And then two is related to C, so we have an arrow from two to C. And then that would be the whole picture of this. So let's look at another one, which is a little bit more interesting. Let's say we have our relation, it's a subset of Z cross the set containing zero, one, and two. And we say that A is related to B if and only if A is congruent to B mod three. So I guess implicitly built into this is everything is related to either zero, one, or two mod three, but that's not too hard to show with the division algorithm. So maybe we could make a picture of this as well. So let's lay out all of the integers at the top. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Then let's make Maybe go backwards, minus one, minus two, minus three. Maybe that's enough integers. And then we'll have down at the bottom, zero, one, and two. And then we'll put arrows if they're congruent mod three. So notice negative three is congruent to zero mod three because it's a multiple of three. Zero is congruent to zero mod three. And three is also congruent to zero mod three, as well as six being congruent to zero mod three. So negative three, zero, three, and six all collapse down to zero. 
But then notice that two collapses to one, one collapses to one, and four also collapses to one mod six. That's because they're all one more than a multiple of three. And then we've got one more thing. So what about negative one? Well, negative one is two mod three. It's two more than a multiple of three. Two is two mod three, and five is two mod three. So that would be our picture in this case. So it's a little bit messy. But that being said, I think we kind of get an idea of what's going on. Okay, so now I'm gonna give you some warm-ups. So here's some nice warm-up exercises based on what we just saw. So let's consider the relation less than or equal to on the set zero, one, two, three. So let's illustrate it with a graph and prove whether or not it is reflexive, symmetric, and or transitive. So next, let's consider the relation with the following graph. And then your goal is to translate this graph into a relation with sets. So what would the set A be? And then what would the set R, which is the subset of A cross A, be? Then, given a finite set A, how many relations are on A? So this may seem like difficult and tricky, but just go back to what you know about exactly what a relation is, and it shouldn't be too bad. And then finally, let's consider the set R, which is all ordered pairs of real numbers x, y, such that their difference is an integer. Now, your goal is to show that this is reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. And that's a good place to stop. This is the 17th video in a series devoted to introductory proof writing. In the previous video, we looked at relations on sets, as well as some certain characteristics that those relations can satisfy. And today we're gonna to look at a special type of relation known as an equivalence relation. So the definition goes like this. A relation R on a set A is an equivalence relation if it is reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. Recall, those were the properties that we studied last time. Then there's kind of an accompanying definition that goes along with this, which is the notion of an equivalence class. So given that R is an equivalence relation on A and we have a, an element, a little a from A, the set, which we'll denote by bracket A, which is the set of all X and A that are related to A. So notice I've got X and A such that X are A. That's said to be an equivalence class with the equivalence class representative A. So I wanna look at some basic examples first before we prove some properties and then look at some more maybe classic examples. So let's take our first set to be negative one, zero, one, two, and we'll look at the following four equivalence relations and kind of comp compare and contrast them. So let's say our, equivalent, our first equivalence relation is just simply equality. So that means that things are equivalent or they are related if and only if they are equal to each other. So what does that mean? That means that we can write R as the following set. So it'll be negative one, negative one. So that means negative one is related to itself. Zero, zero, one, one, and two, two. So recall that R was really a set of ordered pairs and all of the elements from A to B. It was from the cross product of A with itself and an ordered pair was in the relation if and only if they were related. That was sort of the idea here. So this says an element is only related to itself. Okay, so now let's look at the equivalence classes. We'll notice the equivalence class of negative one will simply be the singleton negative one. That's the only thing that's related to negative one. Furthermore, the equivalence class of zero is just the singleton zero. The equivalence class of one is simply the singleton one, and the equivalence class of two is simply the, equi or the singleton two. So we can definitely have equality be an equivalence relation, but I would say it's not super interesting, and that's because it doesn't really filter anything out. The whole idea behind an equivalence relation is you some want something slightly weaker than equality so that you can study a set without looking at maybe exactly the specifics. But equality is almost too strong to do that because if we look at the set of equivalence classes, we've essentially just reproduced the original set. Okay, so let's look at our second equivalence relation, which is two elements are equivalent if they have the same parity. Let's recall that that's the same thing as them being congruent mod two. 
So what things are in this set? So here we would have r is equal to negative one, negative one, and negative one, one. So r, so negative one is related to itself because they have the same parity, and negative one is related to one because they have the same parity. And then furthermore, we would have one, one, and one, negative one. By reflexivity for one, and then reflexivity for negative one, one. Okay, so that would be everything with an odd parity. And then we also have relations between zero and two. So zero is related to two, two is related to zero, zero is related to itself, and two is related to two. So that would be everything in that set. Okay, so notice that ordered pairs exist if and only if the two entries have the same parity, which is exactly what we want. But now let's form the equivalence classes. So the equivalence class of negative one will be the set, con the set containing negative one and one because they have the same parity. Whereas the set containing, or the equivalence class of zero will be the set containing zero and two, again, because they have the same parity. Let's also notice that this top one is the equivalence class of one, and this bottom one is the equivalence class of two. That's why I use this word equivalence class representative. Notice this equivalence class containing negative one and one has two representatives, negative one and one. And likewise for this equivalence class containing zero and two. So here we have, you know, given ourselves some simplification of the original set. So instead of looking at each element individually, we're looking at each element depending on its parity. Okay, so let's look at our next one, which is um, things are related if and only if they have the same sign. And here we'll consider negative numbers, positive numbers, and zero to be three different signs. Okay, so what would our set for our relation look like? So negative one is related to itself, but negative one is not related to anything else because that's the only negative number. Zero is related to itself because zero is not negative or positive. Um, and then we have one is related to one, one is related to two, two is related to one, and two is related to two because those are both positive. And then we have to have reflexivity, reflexivity and symmetry in there. Now we can build our equivalence classes. We've got an equivalence class for negative one, which simply contains the singleton negative one, equivalence class for zero, which is just the singleton zero, and then the equivalence class for one, which is the set containing one and two. So here we have three equivalence classes. We have filtered our original set slightly differently as to above, but we have given some simplification if we're interested in studying the sign of an element from our original set. So which one of these is better kind of depends on what exactly you're trying to do. Okay, so now let's look no restriction. So by no restriction, I mean everything is equivalent to itself which means r is simply equal to a cross a. So this will be quite big. Notice we'll have four times four entries here, so we'll have 16 total entries. So we'll have negative one with negative one, negative one with zero, negative one with one, and negative one with two, and then so on and so forth. So everything is related to everything else. So in this case, you would have a single equivalence class, and you can take any of the numbers as the equivalence class representative. I'll take negative one. So the equivalence class for negative one, like I said, will be everything, negative one, zero, one, and two. And now, whereas this original one was almost too restrictive, it didn't filter the original set in a way that we could study it more simply, this filtering down here is almost too generous. Notice it made everything equal to each other, so that doesn't uh, help us study anything either. So I think the takeaway here is an equivalence relation and the corresponding equivalence classes are ways to filter sets into smaller parts depending on the conditions that you're trying to study. So like in this case, we would want to study the parity. In this case, we would want to study the sign. And we have these nice simplifications for parity and sign. OK, let's keep going. OK, so let's look at another example. Let's define a relation R on R by x is related to y if and only if sine of x is equal to sine of y.
Now, let's look at some equivalence classes. I won't check that this is an equivalence relation. I think it's pretty clear given that our relation is really defined out of this equality right here. Okay, so let's look at the equivalence class of zero. And this will be aided by the fact that sine of zero is zero. So hopefully everyone remembers that from having taken a trigonometry class in the background. Okay, so this needs to be all numbers x such that sine of x equals zero. Well, really it's sine of x equals sine of zero by this rule right here. But because sine of zero is zero, we get just the solutions to the equation sine of x equals zero. But this is exactly the integer multiples of pi. We have negative two pi, negative pi, zero, pi, two pi, and so on and so forth in both directions. Now there's a fancy way to write that if you're psyched, and that would be something like this. It would be pi times z. So that's a way of writing every integer multiple of pi. Okay, now let's look at pi over two. And let's keep in mind that sine of pi halves is equal to one. So it'll be useful to know that for this problem. Okay, so that's gonna be all real numbers x such that sine of x equals sine of pi over two, but sine of pi over two is one. Okay, nice. So when is sine equal to one? Well, it's pi over two, and then it's pi over two plus two pi, which is five pi over two. And it's also pi over two minus two pi. What we'll use there is the periodicity of sine. So in the end, you'll get the following set. So we have pi over two in the middle, five pi over two is next, and then before that is minus three pi over two, and then you can get the rest of them on either side by adding or subtracting pi over two as needed. Now we can write this in set builder notation if we want like this. So maybe it would be everything of the form pi over two plus two n pi as n runs through all integers. I think that'd be a good way to write it. And I guess likewise, you could write everything up here as two n pi as n runs through all integers. Sorry, this should be just n pi as n th runs through all integers. And taking inspiration from this sort of fancy algebraic way of writing this set, we could do the same thing down here. It would look like pi over two plus two n times integers. Okay, nice. But we can actually make a picture of what's going on here. So let's recall the graph of the sine function. So obviously it's like periodic like this. And let's go to an arbitrary x. Let's say our arbitrary x is right here. Good. And now what we'd like to do from there is find everything else in the equivalence class of x. So that means we need sine of x to be sine of the other thing. Well, we can get that just by drawing a horizontal line at this point right here, which is sine x, and look at all the intersection points. So all of these things that are green dots, along with the original yellow dot, are the equivalence class of x. So let's maybe point that out. So this thing, this thing, all of these are in the equivalence class of x. Okay, let's do another. Next up, we're gonna look at an interesting equivalence relation on the set z cross n. So in other words, we're comparing ordered pairs where the first entry is an integer and the second entry is a natural number with other such ordered pairs. So we'll say that a comma b is related to c comma d if and only if a d equals b c. So this has a really nice result. So I'll first show that this is reflexive. So let's notice that a comma b is related to a comma b because a times b is equal to a times b. That's really all there is to it. Next up, let's notice that if a comma b is related to c comma d, that tells us that a d equals b c, but now flipping that, we see that c d is equal to a b, which is the same thing as saying that c comma d is related to a comma b. So that gives us our symmetry. Now let's prove our transitivity. So let's suppose that a comma b is related to c comma d and 
C comma D is related to E comma F. So that gives us two facts. That tells us that AD equals BC, and it tells us that uh, CF equals DE. Nice. Okay, so now let's take this one and multiply it by A. So let's see what that leaves us with. We'll have A D E is equal to A times C times F. But now we can write A D E as B C E. So let's do that. This is the same thing as B C E given this fact right here. But now putting that together, we have ACF equals BCE, but now we can cancel C from both sides of this equation, and that gives us AF equals BE. But that's exactly the condition that we need for AB to be related to EF. And you might be worried right here at this step where we canceled C or divided by C, and you would be right to worry about that because C is allowed to be zero. So this step right here can only occur if C is not equal to zero. So in fact, you'd have to repeat this in the case that C was equal to zero to finish this thing off. But I'll let you do that on your own. Okay, so that's a sketch of transitivity. And then we have reflexivity and um, symmetry. Okay, so now let's look at some equivalence classes. So let's look at the equivalence class of the ordered pair 1, 2. So that's going to be all ordered pairs A, B, such that A, B is related to 1, 2. But let's recall what does it mean for A, B to be related to 1, 2 by our given. So that means that 2 times A is equal to B. So in the end, that'll give us everything of the form A comma 2A as A runs through all natural numbers. So we get something like that. Okay, but that gives us a motivation of how this should be interpreted. So this equivalence class we can interpret as the number 1 half. And that motivation comes if we write out what this equivalence class looks like. So this looks like the set containing 1, 2, 2, 4, 3, 6, so on and so forth. But those are all, well, other than 1 half, those are all non-simplified versions of the fraction 1 half. So notice 2 fourths, that's the same thing as 1 half. 3 sixths is the same thing as 1 half, and so on and so forth. So in fact, that's what you're getting for these equivalence classes. You're getting some notion of the fraction A over B. And we can see that by recalling the following rule about fractions. A over B equals C over D, if and only if A, D equals B, C, which we can just get from cross multiplication. So really, this is a nice way of building the rational numbers out of the integers and this equivalence class equivalence relation setup. Okay, let's move on. So our next little goal is to prove some of the standard general results involving equivalence relations and equivalence classes, starting with the following. So let's suppose that we have R, which is an equivalence relation on a set A. Then what we'll show is that the equivalence class with equivalence class representative A is equal to the equivalence class of B, if and only if A is related to B. Okay, so let's get to it. So let's do this forward direction first. So let's suppose that the equivalence class of A is equal to the equivalence class of B. Okay, then let's note that A is related to itself by reflexivity, but that implies that A is an element of the equivalence class of itself, which is equal to the equivalence class of B. But then taking out the middle, that tells us that A is an element of the equivalence class of B. But then by the definition of the equivalence class of B, that means that A must be related to B. And there we've done it. We've done the forward direction. Okay, so now let's do the reverse direction. So let's suppose a is related to B. And notice that we want to show a set equivalence here. So since we want to show a set equivalence, we need to show that equivalence class of A is a subset of equivalence class of B and vice versa. We'll only do one direction because this is a symmetric argument. But that being said, technically you need to do both. 
Okay, so we'll also suppose that X is an element of the equivalence class of A. And notice where we'd like to go is to show that X is an element of the equivalence class of B. And that's because that will show us the equivalence class of A is a subset of the equivalence class of B, which is like one half of the argument that we'll take to show they're equal. So if X is in the equivalence class of A, then that tells us that X is related to A. But then by transitivity, X is related to A and A is related to B, which means X is related to B. Oh, but if X is related to B, then that's exactly the condition for X to be in the equivalence class of B. Okay, so what did we do? We started with X's in the equivalence class of A, we ended with X's in the equivalence class of B, so that means the equivalence class of A is a subset of the equivalence class of B. And then maybe similarly, the equivalence class of B is a subset of the equivalence class of A, and thus they are equal as sets. Okay, so now let's introduce another definition which is going to be kind of dual to the notion of an equivalence relation in equivalence classes. So for our next definition, we're gonna look at the notion of a partition of a set. So a partition of a set A is a collection of non-empty subsets of A. So there we've got a subset of A which is non-empty, such that if we take the union over this whole collection, we get the entire set. And if we take the intersection of non-equal sets, we get the empty set. So they're disjoint. Okay, so let's look at some examples, starting with a very simple one. So let's take A to be the set 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So this would be an example of a partition of A. We could have the singleton 1, we could have 2, 3 together, and then we could have 4, 5 together. So that's an example of a partition. You could get another partition, maybe 1, 2, 3 is together, so 1, 2, 3 and then maybe four is by itself and five is also by itself. As you can imagine, there's probably a lot of partitions and there are a lot of partitions. In fact, they're related to something called the Bell numbers if you're interested in looking that up. Then we could take integers z and we could partition them a number of different ways. We could partition them into even numbers and odd numbers. So there's the set of all evens and the set of all odd numbers. You could also partition them into the set of all multiples of three. So that would be zero plus minus three plus minus six. And then the set of all multiples of three plus one. So that would be one and then one plus minus three and then one plus minus six, so on and so forth. And then the set of all multiples of three plus two. So that would be two and then two plus minus three, so on and so forth. So that would be an appropriate partition. Okay, so now let's prove a nice result that fuses together these notions of partitions and equivalence relations. Now we're gonna prove a really classic result. Actually, it's the first half of a classic result. The second half will be left as a homework problem. So let's suppose R is an equivalence relation on a set A. So what we'll show is that the set of, of equivalence classes of R is a partition of A. So that means by the definition of partition, there are two things to check. First, that these union to the entire set, and second is that uh, equivalence classes are either equal to each other or disjoint. So let's prove this first part first, that they union to the whole set. So let's really spell out what we need to prove here. So what we'd like to prove is that the union over all A and A of the equivalence class of A is equal to A. So something like that. So I'd like to point out real quickly that the inclusion in this direction is totally trivial. And that's because each of these equivalence classes is a subset of A. So if we're taking the union of subsets of A, we get a subset of A. So that means all we'll focus on is the reverse inclusion. That is, we'll take an element from A and show that it's in this union. But that's also fairly quick. So let's suppose that we have an element, maybe I'll call it little x in A. Okay, but then by reflexivity, we know little x is related to itself, but being related to something is exactly what it takes to be in the equivalence class. So that means x is in the equivalence class of x. 
But now the equivalence class of X is most definitely part of this union since X is in A. So this is a subset of the union over all such equivalence classes. But let's see what we've done. We have started with X in A and we have ended with X as an element of this union. But that tells us that A is a subset of this union. But since this other direction was clear, this is all we needed to show to prove that these union to the whole set. Okay, so now let's move on to this second need, and that is to prove that these are either disjoint or they are equal to each other. And we'll do this by first supposing that we have two that are unequal. So let's suppose we have um, A and B in capital A such that the equivalence class of A is not equal to the equivalence class of B. And then we want to show that they're disjoint and we'll do that kind of by a contradiction. So let's take an element of X from their intersection. So this is how we're moving towards a contradiction. We'll show that no such X can exist. Okay, but notice that means that X is in the equivalence class of A and X is in the equivalence class of B. But that tells us that X is related to A and X is related to B. But then by the transitivity property of equivalence relations, that means that A is related to B. I guess we're using symmetry on this one first to get A to the left. But now if A is related to B, that means that the equivalence class of A is equal to the equivalence class of B. But that's a contradiction. So that contradicted our assumption right here. So that means that it must in fact be impossible to choose such an X. So let's point that out here. No such X exists. But the only rule that X satisfies is it's in this intersection. But if there's no such X in the intersection, then that means that this intersection is indeed empty. But that's exactly what we needed to do. Okay, so let's finish with one more thing. Now we're gonna look at the integers modulo N. And so what is that? Well, we'll denote it by Z subscript N, read that Z N. And that's the equivalence classes of Z where our equivalence relation is congruence mod N. So in the previous video, we showed that congruence mod N satisfied all the properties of an equivalence relation. So that means it gives us equivalence classes. And in fact, there are obvious equivalence classes here. We get the equivalence class of zero. So that's everything that's a multiple of N. We get the equivalence class of one. That's everything that has a remainder of one when divided by N. The equivalence class of two. That's everything with a remainder of two when divided by N. Ending at the equivalence class of N minus one. That's everything with a remainder of N minus one when divided by N. Let's recall that those are the only possible remainders when dividing by N. Okay, so we've got N numbers here between zero and N minus. Well, they're really N equivalence classes. And now there are some obvious operations that you can define on this. You just have to check that they're well defined. So let's define the following observation or operation on the equivalence class A and B. So A plus B will be the equivalence class of A plus B. So since we're working with equivalence classes, we have to check that this makes sense. In other words, it's well defined. And when you take an abstract algebra class, you'll see the need to do this even more and more and more. Okay, so how can we do that? So let's suppose that the equivalence class of A is equal to the equivalence class of A prime and the equivalence class of B is equal to the equivalence class of B prime. And where we want to end, so we want to show that the equivalence class of A plus B is the same thing as the equivalence class of A prime plus B prime. So what that means is that this addition does not depend on your equivalence class representative. But let's notice if A is equal to A prime, that means that A is congruent to A prime modulo N. And then if equivalence class B equals equivalence class B prime, then likewise B is equivalent to B prime modulo N. 
But let's recall that means that a is equal to a prime plus n times, I'll maybe call it k, where k is an integer. That's because n divides a minus a prime by the definition of congruence mod n. And then likewise, b is equal to b prime plus n times l for an integer. Same sort of thing, n divides b minus b prime by the definition of congruence mod n. But now let's note that we can add these and we'll get a plus b is equal to a prime plus b prime uh, plus n times k plus l. But that means that a plus b is congruent to a prime plus b prime modulo n. But that's exactly what we needed to do to show that the equivalence class of a plus b is the same thing as the equivalence class of a prime plus b prime. So in other words, this is a well-defined operation. Now we could go over here and define another operation, which is like multiplication, which would be equivalence class a times equivalence class b equals equivalence class of a times b. But we would have to check that that is well-defined as well. But in fact, there's not really anything to that. It starts all the same until this step, but now you just multiply both sides of the equation instead of adding both sides of the equation. So that'll give us that a times b is equal to a prime times b prime plus, plus n times something. And that something is a little bit complicated and it comes from foiling out these things that I'm writing in red parentheses. But let's notice that everything other than a prime and b prime will be multiplied by n. Okay, but from there we see that a times b is congruent to a prime times b prime mod n, but that's exactly what we need for the equivalence class of a b to be the equivalence class of a prime b prime, which proves that this is a well-defined multiplicative operation. So we're gonna finish off investigating some arithmetic properties of zn. Now we're gonna make an addition in a multiplication table in Z4. So that means all we need to look at is zero, one, two, and three. And I'm gonna use a simplified notation here, which is quite standard when working with Zn, and that's where we're gonna drop the brackets. Because if we know what setting we're working in, we can always think that these really mean the equivalence classes. Okay, so let's add zero and zero. So zero plus zero will be zero. Zero plus one will be one, zero plus two is two, and three is three, and then down this line as well. Now let's do one plus one, that is two, one plus two is three, one plus three is four, but four, the equivalence class of four is the same thing as the equivalence class of zero modulo four, because four doesn't have a remainder when divided by four. Likewise, we can finish out this column the same way. Now, two plus two is four, but that's zero mod four again, because it's a multiple of four. Two plus three is five, but five has a multiple of one when dividing by four, so we get a one there. Likewise, we get a one here. Then three plus three is six, so we get a two here, because that has a remainder of two when divided by four. So we get this interesting addition table when we're working in Z4. Now let's look at the multiplication table. So zero times anything will be zero, okay, so that's not really surprising. One times anything will be itself, so that's the multiplicative identity still. Now let's look at two times two. So two times two is four, which is zero. So that's actually quite interesting, maybe more interesting than you may realize at the moment, because we've just multiplied two non-zero objects and gotten an object which is zero. Now let's do two times three. So two times three is six, which has a remainder of two when divided by four. So two times three is two. So that's also kind of interesting. But then three times three is nine. That has a remainder of one when divided by four. So three times three is actually equal to one. So three is the, its own multiplicative identity when working in Z4. Okay, so I'm gonna leave you with some warmups. I'm gonna leave you with three warmup exercises. So first, define a, rela define a relation R on the integers by X is related to Y if and only if X plus seven Y is even. Next, prove this is an equivalence relation and describe its equivalence classes. Next, let's set A equal to the set A, B, C, D, E, and let R be an equivalence relation with three equivalence classes such that A is related to D and B is related to C, and then your goal is to use the properties of an equivalence relation to write R out as a set. So these two facts, 
that A is related to D and B is related to C, together with the fact that there are three classes, really restricts this down to a single type of relation. Okay, next, let's make an addition and multiplication table for Z6. And that's a good place to stop. This is the 18th video in a series devoted to introductory proof writing. In the previous couple videos, we looked at relations on sets. And for a brief minute, we looked at a relation between two sets. And today we wanna to look at functions, which is really a very special type of relation between two sets. So let's look at our proper definition. So we'll suppose that A and B are sets, and then a function f from a to b, which we'll denote with the following notation, so read this as f is a function from a to b, is a relation, so that means it's a subset of a cross b, such that for every a in a, there is exactly one b in b, so that should be a lowercase b, such that the ordered pair a comma b is an element of f. Remember that f is really just a subset of a cross b, so at its heart. And so generally we'll write f of a equals b. And so that's like proper, maybe very common function notation that you know from pre-calculus or calculus class. But another notation we could use is this f a gets sent to b or a is mapped to b. So notice it's this arrow with this little vertical line here. And then if we're working with more than one function, we might put a little f over this to say that that mapping is done via f. Now there are things associated to functions like the domain. And so the set a is known as the domain of f. Then b, which is the target, is called the codomain of f. Notice that's not the range of f. The range is only the points in b they get landed on. So in other words, it's everything of the form f of a as a runs through all capital A. So like I said, that's called the range of f or sometimes the image of f. Okay, so now let's look at a very basic example and then non-example as well. So let's look at this function f. So it takes a to one, b to three, c to four, and d to three. I guess I should say that a is the set a, b, c, d, and b is the set one, two, three, four, five. So we could maybe draw this in a picture like uh, this. So we could have a bubble over here that's a, so it contains a, b, c, d. Then we could have a bubble over here that is b, so that's one, two, three, four, five. And then we'll notate this as arrows. So A gets mapped to one, so there's our arrow. B gets mapped to three. C gets mapped to four. And then D also gets mapped to three. So we have something like this. You know, we could also write it as F of A equals one or as A gets sent to one. We could also write F of B equals three or B gets sent to three and so on and so forth. So those are just different ways of writing the same kind of thing over and over. Let's compare that with this R over here, which is a relation but not a function. Let's draw a picture of that. So we'll have our set A, which is made up of little a, little b, little c, little d, and then our set B, which is the numbers one, two, three, four, five. Now notice this tells us to take A to one. Okay, that's cool. B to two, so everything is still okay. But it also tells us to take A to three. And that's where we have our problem. Notice, every, notice over here that every A in A, there is exactly one B in B such that A comma B is an F. But this A is connected to two elements from B, one and three. So that's how you can see it in the set. In the picture, we can see that as having two tails of arrows based at A. Okay, so now let's continue on. So C gets mapped to four under this relation, but notice D is not sent anywhere. And that breaks a rule as well. So notice for every A and A, there is exactly one. Well, D has zero elements that is mapped to, so that is not exactly one. So there are a couple of different reasons why this relation is not a function. So before moving away from this example, I'd like to do one more visualization. So I'd like to take one more visualization of our function and I'll maybe leave the visualization of the, of the relation as maybe a warm up problem or maybe an exercise for you to do on your own. 
So here's what I have. I have the set A cross B, so down here on a horizontal axis, if you will, it's not exactly an axis, we have our set A, and on the vertical, again, axis, we have the set B. Now what I'd like to do is graph this function. So this is like an interesting discrete function on two finite sets, so it's not like a graph like you might see in a calculus class. So notice it will contain this A comma one element, but then after that, we have to sneak up here and then we contain this B comma three element. So that would be the next thing that it contains. Then let's see, then we sneak up here and it contains this C comma four and then we sneak down here and it contains this D comma three. So in the end, the graph would be this like blob that's going through A cross B containing all of these ordered pairs. But notice this blob passes like some version of the vertical line test, which is the test that you might have used in calculus or pre-calculus to determine if something was a function. Now, like I said, I'll leave it to use an exercise to graph this relation and see that it's not quite as nice. Or you can see the visualization of the fact that this is not a function. Okay, so let's move on. For our next example, let's consider the function f. Its domain is the integers and its codomain is the natural numbers. And we'll define it via this rule here. So this is like a standard way of defining a function. So we have when f acts on n, it gives us the absolute value of n plus one. Or we could also similarly or equivalently define it by this arrow rule. So we have n is mapped to the absolute value of n plus one. Now let's look at a couple of examples of evaluations, although this is quite simple. Notice f of 3 will turn into the absolute value of 3 plus 1, which is 4. f of negative 2 will turn into the absolute value of negative 2 plus 1, which is 3, and so on and so forth. So in fact, we could graph this if we wanted to, and I would say that would probably be something nice to do. So notice the number zero, so f of zero will give us one, so that would be this point right here. f of one will give us two, so that would be this point that's about right here. f of negative one will give us two as well. f of two will give us three. f of negative two will give us positive three, just like we saw before. And as you can see, we will essentially get this shape, which is a bunch of dots in a V. And those dots all lie on this like lattice of the integers and the natural numbers. So something like this. So you can imagine this as being the lattice of the integers and the natural numbers. Okay, let's do another one. So for our next function, let's look at phi, which goes from z squared. In other words, z cross z to z. So it has an input of two integers and an output of one integer and it's defined by the following rule. Phi evaluated at mn is 14m minus 8n. Now I think maybe something good to do with this function is to determine its range. So let's go to get a good guess for its range by evaluating this at some points just to see what we get. So let's notice that phi evaluated at 0 comma 1 will be equal to negative 8, just based off of that rule. Phi evaluated at 1 comma 0 will be equal to 14 based off of that rule. Notice that phi evaluated at 1, 1 is 14 minus 8. That's equal to 6. What about phi evaluated at 1 comma 2? So that'll be 14 minus 16. That is negative 2. Oh, but what about this? What about phi evaluated at negative 1, negative 2? So that'll be negative 14 plus 16, which is two. Okay, well, what do we notice about all of these numbers? Well, in fact, they're all even. And this is the smallest positive even number, and this is the smallest negative even number. So it seems like we're just getting all of the even integers. And that'll be what our claim is. And we will prove this claim. So here's our claim that the range of phi, let's maybe write it like that, the range of phi is equal to all even integers. So we could write this as two times k such that k runs through all integers. But let's recall using some notation similar to what we had in a previous video, that could be two z. That says we're scaling every integer by two. Okay, so let's see how this proof goes. 
Our goal is to show that two sets are the same, which means we need to do this with double inclusion. So let's do that. So we'll start with the inclusion going this way. So let's suppose that we have a number L, which is in the range of phi. But what does that mean? That means that L equals phi of mn, which equals, let's see, 14m minus 8n for some m and n, which are integers. That's what it takes to be in the range. But now let's notice this. Note that we have L equals, well, 14M minus 8N, but we can factor a two out of that, leaving us with 7M minus 4N, but that's very clearly in this set of even integers because it's multiplied by two and then 7M minus 4N is an integer. So let's just write this is in 2Z since that's some nice short notation. Okay, so that means we have proven the right inclusion or the inclusion in that direction. So let's move on to the reverse inclusion. So let's suppose that we have a number, what should we use this time? Let's maybe use 2a, which is in 2z. Well, remember 2z, that's all even integers, so that means it's of the form 2 times a. And then let's observe the following calculation, which can be motivated by this up here. This phi of negative one, negative two is two. So if we have phi of negative a, negative two a is equal to, let's see, this will be 14 times negative a minus eight times negative two a. But after fairly simple calculation, we'll see that that is equal to two a. But this equation shows us that 2a is in the range of phi because we wrote 2a as an output of phi. That's exactly what it means to be in the range. I left out an e there. But that's exactly what we need to finish off this reverse inclusion. So the forward inclusion and the reverse inclusion finish the proof that the range of this function or the image of this function is indeed all even integers. Okay, so now let's move on to some special types of functions. Now we wanna look at some special classes of functions. So let's see the definition. Given a function f from a to b, we say that f is injective, or in other words, one to one, if for all x and y in A, we have f of x equals f of y implies x equals y. Then we call it surjective or onto if for every b in that should be b in b, we have an A in A such that f of A equals b. So this means everything is landed on. And then we say it's bijective if it's both injective and surjective. So let's look at some pictures of functions that are injective, not injective, and surjective and not surjective. Okay, so first for an injective function. Let's say we have the following action like this. So these three dots, notice they're all mapped to three different places in the codomain. That's exactly what we need for this to be injective. So everything from the domain is mapped to a new thing in the codomain. Let's compare that to something that is not injective. So let's say we have some action like this. So notice this second and third dot are both mapped to this second dot. So they're mapped to the same thing. That makes this thing not injective. Notice if this were x and this were y, here we have f of x equals f of y, but x is not equal to y. Okay, now let's go over and explore a surjective and a not surjective function. So a surjective function means everything in the codomain is landed on, and this would be an example. Notice every dot over here is mapped onto. Then something that's not surjective would be something like this. So notice that this dot over here is missed. So you can think about uh, something that's surjective doesn't miss anything in the codomain. Okay, so next I'd like to give some outlines for proving that functions are injective and surjective and then do some examples. So now I'd like to look at some proof outlines for proving injectivity and surjectivity of a function f from a to b. 
So in order to prove that it's injective, you'll start by supposing you have x and y in A such that f of x equals f of y, and then you will decode that or unpack that using the definition of f and do some calculations here. That's what this purple box is to finally end with x equals y. And so that'll complete this proof. And then showing that f is surjective is a little bit trickier. So in your scratch work, you will solve f of a equals b for a. And what you'll get is a is written in terms of b. Then you're ready to write down your final proof. So we'll suppose that little b is in b and consider a equals, well, this crazy thing that you found after solving this. And then next up, you say something like, now observe that f of a equals b, but this is going to involve essentially the reverse calculation of this over here. Okay, so I think it's best to look at some examples of this. So let's first consider the function f that goes from the real numbers minus 0 to the real numbers defined by f of x equals 2 over x minus 1. And we'll show that that is injective, but not surjective. So let's start by showing that it's injective, and then we'll show that it's not surjective by finding someone who is missed. And then we'll redefine the codomain to make it surjective. Okay, so injective. So let's suppose that x and y are in the set of real numbers minus zero, where f of x equals f of y. And now let's unpack that and see that that means that 2 over x minus 1 equals 2 over y minus 1. But now essentially we just solve for y or solve for x. It's the same kind of thing. So we can add 1 to both sides to get 2 over x equals 2 over y. Then we can invert this and we'll see that x over 2 equals y over 2, which means that x equals y. But that's exactly where we needed to end up to show that this was injective. So now let's show that it is not surjective. And the way to do this is to think about the horizontal asymptote of this function. Notice the horizontal asymptote will be negative 1. If we let x approach infinity, this thing will like disappear and we'll have minus 1. And that's going to be the thing that is missed. So here's our claim. And that is there is no x from the real numbers minus 0 such that f of x equals negative 1. And how can we see that? And we can see that because, so let's do a little proof of that. So let's set f of x equal to negative 1 and show that we get no solution. Notice this is the same thing as 2 over x minus 1 equals negative 1, which is the same as 2 over x equals 0. But let's notice that 2 over x equals 0 has no solution. But that's exactly what we needed. Okay, so now let's maybe fix this and change this codomain from the real numbers to the real numbers minus negative 1. And now we'll show that it is surjective. So let's put an and here and we'll show that it is surjective. Okay, so the first step to showing it's surjective is to do this scratch work. Remember that scratch work is where we solve. So let's solve the equation f of a equals b for a. So let's see, that means we have 2 over a minus 1 equals b. That's the same thing as saying 2 over a equals b plus 1. But then that's the same thing as saying that a is 2 over b plus 1. Now we can see why b is not allowed to be 1. Also, that gives us a 0 in the denominator of this expression. So that would be our a. Now we're ready to show that this is surjective under these new conditions. So let's suppose that b is from the set r minus negative 1, and then let's set a equal to 2 over b plus 1, based off of that side calculation. Okay, now from here, let's do our final calculation. So we have f of a, so that's going to be equal to, let's see, 2 over a, but that's going to be 2 over 2 over b plus 1 minus 1. Great. But now you can simplify this. Maybe I won't go through all the details, but if you simplify all this, you'll see that you get b, but that's exactly what you need to get for surjectivity. Okay, let's do another. 
For our next example, we're going to consider the function, which I'll call g. It goes from z2 to z2. So in other words, from two copies of the integers to two copies of the integers, z cross z. And it's defined by g evaluated at m comma n is 2m plus 3n comma m plus 2n. Now our goal is to show that this is bijective. So let's start by showing that it's injective. So let's suppose that we have m comma n and maybe what I'll call m prime comma n prime in z2 such that g of m comma n equals g of m prime comma n prime. And what we want is for these two ordered pairs to be equal, which means both of their entries are equal to each other. In other words, m is m prime and n is n prime. Okay, so let's notice that this equation right here turns into the equation involving the outputs. So we have 2m plus 3n comma m plus 2n is equal to 2m prime plus 3n prime and then m prime plus 2n prime. Okay, but what does it mean for ordered pairs to be equal? Well, ordered pairs are equal if and only if both entries are equal. So that means we need this entry here to be equal to this entry here. We also need this second entry to be equal to this second entry. So let's bring that down. We have 2m plus 3n must be equal to 2m prime plus 3n prime. And furthermore, m plus 2n must be equal to m prime plus 2n prime. Okay, great. But now, where would we like to go from here? Well, something that I would like to do is perhaps add these two equations with some scaling. So I think maybe our best bet is to take the second equation, multiply it by negative two, and then add these two equations. Why? Because that'll cancel the m's here and the m primes here. So let's see, we'll have 2m minus 2m, that's zero. We have 3n minus 4n, so that's negative n. Then the m primes cancel similarly, and then we'll have negative n prime over here. But if negative n equals negative n prime, that means n equals n prime. Okay, great. But from here, it's a short trip to see that m and m prime are the same as well. We can perhaps take this and plug it into this first equation and do a very little bit of simplification to see that m is equal to m prime. Okay, but if m is equal to m prime and n is equal to n prime, then that means that m comma n is equal to m prime comma n prime, which is exactly what we needed to finish this proof of injectivity. Now let's show that it's surjective. Now we'll show that it's surjective. Recall that involves a little bit of a scratch calculation. So what we'd like to do is solve g m comma n equals maybe a comma b for the ordered pair m comma n. So notice that's the same thing as 2m plus 3n equals a and then m plus uh, 2n equals b. Just by using the definition of g, and then again the fact that ordered pairs are equal if and only if their entries are equal. Okay, but now we'll do essentially the same thing that we did before. So let's take this, multiply by negative 2 and add, or maybe multiply by 2 and subtract. It's the same kind of thing. So that's going to give us 2m minus 2m, which cancels. 3n minus 4n, so that's minus n, equals a minus 2b. But notice that means that n is equal to minus a plus 2b. Okay, good. And now let's swing that back into one of the earlier equations and see what that leaves us with. Perhaps we'll swing that back into this first equation. So that leaves us with 2m plus three times negative a plus 2b equals a. Okay, so that gives us 2m minus 3a plus 6b equals a. So we get 2m equals, let's see, moving that around, we'll have 4a and then minus 6b. 
which means m equals 2a minus 3b. So there we have it. We have values for m and n that will make this work. Okay, so now we're ready to write this up. So let's suppose that a comma b is in z cross z, in other words, z squared, and set m comma n equal to this thing that we calculated over here. So 2a minus 3b comma minus a plus 2b. And then observe that g evaluated at m n. Well, that's going to be the same thing as g evaluated at this. So 2a minus 3b comma minus a plus 2b. But by the rule up here, we know that will be equal to 2 times 2a minus 3b plus 3 times negative a plus 2b. That's the first entry. And then the second entry is 2a minus 3b and then plus 2 times negative a plus 2b. So that's the second entry. So just to reiterate what's going on here, because it's kind of messy, this is 2m plus 3n, and then here we have m plus 2n as needed. But now you can simplify this just doing standard calculation and you'll see that you get a, b in the end, which is exactly what we need. We found this, what's called a pre-image for the element a, b. Okay, let's maybe do one more quick one and then I'll leave you with some warm-ups. For our last function, we'll call it h and it goes from z cross z to q and it's defined by h of m n equals m over the absolute value of n plus 1. And our goal is to show that this thing is surjective but not injective. Okay, let's show that it's surjective. These are actually pretty quick and we don't actually need to do a bunch of side calculation here because we can kind of guess and check our way to it. So let's suppose that we have a over b in q. So we know that every element of the rational numbers can be written as a over b where a and b are integers but b is not equal to zero. And now let's observe that h evaluated at a comma, let's see, b minus 1 will give us a over the absolute value of b minus 1 plus 1. But that's going to end up giving us a over b. But notice this doesn't quite work if b is negative. So we might as well choose b to be bigger than or equal to one. And you might say, well, how do we know we can do that? Well, every rational number can be written with a natural number denominator, so that's totally fine. And now everything works out perfectly. Okay, so now let's show that this thing is not injective, and we can do this by counterexample. So let's first note that h of, let's see, 2 comma 0 is equal to 2 over 0 plus 1, which is the number 2. But I think we can maybe hack this together. Notice that h of 4 comma 1 is equal to 4 over 1 plus 1, which is also equal to the number 2. So we have two elements that are not the same. 2 comma 0 is not equal to 4 comma 1, but they evaluate to the same number via the function. So this means it is not injective. Okay, let's leave you with some warm-ups. So here are three nice problems to practice what we've seen today. So let's consider the function f from z to z squared or z cross z. Let's define it by f of n equals n minus 3 comma 3n plus 2. Notice the output needs to be in z cross z so it has two components. Then next, with proof, decide if f is injective and or surjective. So for our next one, let's consider the function g. It goes from r minus 3 to r minus 2, and it's defined by g of x equals 2x plus 1 over x plus 3. Let's show that is indeed bijective. And finally, let's define a function h from z cross z, in other words, z squared to z, defined by h of m n equals 3m plus 5n. And you can show that that is surjective but not injective. And that's a good place to stop. This is the 19th video in a series devoted to introductory proof writing. In the last video, we looked at the basics of functions, including injective and surjective functions. And now we want to look at compositions of functions, inverse functions, and some other things. 
Okay, so let's get started. So let's say we're given functions f, which goes from a to b, and g, which goes from b to c. Then we can define a new function, which is called g composed with f, and this is the notation, and it goes from a to c, and it's defined as follows. So g composed with f of x is the same thing as g of f of x. So in other words, we apply the function f to x, and then that result is applied by the function g. So notice x is an element of a. When we plug it into f, we get an element of b. And then when we plug that into g, we get an element of c. So that's how this works. Here's also a nice diagram. So f is like an arrow going from a to b. g is like an arrow going from b to c. And then the composition is like your shortcut. So it's an arrow from a all the way to c. Okay, let's look at a really basic example that comes from like the definition of a function as a subset of the cross product. So let's consider the set A, which has lowercase a, b, c, d, the set B, which has the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and the set C, which has w, x, y, and z. And then we'll define a function f. Notice that under this setup, f goes from a to b and it's the following ordered pairs. So a comma three, b comma two, c comma one, and d comma three. And then we've got a function g, and notice that by the way we have this set up, it's a function from b to c. So it has one w, two x, three z, four z, and then five w. Okay, and now we'd like to write the composition as a set. So let's get to it. So let's say we have our set A here, so we can put it out as a diagram as these points A, B, C, and D. Then we have our set B here, which is like just the points one, two, three, four, five. And then finally our set C, which is W, X, Y, and Z. Okay, and now maybe this blue arrow will be what F does to assign elements of A to elements of B. So notice it takes a to three, so that gives us this sort of assignment here. It takes b to the number two, so that would be that sort of arrow. It takes c to the number one, so that would be an arrow like that. And then finally it takes d to three. So let's notice it misses four and five, but that's totally okay. And then let's say in this magenta color, we'll outline the action of g. So G takes one to W, so that would be like an arrow right across. It takes two to X, three to Z, four also to Z, and then five up to Y. So it does that sort of action. And now let's take this and write down G composed with F as a set. So hopefully this shouldn't be too bad. Maybe we'll cut out the middle on these in green and trace what happens to the elements of A, B, and C. So notice that this element of A goes to three and then all the way down to Z. So what that tells us is that G composed with F of A is Z, which means we have the ordered pair A comma Z in this set. Okay, now what about B? So B is gonna loop up here through two and then straight across to Z. So we start at B, we end at X. Sorry, I should have said X. So that tells us the ordered pair B comma X is an element of our function. Okay, then what about C? Well, C loops up here to one and then straight across to W. So that tells us that in the end, under this composition, C is sent to W. That gives us the ordered pair C comma W in this composition. Then we have one more to check, and notice that takes D up to three, but then three branches down back to Z. So that means D gets sent to Z in the end. So we have D comma Z is our last ordered pair. And that would be a full set description of this composition of functions. Okay, so now let's do some more familiar examples. So our next example will involve some functions that are familiar from calculus class. So they're both functions of real numbers to real numbers. The first one, which we'll call f, sends x to x times e to the x. So let's notice that under the notation that we used last time, that would be equivalent to writing it as x gets mapped to x 
e to the x, and we can put an f up here, just to be familiar with all of the different notations of how to describe assignment. And then g takes x to x squared plus 3x. So we could write that as x gets sent to x squared plus 3x via the function g. And now since the domain and the codomain are the same, we can compose these in any order we want. So let's do that. So let's first calculate g composed with f. So that will be g of f of x, but that will be g with f of x inside, so that's x times e to the x. But g is telling us to square something, multiply it by 3, and then add those together. So that gives us x squared e to the 2x. That's what we get for squaring it. Of course, we're using standard exponential rules there. And then plus 3x e to the x. Okay, nice. And now let's do the composition in the other order. We have f composed with g of x. So that's f of g of x. So that'll be what? f evaluated at x squared plus 3x, but that ends up being x squared plus 3x times e to the x squared plus 3x. But I guess maybe the quickest takeaway here is that these are not equal. So notice that f composed with g and g composed with f are not equal to each other. And that is hopefully fairly familiar from like a calculus class. But what we get here is that the composition of functions is not commutative. Well, in fact, if we don't have the right sets chosen, then one direction doesn't even make any sense. Okay, another thing that I'll just state right now, but I won't prove, you can find the proof in the book of proof, which I'm using as a textbook for this course, is that the composition of functions is associative. The proof is pretty straightforward, and I don't think it's really illuminating in any way. So now let's move on to how injective and surjective functions behave under this composition. So for this theorem, we want to suppose that f is a function from a to b, and g is a function from b to c, just like our setup over over here for defining composition. Furthermore, we'll assume that they are both injective, and then we'll show that their composition is injective. But we'll also show that if they are both surjective, then their composition is also surjective. So this is really two proofs in one. So let's prove the injectivity proof. So let's suppose that f and g are injective and that we have x and y in the domain of g composed with f, so that will be in A, such that when we apply g composed with f to x, we get the same thing as applying g composed with f to y. And what we'd like to do is see that this leads to having x equals y. Recall that that was our standard outline for proving something was injective. Okay, so let's see how we can do that. So notice that this tells us via the definition of composition that g of f of x is equal to g of f of y. But now we'll use the fact that g is injective to say that f of x is equal to f of y. Remember, that's the definition of injectivity. So let's write that down. So since g is injective, we have f of x equals f of y. Great. But now we'll just do the same thing with f. So now since f is injective, we have x equals y. But that's exactly all we needed to do to show that the composition was injective. So let's maybe look at our beginning step and our ending step. So we had an x and a y in A, such that g of f of x was equal to g of f of y. And then we did a calculation, including using the fact that g and f were both injective, and we landed at x equals y. And recall that that was exactly the way to prove something was injective. Okay, so now let's flip this around and show the surjectivity statement is also true. So in other words, what we'd like to do is suppose that f and g are surjective and somehow get that f composed with g, or g composed with f, I should say, is also surjective. 
But remember, that means we need to take something in the codomain of G composed with F and find a preimage for it. Okay, so let's do that. So let's suppose F and G are surjective and little c is an element of capital C. So we need to take something from capital C because G composed with F goes from A to C. So our end game will be to find a lowercase a and a that gets mapped to C under this composition. Okay, so now let's apply the surjectivity of our component functions. Okay, so since G is surjective, um, we have some little b in b such that g of little b equals c. So that's exactly the definition of surjectivity applied to g, which we are assuming is surjective. And now we'll do that again, applying the definition of surjectivity of f. So since f is surjective, we have a little a in a such that f of little a is equal to b. And now we're essentially home free. We can just make the following observation, that g composed with f evaluated at this little a is exactly equal to g of f of a, but that's g of b. But remember that b was chosen just so that it gets mapped to c under g. So that's exactly what we needed to do. So what did we do? We took an arbitrary C in the codomain and via the definition of surjectivity and the properties of the given functions, we found an A in the domain such that that A gets mapped to that C under our composition of functions. But that's exactly what we need in order for this composition to be surjective. Okay, so now that we've done this, let's look at inverse functions. So hand in hand with the notion of a composition of functions is the notion of an inverse function. So let's build up towards that definition. We'll need something called the identity function first. So given any set x, so that's a capital X, the identity function, which we'll write as i sub x, goes from x to x. And what does it do? Well, essentially it doesn't do anything. So it takes every element to itself. So this is a lowercase x here being mapped to itself. And that's true for all little x in x. Okay, that's cool. Then given a bijective function f going from a to b, we say that this function g going from b to a is its inverse if two things are satisfied. g composed with f is the identity on a. So notice if we compose it in that order, we'll go from a to a. And then f composed with g is the identity on b. So if we compose it in that order, we go from b to b. And then I should point out here that under this setting, we have a special name for G, and that is the inverse of F. So we'll write it as F inverse like this. And there's a bit of stuff that we're skipping here, like how do we know that having a bijective function means that we have an inverse and stuff like that, but I think that's okay for now. Okay, so now let's look at the following example. So we've got F, which goes from the real numbers minus one to the real numbers minus two and it takes x to 2x plus 1 over x minus 1. So I won't check this as bijective. We checked that a function very similar to this was bijective earlier. So what we'll just do is find its inverse. And we're going to find its inverse using the standard like pre-calculus method. Okay, so let's set y equal to 2x plus 1 over x minus 1, and then we'll swap x and y, so that'll give us x equals 2y plus 1 over x, sorry, over y minus 1, and now we'll solve for y. So let's see, that's going to give us x times y minus x equals 2y plus 1. Now we'd like to gather all the y's on one side of the equation. That gives us xy minus 2y equals x plus 1. Now we can factor a y out of the left-hand side. That leaves us with y times the quantity x minus 2 equals x plus 1, which tells us that y equals x plus 1 over x minus 2. And then finally, that's what we assign to f inverse. So f inverse of x is equal to x plus 1 over x minus 2. And notice it has the correct domain and codomain.
Its domain is definitely all real numbers except for two. And then its codomain is definitely all real numbers except for one. And in fact, that's its range as well. And then you can check here that if you compose f with f inverse, you get the identity function. So that's good. Let's look at another example. For our next example, we'll take the function g from z squared to z squared. So that's z cross z to itself. And we'll say that it takes an ordered pair m comma n to the ordered pair 2m plus n comma 5m plus 3n. And we could do this by brute force, but I think we're going to assume that most people have seen linear algebra and use a trick here. It's not really much of a trick. So what we'll do is change our notation. And instead of writing these as ordered pairs, we'll write them as two-dimensional vectors. So that means we have g evaluated at the vector mn gives us the vector 2m plus n, 5m plus 3n. But this action over here looks exactly like multi multiplication by a two by two matrix. And what is that two by two matrix? Well, we can deconstruct it fairly easily. So this 2m plus n tells us that we should have a two here and a one here. And then this 5m plus 3n tells us we should have a five here and a three here. Now, if you want to, we can check that everything works, but as you'll see, it will work. And by check, I mean we're gonna multiply this matrix that we found, 2, 1, 5, 3, into Mn and make sure we get the right output. But let's see, swiveling this 2, 1 into Mn gives us 2M plus N. Here using like standard matrix vector multiplication, then swiveling this 5, 3 into the Mn gives us 5M plus 3N as needed. So this all checks out. So now in order to find the inverse of this function, all we have to do is find the inverse matrix. So let's do that. So we want 2, 1, 5, 3 inverse. So how do we do that? Well, it's one over the determinant. So one over AD minus BC. So two times three minus five times one. And then we'll swap the diagonals, three, two. And then we'll negate the off diagonal. So negative one, negative five. So something like that. But now let's notice that this number right here is exactly one over one, which is the number one, which tells us that our inverse is simply this matrix three, negative one, negative five, two. And I actually chose those numbers nicely because if we had gotten a fraction here, then this would not have been bijective in the integers and we would not have been able to invert this in the integers. So it's important that we got integer entries this whole way. Okay, so now we could like put this back into our original notation and say that gm inverse of mn is equal to, let's see, it'll be 3m minus n comma minus 5m plus 2n. Just putting everything back in order. And this will be the inverse. And now you can check that these are inverses, but I'll leave that to you. Okay, now we're gonna look at the notion of an image and a pre-image. So let's suppose we have a function f, which goes from a set a to a set B. Then if we have a subset X of A, the image of X under A, but generally we don't write that if the context is known. So the image of X is, well, we'll de denote it by F evaluated at the whole set. So we read that as F of X or the image of X. So it's going to be everything of the form F of little x as X goes through all of capital X. Now, let's quickly notice that the image of x is a subset of the codomain b. In fact, it's a subset of the range. Next, if we take y to be an element of the codomain b, the preimage of y, which we'll denote by f inverse of y, or just say the words preimage of y, it'll be the set of all x and a such that f of x is an element of y. Now let's notice that f inverse of y or the preimage of y is a subset of a, so that's important. The image is a subset of the codomain, while as the preimage is a subset of the domain. Okay, let's, so let's look at an example. Let's say we've got this set a, which contains lowercase a, b, c, d, e, and a set b, which contains the numbers one, two, three, four, five. And then our function f is defined by the following order pairs, a comma one, b comma three, c comma one, d comma four, and e comma two. So let's find the image of a certain set. So let's find the image of the set containing a, b, and c. 
So that'll be one because f of a is one, and then three because f of b is three, but then f of c is also one, but we already have that listed, so that doesn't add to our set. Okay, that's cool. Now what about f of the whole set a? So this would be like the image of the entire function or the range of the entire function. So let's work through a, b, c, d, and e. So a gets sent to one, Let's see, B gets sent to three, D gets sent to four, and E gets sent to two. So in the end, we get one, two, three, four. So that's not quite the whole codomain, but that is the range because it's the image of the domain. Okay, so now what about the pre-image of the set containing one and two? So let's see what that'll leave us with. So we don't wanna look for everything that gets mapped to one. So A gets mapped to one and C also gets mapped to one. So we get A comma C. Those are the things that are mapped to one. And then what is mapped to two? Well, E is the only thing that's mapped to two, so we get E. Okay, great. Now let's look at one more. Let's look at the pre-image of the singleton five. But let's notice that nothing gets mapped to the number five, so this just gives us the empty set. Okay, let's look at another example. For our next example, let's consider the function g. It goes from r to r, and it's defined to be the sine function. Okay, so let's see what we have. Let's do the image of the following set. Let's say it's everything of the form n times pi over two as n runs through all integers. Okay, so what do we know about this? Well, if n is an even integer, then we get a multiple of pi, but sine of a multiple of pi is zero. So we know that this set contains the set, the number zero. But then if n is equal to one, we get pi over two, but sine of pi over two is one, so we're good to go there. And then if n is equal to negative one, we get sine of negative pi over two, but sine of negative pi over two is negative one. So those will be the three numbers that we get. And I guess maybe you could argue that those are the only three numbers, but I think we'll leave it at that. Now let's look at the pre-image of something. So let's take the pre-image of the set containing the square root of two over two and negative the square root of two over two. So let's notice that this will be everything of the form pi over four, three pi over four, five pi over four, seven pi over four, so on and so forth. But let's notice that those are everything that is pi over four away from something that is n pi over two. So we can actually write that set as follows. It's gonna look like pi over four plus n times pi over two as n ranges through all integers. So we'll get something like that. Now we could do some other pre-images as well if we wanted to. Like what if we did the pre-image of the interval from zero up to one, maybe not including zero, but including one. So this is a bit trickier, but notice that sine of zero is zero, so we could include the point zero, or we'll start an interval at zero. And then sine of pi over two is one, so this takes us up to pi over two. So we'll have something like that. But then we'll union this with a bunch of other things that look fairly similar, and that's based off the periodicity of sine. So let's see, we'll union this with, maybe the next one will be two pi to five pi over two. Notice that's two pi plus pi over two. And then we'll get something back here as well, which is like negative two pi, and then negative two pi plus pi over two, which I think is negative three pi over two. So we get something of that form. And then we'll union those infinitely in both directions. But in fact, I think we could write that in the following setup. Maybe it would be the union as we work over all integers n of two times n times pi and then two times n times pi plus pi over two. I think that would be a nice way of writing that pre-image. And in fact, in order to make this a little bit more interesting, let's exchange this interval from zero to one to the interval from zero to infinity. And notice nothing changes. 
And that's because sine is never larger than one. So adding all of those numbers larger than one doesn't like allow you to get anything else out of the domain when taking this pre-image. So I'm gonna end with the statement of a pretty important theorem and we'll prove parts of it before leaving you with some warm up. So the following is a classic theorem. We'll prove two parts of it, but it also makes for some really important classic exercises that are somewhat of a rite of passage when going through a class like this. So let's say we've got a function f from a to b. We have two subsets of a, which are w and x, two subsets of B, which are Y and Z, then the following six containments or equalities of sets hold. So the image of W intersect X is a subset of the image of W intersect the image of X. Then the image of the union of W and X is equal to the union of the images. Then next, X is a subset of the pre-image of the image of X. So that's how you would read that properly. Then notice the pre-image acts very nicely. In fact, the intersection and the union distribute with giving you equalities there. So in fact, with union and intersection, the pre-image is almost more natural than the image. And then we also have this statement. The image of the pre-image of Y is a subset of Y. Okay, so let's see which one of these we should do. So let's maybe do this one first, and then we'll do one more. So let's see, how do we wanna do this? Well, with double set containment. So let's suppose that little x is an element of the pre-image of y intersect z. But what does it mean to be in the pre-image? Well, that means if you apply f to little x, you land in y intersect z. That's exactly what it means to be in the pre-image. But what does it mean to be in the intersection? It means that you're in both of those sets. So f of x must be in y and f of x must be an element of z as well. But where do we go from there? Well, if f of x is in y, that means that x is in the pre-image of y. That's by the definition of the pre-image. And then if f of x is in z, that means that x is in the pre-image of z. So again, that's by the definition of the pre-image. So what have we shown so far? We've shown that the pre-image of y intersect z is a subset of the pre-image of y intersected with the pre-image of z. And what's left is to show the other containment. But I'm actually gonna leave that as an exercise because it goes very, very similarly. Okay, let's do one more. So maybe for our next one, we'll prove this last statement here. So we, this is a single containment, so we only have to do one thing. So let's maybe suppose that little y is an element of f of f inverse, sorry, the image of the pre-image of y. Okay, so let's decompose this a little bit at a time. What does it mean to be in the image? Well, by the definition over here, that tells us that y equals f of little x for some little x in this inside set. But that inside set is inside f inverse of y or the pre-image of y. But what does it mean to be in the pre-image of y? So being in the pre-image of y means f of x is in y. Again, that's what it means to be in the pre-image of y. But now we can just put these two equations together. So this equation and this equation, and we have it. So since f of x is equal to y, we have y is in y. But look at what we've done. We started here with y in the left-hand side and we ended with y in the right-hand side, but that's exactly what it takes to prove this subset relationship. Okay, so now I've got some warm-ups for you. So here are three nice warm-up problems to practice what we've seen. So the first is to define two functions from integers to integers, which we'll call f and g by the following piecewise rules. So f of n is 2n minus 1 if n is bigger than or equal to 0, and 2n if n is less than 0. And then g of n is n plus 1 if n is even, and 3n if n is odd. And then you'd like to determine the composition of f with g and g with f. So I know at least one of these can be simplified quite a bit into something nice. 
So for the second one, let's define this function f from r to the open interval from zero to infinity by f of x equals e to the x cubed plus one. So let's show that f is bijective and find its inverse. Finally, we've got a counting problem. So we'd like to determine how many functions we have from the set a, b, c, d, e, f to the set 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 with the property that the cardinality of the pre-image of the singleton 5 is equal to 3. So that means there are three elements from the domain that get mapped to 5. And if you're not in the course that I'm teaching, then you might want to prove the rest of those statements from that theorem. If you are in the course that I'm teaching, well, you'll likely do those for part of your homework. And that's a good place to stop. This is the 20th video in a series devoted to introductory proof writing. And today we're going to do proofs that might come from an advanced calculus class or maybe the very beginning of a real analysis class. And I think this is kind of a new thing, introducing these types of proofs into introductory proof writing classes. The standard for a long time was to focus on proofs that came from number theory or other types of discrete math, whereas these come from continuous math. So I think that's a really good idea because it gives you a more holistic view of the types of mathematical proofs that you are going to see in upcoming courses. Okay. So today we're going to be focusing on the pre precise definition of a limit. So it's possible you saw this in an introductory calculus class, maybe like differential calculus or calculus one, but not everyone covers this in that sort of class. Okay, so let's suppose that f is a function from a subset x to r, where x is a subset of the real numbers, and a is an element of x, so a is a real number. Then we say that the limit as x approaches a of f of x equals l, and use this standard notation, if the following statement holds. So let's read this and then parse out what it means. So we have for every epsilon bigger than zero, there is a delta bigger than zero, such that if x minus a is less than delta, then f of x minus l is less than epsilon. So some authors like write this as sort of a challenge. So you challenge someone by giving them a very, very small number epsilon, and they stand up to that challenge and give you a number delta, so that as long as x is, is within delta of a, f of x is within epsilon of l. So in other words, this is like kind of saying that if x is very, very close to a, then f of x is very, very close to l, but it's doing it in a more precise way. So here's a picture of what's going on. Let's say this green is the graph of a function, so it's like the graph y equals f of x, and then we have our point down here a, and then our l here, which will be our eventual, eventual limit. So the given epsilon tells you to essentially make this epsilon band around this horizontal line l. So notice up here we have l plus epsilon, and down here we have l minus epsilon. And then this existence of a delta tells us that we can get close enough to A so that the graph is always within this epsilon band for the inputs that are, like I said, close enough to A. So notice that's what we have here detailed. So look at our little rectangle, which is from A minus delta to A plus delta, and then L minus epsilon to L plus epsilon. And our graph is totally within that rectangle. And so that would be like a graphical representation of this happening. So we could squeeze these two epsilon bands together and that will cause these delta bands to squeeze closer to A. So that's the sequence of events. The epsilons get squeezed first and they cause the deltas to squeeze. Okay, so we're gonna need three like standard lemmas in order to look at some of the proofs that we'll look at eventually. And they're all versions of this triangle inequality. And so let's look at the most basic version first. So I'll call this a lemma, it's the triangle inequality. It says if x and y are real numbers, then the absolute value of x plus y is less than or equal to the absolute value of x plus the absolute value of y. In the real numbers, this is not so obvious why it's called the triangle inequality, but in R2 it is, because this is the difference between going along two legs of a triangle versus just taking the shortcut. Okay, so let's see how this might work. 
We'll start with the right hand side. So we've got absolute value X plus absolute value Y and we will square it. So that'll give us the absolute value of X quantity squared plus two times the absolute value of X times the absolute value of Y plus the absolute value of Y squared. Okay, nice. But now notice that the absolute value of x squared and the absolute value of y squared is the same thing as just x squared and y squared, given that we're in the real numbers here. Also, the absolute value of x times the absolute value of y is bigger than or equal to x times y. So that's how we build our, in our inequality. This is bigger than or equal to x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. So again, we like make the inequality by dropping the absolute values. This to this is equality. This to this is equality, but here to here, these middle two terms are inequality. But now we can factor this. This will be x plus y squared. But squaring something and taking the absolute value and then squaring are the same thing in the real numbers. So this is equal to the absolute value of x plus y squared. But let's notice we've got a positive number squared, a positive number squared. That means we can take the square root and the order remains. So taking the square root, we have the absolute value of x plus y over here. And then bringing down the inequality in the correct direction, we'll have the absolute value of x plus the absolute value of y. But that's where we needed to end. Okay, so now let's look at our two other versions of the triangle inequality. So the next version of the triangle inequality we'll look at is sometimes known as the reverse triangle inequality. And it involves subtraction instead of addition. It says that if we have real numbers x and y, then the absolute value of the absolute value of x minus the absolute value of y is less than or equal to the absolute value of x minus y. So we'll start with our normal triangle inequality, so our initial triangle inequality. And I'm gonna rewrite this with u and v. So we have the absolute value of u plus v is less than or equal to absolute value of u plus absolute value of v. And then what we'll do from here is evaluate this for different values of u and v to produce things that look like our goal inequality. Okay, so let's start with u equals x minus y, and then v equals y. Let's note that immediately that tells us that u plus v is equal to x, just by simple calculation. So plugging this into our triangle inequality, which we proved on the previous board, gives us the following inequality. So x plus y is x, like I said, and we have that's less than or equal to the absolute value of x minus y plus the absolute value of y. So we have something like that. Okay, good. Now let's move this around so it starts to look like what we have over here. So moving this absolute value of y to the other side of the inequality gives us absolute value of x minus absolute value of y is less than or equal to absolute value of x minus y. Okay, let's put a box around that because we will hold that for just a bit. Okay, now we'll take our original inequality and evaluate it somewhere else. Well, it's at a pretty similar place. Let's take u to be equal to y minus x, and we'll take v to be equal to x. So immediately we see in this case, u plus v is equal to y. So what does that do for us? So we have u plus v in absolute values on the left-hand side. Like I said, that's y in absolute values. So we have absolute value of y is less than or equal to. So we'll have u, which is absolute value of y minus x, plus v, which was absolute value of x. So something like that. Okay. But now let's move some things around here and see what we get. So here we'll have absolute value of y minus absolute value of x is less than or equal to absolute value of x minus y, where I took the opportunity to change the order of subtraction from y minus x to x minus y, given that I'm inside of absolute value. So that's not really a problem. 
Now let's put the green and the blue box together and see what we have. So reading this green one off just as is, we won't change that, but we will change this blue box a little bit just to make it work a little bit better with our final goal. Notice that this is equivalent to saying negative absolute value of x minus absolute value of y is less than or equal to absolute value of x minus y. And now let's put a green box around this one because it's playing a similar role to the one above. But notice that these two inequalities are equivalent to the compound inequality that we want. So in other words, these two put together say that we have absolute value of x minus absolute value of y, all in absolute values is less than or equal to absolute value of x minus y, which is where we wanted to end up with this reverse triangle inequality. Okay, now let's look at another version. Here we've got another version of the triangle inequality, which will follow very, very quickly from the original triangle inequality. So we have absolute value of x minus y is less than or equal to absolute value of x plus absolute value of y. Okay, so let's go get going on this. Like I said, this will be very quick. We have absolute value of x minus y is equal to absolute value of x plus negative y. But now we'll apply the normal triangle inequality to that. That will be less than or equal to the absolute value of x plus the absolute value of negative y. But the absolute value of negative y is clearly just the absolute value of y and that takes us home. Okay, so now let's do some examples of showing limits have certain values using our precise definition. Now we're gonna do some examples where we show certain limits have certain values using our precise definition. And this is gonna involve a scratch work, so we're gonna do scratch work, and then during our actual proof, we'll essentially be writing our scratch work in reverse. So I think this is the standard way to approach this. And this scratch work first method is fairly similar to what you did when you proved a function was surjective. Okay, so let's show that the limit is x goes to two of three x minus one equals five, so that value should be somewhat familiar from a calculus class. Okay, so now let's do our scratch work, which means we're going to start at the end. We will start with this condition right here, f of x minus l is less than epsilon, and we'll work back towards this condition, x minus a is less than delta, and delta should depend on epsilon. Okay, so let's get to it. So we want the absolute value of 3x minus 1 minus 5, like I said, to be less than epsilon. Great. And then just looking ahead, down here at the end, we should have the absolute value of x minus 2 less than something. And that something is exactly what we will call delta. Great. And how do we know it's x minus 2? Well, because we're having x approach 2. And how do we know it's 3x minus 1 minus 5? Because 3x minus 1 is playing the role of f of x and 5 is playing the role of l. So in this case, there's not much to it. This will be quite quick. Let's simplify this inequality right here, or maybe the interior of the absolute value, giving us the absolute value of 3x minus 6 is less than epsilon. But notice that we can factor a 3 out of that, leaving us with 3 times the absolute value of x minus 2 is less than epsilon. So clearly we use the fact there that the absolute value of 3 is 3. And then finally we can divide 3 on both sides and we'll get epsilon over 3. And so that will be our choice of delta. And now we're ready for the proof of this limit value. So let's see it in action. So generally you start with the following language. Given epsilon bigger than 0, let's take delta to be equal to epsilon over 3. So this is the challenge. Given some arbitrary epsilon bigger than zero, we can find a delta situated in a way that will make everything work out. Okay, and then where do we go from here? So next up, let's notice that after we take this arbitrary epsilon and pick a delta, we have a conditional statement, an if-then statement. So that means we need to prove that using standard rules from proving conditional statements. So we will suppose that x minus a is less than delta and show that that leads to f of x minus l is less than epsilon. Okay, so let's do that. Let's suppose that absolute value of x minus 2 is less than delta, but delta is equal to epsilon over 3. 
but let's notice that that immediately leads to three times the absolute value of x minus two is less than epsilon, which immediately leads to the absolute value of three x minus six is less than epsilon, which in turn leads to the absolute value of three x minus one minus five is less than epsilon. And that's exactly where we needed to end up. Okay, so now let's do another example. For our next example, we'll show that the limit as x goes to three of two x squared equals 18. So let's take our approach that we did before, starting with our scratch work. So we would like the absolute value of two x squared minus 18 to be less than epsilon. And recall, we wanna root this out until we have an x minus three term. So let's try to get there. So we can divide a two out of this, giving us two times the absolute value of x squared minus nine is less than epsilon. Then maybe do a couple steps at once. This factors into x minus three times x plus three. I can write both of those in absolute values. And then dividing by two, we have that's less than epsilon over two. But now we look at that and we see we have this extra term. And this extra term in this case is this x plus three term. So we'd like to somehow take care of that, like maybe bound that above and below by something. Okay, so how can we do that? Well, let's do like a little bit of wishful thinking. So if the absolute value of x minus three is less than one, so in other words, if delta is at least one or smaller, which it probably is because we're taking an epsilon to be very small, then we have the following inequality. This will simplify down to negative one is less than x minus three is less than one. That's how compound inequalities arise out of absolute value inequalities. But this is the same thing as what? Two is less than x, which is less than four, but we want x plus three. Notice this means that five is less than x plus three, which is less than, let's see, add three, we have seven. But now taking the absolute value here doesn't really do anything. Notice this means that the absolute value of x plus three is less than seven. Okay, but now plugging this into our inequality that kind of gave us a little bit of pause and then bringing it down leaves us with the absolute value of x minus three times seven is less than epsilon over two, which means the absolute value of x minus three is less than epsilon over 14. So that tells us that should probably be our delta, but notice our delta should also be less than one based off of this. So the real problem is how to encode that in our solution. So let's maybe see how we might do that. So let's say we are given an epsilon bigger than zero. Let's take delta to be equal to the minimum of the following two numbers. One number will be one and the other number will be epsilon over 14. So you could have a crazy person give you an epsilon of like 20 and then one will be smaller, but likely epsilon is super small, like one over a million or something. So the one doesn't really matter. But that being said, this is the precise way of going about this. Okay, so now where can we go from here? Well, keeping in mind what we did over here, we're gonna need a bound for x plus three. So let's get that bound for x plus three first. Now let's see that if we suppose that the absolute value of x minus three is less than delta, then that means first of all that the absolute value of x minus three is less than one, but then bringing that all out, that tells us that x is between, like we saw over there, two and four, but that means that x plus three is between two and seven, which means the absolute value of x plus three is less than seven. And now with this setup, we're ready to finish it off. So let's maybe put observe or something like that, that the absolute value of two x squared minus 18 is the same thing as two times the absolute value of x minus three, and then times the absolute value of x plus three. But now we can put in our inequality right here. And maybe we should change what we have up here to say, notice that x minus three is less than one and absolute value of x minus three is less than epsilon over 14. That's what we get out of this minimum statement. And we'll use each of those. 
So just to reiterate, we use this less than one to derive this inequality for absolute value x plus three, and we're about to use the epsilon over 14 here. Okay, so now let's use our inequality. So now this is less than two times, so we already determined that absolute value of x minus three is less than epsilon over 14, so I can put an epsilon over 14 here. And then we know absolute value of x plus three is less than seven from this line here, so times seven here, but that all turns into epsilon. So in the end, we have absolute value of 2x squared minus 18 is less than epsilon, which was needed. Okay, let's do one more before we prove some standard results involving limits. Okay, so for our last example, before we prove some general results, we'll show that the limit as x goes to nine of the square root of x equals three. So again, let's do our scratch work first. Okay, so we will need the absolute value of the square root of x minus three to be less than epsilon. And let's look at where we should finish off. Well, we should finish off down here with the absolute value of x minus nine is less than something. And that something is what we will eventually call delta. So now how can we build absolute value of square root of x minus three to absolute value of x minus nine? Well, in this case, we'll wanna multiply by something. So what will we multiply by? Well, I think the square root of x plus three is a good choice, just based off of difference of squares factorization. And of course, we don't really need this in absolute values because that's always positive, but let's just put them in there to be safe. Okay, so multiplying both sides of this inequality by this term will give us absolute value of x minus nine on the left-hand side because square root of x squared is x. And then on the right-hand side, we will have epsilon times the absolute value of the square root of x plus three. And now we need to bound this square root of x plus three. And I think we can do that the same way as we did before, but I'm gonna need a little bit more room, so let's get rid of this. Just keeping in mind that's where we're going. So let's play the game of wishful thinking and let's say what would happen if the absolute value of x minus nine was less than one? Well, that means that x is between eight and 10. But then if we take the square root of x, we'll see that the square root of x is between the square root of eight and the square root of 10. But that's a little bit gnarly to work with, so perhaps we'll like round each of them to their closest like perfect square. So this is less than the square root of 16, which is four, and this is larger than the square root of four, which is two. So, so deleting out the middle, we have two is less than the square root of x, which is less than four. Now we can add three to all parts of this, and we'll see that five is less than the square root of x plus three, which is less than seven. But in this case, since our absolute value of x plus three lives in the numerator of the calculation, we're actually gonna need to bound it below. So let's take that. We have the absolute value of the square root of x plus three is bigger than five. And that gives us motivation to take delta to be equal to five times epsilon, not epsilon over five. Again, because things are happening in the numerator instead of in the denominator like in the previous case. And now we're ready to write down our final solution. So let's say we are given epsilon bigger than zero. Let's take delta to be equal to the minimum of one and five times epsilon. And first we will derive this inequality. First, if the absolute value of x minus nine is less than delta, then in turn it's less than or equal to one, which leads to the absolute value of x plus three bigger than five by that calculation we did over there. And now we're ready to finish this thing off. So let's maybe write it in a slightly different order just for some variety. So let's maybe say, note the following calculation. We have five epsilon is bigger than or equal to delta, since delta is the minimum of these two, but delta is bigger than the absolute value of x minus nine, but that's equal to the absolute value of the square root of x minus three times the absolute value of the square root of x plus three by factorization. 
but now that in turn is bigger than five times the absolute value of x minus three by this inequality right here, which we derived over on the scratch work. But now, I just had my epsilon backwards, but now reading this and dividing by five, we get exactly what we need. This leads to the absolute value of the square root of x minus three is less than epsilon, which is exactly what we need for this limit to have the following value. Okay, so now let's prove some more general results. For our main result, we'll prove standard limit rules that you learned in calculus. So let's suppose the limit as x goes to a of f of x is l, and the limit as x goes to a of g of x is m. So in other words, the two limits exist. Then we will show the following four statements hold. So first, the limit as x goes to a of c times f of x is c times l. So where c is a constant multiple. I haven't written that here, but let's assume c is a constant, so a real number. So in other words, we can essentially factor this c out. Then next, we'll show the sum rule. So the limit of the sum of two functions is equal to the sum of the limits. Next, the product rule. So the limit of the product of two functions is equal to the product of the limits. And finally, the quotient rule. The limit of the quotient of two functions, functions is equal to the quotient of the limits. Of course, there, we need that that bottom limit is not equal to zero. Okay, so let's get going with this first statement. So let's say we are given epsilon bigger than zero, and we'll first use this epsilon along with the fact that our limit of f of x is l in this case. So let's take delta bigger than zero such that if absolute value of x minus a is less than delta, then the absolute value of f of x minus l is not less than epsilon, but it's less than epsilon over c. So something like that. And now we're ready to essentially finish this thing off. So let's note that our final goal is the absolute value of c times f of x minus c times l, which we can factor a c out of, giving us f of x minus l. But recall that we built this to be less than epsilon over c, so this is less than c times epsilon over c, which is equal to epsilon. I guess I should state here that c is not just a constant, but it's a non-zero constant for this to work. I'll let you think about the case what happens when c is the zero constant. Okay, so let's see, did we do it? Yes, given an epsilon bigger than zero, we found a delta out of our original assumption so that this difference here was less than epsilon as needed. Okay, let's move on to our second statement. Now for our second statement. So again, let's say we are given epsilon bigger than zero. Let's take delta one and delta two bigger than zero such that if absolute value of x minus a is less than delta one, then the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon over two. Okay, so we can do that because of this limit which was given. And then also, absolute value of x minus a less than delta two should imply that the absolute value of g of x minus m is also less than epsilon over two. Great. And now we're ready to finish this thing off. Well, we have to find our final delta. So let's take delta to be equal to the minimum of delta one and delta two, and note the following calculation finishes it off. So the absolute value of f of x plus g of x minus l plus m by the triangle inequality separates out into the absolute value of f of x minus l plus the absolute value of g of x minus m. So just to reiterate, there we use the triangle inequality after moving some things around here, but we did use the triangle inequality there. But notice now we wanna apply this rule up here, but we need to include a statement here, which I forgot. If absolute value of x minus a is less than delta. So if it's less than delta, then it's less than both delta one and delta two, which means that this object right here is less than epsilon over two plus epsilon over two, which is equal to epsilon. So that finishes this proof off. Okay, now let's do our product rule proof. Okay, so now for our product rule, which is a bit trickier. So let's see how that goes. So let's say we are given epsilon bigger than zero. Let's take the following three deltas. 
So let's look at these. So our first delta will be chosen as follows. So delta one bigger than zero, such that if x minus a is less than delta one, then, which I'll write as an implication, we have absolute value of g of x minus m is less than one. Okay, well that may not seem super helpful, but let's see where that leads us. So that'll lead us to m minus one is less than g of x, which is less than m plus one. So that's pretty easy to unravel this absolute value inequality to this compound inequality. But retrieving an absolute value back into this, we'll see that this means the absolute value of g of x is less than the absolute value of m plus one. Okay, great. So that's how we choose our delta one so that this occurs. But the real takeaway here is that we actually chose this delta one so that this inequality over here happened. Okay, now we'll choose our delta two and our delta three a little bit more like we did before. So let's take delta two bigger than zero such that x minus a less than delta two in absolute values implies f of x minus l less than not epsilon over two, but epsilon over two times this object. So two times absolute value of m plus one. And now we'll choose delta three kind of in concert with this, but with the function g of x. So delta three will be chosen such that the absolute value of x minus three less than delta three implies absolute value of g of x minus m is less than epsilon over two times the absolute value of l plus one in this case. And notice by our construction, those denominators are never zero, so that's okay. Now, finally, let's set our delta to be equal to the minimum of delta one, delta two, and delta three. And then we're ready to finish this thing off. So if absolute value of x minus a is less than delta, then that means it's less than or equal to delta one, delta two, and delta three, so that's good. And now we can see that in this case, the absolute value of f of x times g of x minus l times m simplifies as follows. So we'll start by adding a version of zero in there. And that version of zero will be L times G of X. So this is equal to the absolute value of F of X times G of X minus L times G of X plus L times G of X minus L times m like that in absolute values. But now we can see that we've got a common G of X factor here and we have a common L factor here. And then we can use the triangle inequality to take those into two absolute values. So that's gonna say that this is less than the absolute value of G of X times, let's see, the absolute value of F of X minus L is gonna be left over after pulling that G of X out. And then we'll have plus the absolute value of L after pulling that out and then times the absolute value of g of x minus m is what's left over after that. But now let's notice that the absolute value of g of x is less than absolute value of m plus l. So that'll cancel this f of x minus l's denominator down to epsilon over two. And then we'll have an l times epsilon, so plus absolute value of l times epsilon over two times absolute value of l plus one. So that occurs from this last term. But notice that this l plus one and this l will cancel that down to epsilon over two with the correct inequality, giving us this whole thing is less than epsilon over two plus epsilon over two, which is epsilon. And that finishes this whole thing off. Okay, so now let's do our quotient rule. Now let's work on our quotient rule, the last thing that we need. But we're gonna prove a specialized version of this. We'll prove the case when f of x is equal to one. So we'll prove the limit as x goes to a of one over g of x is in fact equal to one over m if m is not equal to zero. But that combined with number two would give us, but that combined with the product rule would give us exactly what we wanted there. Okay, so let's do that. Well, maybe we'll put a box around this to show that this is actually what we are proven, proving. 
So let's say we're given epsilon bigger than zero, let's take the following deltas. So let's take delta one bigger than zero that makes the following happen. And that is that if x minus a is less than delta one, then we have absolute value of g of x minus m is less than uh, the absolute value of m over two. Okay, so again, that's possible. We're just taking our epsilon to be absolute value of m over two in that case. But now let's see where that takes us. So we have the absolute value of g of x minus m is using one of those triangle inequalities will be bigger than or equal to the absolute value of m minus the absolute value of g of x. But then this can be pinned on the left by absolute value of m over two. So now putting those two things together, we'll see that the absolute value of g of x is bigger than the absolute value of m over two. So again, that's from those two portions right there. But we're gonna need something involving one over the absolute value of g of x. So let's notice that one over the absolute value of g of x is less than two over the absolute value of m. But we don't actually need it like this, we need it in one other version, which I'll summarize up here. And that is one over absolute value of m times absolute value of g of x is less than two over absolute value of m quantity squared. Okay, good. Now I'm gonna get rid of this and then we'll talk about our delta two choice and finish this up. Okay, now we're ready to talk about our delta two choice. So we'll choose delta two bigger than zero such that x minus a is less than delta two implies the following. And you'll see all of this come together. So we'll have absolute value of g of x minus m is less than epsilon times the absolute value of m squared over two. And that's motivated by this inequality that we built before. Okay, so now we're ready to finish it off. So let's set delta equal to the minimum of these two, delta one and delta two, and observe that if the absolute value of x minus a is less than delta, then the following calculation holds. So the absolute value of one over g of x minus one over m turns into the absolute value of g of x minus m over m times g of x just by finding a common denominator. But then we can split these absolute values up and see that we get the absolute value of g of x minus m in the numerator over the absolute value of m times the absolute value of g of x in the denominator. But now we can apply our two deltas. So delta one will give us this inequality and delta two will give us this inequality. So this is less than two times epsilon times absolute value of m squared over two times absolute value of m squared when putting it all together, but that's equal to epsilon. And that finishes off this last case. So now I'll leave you with some warm up. So here are three nice warm up problems based off the precise definition of the limit. So you'll use that precise definition to prove the limit as x goes to four of two x plus one is nine, limit as x goes to negative three of x squared minus two is seven, and finally limit as x goes to two of two x minus one over three x plus four is three over 10. And that's a good place to stop. This is the 21st video in a series on introductory proof writing. And today we're gonna to look at basic proofs involving sequences and series. So let's start with what it means for a sequence to converge. And so maybe before that even, we should just recall that a sequence is a list of numbers. So like one, three, five, seven, nine, that's a sequence. And that's the list of all odd numbers. So that would be the sequence of all odd natural numbers. But we generally write sequences with indices. So like A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, so on and so forth. And then we package all that up into the following notation. So a sequence, which we'll write curly braces A sub n, converges to L. And in that case, we will write the limit as n goes to infinity of A sub n equals L if for every epsilon bigger than zero, there is a natural number n such that if little n is larger than capital N, 
then the absolute value of a sub n minus l is less than epsilon. So what this means is that we can always make the terms of our sequence very, very close to the limit of the sequence if we look far enough into the sequence. So here's a picture of that happening. So let's say here's our limit L. I've put my epsilon bound around L and I've put my N here. And notice my sequence is in this magenta chalk. And once we get past this capital N, we're always within our epsilon band. And the idea is that you can squeeze this epsilon band closer to L and that will push this capital N further out. But you can always find a capital N where after that point, you're always within epsilon of your limit. Okay, so now that we've like looked at that precise definition, let's show that a few sequences have certain limits using this precise definition. So let's maybe first consider the following sequence, which is of the form 3n plus 1 over 2n plus 4. And then I'm going to introduce some more notation. Sometimes you write here that n goes from 0 or maybe 1 to infinity. There could be a different starting point though. Okay, so let's write the first couple of terms of this. So if we plug in n equals 1, we will have 3 plus 1, which is 4 in the numerator. And then in the denominator, we'll have 2 plus 4, which is 6. So we have 4 over 6. So that can pretty clearly be simplified, but we won't simplify it. If we plug in n equals 2, we will have 7 over, let's see, plugging 2 in here, we'll have 8. Good. Then if we plug in n equals 3, we'll have 9 plus 1, which is 10, over, over 6 plus 4, which is also 10. Okay, then you can see this goes on and on and on. Great. And now probably from calculus, you know that the limit here should be the ratio of the leading coefficients. So it should be three over two, and that's what we'll show. So let's maybe do that in the form of a claim. So let's make our claim, which is the limit as n goes to infinity of three n plus one over two n plus four is in fact equal to three over two. And if you recall how we proved certain limits had values in our previous video when we talked about functions, there was a bit of scratch work to do to get ourselves set up. And in fact, in this case, there's also a bit of scratch work to do in order to get ourselves set up. This is kind of like solving the problem in reverse and then rewriting it in the forward direction. Okay, so let's start with where we want to end up, which is 3n plus 1 over... 2n plus 4 minus 3 halves is less than epsilon. Of course, that's within an absolute value. So that's the nth term of our sequence minus the would-be limit of our sequence. But now we probably want to simplify what's going on in the absolute value. We can do that by finding a common denominator. The denominator on this left-hand term is already even, so we only have to build up the denominator on the right-hand term. And we'll do that by multiplying by n plus 2 over n plus 2. That gives us 3n plus 1 over 2n plus 4, just bringing that down, minus... 3n plus 6 over 2n plus 4, like that. We want that to be less than epsilon. But let's see, that's going to simplify to 5 over 2n plus 4 is less than epsilon. But now we can start doing a little bit of simplification. And notice that 5 over 2n plus 4 is itself less than 5 over 2 times 1 over n. And that's just, just from dropping the plus 4 in the denominator, which makes our whole thing larger. So if we can pin that smaller than epsilon, then we're good to go. But notice that means 1 over n is less than 2 over 5 epsilon, maybe 2 epsilon over 5, which is the same thing as saying n is bigger than 5 over 2 epsilon. And this 5 over 2 epsilon is what we will take for our capital N. Okay, so now we're set up to write our proof in the proper order. Okay, so let's say we're given an epsilon bigger than 0. Let's take our capital N, which is a natural number, so that 
capital N is larger than five over two times epsilon. We can't really take it to be equal to five over two times epsilon because this may not be a natural number. But by the Archimedean principle, we know that for any real number, we can find a natural number larger than that real number. Okay, and now looking over here at the definition, we need to prove this conditional. So if little n is bigger than capital N, then a sub n minus l is less than epsilon. This is our a sub n minus l less than epsilon in our case. Okay, so let's get to it. So let's suppose that little n is bigger than capital N and then make the following calculation. So we'll have the absolute value of 3n plus 1 over 2n plus 4 minus 3 over 2, which is equal to the absolute value of 5 over 2n plus 4 by the calculation that we did over there. But that is less than 5 halves times 1 over n. We can drop the absolute value because everything in there is positive at this point. And the inequality comes from the fact that we made the denominator smaller. But now since lowercase n is bigger than uppercase n, we know this whole thing is less than 5 over 2 times 1 over capital N. But since capital N is larger than 5 over 2 epsilon, it means 1 over capital N is smaller, smaller than 2 over 5 epsilon. So we have this is less than 5 over 2 times 2 over 5 epsilon. But now those two cancel, giving us epsilon. So let's see. Have we done it? Yes. We said if n is larger than this capital N, then our a sub n minus l is less than epsilon. So that means we've proven this claim. Okay, let's do another. For our next example, we'll show that the limit as n goes to infinity of n over n squared plus one is equal to zero. And we'll do this with our scratch calculation and then final draft approach. Okay, so for our scratch calculation, we'll look at our goal, which is to show the absolute value of n over n squared plus one is less than epsilon. But notice all of the terms here are bigger than zero. So this is equivalent to saying n over n squared plus one is less than epsilon. Notice I'm not really, notice it looks like I'm not subtracting the limit, but the limit is zero. So the minus L is just minus zero in this case. Okay, now where can we go from here? Well, we'll do a similar trick as we did in the last board, and that is we'll drop this plus one, creating something larger. So in other words, we'll look at n over n squared, which is larger than n over n squared plus one. So we made the denominator smaller, which made the entire thing larger. But notice that is one over n, and if we can get this less than epsilon, then our thing is also less than epsilon. But in fact, we can make that less than epsilon fairly easily just by picking n to be bigger than one over epsilon. So that'll be our choice for capital N, or our choice that we want our capital N to be larger than. Okay, so now I think we're ready to write down this proof. So let's say we're given some epsilon bigger than zero, let's take our natural number capital N so that capital N is larger than one over epsilon. But now that means that one over capital N is less than epsilon, okay. Now we're ready to finish this thing off. So let's suppose that little n is bigger than capital N and observe that the absolute value of n over n squared plus one is equal to n over n squared plus one because we don't really need the absolute value, but that is less than n over n squared because we've made the denominator smaller, thus making the whole thing larger but that's equal to one over N, but that is less than one over capital N, given that little n is bigger than capital N, but that is in turn less than epsilon by this observation that we made up here, which was born out of the way that we chose our capital N in the first place. So let's see, we started with an N larger than this capital N and we ended with our term minus its limit is less than epsilon, which is exactly what we needed to prove that this limit was zero. Okay, let's look at a different type of limit. Now we'll look at a different type of a limit where the limit maybe does not converge, but it diverges to infinity. 
So let's say we're given a sequence a sub n. We say that the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n equals infinity if for every real number capital M, there is a capital N, which is a natural number, such that if little n is bigger than n, then a sub n is bigger than m. So instead of trying to get the terms of the sequence close to some limiting value, we want to drive the terms of the sequence as large as we can. So you think about this capital M as a very large number, and we can always achieve a tail of this sequence, which is always over that large number. Okay, so let's look at a couple of examples. So let's maybe start with a fairly simple example, which is the sequence two to the n, so powers of two. So let's notice that this is 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, so on and so forth. So that pretty clearly diverges to infinity, or it has a limit which is infinity. But let's maybe check that. So we'll do this with a scratch work and then forward direction proof just like before. So let's lay out our scratch work. So what we want is for two to the little n to be bigger than some real number m. So I think one way to do this would to be as follows. Notice if we take capital N bigger than M, then, then two to the N is always bigger than N. So if you put something in an exponent, you'll always get something larger than what's in the base, but that is bigger than M. So maybe something like this works, but this is really just like some scratch work, right? And that really kind of tells us the need for the following lemma. So the lemma would be something like this. So maybe for all n, which are natural numbers, we have two to the n is larger than n. I think something like this might help us out. Okay, so now let's go over here and prove that lemma using induction, and then we can apply the proof of that lemma or apply the result of that lemma to our final goal. Okay, so let's say lemma for all natural numbers n, we have two to the n is larger than n. Okay, so like I said, we're gonna do this by induction, which means we'll first need our base case. So our base case is the n equals one case, that's the smallest natural number, and it, pretty, and it holds pretty clearly in this case. So we have two to the one is equal to two, which is bigger than one. So we're good to go there. And now let's make an induction hypothesis. So let's suppose for some k bigger than or equal to one, we have two to the k is bigger than k. So something like that. And then let's consider the next case. So we'll consider the two to the k plus one case. Okay, but now notice that two to the k plus one is equal to two times two to the k. But that is larger than two times k by the induction hypothesis. But two times k is equal to k plus k, just by the definition of multiplication. But then since k is bigger than or equal to one, we know this is bigger than or equal to k plus one, just replacing one of those k's with one. But now we have proved our induction step. Notice we have two to the k plus one is larger than k plus one. So that finishes this proof. And now, we're, and now we're ready to prove that this sequence in fact diverges to infinity. But let's maybe do that in the place of this proof right here. Now that we've got our lemma, we're ready to prove our claim. So let's say we are given some real number which we assume to be quite large, but it's not written that it's quite large. So we've got a real number m. Now let's take a natural number, which we'll call n, such that that natural number is bigger than our real number. So this is always possible by the Archimedean principle. And now suppose that our lowercase n is bigger than our uppercase n, and notice that two to the n is larger than n by the Archimedean principle, but that's larger than our capital N by this assumption right here, but that's larger than our capital M by our setup here. So in the end, we've pushed two to the N larger than M, which if you look carefully at the definition over here is exactly what we need to do to show this limit is infinity. 
Okay, let's do a related problem. Next up, we'll look at the sequence two to the n over n. And probably from a calculus class, you know that this should also diverge to infinity. And that's because the denominator is acting like a polynomial, whereas the numerator is acting like an exponential function. And exponential functions always grow faster, they always win. But how would we show this? I think maybe to show this super carefully using the tools that we have, we could start with the following lemma, which says for all n bigger than or equal to two, two to the n is bigger than or equal to n squared. But if two to the n is bigger than or equal to n squared, then that'll nicely interact with the denominator that we have here. So that's a sketch of where we would go with this. Okay, now let's prove this with induction. Notice our base case will be the first case satisfied, which is n equals two here. So if we plug in n equals two, we get two to the two, which is equal to two to the two. Great. So that's really all there is to that. Now let's make an induction hypothesis and then prove our induction step. So let's suppose for some k bigger than or equal to two, we have two to the k is bigger than or equal to k squared. And then we'll consider the next case. So and consider, like I said, the next case, which is two to the k plus one. So let's notice that that is equal to two times two to the k. But now we can apply our induction hypothesis to take care of this two to the k. So this is bigger than or equal to two times k squared. Okay, but then we can rewrite this as k squared plus k squared. And then from here, you might need another little bit of an inequality, which I'll leave as a homework lemma. And that says that this is bigger than or equal to k squared plus 2k plus 1. And so let's just sketch out what's needed for that. And that is to show that k squared is bigger than or equal to 2k plus 1 which is definitely true after a point. Okay, so that would maybe be something to add into this to like clear up all of the gaps. But now k squared plus two k plus one is equal to k plus one squared. So we in fact have two to the k plus one is bigger than or equal to k plus one squared as needed to finish this induction proof. Okay, so now let's prove that this sequence in fact diverges infinitely. Now we're ready to finish this example off. So let's say we are given some m, which is a real number. Now let's take some natural number n such that capital N is larger than this real number m. So again, always possible by the Archimedean principle. And now we'll suppose that lowercase n is bigger than capital N and observe that this essentially takes us home. So we have two to the little n over n is bigger than or equal to little n squared over little n by our lemma, which is equal to little n, which is bigger than capital N, which is bigger than capital M as needed. So that's what finishes this proof off. Okay, now let's look a bit at series. Now we're gonna look a very little bit at series. So let's recall that the series, which can be written as the sum as n goes from one to infinity of a sub n, converges to s if the sequence of partial sums also converges to s. Let's recall the sequence of partial sums, which we'll denote by s sub n, is equal to a1 plus a2 all the way up to a n. So I think it's aptly named sequence of partial sums. Let's also recall that if the limit of the sequence of partial sums either does not exist or is plus or minus infinity, then we say that this series diverges. Okay, so let's look at a couple of examples starting with the sum of one over two to the n. Okay, so let's look at a couple of cases of the sequence of partial sums to get an idea for what's going on here. So notice that s sub one is simply one half. That's the first term. S2 is equal to one half plus one quarter, which is equal to three quarters. S3 is equal to one half plus one quarter plus one eighth, but that's three quarters plus one eighth, but that's six eighths plus one eighth, which is seven over eight. And then maybe S4 you can calculate to be 15 over 16. 
So notice the denominators are always powers of two and the numerators are one less than those powers of two. So that maybe brings us to the following claim, which would be S sub n, which is equal to one half plus one fourth plus all the way up to one over two to the n is equal to two to the n minus one over two to the n. Okay. And now let's prove this by induction. But if we can prove this by induction, then we're probably done. And that's because we can rewrite this as one minus one over two to the n, which has a limit which is equal to one, which maybe we won't show, but you would show that exactly the same as we showed these other limits were equal to one. So anyway, let's, like I said, prove this by induction. Notice the base case is done by our preparatory calculation. So let's make an induction hypothesis and prove the induction step. So let's suppose for k bigger than or equal to one, we have s sub k is equal to one minus one over two to the k, as we calculated up here and surmised. Okay. Now next, let's consider the next partial sum, which is s sub k plus one. But notice that's exactly equal to s sub k plus one over two to the k plus one. And that's because in general, a sub k plus one is all that you need to add to the k partial sum to get to the k plus first partial sum. Now we'll apply our induction hypothesis to get one minus one over two to the k plus one over two to the k plus one. Okay, but now we can simplify this pretty easily by giving ourselves a common denominator. We can add one here if we multiply by two here. And then if we subtract those, we get one minus one over two to the k plus one just as needed. And that proves the closed form of the sequence of partial sums in order to prove that this is in fact equal to one because the limit of the partial sums is equal to one, you would have to prove that carefully with the epsilon n definition of the limit of the sequence like we've been doing, but I'll maybe leave that as a little bit of a homework exercise. It follows very similarly to the other examples we did. Okay, let's do another. For our next example, we'll look at the sum as n goes from one to infinity of one over n squared plus n. And here we're gonna take motivation from calculus where we did partial fraction decomposition. And let's take this one over n squared plus n and note that we can rewrite it one over n minus one over n plus one. So if we give those things a common denominator, we'll see that that works exactly. And now let's write our nth partial sum. So notice S sub n will be the first term. So that'll be one minus one half plus the second term, which is one half minus one third, plus the third term, which is one third minus one fourth, all the way up to the nth term, which by our decomposition is that thing over there. So this is one over n minus one over n plus one. But notice there's a lot of cancellation here. We get this half cancels this half, this third cancels this third, this quarter will cancel this quarter, all the way down to this one over n will be canceled by something before it, leaving us with one minus one over n plus one. But perhaps we would really wanna prove this carefully with induction. So let's see how we would lay that out. So let's make our claim that S sub n is one over or one minus one over n plus one in this case. So notice that our base case will be the n equals one case here, which will be just one over two, which is equal to one minus one half. And now let's make an induction hypothesis. So let's suppose for some k bigger than or equal to one, we have s sub k is equal to one minus one over k plus one, and let's consider the next term. So s sub k plus one will be s sub k plus the k plus first term, but we'll take this format for the k plus first term. So this will be one over k plus one minus one over k plus two. Two. But now we can use our induction hypothesis to rewrite this S sub K as one minus one over K plus one. And we'll see that these one over K plus ones cancel and we're left with exactly what we need, which is one minus one over K plus two. So that establishes this closed form here.
But now all we have to do is take the limit of this sequence of partial sums. Again, proving that carefully using our epsilon n method, we'll see that this goes to the number one. So that means the value of this series is one. Okay, let's look at one more series. Now we're gonna look at a famous series known as the harmonic series. So that's the sum of terms one over n, the sum of reciprocals of natural numbers. So in other words, this is like one plus half, plus third, plus quarter, plus dot, dot, dot. And maybe surprisingly, we'll show that this diverges, which you probably saw in a second semester calculus class already. Okay, so let's see how to do that. Instead of taking the nth partial sum, we'll take the two to the nth power partial sum. So let's see, S sub, like I said, two to the n. So that'll be one plus one half, plus one third, plus one quarter, plus one fifth, plus one sixth, plus one seventh, plus one eighth. And like I said, ending way out here at one over two to the n. Okay, nice. And now we're gonna make some replacements. So let's maybe make this, let's maybe group one third and one quarter and replace, and we'll replace one third with one quarter. We'll group a fifth through an eighth and we'll replace a fifth, a sixth, and a seventh with an eighth. And then we'll continue to do that. But making those replacements means that we have something smaller because a quarter is smaller than a third and an eighth is smaller than a fifth and so on and so forth. So that means our starting thing is greater than one plus one half plus a quarter plus a quarter is a half. An eighth plus an eighth plus an eighth plus an eighth is also a half. And you'll see that we have just a bunch of strings of one half. But how many strings of one half do we have? Well, we have exactly n copies of one half. And that's because we went out here to two to the nth power. So that's pretty clear here because this is two to the third power and after one over eight, so going out that far, we have three copies of one half. Okay, so notice that we can put all these together and we'll get one plus n over two, but now that clearly goes to infinity as n goes to infinity, which again, you can check with an mn argument like we did before. But the important thing here is that we have shown that this harmonic series is in fact divergent. So we have a divergent series. Okay, so now let's prove a general result before I leave you with some warmups. Now we're gonna prove a result whose contrapositive is known in a calculus class as the test for divergence. So in particular, we'll show that if the sum as n goes from one to infinity of a sub n converges, then the limit of the terms equals zero. Let's recall the contrapositive says that if the limit of the terms is not zero, then our series diverges. Okay, so let's get going with the proof. So let's suppose that the sum as n goes from one to infinity of a sub n has a value of s. And then let's also set s sub n to be the nth partial sum. So a1 plus a2 all the way up to a sub n. So we know that s sub n converges to s. So let's use that via the definition of convergence for a sequence. So let's say we're given an epsilon bigger than zero, let's take our capital N, which is a natural number, such that if little n is bigger than capital N, then the absolute value of S sub n minus S is less than epsilon over two. Now we'll choose epsilon over two for a reason which will come up. And we're allowed to do all of this because we know something about the convergence of that sequence of partial sums. Okay, so now let's observe that if little n is bigger than capital N minus one, so that's our new capital N in this case, it's just capital N minus one, or capital N plus one, I should say. And that's because that means N minus one is larger than N, just for what it's worth. We have the following result. So let's notice the absolute value of A sub N is the same thing as the absolute value of s sub n minus s sub n minus one, the nth partial sum minus the n minus first partial sum. Notice that's just taking all of these terms and subtracting off all but one of them. 
But now we'll add a version of zero in here. This is equal to the absolute value of s sub n minus s plus s minus s sub n minus one. Like I said, just adding a version of zero in there. But now we can apply the triangle inequality to see that this is less than or equal to the absolute value of s sub n minus s plus the absolute value of s sub n minus one minus s. But since n minus one is larger than n, and that means that n is also larger than n, we know that each of these is strictly less than epsilon over two by our setup right here. But that's equal to epsilon. But that means we have our a sub n term is less than epsilon, which is exactly what we need for its limit to be zero. Okay, so now I've got some warm-ups for you. Now I've got three warm-up problems for you. So the first is to show using the epsilon n definition of a limit of a sequence that the limit as n goes to infinity of n minus three over two n plus five is one half. Next, show via partial sums and stuff like that, that the sum as n goes from one to infinity of one over three to the n is equal to one half. So at the end of this, you'll need an epsilon n proof that the limit of the sequence of partial sums is what you want it to be. And then finally, a little bit more general of a proof, which you can adapt something from what we did in a previous video, and that is show that the limit, if the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n is L, and the limit as n goes to infinity of b sub n is m, then the limit of the sequence built out of the sum of the terms is l plus m. And that's a good place to stop. This is the 22nd video in a series devoted to introductory proof writing. And today we want to talk about what it means for sets to be the same size. And this is even if they're not finite sets. So let's jump right into a definition. So we'll say that sets A and B have the same cardinality, or we may say they are equinumerous if there is a bijective map between them. So we might call that bijective map F. So we've got a bijection from A to B. And then in that setting, we'll write the following maybe bit of notation. We'll say the cardinality of A is equal to the cardinality of B, or really this set with like absolute value symbols around it, but it's not really absolute value symbols. Or we might say they have equal cardinality with this notation. So notice we've got A equals with a subscript C, B. So that means they have equal cardinality or they are equinumerous. So what's the main idea here? Well, the main idea is to count things are the same with act out, without actually counting. And just imagine that you have six objects. Maybe you've got six blue objects and you also have six magenta objects, but you don't know how to count past four. How might you know that there are the same number of blue object objects as magenta objects? Well, you could know that just by matching every blue object with exactly one magenta object. So we'll match this blue dot with this magenta dot and so on and so forth. And then we've shown that there are the same number of blue dots as there are magenta dots without actually counting them. Yeah, there are six blue dots and six magenta doc dots, but we didn't really need to count up to six to show that there were the same number. All we had to do was to show that there was a one-to-one -one correspondence or a bijection from the set of blue dots to the set of magenta dots. Okay, so let's look at a little bit more of a concrete example. Let's say we have the set A, which is the set containing 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So it has six elements. And let's say we have the set B, which is the set containing 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, and 13. So another six elements. Notice they both have six elements, which means there's probably a bijection between them. And in fact, we can exhibit this bijection by the following map, which I'll call F. So it'll take N and send it to three plus two N. And so even though A has six elements and B has six elements, we can show they have the same number of elements without actually counting to six by checking that this is indeed a bijection. Okay, now let's look at some more interesting examples. Now let's look at a more interesting example. So I think we can all agree that the set of natural numbers and the set of integers both have infinitely many elements. 
But do they have the same infinity of elements? Well, this theorem will show that they do. So we'll show that the cardinality of natural numbers is equal to the cardinality of integers. So in other words, we can find a bijection from natural numbers to integers. Now, how might we do that? Well, let's do it with a schematic first. And after we do that, we'll write down maybe a formula for this map. So let's define our function f from n to z by the following diagram. So I'll put all my natural numbers on the first row. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, so on and so forth. And then I'll list my integers on the second row. And I'll list them in the following order. Maybe 0, 1, negative 1, 2, negative 2, 3, negative 3, so on and so forth. So I think there's a pretty clear pattern of how we are listing the integers. And so the function that we're making will map 1 to 0, 2 to 1, 3 to negative 1, 4 to 2, 5 to negative 2, 6 to 3, 7 to negative 3, and so on and so forth. Now, I think this is pretty clearly a one-to-one -one and onto map, in other words, a bijective map, which indeed shows that the set of natural numbers and the set of integers are equinumerous. But since we can in this case, let's write down a formula for this function. Okay, so let's notice that f of n has the following behavior. So it's pretty easy to see what it does to even numbers. It just takes half of them. So two gets mapped to one, four gets mapped to two, three to six, that's half of each of those. So this will go to n over two if n is even. Then we just have to decide what happens if n is odd. And looking at, looking at it for a little bit, we'll see that it sends n to one minus n over two if n is odd. And let's check that to make sure it makes sense. So notice 1 will be sent to 1 minus 1 over 2, that's 0. 3 gets sent to 1 minus 3 over 2, that's negative 2 over 2 or negative 1. And then you can check the rest of them seem to work out as well. So this is our map. And then we could check that this is bijective, like by hand if we wanted to. So let's maybe do that for practice. We'll first show that it's injective. So let's suppose that f evaluated at m is the same thing as f evaluated at n, and then we'll break this down into two cases. So the first case is that f evaluated at m and thus f evaluated at n are both less than or equal to zero. Well, they're equal, so they both have to be less than or equal to zero if one of them is. But if they're both less than or equal to zero, they must be from this output. Notice that things of this form, 1 minus n over 2, where n is a natural number, are less than or equal to 0, whereas things of this form are always strictly bigger than 0. So what does that tell us? That tells us that 1 minus n over 2 is equal to 1 minus m over 2, which leads us to m equals n. Okay, then we would need to go on to our second case. So case two would be f of m equals f of n, which is strictly bigger than zero. So in that case, we know that we're coming from this setup right here. So we have m over two equals n over two, which again leads us to m equals n. Okay, so either way we have it, we have f of m equals f of n leads to m equals n, which means we do have injectivity. Now let's prove surjectivity. So let's say that we've got an integer and find a pre-image for that integer. So if we've got an integer b, we'll split this into two cases. So our first case is what happens if b is bigger than or equal to 1. So if b is bigger than or equal to 1, then note that f evaluated at 2b is exactly equal to b. And that's pretty clear that's how it's going to happen from our chart up here. Notice that all positive integers are landed on by the even integers. Okay, so now what about our second case? So case number two is what happens if b is less than or equal to zero. So here you can note that f evaluated at 1 minus 2b is equal to b. And you might be worried because 1 minus 2b seems like it may not be a natural number and our domain is all natural numbers. But if b is less than or equal to 0, then 1 minus 2b is most definitely a natural number just by construction.
So anyway, either way we have it, we have found a pre-image for our integer b. So putting these th two things together, we see that f is a bijection, which really finishes off this careful proof that the natural numbers and the integers are equinumerous. Okay, let's do another. So we just finished showing that the integers and the natural numbers are equinumerous. But now we'll show that not all infinite sets are equinumerous with each other, and we'll do that via an example. We will show that the natural numbers and the real numbers are not equinumerous. So that means there are different cardinalities for infinite sets. Okay, so how might we do this? Well, we'll do this by way of contradiction. So by way of contradiction, let's suppose that the cardinality of the natural numbers is the same thing as the cardinality of the integers. And let's say that's via some bijection, which I'll call f. And so that goes from n to r. Great. And now let's consider the decimal expansion of everything in the image of f. So I could write f of one as a whole number part, which I'll just write as a star. We won't need the whole number part. And then decimal point a11, a12, a13, a14, so on and so forth. So we've got these places on the decimal uh, double subscripted. The first subscript is which natural number they come from, and the second is their position. So that means f of 2 will look like, well, a whole number part, which we don't care about, so I'll put a star there. And then a21, a22, a23, a24, so on and so forth. Maybe we'll write one more down. f of 3 will be star dot a31, a32, a33, a34, dot, dot, dot. Okay, great. But now we'll show that this function cannot be surjective, and we'll do that by constructing something which is not in this list. So notice this list goes on and on and on, and since we're towards a contradiction, supposing it's bijective, then every real number should be on this list. But like I said, we'll find a real number that's most definitely not on this list. Okay, so let's define a number which I'll call y, which is on the open interval between 0 to 1, by the following decimal expansion. So I'll say y is equal to 0 point b1, b2, b3, b4, so on and so forth. And these bn's will be defined by the following like kind of decision. They'll be equal to zero if a n n is not zero, and they're equal to one if a n n is equal to zero. So we go on this diagonal right here. So let's highlight this diagonal. So a one one down to a one two down to a sorry a one one down to a two two down to a three three down to a four four and so on and so forth. And we look at a one one and we decide is it zero or is it not zero. If it's zero, then we set b1 equal to one. If it's non-zero, we set b1 equal to zero. And then we continue doing that. But let's notice that by doing that, we'll have the nth decimal place of y is always different than the nth decimal place of f evaluated at n. But that means that y is not the output of anything here. So let's maybe summarize that here. We have y is not equal to f of n for all natural numbers n, which means that f of n does not contain y, so it cannot be all real numbers. But that means that it's not bijective, but it not being bijective is a contradiction, contradicting our original assumption that the natural numbers and the real numbers were equinumerous. So again, let's review how we know that y is not equal to f of n for all n, which are natural numbers. That's because the first decimal digit of y is different than the first decimal digit of f of one. So that means it can't be f of one. The second decimal digit is different than the second decimal digit of f of two, so it can't be f of two. The third decimal digit is different than the third decimal digit of f of three, so it can't be f of three, and so on and so forth. So wrapping that all together, we have y cannot be one of these f of n's, which means f cannot be bijective.
Okay, let's maybe look at some sets that are equinumerous with R. Next up, we'll show that the open interval zero to infinity is equinumerous or has equal cardinality with the open interval from zero to one. And we'll construct a function that does this, but we'll use a geometric argument to start that function. Okay, so let's start with our real number line here. Let's maybe put zero on the real number line at that spot. Maybe back here, we'll put negative one. And then let's put a partial real number line. Maybe what I really mean is the interval between zero and one going vertically right there. Great. And then next up, we're gonna need this point up here which is the point negative one comma one. So let's put that in there, negative one comma one. And then let's go over here to some arbitrary x, which is between zero and infinity. So it's on that open interval. And then let's make a line segment from x to our point negative one, one. So the line segment would look something like that. And then its intersection point with this interval will be called f of x. And now notice as x move towards zero, f of x will also move towards zero. And then as x gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, f of x will move towards the number one. Let's maybe point this as the number one here. And we can also get a nice formula for f of x using similar triangles. Okay, so let's drop a vertical right here. We'll notice this has length one, and then this has length f of x, obviously, and length x. But from x to negative one, we have length x plus one. So let's see. We can see that one over x plus one is equal to f of x over x. Again, by similar triangles. We've got the height of this triangle and the base, the height of the smaller triangle and the base. But putting this together, we see that f of x is equal to x over x plus one. And then you can check that this is bijective and you could maybe check this using methods previously in the course. So I'll leave that as a little bit of a homework exercise. So check this is bijective for the region that we need it to be. So in other words, it goes from zero infinity to zero one. But the appearance of that bijective function means that these have equal cardinality. Okay, let's move on. Now we're gonna prove a very important general result that says equality of cardinality is in fact an equivalence relation. And let's recall, in order for it to be considered an equivalence relation, it must be reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. So we'll check each of these, starting with reflexivity. So this is pretty quick. Let's notice that the identity map, which is generally called I sub A, which goes from A to A and is defined by a, I sub A evaluated at A equals A, is a bijection. There's not really much to that. I won't check that's a bijection or anything. The identity map is kind of clearly a bijection. But the fact that that's a bijection means the cardinality of A is equal to the cardinality of A, which is exactly reflexivity for this relation. Now let's look at symmetry. So let's suppose that the cardinality of A equals the cardinality of B, and let's say via a bijection from A to B, which I'll call F. Okay, but if F is a bijection, it has an inverse. So I'll write that as since F is bijective, there exists a unique, so there's some notation, there exists a unique inverse, which I'll call F inverse from B to A, which is also a bijection. So I think earlier we proved that a function has an inverse if and only if it's a bijection. Okay, so that means F inverse is a bijection, but the fact that F inverse is a bijection means the cardinality of B equals the cardinality of A. But starting here at cardinality of A equals cardinality B and ending here at cardinality B equals cardinality of A is exactly the symmetry rule for equivalence relations or for relations. Okay, now let's look at transitivity. So let's suppose that cardinality of A equals cardinality of B and cardinality of B equals cardinality of C via bijections again. So bijections 
which I'll call F going from A to B and G going from B to C. And then previously we showed that composition of bijections was a bijection. So that tells us that G composed with F, which goes from A to C is also a bijection. So again, we did that in a previous video. I won't go over it here. It's pretty straightforward if you just follow the definitions of injectivity and surjectivity. But that means we've got a bijection from A to C, which leads us to say the cardinality of A is equal to the cardinality of C. But starting with these two equalities and ending with this is exactly what we need for the transitivity of this relation. So putting these three things together, the equality of cardinalities is an equivalence relation. And you might say, well, equivalence relations always come with equivalence classes. So what are the equivalence classes in this case? Well, the equivalence classes are exactly what are known as the cardinal numbers. So that's more of an advanced set theory type thing. But for instance, the equivalence class of the cardinality of the natural numbers is given by the cardinal number, which is called aleph zero. And then there's another one for the equivalence class of the cardinality of the real numbers and so on and so forth. So again, we're not gonna talk about that so much here, but a full course in set theory would study these things in depth. Okay, let's do another example. Now we're gonna look at two more kind of important examples. The first is that the cardinality of the real numbers is equal to the cardinality of the interval from zero to infinity. But that seems like it should follow. Notice that this interval from zero to infinity is essentially half the real numbers. And we know that's equinumerous with zero to one, which is much smaller. So it seems like it should also be equinumerous with r. And we can do this with a pretty simple function. Let's consider the function g going from r to this interval from zero to infinity defined by g of x equals e to the x, like from calculus class. So it's well known that the values of that function are all non-negative, or I guess I should say positive real numbers. And also it's a one-to-one -one function. So that means it's bijective to the interval from zero to infinity but that proves this equality of cardinality. Now we've got one that's a little bit more interesting and that is the interval from zero to one, not including zero and not including one, has equal cardinality to the closed interval from zero to one. And we can do this kind of with a picture. So let's say we've got our open interval from zero to one here, and then maybe underneath we'll have our closed interval from zero to one. And the idea is we want to take single points out of this open interval, map them onto the end points, and then kind of fill in the gaps afterwards. So there's a number of different ways to do this. Maybe here's how we'll do it. Let's take the point right here, which is one half, and we'll map one half to the number one. And then after that, we'll take the point right here, one third, and we'll map that to zero. And then after that, we'll take one quarter and we'll map that to one half. And then we'll take one fifth and we'll map that to one third. And then we'll take one sixth and we'll map that to one quarter. And now I think you can kind of see what we're doing. So we're taking a half and a third and we're filling in those two open points into closed points. And then we're like just kind of cascading everything down after that. And then what do we do with every point that's not of this form? Well, those just get mapped to themselves. So we could put that together as follows. Let's define f from 0, 1 to closed 0, 1 by f of x equals, so this is going to be a big piecewise function. So it'll equal 1 if x is equal to 1 half, 0 if x is equal to 1 third. But then let's notice 1 quarter gets mapped to a half, then 1 fifth gets mapped to a third. So it'll get mapped to 1 over n minus 2 if x is equal to 1 over n and n is bigger than or equal to 4. So does that work out? Well, 1 over 4 gets mapped to 1 over 2, 1 over 5 gets mapped to 1 over 3, and so on and so forth. And if we're not one of those numbers, then it gets mapped to itself. So f of x is equal to x otherwise. And you can check that this is one to one and onto, but by construction, it's pretty clearly one to one and onto. So that shows us that open intervals and corresponding closed intervals have the same cardinality. 
But now putting this together with the fact that cardinality makes an equivalence relation tells us that all of these sets are the open interval from zero to infinity, the open interval from zero to one, the closed interval from zero to one, the half open interval, etc. have the same cardinality. So of course we only checked some of those. We didn't check this one with the half open interval, but you could imagine that it has a pretty similar to proof to what we saw right here. You might say, well, why are we dealing with the open interval between zero and one? What about more generally the open interval from A to B? Well, just by scaling, you can also check that that has the same cardinality, but we'll leave that for a homework exercise. So here I've got three nice warm up exercises based off what we saw. So the first is to show that the cardinality of the set of even integers is the same thing as the cardinality of the set of odd integers. Next, show that the cardinality of the set of 0, 1 cross n is the same thing as the cardinality of n. So there, that's just the finite set containing two elements, 0, 1. And then finally, show the cardinality of the real numbers is the same thing as the cardinality of the set from 3 to 19. So you might actually want to use transitivity here by showing that 3 to 19 is equal in cardinality to 0, 1, and then apply a result from the video. But you could do this a number of different ways. And that's a good place to stop. This is the 23rd video in a series devoted to introductory proof writing. And today we're going to talk about what it means for a set to be countable and uncountable. Let's jump right into a definition. So we say a set A is countable if it's either finite or it's equinumerous with the natural numbers. That is, it has the same cardinality of the natural numbers. And if you recall from last time, that was equivalent to having a bijection between the natural numbers and that set. Okay, and then we say that A is uncountable otherwise. In other words, there is no bijection between N, the natural numbers, and the set A, or their cardinality is not the same. Now, the cardinality of the natural numbers is an important cardinal number, if you will, and so we generally give it a name, and that name is Aleph Zero. So I think my like handwriting for this is not great, but it generally looks like this shape. You can Google it and get an idea for different ways of write, writing this down. It's the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And so like I said, the cardinality of the natural numbers is Aleph zero, but we could write that as an equation as follows. Okay, so let's move on to our first big result of the day, which will help us prove a lot of associated results. And that is a set is countable if and only if its elements can be arranged into a list. Okay, so this is an if and only if statement, which means we have two directions to prove. Let's prove the forward direction first. So we'll start by supposing that A is countable. But notice that breaks into two cases immediately. So either A is finite, so let's write that as case one, A is finite, but in that case, we can write A as its elements. So in other words, we have A is A1, A2, A3, all the way up to AN, where N is the cardinality of A in this case. But clearly that's a list. So we've listed the elements of A. So if A is finite, this is pretty straightforward. And so let's look at case two, which is A is infinite and Thus, the natural numbers have equal cardinality to A, and let's say that's via a bijection, which I'll call F, which goes from N to A. But notice that this bijection can easily be used to build a list of the elements of A. So notice we have a list with every element from a, and that list goes like this, F evaluated at one, F evaluated at two, F evaluated at three, F evaluated at four, and so on and so forth. Okay, so either way we have it, via these two conditions that give us countability, either finiteness or infinitely countable, we can build a list that contains all of the elements from A. So that finishes the proof of this forward direction. And now we'll move on to the proof of the reverse direction. So let's suppose the elements 
of A are arranged in a list. And that list is A1, A2, all the way up to AN, and then let's keep going. So maybe I won't look at the case when this list is finite. If this list is finite, then A is clearly a finite set. But then if A is a finite set, then it's countable. So let's only look at the case where A is infinite and all of its elements are on this list. But the fact that we've got a list of all of these elements gives us a really easy way of creating a bijection between the natural numbers and the elements on our list. And the natural numbers is just defined by the order of our list. So we could send the natural number 1 to A1. We could send the natural number 2 to A2. And in general, we could send the natural number N to AN. So in other words, this defines a bijection, which we'll call F, going from N to A by F evaluated at N is A sub N. But the fact that we've got a bijection from n to a is exactly what we need to have the cardinality of n equal to the cardinality of a, finishing the proof of this result. Okay, so now let's apply this result a few times. Our first main result will be to prove that the rational numbers are countable. That is, the cardinality of the natural numbers is the same as the cardinality of the rational numbers, which may seem a little bit surprising because the rational numbers seem so much bigger than the natural numbers. In fact, it seems like they should be closer to the real numbers, but they're not. They're not closer to the real numbers. In fact, they are equinumerous with the naturals, and we'll prove that here. Okay. So our strategy will be to list or create a list which contains all of the rational numbers. And then since we have that list, that list can be used to find a bijection, which will finish it off via the result of the previous theorem. So I've started a chart here that will help us form our list. And along this first row, we'll write what will eventually become the numerator of a certain rational number. And then along the column, we'll write what, be what will become, what will eventually become the denominator of a certain rational number. Then in the numerator, we're gonna list all integers. So I'll list 0, 1, negative 1, 2, negative 2, 3, negative 3, so on and so forth. So I think we can all agree that that will be a list of all of the integers, kind of as we saw previously. And then down the column, I'll list all of the natural numbers. And that's because if I take the numerators to be any integer, I only need the natural numbers as denominators in order to get all of the rational numbers. Okay, so here we'll have one, two, three, four, and then so on and so forth. I think that's far enough to get an idea of what's going on. And then at the intersection of the rows and the columns, we'll form a fraction with the denominator given by whichever column we're in, or the numerator given by whichever column we're in, and the denominator given by whichever row we're in. So let's see, this will be zero over one, here we'll have zero over two, zero over three, zero over four, and so on and so forth down. So notice those are all equal to zero, which is not super interesting, but we will definitely have repeats here, which we'll take care of in the end. And then here we'll have one over one, one over two, one over three, one over four, so on and so forth. So those are all new. And then next we'll have negative one over one, negative one over two, negative third, negative fourth, so on and so forth. Here we have two over one, two over two, two over three, two over four, so on and so forth. Negative two over one, negative two over two, negative two over three, negative two over four, and then continuing in that direction to the right and down. Notice that we've listed some of the numbers more than once. We have one half here and we have two over four here, which is equal to one half. We have one here and then we have two over two, which is also one here. So once we make our list, we'll have to like exclude repeats. Now, how will we make our list? Well, the trick is to count along a diagonal. We can't count along all of the rows because we've got an infinite list here, an infinite list here. There's nowhere to stop going out that way. But if we count along diagonals like this, we can make a list. So let's do that. So we'll count like this first, okay? And then after that, we'll count like this. 
So maybe I'll put a circle around what we keep and then I'll go straight through what we don't keep. So we will not keep this zero over two because we've already counted it. Then we won't keep this zero over three because we've already counted it, but we will keep the one over two and the negative one over one. So just to like be clear, this is the order that we're making our list in. So this is, will be the first element, the second element, the third, the fourth element, and then the fifth, sixth, and so on will come from here, here, and then trending down and right. So let's draw what's going on in this next diagonal. So we'll get a third, we'll get negative half, we'll get two over one. So we'll get all of those numbers. So this will be the fifth element of the list, the sixth and the seventh. And then let's keep going. So we'll skip the zero over five, which is right here. We'll get the one over four. We'll get the negative one over three. We will skip the two over two, but we will take the negative two over one. And that'll be the eighth, ninth, and 10th elements of our list. So now putting this all together, we'll see that we will form a list. And that list goes like this, zero, then the next element is one, and then one half, and then negative one, and then one third, and then negative half, and then two, and then a quarter after that, and then negative one third after that, and then negative two after that, and so on and so forth. So we've made a list that definitely contains rational numbers. Will it contain all rational numbers? Well, it will because somewhere on this table is every rational number. And since we're counting through every element of this table and either keeping it or throwing it away, we'll eventually count every rational number. And that's the, essentially the idea of this proof that the rational numbers are countable. We do that by making a list. Notice that it would be extremely difficult to write down a formula that defines a bijection between n and q. In fact, it's not really worth it given that this description here without a formula is pretty clearly a bijective correspondence. And it's kind of nicer anyway. Okay, so let's do another related result. Now we're gonna prove a related result. And that says if A and B are both countable, then so are the sets A cross B, their Cartesian product, and A union B, their union. Okay, so let's get off the ground. So the first thing that we'll do is write A and B as lists. So we'll write A as A1, A2, A3, dot, dot, dot. So there we have a potentially infinite list there. And then we have B is the set B1, B2, B, three, dot, dot, dot. So we know that we can write A and B as lists by that theorem that we started the video off with. Now that we've done that, we wanna focus on the case when we're looking at A cross B, and then we'll swing around to A union B afterwards. And the case when we're looking at A cross B is very, very similar to what we did with the rational numbers. You can maybe even guess what it's gonna look like by what we did with the rational numbers. So let's list everything in A along this first row and everything in B along this first column and then we'll make diagonals just like we did before. So here's A1, A2, A3, A4, so on and so forth going infinitely in that direction. And here we'll have B1, B2, B3, B4 and then infinitely down as well. And then at the intersection of the rows and the columns, we'll put our ordered pairs. So here we have A1, B1. Here we have A2, B1, A3, B1. Finally, A4, B1, and so on and so forth. That's what's happening in the first row. And then in the first column going down, we'll have A1, B2, then A1, B3, a1, B4, and then down with entries A1. Then we can fill out the rest similarly. So here we'll have A2, B2, and then A3, B2. And here we'll have A2, B3, and then A3, B3. And then I'll let you fill in more if you need to. And now we're gonna play this same game that we did with the rational numbers to create a list. So let's go across the diagonal here to make our 
first entry in our list. So there's our first entry. And then we'll go across this next diagonal here to create our second and third entries in the list. And then we'll go across this diagonal here, which is right below it, to make our fourth, fifth, and sixth entries in the list. And then we'll just keep going down and down and down and down. And since every element of A cross B is in this array somewhere, and we're going through every element of A cross B and like listing them in this certain order, that means we have actually formed a list of all of the elements of A cross B. But forming a list of the elements of A cross B means that A cross B is countable. In other words, the cardinality of A cross B is the same thing as the cardinality of the natural numbers. Okay, so now let's look at the case when we're taking A union B. So the case for A union B is a little bit shorter. We'll just make a single list. We don't have to make an array or anything. It's just what we'll think about is shuffling the elements of A and the elements of B together. So I'll write A union B with the following notation. So we'll take A1, B1, A2, B2, A3, B3, and so on and so forth. So we alternate elements of A and elements of B. And then, well, since the union throws out duplicates, we'll just throw out duplicates whenever we need to. But the end result is that we've created a list of all of the elements of A union B, but that's exactly what was needed to show that the cardinality of A union B is the same thing as the cardinality of the natural numbers. We've found a list of the elements of A union B. Okay, so now I'd like to introduce a couple of more definitions having to do with unequal cardinalities. Now we somehow want to classify sets that do not have equal cardinality by size, and we'll do that with the following definition. So let's suppose that A and B are sets, then we define the following three notions, one of which we've defined before. So the cardinality of A equals B, if and only if there's a bijection from A to B. Let's recall we also had this notation here with a equal sign and a subscript C. I'll remind you of that notation as well for these other two definitions. So we say the cardinality of A is less than or equal to the cardinality of B, if and only if there is an injective map from A to B. And we have similar notation for that as well. And then we say the cardinality of A is strictly less than the cardinality of B, if and only if there is an injection from A to B, but no bijection from A to B. And again, we've got like that similar notation for that notion as well. Okay, so now we're going to prove a really important theorem, and it's like a real classic one as well. And it says that if you have any set A, then the cardinality of A is strictly less than the cardinality of the power set of A. So in other words, this action of taking a power set always builds something which has a larger size. And let's see the motivation for this. Let's say that if A is finite, we know the following fact the cardinality of the power set of, or the cardinality of A is most definitely less than two to the power cardinality of A. That's because like X is always less than two to the power X, but that's equal to the cardinality of the power set of A in this finite case. So there we've like made the inequality. But of course, the finite case is not every case. We definitely have infinite sets, and that's what we want to prove here, a general proof that will include infinite sets. So the first thing that we'll do is construct an injection from A to power set of A, but then show that there is no bijection. So let's first consider the map, which I'll call G, going from A to power set of A. And what it does is it takes an element A and it sends it to the singleton A, so the singleton subset A. Okay, well, let's notice that this map is injective. So I won't check that, that's pretty clear that this map is injective. But the fact that this map is injective tells us that the cardinality of A is less than or equal to the cardinality of the power set of A. We just have to show that there's no bijection to finish this thing off. So now let's show that there is no bijection and we'll do this by way of contradiction. So by way of contradiction, let's suppose that F going from A to the power set of A 
is a bijection. But since it's a bijection, that means it is surjective. So that's important. The real thing here is that it will fail surjectivity. Now we'd like to consider a very carefully constructed set. So let's consider this set, which I'll call B, and it's made up of all elements from A, so it's a subset of A, and those elements of A satisfy the following rule. A is not an element of F of A. So this may seem kind of crazy, but notice that what does F do? It takes elements of A and sends them to elements of the power set. But what's the what are elements of the power set? Well, they're subsets. So what F really does is it takes elements of A and it assigns them to subsets of A. But that means we can talk about an element of A being inside of its assigned subset or not. And this is how we'll define B. So it will be all A in A such that little a is an element of F of little a. Okay, so that's interesting. So let's note that this is most definitely a subset of A, which is the same thing as saying that B is an element of the power set of A. But now, since F is surjective, we can find a little b in A such that B equals F of little b. So it's a subset, which means it's in the power set, but this is an onto function, so we just find the pre-image of this subset. But now the real question is, is little b in b? And this is where we're, gonna, where we're gonna run into a really interesting contradiction. So let's do this by cases. So case number one, which is b is an element from b. If b is an element from b, by the definition of this capital B, that tells us that little b is not in f of little b. Oh, but that's a problem because f of little b equals capital B. So we have if B is in capital B, then B is not in capital B. But that's impossible. That's a contradiction. We have something happening and it's negation happening at the same time. Okay, so now let's look at case number two, which is B is not in B. Oh, but this capital B equals F of little b. So we really have B is not an element of F of little b. But that's exactly the condition to land in B. So that implies that little b is in the subset of B. But that's another contradiction. We said that B was not in capital B, and that implied that B was in capital B. So something is true and its negation is true at the same time, which is another contradiction. But those are the only two cases, both lead to contradictions. So that means up here in our assumptions, we made an assumption that is false. And what is that assumption? Well, the assumption is the existence of this bijection from A to the power set of A. So that means no such bijection exists, but since no such bijection exists, we have satisfied the condition down here for the cardinality of A being strictly less than the cardinality of the power set of A. Okay, so I want to do two things before we leave. One is look at a result that's built off of this, and then also give you some warm-up exercises. So it follows from that last theorem that we proved that we have an infinite list of non-equal infinities. So we could start with the natural numbers, which is a countably infinite set, and then we could take the power set of natural numbers and create a set with cardinality, which is strictly bigger than the natural numbers. Then we could take the power set of that and create another set, which is bigger than the cardinality of what we had in the previous step. Then we could continue taking the power set forever and ever and ever and create all of these infinite sets with unequal cardinalities, kind of increasing cardinalities, if you will. Now you might say, well, I know that the natural numbers lives right here. Well, is there anything maybe more common that has the cardinality of the power set of the natural numbers? And yes, in fact, the real numbers has the cardinality of the power set of the natural numbers. Then what about the power set of the power set of the natural numbers? Well, yeah, all functions from R to R, 
not continuous functions, but all functions from R to R has the cardinality of the power set of the power set of the natural numbers. Then you can keep going and these things get kind of more obscure. Maybe another question which is obvious to ask is, okay, I have an infinite set here, natural numbers. I have an in infinite set here, which is either real numbers or power set of natural numbers. They are unequal. One is larger than the other. Is there any set in between them? In other words, can I find an inf infinite set whose cardinality is larger than natural numbers but smaller than real numbers? Well, that's actually unknown, and that's in fact known as the continuum hypothesis. And also, in fact, it's been proven that it's impossible to prove it true or false. And versions of set theory are consistent with it and without it. So I think that's pretty interesting in itself. Okay, so now that we've said all of this, I'll leave you with some warm-up exercises. So now I've got three nice warm-up problems based on what we saw today. The first is to consider the following set, which I'll call A. It will be all ordered pairs m comma n, where m and n are natural numbers, and m is less than or equal to n. So let's show that's a countable set. Next, let's describe a partition of the integers into five countably infinite subsets. So you'll have to recall what a partition of a set is, but that might be a nice review. And then finally, let's prove that the set of all complex numbers is in fact uncountable. And that's a good place to stop. This is the 24th video in a series devoted to introductory proof writing. And today we're gonna to look at a very powerful way to show that two sets have the same cardinality. But we need a bit of a setup first. So let's recall if we have sets A and B, we say the cardinality of A is less than or equal to the cardinality of B, if and only if there is an injective map from A to B. So I'll use this hook arrow to mean that we have an injection from A to B. Furthermore, we would say that cardinality of B is less than or equal to cardinality of A, if and only if there was an injection from B to A. And so we know with numbers, if x is less than or equal to y and y is less than or equal to x, then x must be equal to y. So it would be nice if that were also true for cardinality. So in other words, it would be nice if the cardinality of a being less than or equal to the cardinality of b and the cardinality of b is less than or equal to the cardinality of a, then they have equal cardinality. In other words, a and b are equinumerous. But what does that really mean? That means we should be able to take an injection from a to b and another injection from B to A and construct a bijection from A to B. And that's exactly what we'll do today. And this is called the Schroeder-Bernstein theorem or sometimes the Schroeder-Cantor-Bernstein theorem. Okay, so let's give a general idea of the construction before we look at the careful proof. So let's say this blue box over here is our set A and it's being mapped to this red circle over here by our function f, and that is our set b. So notice all we have is that a gets mapped to b in a one-to-one -one method, so it's injective. So that means we may miss elements of b over here. So we could maybe see the image of a inside of b like this. So this inside square right here would be f of a. Okay, nice. Then we could take the image of b inside of a under g and get a picture that's something like this. So we would have a circle in here. So remember that g is injective, it may be surjective, so it may miss things like this right here. But notice it's got this f of a inside of it. So let's draw this f of a inside right here. And let's get a handle on what these parts are. So notice that this outside bit right here is g of b. And then this inside bit right here is g of f of a. And then the idea is we keep doing this to build like this nested action. So let's maybe do one more. So applying F, that'll actually give you a copy of another red circle in here and another blue circle in here or blue square in here. And what would those be? So this would be F 
of g of b, and this right here would be f of g of f of a. And you can imagine this going on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Now, what we'd like to do is somehow define this map from A to B so that it makes a choice as to which part of this like descending inclusion we are a part of. And maybe the easiest way to do that is to map all of the blue sets over here on the left to the blue sets on the right and then map all of the red sets on the left to the red sets on the right. So let's just keep in mind that the blue set will be between this outer blue boundary and this red boundary. So this blue set that I'm shading right here should get mapped to this blue set over here that I'm shading. So for instance, a point right here would get mapped to a point right here. Okay, great. And then this red set right here should get mapped from this red set, which is right here. And you can imagine what's going on after that. So this blue square that's inside here should get mapped to this blue square inside here. And then what's going on here inside of this red circle, but outside of the blue square, will get mapped to a red circle that's inside this inner blue square. Okay, so anyway, what we'd like to do is somehow describe all of the blue sets and all of the red sets. But notice that the red sets are just a complement of the blue sets, so that shouldn't be too hard once we get the blues. Let's notice that this outer blue set is just simply A minus G of B. Great. So that's this outer blue set. Okay, but then what's this inner blue set? Keeping in mind that we'll have this red circle inside, and then what we get after doing this shading. So this blue set in here will be, let's see, G of F of A minus another G of B, because I, we have to take away what's going on right here, but what's going on right here is G of F of G of B. So let's write this down, G of F of G of B. Great. So just to reiterate, this is the outermost blue shading, and then this is the second level of blue shading. But of course we wanna union them. And then we'll get another level of blue shading which is inside of here, and that'll be constructed the same way, but we'll just have more compositions of this uh, G of F of B. So let's see, putting this all together, we'll get a set which I'll call U, which will be the union as N goes from zero to infinity of the infold composition of G composed with F, evaluated at A minus G of B. Okay, and notice that if we set N equal to zero, we get this first set, which like I said, is this outer blue region. If we set N equal to one, we get this set here, which is maybe the next level of blue region, and then so on and so forth. Okay, so just to reiterate, those are all of the blue sets. And then after that, we'll have all of the red sets are just simply their um, complement in A. So they'll be A minus U. Then we can figure out what happens to the elements by what we spoke about before. So this element right here, which I'll maybe call A, will get mapped to F of A. Okay, but then this element right here, which maybe we'll call X, will get mapped over here to the inverse image of X under G. But notice since G is injective, that's well-defined, especially since X is inside the image of G in the first place. Okay, so it looks like when we're in a blue set, in other words, when we're in the set U, we will be traveling over to our set B using our function F, whereas if we're in a red set, and the red sets are labeled by V, we will be traveling from A to B with the inverse of G, which is well-defined because we are inside the image of G, and G is injective.
Okay, so now that we've got this kind of idea of what's going on here, let's look at the careful proof. Now we're ready to prove the main result for this video, which is, like I said, the Cantor-Schroeder-Bernstein theorem, which says if the cardinality of A is less than or equal to the cardinality of B, and the cardinality of B is less than or equal to the cardinality of A, then they have equal cardinalities. Okay, so let's do that. So let's suppose that we have our setup. So cardinality of A is less than or equal to cardinality of B. And let's say that is via an injection, which I'll call F. So I'll use this hook arrow to indicate that it's an injection. And then we'll also suppose that cardinality of B is less than or equal to cardinality of A, and that's via an injection which I'll call B or G. And now we'll define those sets, which will be the blue and red sets that we saw on the previous board while we were getting some motivation for what's going on. So let's define our set U, which will be the union over all non-negative integers of the infold composition of G composed with F, and then evaluated at the set A minus G of the image of B. So something like that. And then we'll take V to be equal to A minus U. But that clearly sets up a disjoint union of A. So A is the disjoint union of U with V. And that's because V is defined to be the complement of U in A. Okay, now we have our sets defined. Now let's define our function. So we'll define our function H from A to B by H of X equals, so it'll be equal to F of X if X is in U, and it'll be equal to G inverse of X if X is in V. And maybe let's underscore that this is okay. And what I mean by okay, it's well-defined because um, X is in the image of G. So that means we can apply G inverse and G is one-to-one. -one. That means there's a clear single element for which this is. Okay. So now we'd like to show that H is one-to-one -one and onto. So let's first show that H is injective. Okay, so let's suppose that H of X equals H of Y. And this is gonna break down into three cases depending on where X and Y come from. So the first case is if X and Y are both from U. Okay, but h of x equals h of y, when they both come from u, boils down to f of x equals f of y, which boils down to x equals y, and that's because f itself is injective. So there's not much to do right there. Now the second case will be what happens if they both come from v. Okay, well, if they both come from V, then applying H is the same thing as applying G inverse, and we have G inverse of X equals G inverse of Y. But from here, we'll simply apply G to both sides of this equation, giving us X equals Y. So we don't actually use the injectivity of Y at this step, or of G at this step. What we've really done is use the injectivity of G way back here to have this function be well-defined in the first place. Okay, so that brings us to our third case, which is what happens if X is in U and Y is in V. So they come from different sets. Okay, well, that means that F of X equals G inverse of Y. But now applying G to both sides, we'll get Y equals G of F of X. But notice everything of the form g of f of x is inside of u by the definition of u. So this is in u. But let's notice that's a contradiction because we have simultaneously y is in v and y is in u, but those are disjoint sets, so that's impossible. So like I said, that gives us a contradiction. So based on the analysis of these three cases, h must be injective. Now let's move on to the surjectivity proof. We just finished showing that H is one-to-one. -one. In other words, H is injective. Now we'll show it's surjective. But then we'll have a bijection from A to B, which means the cardinality of A will be equal to the cardinality of B, finishing everything off.
Okay, so let's suppose we have something from the codomain. I'll call it little b. So like I said, that comes from capital B. But notice that means that g of little b must be inside of A, given the fact that G goes from B to A. But then let's recall that A is the disjoint union of U and V. So I'll put a little dot right there to show that we're, or to indicate that we have a disjoint union. So that little dot sometimes means that U intersect V is the empty set. Again, a disjoint union. But the fact that we have a disjoint union there allows us to break ourselves into two cases. So the first case is what happens if g of b is inside of u. Okay, but that means that g of b is inside of one of the components that union up to u. So in other words, it's inside g of f composed with itself n times evaluated at a minus g of b for some n bigger than or equal to zero. So in other words, g of b equals g composed with f, composed with itself n times evaluated at x for some x, which is inside of a minus g of b. And now I'd like to make a little subclaim over here that n is not allowed to be zero. So here's my subclaim that n is not allowed to be zero. Because if n is equal to zero, then that means g of b equals x. But notice that x is not inside of g of b by our assumption up here, but that's a clear contradiction because if you evaluate an element at a function, well, it will be in the image of that function. So that means that in fact, yes, n cannot be zero. It has to be bigger than or equal to one. But if it's bigger than or equal to one, we can factor a copy of g composed with f off of it. So we have g composed with f composed with g composed with f to the n minus one evaluated at x. But now we can cancel a g from both sides and we will have b equals f of g composed with f n minus one of x. Great. But now if we set this element right here equal to A, then what we have is B equals F of A for some A in A. It just turns out that the A has this complicated formula right here, which we got out of our argument above. Okay, so like I said, that's our first case when G of B is in U. Now let's look at the second, somewhat shorter case when G of B is in V. Now let's look at this second case where G of B is in V. But notice if G of B is in V, then applying H is the same thing as applying G inverse by our definition of H. So let's note that real quick. And then this is gonna fall out very quickly. So H of G of B is exactly equal to G inverse of G of B, which is equal to B. So there, we found a pre-image G of little b of our element b that we chose above, but that's exactly what we needed to do to finish this surjectivity proof. Okay, so that finishes the proof of this big theorem, and now we'll look at some example applications. So we just finished proving the cantor schroeder bernstein theorem, which says that if you have cardinality of A is less than or equal to cardinality of B, and cardinality of B is less than or equal to cardinality of A, then the two cardinalities are equal. But in terms of functions, that means if we have an injection from A to B and an injection from B to A, then we have a bijection between these two sets. And that's maybe how you want to think about it because often it's most easy to find an injection between two sets and then not worry about finding a surjection. So like I said, injections are somewhat easier to construct than surjective maps. And so this cantor schroeder bernstein theorem allows us to show two sets have equal cardinality, they're e equinumerous, by just constructing injections, which, like I said, are easier to construct. Okay, so let's do an example that we have done before, and that is to show that the closed interval 0, 1 has equal cardinality with the open interval 0, 1. Okay.
So let's first show that we have the inequality maybe in this direction. Open interval 0, 1 is less than or equal to in cardinality to closed interval 0, 1. And since open interval 0, 1 is a subset of closed interval 0, 1, this is quite easy. We can just use the inclusion map, which is generally written as an I, and this takes like I said, open interval 0, 1 to closed interval 0, 1, and just it takes x to x. So this is clearly an injective map, but it being an injective map proves this cardinality condition. Okay, so now let's prove this second direction so that the cardinality of 0, 1 is less than or equal to the cardinality of open 0, 1. And maybe let's visualize what's going on with this over here. Okay, so let's look at open interval 0 to 1 on the bottom, and we'll look at closed interval 0 to 1 above. And what we'll essentially just do is we'll scale this closed interval 0, 1 until it fits inside of the open interval 0, 1. So let's scale it maybe until it moves between one quarter and three quarters. And that is most definitely not onto, but this example is not onto either, but it is definitely one to one. If all we do is scale this a little bit. So now we've got to construct a function that does that, but that's not too difficult. So let's define f from closed 0, 1 into open 0, 1 by f of x equals, let's maybe take it equal to 1 quarter plus 1 half times x, and that'll do it exactly. So let's notice that takes the point 0 to 1 quarter, 1 to 3 quarters, and then scales everything in between, and that's clearly a 1 to 1 function, which I'll let you check. Okay, so now putting these two things together, we have our result up here that these two have equal cardinality. All right, let's now look at a little bit more of an interesting example. For our last result, we'll show that the cardinality of the real numbers is equal to the cardinality of the power set of the natural numbers. So we alluded to this result, I think, in the last video. Now we'll prove it. And we'll use the fact that the cardinality of the real numbers is the same as the cardinality of the half open interval from 0 to 1, where we include 0. And we'll do this by constructing injections. So an injection which I'll call f from 0, 1 to the power set, and then another injection which I'll call g from the power set to 0, 1. Okay, so let's see how we can construct f first. So the idea is to take an element from 0, 1 and then, writing, and then write it in its decimal expansion. So let's do that. So let's take x from 0 to 1 and, like I said, write it in its decimal expansion. So it can be written as 0.a1, a2, a3, a4, so on and so forth. So we have x is equal to that. And you might say, well, decimal expansion is non-unique. A trailing tail of nines is the same thing as a trailing tail of zeros. But let's just always take a trailing tail of zeros instead of a tailing trail of nines. So I'll maybe point that here. So we'll use 0.4 instead of 0.399 repeating. Great. So when we have a choice as to take a trailing nines or trailing zeros, we'll take just the trailing zeros. Okay, now we'll define f evaluated at x as follows. So it'll be equal to 10 times a1, and then 100 times a2, and then 1,000 times a3, all the way up 10 to the n times a sub n, and so on and so forth. So let's look at a little bit of an example of what's going on here. So f evaluated at 0 0.231 will be equal to the subset 2300 1000. And recall, we're getting subsets as outputs of f because f should take these numbers and output subsets. So that's the right type here. And now we just need to finish this off with the claim that f is injective. But this is pretty straightforward. Let's suppose that f of 0.a1, a2, so on and so forth, is equal to f of 0.b1, b2, so on and so forth. 
But let's notice that this encodes the decimal points as like multiples of powers of 10. So it's really easy to see when two sets are equal. And in fact, what this means is that 10 to the n times a sub n is equal to 10 to the n times b sub n for all n. But that gives us that a sub n is equal to b sub n for all n. But that means that those two inputs were the same. So maybe if we call this input here x and this input here y, then that implies that x equals y. But that's what we need for our injectivity. Okay, so now let's construct our reverse map. Now let's construct our map G, which takes an element from a power set, in other words, a subset of natural numbers, and it gives us a number between zero and one. And this will kind of be in the same spirit. So let's say that G takes a subset A, and what it gives us is the number 0.A1, A2, A3, A4, so on and so forth where we define a sub n to be zero if n is not in a, and it's one if n is in a. So somehow we're like collecting some data on what natural numbers are inside of a. So let's look at some examples here. So let's notice that g of the empty set is equal to just the number zero. And that's because nothing is in the empty set. And then what about g of the set of all natural numbers? That's a subset, so we have to know what g does to that as well. Well, that will be equal to 0 0.1111, so on and so forth. That is a repeating one. It's, that's because it includes all natural numbers. Let's look at a little different example. Let's say g evaluated at the set 1, 3, 4. So that'll be 0 0.1011. So it contains zero, does not contain two, contains three, contains four, doesn't contain anything else. So that would be the image of G in this case. Okay, so now let's finish this off by proving that G is injective. And by the construction of G, this will be pretty straightforward. So let's suppose that G of A equals G of B. But then we need to show that A is equal to B. But A and B are subsets, so we need to do that with subset double inclusion. So let's suppose that little n is within A. Okay, but what that tells us is that G of A if we set it equal to 0.A1, A2, AN, so on and so forth, this nth digit right here is equal to one. But then if we set G of B equal to the expansion 0.B1, B2 up to BN, so on and so forth, then this nth digit right here is also one. That's because these outputs are the same. But if the nth digit of B is one, that tells us that N is in fact inside of B as well. But that means that A is a subset of B. But then by a completely symmetric argument, we can show that B is a subset of A. So I won't write that down because it's completely symmetric. So in the end, we will have that A and B are equal as sets, which is what we need for G to be injective. And that finishes the proof of these equal cardinalities. Now let's finish this off with some warm-up exercises. So I've got two warm-up exercises for you. The first is to show that if A is a subset of B and we have an injection from B to A, which we'll call G, then A and B have equal cardinalities. Then next, let's prove that N cross N, in other words, N squared, has equal cardinality with n using Cantor, Schroeder, Bernstein. So we did an alternative proof last time, but I think you could do a second kind of nice proof as well using this new theorem, and that would give you practice using this new theorem. And that's a good place to stop.